He stood there on the floor of the sculptor's studio, his eyes fixed on the man who was climbing higher and higher on the marble statue that towered above him. His lips curled as he heard the desperate pleading. You've got to give me a chance. My work is good, really good. Look at this figure, the life, the power of these lines. I tell you, there's no use climbing up there. My mind's made up. And this higher figure, look, it's like music, music in stone. Music in stone. Murder in stone. Attention all units, general alarm. Attention all units, general alarm. Criminal at large. Repeat. Attention, general alarm. Attention listeners. Criminal at large. Wanted for murder. $1,000 reward. Repeat. $1,000 reward. Attention, all listeners. Criminal at large. Criminal at Large, radio's newest, most exciting mystery show. A complete half-hour mystery play, and then... A thrilling nationwide manhunt with a chance for you, the listener, to win $1,000 for the capture of Criminal at Large. Listen first for drama, action, excitement. But listen, too, for the clues scattered throughout the play. Clues that can bring you the reward of $1,000 in cash. Immediately following tonight's broadcast of Criminal at Large, somewhere in the United States, a person answering the exact description of the criminal in the play will begin a seven-day tour of the nation, stopping in towns and cities, perhaps your town, your city. Remember, the clues will be scattered throughout the play itself. Listen carefully. Watch for description of height, age, color of hair, clothes he is wearing, identifying marks, habits, mannerisms the type of place in which he is most likely to be found. The criminal at large will not resist capture. When you find him, he will quickly admit his identity and arrange for immediate payment to you of $1,000. If he is not found before next Friday night, the reward will be increased to $2,000 for next week's fugitive, with an additional $1,000 being added each week until you, the listener, discovers the criminal at large. You'll enjoy it whether or not you're interested in the $1,000 reward. But you'll enjoy it more if you play the detective game All America is Playing. Remember, listen for the clues that can bring you $1,000 for the capture of Criminal at Large. There in his studio, Greg felt almost like a god. Those marble figures towering high above him, his hands had created those figures, given them warmth, almost life. To the 30-year-old sculptor, this was the hour of triumph. That huge memorial group, it was a dream completed. A dream that started the day Ricky had given him the commission. He should have known Ricky wasn't giving him anything. He'd never given him anything. Ricky hated Greg. Hated him because Ruth loved him. Ruth was the only thing Ricky had ever wanted, and he couldn't get. And he wasn't a good loser. No, anything Greg got from Ricky, he paid for. This time, the price tag was... Death. <laughs> 
Yes, old Franz's death. The huge block of cement supporting the tall marble statue. Franz's body was in that block. Franz, whom Greg loved and who he killed. And that was only part of it. Part of the horrible thing began when Franz came to the studio to tell Greg that the plan for a statue to be erected in a central square had been approved. Yeah, the committee has approved the memorial, even appropriated the money. It's to be in marble. And to be done by a sculptor of this state. Oh, Franz, if they name me. That victory group of mine. Think of it done in marble. Massive stone and power. Uh, wait, Greg. A committee is to choose the sculptor. A committee headed by Ricky Thorn. Ricky? But why? Why? Ricky's no artist. He has money, Greg. Money and influence. Well, maybe the rest of the committee will... Oh, what's the use of pretending? Ricky will see I don't get it just as he's done before. I think you are wrong, Greg. Ricky wants to help you. Even with your plan to build an art museum, he helps you. Oh, helps me. But he does. He helped raise almost $15,000. Even leaves the money in your care until the building can be started. Sure, because he knew what it'd do to me. Not having enough to live on, sitting here without a dime to buy stone, without the tools that I need. And all the while having that money, money I can't touch. Oh, I don't think Ricky meant that. No, no, nobody ever thinks Ricky means that. He's clever, all right. Clever and cruel. Oh, Greg, Ron. Oh, wait till you hear. Oh, hear what? With the state memorial, it's been approved. Greg, do you realize what it means? Yes, I do. Another chance for Ricky to knife me in the back. Oh, Greg. Ricky's with me. He's parking his car and he has wonderful news. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, how sorry he'll be that I didn't get the commission. How he worked for me. How he pleaded with the rest of the committee. No, Ruth, is no use. Hiya, Greg. Ruth, tell you the news. She told us only Wait a minute, that... France. Wait a minute. Let Ricky tell it. He enjoys this, don't you, Ricky? A chance to watch me squirm a oh, little. Now, wait it. a minute, old man. Wait a minute. No, Give me a no, chance. No. Go ahead, go ahead. Tell me why I wasn't picked as the sculptor. But you were picked. Here. These are the official papers. You mean... I mean you've been commissioned to do that victory group of yours. In marble. <laughs> Couldn't be. But it was. Everything Greg had ever wanted, all his plans, his dreams, handed to him by Ricky. Greg tried to take it in. He tried to shut out the little voice that was beating against his brain. Don't trust him. Ricky hates you. He wouldn't give you this. He wouldn't make it easier for you to marry Ruth. Watch out for him. But... There were the official papers commissioning Greg to do the memorial. Ricky couldn't stop that. Nothing could stop it. This was it for Greg. The start of everything. Of horror and violence and murder. How Ricky must have laughed as Greg plunged eagerly into preparations. But it was like being a new person... He was no longer an unknown struggling artist. Now he was D. Gregory Hunt, commissioned to do a quarter of a million dollar memorial. How simple it was for him to arrange for credit for everything. And in the months that followed, the group slowly took form, became even greater than Greg had dared to dream. Even Franz approved, good old Franz, the most exacting of teachers. Franz looked at the work, smiling in pleasure as he said, Yeah, Craig. It is good. I am proud of you. But always I knew your hands held the key to beauty. Oh, oh, wait now. What about all those times you made me destroy a model just when I was sure it was perfect? Training, Craig. Training so that now you can do a great thing like this. But you must be careful, Craig. The size of this. So tall it is. Yes, I know. I'm going to brace it with steel rods in the back. You see those two forms? They'll be cement blocks to hold the rod. Yeah. Good. And then later the bronze base will give added support. But you should put the rods up now. Well, it's just that I hate to take the time. The, the days seem too short as it is. <laughs> like a man with a sweetheart, no time for other things. <laughs> no wonder they say sculptors are a little mad. <laughs> of time, the changing of seasons, they meant nothing to Greg. All that mattered were the figures emerging from the marble. 
Finally, it was time to order delivery of the bronze base. Up till then, Ricky hadn't even visited the studio, but he showed up that day and seemed strangely interested in the matter of the bronze base. His voice was very casual. Oh, uh, Greg, about that bronze base, won't it cost quite a bit? Mm, yes, $12,000. But it's all right. You see, Ricky, having this commission makes it easy. The Atlas Company said not to worry about payment until I was paid. The Atlas Company? Uh, that's where you're getting the bronze? Mm-hmm. I'm going down there now. Why not come along? Oh, well, thanks. I, uh, I have an appointment. Oh, well, wait, though. At least you have time to see how the work's going. Hey, let me show no, you. No, 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 Greg. I, I'm in a hurry, really. Some other time. Greg watched Ricky walk out through the door. Suddenly, he had that same feeling of danger, of warning. Something about the way Ricky had looked, the casual way he had spoken. Greg shrugged away the thought, pulled his light-colored trench coat over his brown suit, and went to see about delivery of the bronze base for the statue. At the Apples Company, the clerk seemed courteous as ever. Why, uh, yes, Mr. Hunt, the base is all ready for you. A magnificent piece of work. Oh, fine, fine. How soon can it be delivered? Immediately, of course. Well, that is, <laughs> after the uh, payment... Payment? Well, yes, $12,037. That includes delivery, of course. Oh, but I've made arrangements to pay for the base when I get my check for the memorial. Oh, huh. I'm afraid there's been a misunderstanding. No, no, I, I made it quite clear that... Wait, uh, may I see the manager? Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Hunt, but it was the manager who instructed me. The base cannot be delivered until we receive payment. Payment in full. <laughs> Why had they suddenly closed off his credit? Greg had made the mistake of forgetting Ricky hated him. Why, he even went to him for help. As always, Ricky was polite, polite but regretful. Oh, I'm awfully sorry, Greg, if there were any way I could help but you. But, Ricky, there is a way. It's only $12,000, and you know the fee I'm to get for the memorial? Yeah, that's just it. I do know. I'm on the committee that appointed you. I'd have to pass on your work when it's done. But that wouldn't make any difference oh, about... but it would make a difference. Look, this is a state project, and that means politics. If they found out that I'd loaned you money, they'd charge collusion, cancel the whole thing. But, Ricky, I've got to get that money. I've got to. But Greg couldn't get the money. Every door that had been wide open was suddenly closed. He gave up. Sat there in his studio like a half-dead person, staring at the monument towering 60 feet above him. The monument that meant everything in the world to him that might never be finished. And then again, that little voice started beating against his brain. That money, the $15,000 you're holding for the art museum, it's in your name. You could repay it from your fee. No one would ever know. It would be months before the material for the museum would be available. Yes, he'd have plenty of time. How simple it was. Maybe they're always simple, the things that lead to murder. They didn't question Greg at the bank. He hurried back to the studio, called the Atlas Company, and told him he'd be right down with the money. But just as he hung up, old Franz walked into the studio. Oh, hi, Franz. I'm sorry I'm just on my way up. No time to waste these days, hmm? I see also, no time yet to put up those steel rods. Greg, if that should fall... Oh, don't worry, it's all right. Everything's all right. Mm-hmm. And yesterday, there was no hope in all the world. <laughs> well, that was yesterday. Ah, the company changes its mind, eh? The bronze base. They trust you for it after all. Well, they don't have to. Look, I'm paying cash for it. Greg, all that money, where did it come from? Ricky? No, no, I, I borrowed it. Yes, I borrowed it. At the bank. I, uh, I used the marble for security. But the marble is not paid for. Greg, look at me. Where is that money from? Well, I told you, the bank, they... Oh, what difference does it make? Greg, the truth. You must tell me the truth. Well, I tell you, it doesn't matter. It's just for a few weeks. They're not ready to start the museum, and by that time Greg, I'll be... no. Able... That money is not yours. Well, it's in my care. I'll put it back, Franz. It's just a loan. Look, friends, I've got to. I've got to finish this work. It's my whole life. It's everything. Yeah, and that is why you can't. Beauty is not a thing only of hands and chisels. If you did this, it would show. 
They would be ugly. No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. The group's almost done. I'll have time to... No. Hey, France, wait. France, where are you going? To Ruth. You will listen to her, and she will stop you because she loves you. Oh, Ruth won't understand. She think I was no. stealing it. I did... France, wait. No, I do it for you, Greg, to stop a bad... You're not going to tell Ruth. You no. can't stop no. me now. Nobody's going to stop no. me now. Oh, Greg, let me go. Let me go. I said you're not going to. I told you not to, friends. Brian, speak to me. I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't... Brian's... Brian's, you're... You're dead. You have just heard the first act of tonight's play on Criminal at Large. Remember, immediately following this broadcast, a man answering the exact description of the sculptor in this play will start on a coast-to-coast tour of the nation, stopping in towns and cities along the way. If you recognize that person, he will immediately admit his identity and arrange for payment to you of $1,000 in cash. We'll continue with tonight's play in just a moment. And now, back to Criminal at Large. A young sculptor, Gregory Hunt, needing money to complete a memorial statue which was to be his masterpiece, embezzled funds left in his care. Surprised in this act by his old art instructor, Franz, Greg had struggled with the old man. In his fury, he'd struck Franz with a heavy chisel, and now the old instructor lies dead on the studio floor. They wouldn't believe it was an accident. They call it murder. If only he could find some way to... But wait. There was a way. The cement. The forms were ready for the huge cement blocks into which the rods were to be fastened to support the statue until it was in its permanent base. All Greg had to do was mix the cement and pour both blocks. They'd look the same. No one would know that in one of them was... Franz's body. Greg waited two days for the cement to harden. Not answering the door, not sleeping, just sitting there waiting. Afraid to look at that cement block. Afraid that in some way he'd be able to see Franz. His body held upright in the cement, his eyes open, staring. Then the second night he fell into an exhausted sleep. It was 9.30 the next morning when he was awakened by someone at the door. Who is it? Oh, it's me, Greg. Ruth. Well, I've been wondering what... Well, Greg, what's the matter? Have you been sick? No, I... I fell asleep sitting up last night. Oh, but you look so... Greg, your hand's all bandaged. I... I cut it on the marble. It's my left hand. It doesn't matter. Well, of course it matters. Oh, Greg, you look so tired. You're killing yourself with this work. Yes, but it's almost done. <sighs> Oh, Greg, and it's so beautiful. But... What's wrong? I... Nothing. I... Well, maybe it's just because it's so big. Looming so far above us. Just for a second, I felt a chill. As though... As though what? Well, as though there was something. Somebody watching. Oh, Greg, there's nothing wrong, is there? I mean... Well, of course there's nothing wrong. Who's that? Did someone come with you? Oh, no, I came alone. Why? Were you expecting someone? The man who stood there chewed sleepily on a toothpick. Greg knew what he was, as surely as though he'd worn his detective's badge on his lapel. The man walked in, slowly looking around the studio. Uh... You happen to know where I can find Fran Shukin? Oh, Franz, is there something wrong with Who are you? Uh, she happens to be a friend of mine. Now, what is it you want? Nothing. Just looking for Fran Shukin. His landlady's kind of worried. Seems nobody's seen him for a couple of days. She said he was good friends with some blonde-haired artist in this building. It's you, ain't it? Yes. Well, that is, Franz and I are good friends. But I haven't seen him for several days. Uh-huh. Hey... Aren't you scared this thing will fall over on you? It can't. It's braced by those rods. And then anchored in cement. I just poured those blocks this week. Yeah, I noticed you got cement splattered all over your shoes. 
good-sized blocks, ain't they? Well, they have to be. That marble weighs tons. Where could it ever fell? Yeah. Well, let us know if you hear anything from Fran Sheehan. Oh, what a strange person. Greg, the, the cold way he looked at you... Oh, Greg, what's wrong? Don't let me alone, will you? I got enough worries trying to get this work done, having to worry about materials, about money. But I thought those things were taken care of. Well, Ricky... Oh, sure, Ricky said. He doesn't know what it is to be broke to. My awake nights worrying about pennies. Oh, Greg, I didn't know. You shouldn't have to worry about money. It isn't fair. I'm going to do something about it. You're an artist, Greg. You shouldn't have to be bothered with that thing. Why didn't you tell me before? The detective will be back. You can work out. But it doesn't matter. All that matters is my work. Finally, Ruth left the studio. Greg went to the Atlas Company, paying the embezzled money for the bronze base. And again, he plunged into his work, forgetting everything except the creation of beauty. And it was beauty. To Greg, that made it worth it. Yes... Worth even Franz's body inside that block of cement. Then the detective came again. He pushed past Greg into the studio and leaned against the block in which Franz's body was hidden. I just dropped by, still looking for that old guy, Franz Schuken. You never heard anything from him, huh? No, I, I told you I spend most of my time working. How come you weren't in when I called yesterday? Well, I have to spend hours at the library on research at museums. It's part of my work. Yeah? You're about done with this, huh? Uh, yes, almost. Uh, in fact, the committee will be here this week to accept it. After that, it'll be moved to the state park. Those blocks of cement, too? No. You see, it'll be on a permanent foundation. It won't need those supporting rods then. Uh-huh. Those rods don't look very strong. They're only temporary. Yeah? And what are you going to do with the cement blocks? I, uh... I don't know. Well... Give us a ring if you hear anything about Fran Schuken. Greg knew he'd be back. He always came back. But in a few days, it wouldn't matter. The blocks would be gone by then. Greg would have them hauled out to where the city was filling in that swamp. Maybe then Greg could forget them and the thing hidden inside. At last, it was the day for the committee to inspect Greg's work. He waited there in the studio alone. Only a few more hours and he'd be free from tenseness, fear, waiting. Ricky, come in, come in. Where are the others? Others? Oh, the committee. Well, you see, they, uh, well, they sort of agreed to leave the final decision up to me. Oh, oh, fine, fine. Uh, Ricky, I, I haven't said anything, but... I, I, I guess you know how much it's meant to me, all your help. Oh, uh, skip it. I haven't done anything. Well, shall we have a look at your work? <laughs> I've never seen it. <laughs> yes, I know. In fact, you made almost a point of not seeing it. Well, I wanted to be impartial. And if I approved your work, it'd be on merit, not friendship. Oh, well, don't worry, Ricky. It's good. Not just because it's mine. Sometimes it seems as though it weren't mine. As though it belonged to someone greater than I. <laughs> You sound like you did in college. <laughs> you used to say I was an artistic phony. Yeah, and Ruth used to jump all over me. We've come a long way since then, haven't we, Greg? Yes, uh, Ricky, I, I don't want to hurry you, but I'm... Your whole future rests on my words. Ruth should be here, huh, Greg? Uh, yes. Uh, now, Ricky, if you want to come She'd over here... She'd be on your side, wouldn't she, Greg? She was always on your side. Well, let's not go into that, Ricky. It doesn't make any difference now. Besides... Maybe it will. At least it'll be easier for you, having her. Easier? Yes. You know how Ruth is, as far as you're concerned. Failing with this won't make any difference to her. Failing? But I haven't failed. Well, Ricky, it's the best thing I've done, better than I ever dreamed. Yeah, I know you've tried. Ricky, you're talking as though... As though I might decide it isn't acceptable? But you can't. The commission, you gave it to me yourself. Yes, because I wanted to help you. No, no, you wouldn't. Remember the terms of the commission, Greg. The finished work had to be approved. Oh, Ricky, even if you hate me... Why should I hate you? This is business, Greg. And you... You're going to... I'm sorry. Sorry. Sure, of course. And I was fool enough to believe you. You never meant to accept it, did you? Oh, I know it's tough. Particularly when you've tied up so much money in it. It's going to be a problem, isn't it? Paying for the marble. And that bronze base. (laughs) 
That was it. Ricky had done this, done it all. Putting the museum fund in Greg's care, then stopping his credit at the Atlas Company. He'd known Greg would use that money. Then afterwards, when the work was refused, Greg would be exposed as a thief. And then that little voice started again. Don't let him stand there laughing at you. It's his fault you stole the money that you accidentally killed Franz. He should be killed, too. But this time, it wasn't going to be an accident. This time, it would look like an accident. The huge weight of that marble towering above him. But wait. Ricky mustn't suspect. He had to make Ricky think he was still begging for another chance. Please, please, Ricky, you've got to listen. If you'd, if you'd look at my work, it's good, Ricky. Look, it's, it's really good. Greg, there's no use climbing up there. My mind's made up. I'm sorry. But look but... at it. This figure, Ricky. Look, the life, the power of these lines. Come down, Greg. I tell you, there's no use. And this higher figure. Look, Ricky, look. It's like music. Music in stone. Music in stone. Murder in stone. Greg could see Ricky's face far below, his lips curling in contempt. Now Greg was near the metal plate which the steel rods were fastened to. He lifted the heavy mallet, judged the blow carefully. <coughs> Bolts loosened. The massive figures trembled. Then they began to lean. Ricky was trying to see what Greg was doing. Greg kept pounding. Now the plate was loose. The tons of marble hung in delicate dread balance. And then started over. Greg forced his voice to a scream. Go on, move! Look, Ricky! Look at my leg! Greg had done it. Ricky was dead, pinned beneath the huge blocks of marble that had thundered 60 feet to the floor below. Greg let himself down from the scaffolding. And then the door was opening. Oh, Greg, Greg. Ruth. Just as I turned in from the street, I heard the crash. And... Oh, Greg. Oh, no. Oh, no, don't look, don't look. Ricky was standing in front of her when, when the rods gave way. He's dead. Oh, Greg. This was to be such a happy day. I had good news for you. And... Good news? Yes. That fund for the museum. I, I talked to the others. The money's yours now. The... The money's mine? Yes. We didn't know you needed funds, Greg. When I explained, they insisted that you take the money. The museum can wait. <laughs> words echoed against Greg's mind. The money was his. If they'd only done that when Franz was still alive, when... But wait, if the money was his, then he wasn't an embezzler. Yes, Greg, it was better than ever, wasn't it? Because Ricky couldn't stop you now. Ricky was dead. Ah, but you had to play it carefully. Call the police first, then. But you didn't have to call them. You turned, and there in the doorway was the detective, his cold eyes taking in the chaos of the studio. What happened? What's going on in there? The statue. What you warned me about. The steel rods pulled loose, and they came... Hey, wait a minute. You got somebody, huh? Who was it? Ricky. Ricky Thorne. Hmm. Accident, huh? Yes, yes. He was in front of it. I shouted to him, but he didn't move fast enough, and yeah. again... Yeah? You mind if I look around? Just curious. I can see how it happened, all right. Oh, Greg, what a horrible man. Those cold eyes and... Oh, Greg, wait, where are you going? I've got to get out. I can't stand it. Oh, Greg, wait. Hey, where'd he go? Oh, I don't know. He's completely unstrung by all this. Such a horrible thing. Yeah, pretty bad, all right. You know, for a minute, I couldn't figure out that accident story of his. Oh, it's not a story. Why, Greg might have been killed himself. Maybe that would have been easier. Easier than what they'll do to him up in that little room in the pen. Penitentiary? What are you talking about? I'm talking about murder. You won't have any trouble picking him up. You got a perfect description of him. We know where he spends his time. Oh, but you're out of your mind. It, it, it was an accident. Maybe. Doesn't matter. You see, I've been looking around behind what's left of the statue. And there was an accident. One that your friend hadn't counted on. What do you mean? Well, I'll show you. That ain't so bad. Just like you was sitting there in a cement chair. Like who was sitting there? Well, I'll show you. 
See, when that statue fell, a big hunk of the marble fell over backwards. Well, what's that got to do with... And it fell right on this cement block, cracked it wide open. You see, uh, I finally found that Franz Schuken guy we've been looking for. <laughs> At this moment, somewhere in the United States, a person answering the exact description of Gregory Hunt is beginning a seven-day tour of the nation. $1,000 reward. Criminal at large. Gregory Hunt wanted for murder. Sculptor by profession. 30 years old. 5 feet 11. Bandage on left hand. Cement stains on shoes. Wearing brown suit. White trench coat. Frequents the vicinity of public libraries, parks, museums, civic buildings. One thousand dollars reward. Yes, one thousand dollars reward to you, the listener, for the capture of this week's criminal at large. You've heard his description, the places he's most apt to be. When you find him and say to him, are you the criminal at large, he will quickly admit his identity and arrange for you to receive one thousand dollars in cash for the capture of criminal at large. The person portraying the criminal at large and the entire operation of radio's most exciting mystery game is under heavy bond with Lloyds of London and conducted under the constant supervision of the world-famous Burns Detective Agency. Tune in next week for the next thrilling mystery play in this exciting series. Hear a report on the capture of Gregory Hunt. Hear the new clues for the next week's Criminal at Large. Remember a new play each Friday night and a new reward of $1,000 for the capture of... Criminal at Large. The time now is half past eleven. The makers of Royco Soup and Surf present... Dead. Touched. My shoulder. Today, we tell of a strange series of coincidences that saved the lives of many people. This story was sent to us by Mrs. G. King of Cowie Road, Durban, and we call it Bridge Awash. I can't run any further, Mary. I can't. You must, Martha. You must. Uh, oh, come on. Don't sit uh, there. We must stop that bus. We must. Oh, you said must four times in a row, dear. Oh, for goodness sake, who cares? Martha, there is no excuse for bad. Look, I'm going and leaving you here. The lives of many people depend on it. Don't take our word for Royco Cape Dutch Cream of Vegetable Soup. Ask Omar. Here's the soup I loved as a little girl. New Royco Cape Dutch Cream of Vegetable Soup is just like my old Omar made. She used a special recipe learned by heart in the good old Cape days. Yes, Royco Cape Dutch Cream of Vegetable Soup is the real thing. It even smells right. Thank you, Omar. And only Royco make real old Cape Dutch Cream of Vegetable Soup. Filled with the good things you would choose. Stuff with Super Blue puts true whiteness back into your wash. A real white, a true white. It's Super Blue! What? Trust Surf to get your wash truly white. The white of Surf with Super Blue. Martha, what are you doing? Ringing the grammatical errors in this newspaper. They're disgraceful. Oh, look at that. Do you see? At least 12. Well, I think it's a complete waste of time. Oh, how can you expect a standard of education when newspapers display such abysmal ignorance? Ah, there's another. You see that? A typographical error. Oh, forget it. Really, dear, there is no need to snap. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm worried about Peter. He said he'd ring at seven and look at the time. Well, I suppose he's been delayed, or perhaps this wind has brought down the telephone lines. I mean, anything could have happened. But that's just it. Anything could have happened. Now, Mary, it's no good thinking the worst. Peter is a strong, able-bodied young man. Oh, dear, there's a misspelt word. I, I ring that, too. There. 
Mrs. Patrick was saying that there are ghastly storms everywhere, and Peter's such an impatient driver. Oh, we're fortunate the storm has not struck this part of the country. Yes, it's coming up fast. Do you see those clouds over there? Now, that's what you call wishing a storm out to us. Don't see the clouds and we will escape. That's the way it is always. Oh, and, and there's another thing. Ah, that will be Peter to say everything's all right. Hello? Peter. Oh, I'm so glad to hear your voice. What? Oh, no, of course I'm not worrying. Uh, what's that? Gearbox? Oh, no. But it's a new car. Well, shall I come and fetch you? Uh, no, it's not waiting at present, but it will any moment. Mary, remember what I said. Uh, what's that? The bus. Oh, that's a good idea. Yes, yes, at eight. All right, do that and you can collect the car tomorrow. Bye, darling. Be seeing you. Now, what's happened? His car's developed gearbox trouble and he had to be towed back to town. He says it's pelting with rain. Oh, here it comes. Thanks to you. Oh, Martha. I said it and I mean you. You brought the storm on yourself. Oh, and it is a particularly horrible one. I, I, I think I shall retire under the blankets. There's nothing worse than these wretched storms in this part of the country. The whole atmosphere seems electrified. Peter's coming back in the late bus. I'm glad he's being sensible about this and didn't expect you to drive 50 miles and fetch him. Oh, well, I, I must take cover. I'll join you for a strong cup of tea when the danger is past. I was relieved when Martha left me. Her carefully ringed newspaper lay on the small table, and the sight of it irritated me. I walked across to the window. Below me, the countryside lay stretched like thick black cotton wool. The lightning was now flashing vividly, and then the rain lashed down, great drops which turned to torrents. There was something grand and wild and fearful in the scene. I stood a moment longer watching, and then a particularly vicious flash of lightning stabbed across the sky, sending forked fingers earthwards. I could see it strike straight into a plantation of great wattle trees which flanked the road bridge. In my imagination, I saw one of those giant trees split and then crash to the ground. I turned from the window and drew the curtain, but I felt uneasy. Perhaps that wasn't imagination, but some sixth sense warning me of the danger. I tried to concentrate on the newspaper, but found I couldn't. I walked to the back of the house, but could see no light in the servants' quarters. If a tree had fallen on the bridge, what of the traffic easing through the rain and mist, unaware of the danger ahead of them? I walked through to Aunt Martha, anything to talk to someone. There was a vast bulk in the bed, completely concealed by thick blankets. I remember calling... Martha? Aunt Martha? Oh. oh, go away until after it's all over. I want to talk to you. In this, you must be mad. I have a steel bridge in my mouth. It's a fearsome lightning conductor. Martha, please. I think one of the wattles has been struck near the road bridge. Well, that wouldn't surprise me. <gasps> Listen to that. Go to bed, Mary, and don't be foolhardy. What if the bridge has been damaged? What did you say? Road bridge damage? If a wattle fell directly onto it, it's possible it has been. Oh, my dear child, what a frightful thought. I'll phone through to Sergeant Fenter and ask him to check. What? Use a telephone in this? With suicide? But I must. Oh, really, you are most tiresome. Why not wait for Peter to come back? He'll know what to do. Peter will be using that bridge. Oh, my... Exactly. I'll phone through to Sergeant Fenter now. Oh, be careful, for goodness sake. Oh, I'm going into retreat again. Oh, what a barbarous country to have storms like these. Oh! I wasn't too happy myself about using the telephone, but it was dead in my fingers. There was no chance at all of raising the exchange or warning the police. Then I was compelled. I was almost forced to do something about it myself. I went through to my aunt again. Oh, now what's the matter? I can't raise the exchange. I'll drive down to the bridge and see if it's all right. What did you say? Oh, look, I can't repeat everything I say, so listen to me. I'm driving down to the bridge to check. You will do no such thing. Wake the servant. They don't seem to be there. I must do something about this. Mary, listen to me. If that wretched bridge has been damaged, car headlights will pick it up. When the visibility is nil, never. Well, then, just hold the right thought. I'm not arguing about this. I'm going right now. 
Now, you stay here. I shan't be long. I can't allow you to go out in this alone. Oh, Aunt Martha. Well, I'm I'm coming too. Oh, no. I'll wrap up well and accompany you. Though heaven knows I still think you are completely insane. Almost before I sat in the car, I knew it wouldn't start. It was as dead as the telephone. Martha sat beside me, straight and disapproving, while the lightning still danced and lunged across the sky. Neither of us spoke as we left the car, and on one accord walked down the long road towards the gate. The water rushed around our ankles, and the red earth was churned into thick mud. The river, normally a gentle stream, rushed and rampaged. Ahead of us was the wattle plantation. And then, as I'd seen it in my mind, it materialized. A great tree had crashed across the bridge, shattering the side and straddling the road. This was a death trap to any unsuspecting motorist. My dear child, this is too terrible. A motorist couldn't see it in this ghastly weather. We'd better walk to the village just as fast as we can. Walk? To the village? But that's all we can do. Oh, but it's over five miles. Let's, Let's not argue about this. Let's go. Oh. Come on. It was a walk into a nightmare. The rain still slashed down. The thunder roared and rumbled and then crashed like giant waves around us. There was lightning too. Always that lightning dominating the scene. I found myself running and praying that we'd see a motorist who'd help us. But there was no one. And then Martha collapsed onto a sodden patch of grass. Oh, I can't run any further. Mary, I can't. You must, Martha, you must. Oh, oh, come on, don't sit there. We must stop that bus. We must. Oh, you said must four times in a row, dear. Oh, for goodness sake, who cares? Mary, there is no excuse for being... No, I'm going and leaving you here. The lives of many people depend on it. Right, I'm coming Well, too. come on, then. There's no time to lose. We staggered into the tiny village half an hour later. Sergeant Fenter was on duty. Mrs. King, hey, what are you doing here? Hey, what's going wrong? It, it's the bridge. There's a tree crashed across it. What? I couldn't phone. The line's down and, and the car wouldn't start. Well, I'll send the van around there straight away. And now you sit where you are and I'll get you some coffee, eh? I shan't be a moment. Oh, I never thought I would be pleased to sit in a police station. But I am... What a relief. You know, Mary, I've been... Yes, hoping. if it's about misspelt words, I How don't... did you guess? That calendar. Do you see the way they've spelt the... I'm not interested. I'm exhausted. Oh, darling, it was a very heroic thing you did. I would still be under those blankets. There you are. Here's your coffee. Uh, now I've sent the van and we'll stop the bus at the turn-off. Oh, thank you, Sergeant. That was the best cup of coffee I've ever had. The bus was stopped, and I watched Peter climb off and almost laughed at the look of amazement on his face when he saw me. That could be the end of my story, but it isn't. There was a fantastic postscript. What a spread when you add the creamy cheesiness of Melrose Cheese World to sandwiches and snacks. Creamy smooth cheese that spreads with ease. Melrose Cheese World. Yes, Melrose Cheese World is real dairy fresh cheese whipped and blended with butter into a creamy smooth spread. What a well of a way to have cheese. Melrose Cheese World. Give yourself a spread. Add the creamy cheesiness of Melrose Cheese World. Dove with Super Blue puts true whiteness back into your watch. A real white, a true white. Super Blue, what? Trust Surf to get your wash truly white. The white of Surf with Super Blue. Peter looked at my car in the morning. The battery was dead. But there was something else inside very much alive. A thick puff adder which lay across the back seat. We all asked ourselves the same question. Had it been there the night before? And if so, how fortunate my car didn't start and irritate the monster into striking.
Thank you for a fascinating story, Mrs. G. King of Cowie Road, Durban. Our sponsor's check for ten rands will be sent to you shortly. Now, don't forget, listeners, we welcome your letters. If death has ever touched your shoulder, do write in and tell us about it. Our address? Death Touched My Shoulder, Box 1540 Durban. Death Touched My Shoulder, Box 1540 Durban. Do write soon, won't you? Be listening again on Saturday morning at 11.45 when we will present the story of another true experience in our series, Death Touched My Shoulder. Death Touched My Shoulder was presented by the makers of Melrose Cheese Whirl and Sap. Listen again on Saturday morning at 11.45 for another interesting story in Death Touched My Shoulder. You're tuned to the national network of Springbok Radio, Springbok Radio for brighter broadcasting, and the time is a quarter to twelve. Adventures in the Supernatural. The XYZ Company brings you a new series of programs. A series which we believe is just a bit different from anything you have ever heard over your radio. A scientific investigation of supernatural phenomena. Adventures into that shadowy realm which lies beyond the horizon of proven knowledge. Conducting this series of investigations and acting as commentator is the eminent psychologist, Dr. Lionel Hirsch. I present him now, Dr. Hirsch. Ladies and gentlemen... May I begin by explaining the position of the sponsor and my own position as regards this series of broadcasts. We are not out to prove or disprove anything. Our attitude is simply of scientific inquiry. To the question, are there such things as mental telepathy, spirits, premonitions? Our answer is, we do not know. However, events do occur, or are reported to have occurred, weird, mysterious happenings difficult to explain through the operation of known natural laws. In this series of programs... We plan to give you in dramatic form the story of some of these happenings. Instances which have been reported to and investigate, uh, investigated by established scientific organizations. In dramatizing these actual cases for radio presentation, it is sometimes necessary to make occasional trifling changes. For example, to fit into a half hour's broadcast events which occurred over a longer period of time. But the basic facts are presented just as they were originally reported. At the close of the dramatization, we will bring to the microphone the person or persons to whom the events occurred, and will introduce such testimony as has a bearing on the case. The final decision, however, as to whether the case is or is not an example of the supernatural will be left to you. Thank you. And so, based upon an original report, we present our first adventure in the supernatural. Our story begins in the library of an English country house. It is a pleasant room which looks out through a glass-paneled door onto the garden and a green, velvety expanse of lawn, invisible now in the blackness of a hot, sultry August night. A night so black that the darkness seems to press like a tangible thing against the window panes. At a bridge table are the Major, his wife, his daughter, and son. Somewhere in the house... A clock strikes eleven. Um, <clears throat> one spade. Two hearts. Well, Mildred? Oh, oh, is it my turn? Uh, it certainly is. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I... Well, well, what's the matter? Well, nothing. I, I was just listening. How quiet everything is. And even the sound of the frogs in the creek. It's as if the whole world had suddenly... Suddenly stopped and was waiting for something. Are you going to finish this rubber? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, I, uh, you... I said a spade. I wish you'd keep your mind on the game. And I said two hearts. You know, that is queer. Uh, what's queer? About the frogs. 
Ordinarily, they'd be crooking like good fellows. Have you noticed uh, there aren't any beetles this evening, are there? Beetles? Bumbling against the windows. When the lights are on in here, there are usually dozens of them. No doubt the heat has killed them. I've never seen it so close and stifling. I'm sure it's been hot enough to be the death of everything. Yes, that's it. That's the feeling. The presence of death. Uh-huh. It came over me as I was returning from the tennis court. It'd been glorious all afternoon until the sun went down. And then darkness came on so swiftly. Everything was quiet and hushed. Not the drowsy quiet of evening, but a deathly stillness. It, it, it was like leaving a bright sunlit street and suddenly stepping into a darkened room where someone lay dead. Oh, don't be morbid, Mildred. That's the feeling. I can't shake it off. Oh, rot. It is oppressive, Charles. We're going to have a storm, that's all. It's always this way before a storm. Now, I bid a spade and Ronnie here bid two hearts. Three diamonds. I pass, as usual. Haven't had a bit of luck all evening. Well, I hope you know what you're doing, Mildred. Here's a nice run of clubs for you, too. Oh, hold on. That's Mother's trick. Oh, hmm? sorry. Oh, yes. Do watch the game, Mildred. The uh, roses in that bowl on the piano are quite wilted. You'd better tell Ellen to cut some fresh ones in the morning. She's getting careless. Why, those were fresh this afternoon. I saw Ellen picking them in the garden. Oh, I don't look it. If you ask me, the whole garden looks a bit seedy. As if everything were dying. Oh, my lead. Where is Ellen this evening, anyway? I let her have the evening off. She has some cousins living near here. She wanted to call on them. Yes, but it's after 11 o'clock. She should be back by this time. I say, Mildred, will you please... Millie. Mildred, what's the matter? She's fainted. Mildred, darling. Here, here, take a swallow of water. Oh, that's all right. Oh, she'll be all right. Well, you feel better? A little. Awfully stupid of me. But, darling, what happened? I, I... I don't know. Everything got dark, and then... And then I heard the sound of hoofbeats and the rumble of a carriage. It kept coming closer and closer. But finally it swept past me. And through the carriage window, I, I saw a face chalk white with staring eyes... It was horrible. There, there, darling. Uh, too much tennis this afternoon in the hot sun. In India, I've seen things like this happen lots of times. Had a little touch of the sun myself once. Fancied I saw all sorts of weird things. One gets over it quickly now. There's nothing to worry about. You feel better now, don't you? Yes, quite all right. Only it did seem so real. You'd better run along to your room and get some rest anyway. And tomorrow we'll call, and we'll call in Dr. Thornton. Oh, I'll be all right by tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. And uh, no more tennis for a few days, eh? I do hope there's nothing really wrong. Oh, I don't see that there's anything to be alarmed about. Mildred's always been a normal, healthy girl. Maybe we'd better go back to town. But let's wait and see what Dr. Thornton says, eh? It's odd, though, it should happen tonight. What with all the other queer things. The frogs and beetles. The flowers suddenly wilting. Oh, I say, don't be a blithering idiot. Listen. Hmm? Uh, is that you, Ellen? Ellen? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I just wanted to make sure it was you. Yes, ma'am, it's me. I, I'm sorry I'm so late getting back. I, we had an accident almost. An accident? Yes, sir. Uh, Jerry, that's my cousin, was driving me back in the motor. He chauffeurs for the Colbert, you know. And we was going along, taking it easy like, and talking over old times, and and then he hears the sound of horses and a coach coming up behind us. A coach? Yes, sir, a carriage. Traveling fast it was, too. It was on us almost before we knew it. Jerry just had time to pull to one side. You mean a coach almost ran into your motor? Yes, sir. Oh, why? Wait a moment. What kind of a coach was it, Ellen? Well, I, I don't know, ma'am. I didn't see it. Didn't see it? Uh, no, sir. Well, what was it being excited like? It, it passed us and went tearing down the road without... The coach me. almost ran into you, passed you, and you didn't see it? No, sir. All we heard was the sound. And that's the truth, sir. If you don't believe me, you can ask my cousin. But I, I've never lied to you in my life, and I'm not lying now. It's the truth, so help me. We know you're not lying, Ellen. But what you heard was probably the wind. There hasn't been a breath of air stirring since sundown. It wasn't the wind. It was something terrible. Terrible. Oh, now, Ellen, I'm sure it wasn't anything terrible. And anyway, it's all over now. There's nothing to cry about. You come along with me. Yes, ma'am. Well, how do you explain that? I don't think Ellen was playing tennis in the sun this afternoon. Oh, a lot of nonsense. That's not an explanation. Well, uh, uh... No, there isn't any explanation, except that she imagined it. A coach. Nobody rides in coaches anymore. 
She'd have been just as reasonable if she said she'd encountered a knight in armor. And I suppose the fact that Mildred spoke of a coach when she fainted... What are you driving at? I'm going to bed, sitting around here talking a lot of nonsense. Hello, hello, thunder. (laughs) Told you it was going to storm. I think I'll go out and have a look at the weather. I say, Ronald, come out here. Yes? What is it? You know, I believe that is a coach. Who in the name of common sense would be driving a coach around the country at this time of night? Listen. Sounds as if it's coming this way, too. No question about it. It is coming this way. It must be at the turn in the road. By Jove, then it's coming here. There aren't any other houses this side of the turn. It must be driving without lights. I can't see a thing. I can. There. Oh, right. Yes. And they're turning in. Great Scott, they're running right over the lawn and through the garden. They'll ruin it. Here, here, here. I say, hold on there. Good Lord, they're headed directly for the creek. They'll never see it without lights. They'll go over the bank. Stop. Stop. There's a creek down there with a steep bank. They can't stop at that clip. They'll go over the bank even if they do see it. Go in the house and get a lantern. Hurry. Charles, what is it? Carriage. Turned off the road and headed for the creek. Slashed right across the lawn and the garden. Well, the horses must have run away. There's probably no one in the carriage. There were two men on the driver's seat. I saw that much. What happened? I thought uh, I heard... Nothing's happened. Go back to your room. Just a carriage that got off the road, dear. A carriage? Yes. They, they must have lost their way. And a very old carriage with a faded crest on it and, and two coachmen in livery. Eh? You saw it? No. But I knew it would come. Hey, here's the lantern. I had a time finding it. Now, be careful, Charles. You don't know what... I'll be careful. Take Mildred inside. Give me the lantern, Ron. Come along. Hello? Hello there. I say hello. There doesn't seem to be anyone about. Oh, here they are, over here. Huh? They pulled up and swung around just in time, too. Not the person they'd have been over the edge of the bank and into the creek. Yes, yes, but where is the coachman? Hello. Let's see how these horses could have run that fast. Positively skeletons. And the coach looks like something out of a museum. I wonder it didn't fall apart. I can't understand what became of the coachman. I say that. Dead. I think there's someone inside the coach. Huh? Well, wait a moment. Stay here. Anyone in there? Huh? Why don't you open the door? Oh, I beg your pardon, madam. I... Oh, Dad, here's the coachman. Oh, wait a moment, you fellows. What are you doing here? Us. Uh... Come down off that coach, I tell you. You're trespassing. We want to talk with you. I say we want to talk with you. You know. There, wait, wait a moment. They won't stop. I didn't see them till they were climbing up on the coach. I don't know where they could have come from. That's not the only curious thing. There's a woman in that coach. And she was dead. Again, the scene is the library, the time the following morning. The garden doors are open and sunlight streams into the room. In the garden, birds sing. The Major and Dr. Thornton are standing in the doorway. Sorry to bring you out here on a wild goose chase, Doctor. I didn't imagine there was anything really the matter with Mildred. Still, Nothing to worry about at all. Mildred's in perfect health. If everyone in the village were as healthy as she is, I'd have to give up my practice. Oh, what do you suppose made her faint? Oh, any number of things. The heat, perhaps. A little touch of indigestion. She's never been subject to fainting spells, has she? No. Some little temporary condition, that's all. I, I don't know whether she mentioned it to you or not, but for a moment after she came to, she talked rather incoherently. She seemed to have the impression that she'd seen a coach. A rather queer coach. Nothing especially unusual about that. Happens lots of times. Ever see a patient come out from under an anesthetic? Same thing. Simply a dream. Only uh, this one persisted. We had a bit of a time convincing her that she hadn't seen it. Well, the human mind's a peculiar mechanism. We don't know very much about it. I don't suppose there are any of us who can tell exactly where dreams leave off and reality begins. We all carry around a certain number of delusions. Yes, yes, I understand there's no one quite sane. (laughs) Not so sure about myself. But I wonder... Suppose a person's mind were a mechanism so finely tuned. 
that it could record a happening long before the less sensitive minds recorded it. Mm-hmm. Or uh, haven't you ever heard dreams coming true? Only in romantic novels. Well, I still have two more calls to make. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Doctor. Oh, uh, what about golf tomorrow? Oh, yes, right, right. Come in. Oh, yes, Ellen? The inspector is here again, sir. Oh, oh yes, yes. And I picked some fresh roses. They look much better today, sir. Yes, yes, don't they? I'll put them here in the bowl. Oh. I think they're as pretty as we've had this summer. Mm, they are pretty. Oh, oh, show the inspector in. Yes, sir. Oh, come in, inspector. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. I'd just like to be bothering you again. But since I talked to you last night, well, there are several little details that need clearing up. No bother at all. Now, in the first place, are you sure that woman in the carriage was dead? Sure she hadn't merely fainted? Inspector, I've served in the army for a long time. I've seen death too often not to recognize it. The woman was dead. And these two coachmen, uh, what did they look like? Well, as I told you, I got only a glimpse of them. Besides, it was quite dark. Oh, yes, one thing I did notice. They wore livery. Livery? Yes. The coach had a crest on it, a coat of arms. As my son said, it, it looked as if it might have come out of a museum. Your son saw all this too? Yes, and so did my wife and daughter. At least they saw the coach pass the house again as it returned from the creek and swung back onto the road. You know, Major, this case has some very extraordinary aspects. My first theory was that the two coachmen were taking a body somewhere with the idea of disposing of it and got onto the wrong road. Sir? However, an investigation of the vicinity shows no deaths nor disappearances reported. Hmm. And if these two men were attempting to dispose of a body, they'd scarcely want to attract attention to themselves by dressing in livery. What's more, such a coach as you describe would certainly have been noticed on the road. Thus far, we haven't discovered anyone who has seen it. It passed our maid on the road last evening. Oh, well, would you mind if I had a talk with her and get her description of it? She won't be able to give you a description. She didn't see it either. Didn't see it? If it passed her on the road, uh, I'm afraid I don't understand, Major. I don't think any of us understand. I don't think we'll ever understand. Why, what do you mean? When I say this, Inspector, I want you to know that I'm a sane, sensible, practical sort of a person. But in a universe as complex as ours, it is conceivable that there are other worlds, other planes of existence... Events which occurred in time and space, not our time and space. Perhaps that coach and its strange occupants wandered momentarily from out of another world. Well, I... Uh... You recall last night I told you the carriage had plunged off the road, crashed through the garden and cut across the lawn. Yes. Under those galloping hooves and careening carriage wheels, I naturally assumed the garden would be wrecked, the lawn pieces. Well? This morning when I looked out, there wasn't a single hoof print, a single rut of a carriage wheel... A single broken trellis in the garden. On the lawn, not the tiniest bit of turf had been disturbed. Inspector, there was not one sign that the carriage had ever been here. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I am turning the microphone over to Dr. Hirsch for his comments on the story you have just heard. Thank you. This dramatization was based upon an actual report given to the British Society for Psychical Research by Major Charles Gordon Beck. A mysterious coach carrying a dead woman, crashing across a lawn, yet leaving no marks, then disappearing into the night. And mind you, four sane people believe they saw it. What is the explanation? Now, from a scientific standpoint, we cannot begin our investigation with the assumption that the report is true. Neither can we take the opposite assumption, that it is false. In drawing our conclusions in this respect, there are several points to be considered. First, the character of the recipient, that is, the person who claims to have perceived or witnessed the phenomenon. We have to decide, by whatever ability we have in judging a man's character, whether he is truthful or not. Before we decide he is not telling the truth, we should find some inconsistencies in his story, or at least some motive or reason for his telling a falsehood. But, if we fail to find these, we do not yet have to assume that his story is true. The man might be telling an untruth, and yet be perfectly honest. He may be an imaginative type, capable of conjuring up in his mind all manners of weird experiences and actually believing them. 
Or he might have had an uh, hallucination. Once again, we have to judge a man and decide whether he is an imaginative type, the kind of person who would dream dreams and see visions. If we decide that he is telling the truth, that he actually saw what he claims to have seen, there is still the possibility that he is a victim of a hoax, a practical joke. So, before we arrive at any conclusion at all, we should look for natural causes to explain the affair rather than supernatural. Now, I'm going to let you make your own decisions on all of these points. I'm bringing to the microphone for an interview the man who saw the coach and its occupant and who made the report to the British Society, Major Charles Gordon Beck. Major Gordon Beck, with the dramatization you heard just now, an accurate representation of what happened? Yes, as far as the facts are concerned. Of course, the words which your characters used were not precisely our words. Of course. But the story we presented was just as it actually happened. Yes, yes. How long ago did this happen? Let me see. About ten, uh, no, about eleven years ago, last August. Mm hmm. Where did it happen? In Devonshire, England, where I was living. Did the house you lived in have the reputation of being, well, uh, haunted? No, not that I heard of. In your experience, had anything strange ever happened there before? No. Or after this curious affair? Never. You are an army officer, are you not? I was. Uh, I'm retired now. In your own personal experience, not only in your home in Devonshire, but anywhere, anytime, has any other occurrence like this ever happened to you? Have you ever experienced hallucinations? No, no, nothing like that. Do you believe in supernatural phenomena? Well, no, I can't say that I do. I've always considered myself a, a practical man. Yes. Now, understand, Major, we're not trying to trip you up, but simply attempting to find some sort of logical explanation. How do you know you didn't imagine the whole thing? Well, if I'd been the only one to have seen it, I think I would have doubted my own sanity. But my son accompanied me down to the creek, and my wife and daughter saw the coach pass the house. Now, I don't think we all could have imagined it. Well, how do you know it wasn't a practical joke that someone was playing on you? Well, that wouldn't explain the absence of wheel marks on the lawn and in the garden. All right. Then let's take another assumption. Let's assume there's a family living in the country, getting a bit bored with life, and they make up a story just to amaze the neighbors. Remember, I'm not saying you did make up the story, of course. I'm asking if that isn't a logical explanation. Yes, uh, perhaps it is. But they'd have to be very silly people, and they'd probably gain a reputation of being unmitigated liars. And in such a case, uh, I don't think they'd take chances of running afoul of the law by leading the police on a wild goose chase. Of course, they, they might try to amaze their neighbors. Well, no, I don't think they'd try to amaze the police. Well, how long after this happened did you notify the police? Immediately. The same evening. Did you tell anyone else about it? Well, not at the time. You see, at first I was mainly concerned with the fact that the woman in the coach was dead. Yes. I didn't realize how unearthly the affair was until the next morning. Until I saw there were no marks on the lawn. And then I decided I had better not say anything more about it. You see, uh, people might think I'd gone out of my head. Mm -hmm. And you didn't say anything about it? No. no. You didn't use the affair to gain any notoriety? No. But you intimate that some time later you did mention the affair. Uh, how long afterwards and to whom? Well, I should say uh, about three months afterwards. I mentioned it to some friends in London. One of them suggested that I report it to the British Society for Psychical Research. And you did? Yes, yes. I made a report and is included in the proceedings of the society. Did the British Society for Psychical Research offer any explanation? No, oh, but they did tell me a very unusual thing. Uh, they said that at four different times, four different people in four different parts of the world had reported a similar occurrence. What do you mean by a similar occurrence? I mean a coach with coachmen and carrying the corpse of a woman. And this strange equipage was never apprehended, never caught... Never explained? No. Have you yourself any explanation to offer? No, I haven't. I've puzzled over it for years. And so has my wife and my son and daughter. As I told you several days ago, my only reason for coming to your wireless studio here would be for the purpose of putting the story before a great many people. Perhaps, uh, perhaps there's a very simple explanation that I've overlooked, that some of them might see. Thank you, Major Gordon Beck. Thank you very much. So there you are, ladies and gentlemen. That's as far as we've been able to go. 
Is there an explanation for Major Gordon Beck's unusual experience? We leave that to you. And now I am returning the microphone to your announcer. Ladies and gentlemen, we are genuinely interested in studying so-called supernatural phenomena. If anything of this nature has happened to you, we would greatly appreciate a letter about it, giving names, dates, and the facts as you remember them. If your report is adaptable to dramatization, we will reimburse you for the story. We say good night now and allow you to draw your own conclusions concerning the story you have heard. The Adventures of the Scarlet Cloak, starring Wendell Niles. This is a story of the Golden West, as it was more than a hundred years ago. A land of mystery and intrigue. A romantic paradise where the dons and senoritas held to their ancient customs while rubbing elbows with rugged American frontiersmen and pioneers. Where lace-trimmed handkerchiefs from Barcelona were carried next to the heart under crude buckskin jackets. The territory was a melting pot, quiet on the surface like the Pacific, but torn with undercurrents and riptides. It was a restless and growing land, where the strong made their own laws and the weak obeyed or perished. This is the saga of Brad Carver, a fabulous man in a fabulous land. Some called him an angel. Some called him a devil, and many claimed that he never lived at all. But the story of Brad Carver is as colorful and exciting as were his roaring guns and flashing rapier as he cut a flaming swath through this glorious land. Our story starts in October of 1842 as a dusty and battered wagon train at the end of the Santa Fe Trail paused within sight of a settlement of 200 people. Oh, hold your teams, hold them! So we made it, Carver. Los Angeles dead ahead. So that's Los Angeles. Doesn't look like much, McKeever. Well, I guess it ain't Boston, Carver. But it's going to be a mighty big city one day. And it looks good to me right now after 3,000 miles of prairie and engines and mountains and desert. It still doesn't look like much to me. Well, this is where you and I park, McKeever. Where are you striking for? North. Monterey. I'm heading north myself, San Francisco. As soon as I get these folks in and settled, I'll ride along with you if you're willing. Sure, McKeever. Thought maybe you'd had enough of me. Look, Carver, when we started out, you was just another Boston tea drinker to me. But back there on the trail, you proved I was wrong when the going got rough, and I'm admitting it. So do we ride together, or don't we? We ride together, McKeever. Good. We'll hit the trail as soon as we get the train into town. Come on! We're moving! Get up, everybody! Get up! I ain't one for asking a man questions, Carver. But you're in a powerful hurry to get to Monterey. I haven't been there in 20 years. I've got an old score to settle. Old score? You couldn't have been more than a kid 20 years ago. I was old enough to remember my home on fire. My mother and father murdered. I'm sorry, Carver. Couldn't be a bad country. You're lucky they didn't get you. They would have, except for the loyalty of a Mexican named Sancho who worked for my family. I don't know what happened to him afterwards, but he got me to San Francisco and put me on a ship that took me to my father's people in Boston. You know who murdered your folks? No. They rode in at night with their faces covered. My father wounded the leader through the shoulder with a rapier, and one of the mobs stabbed him in the back. 
I've got to find the leader. Well, it won't be easy. He may be dead by now. He may be. But if he isn't, he'll carry a rapier mark on his shoulder. If that man is alive, McKeever, I'm going to find him and kill him. Now I know why we've been knocking on these ponies. We'll switch mounts at the next station. I want to stay on the trail all night and make Monterey by dawn. All right. Get up there, boy. the house? In that grove of trees? Yes. What's left of it? My uh, mother and father are buried in the grove down there. That's the only news of them I ever had. Well, goodbye, McKeever. If, uh, if I thought I could help... Thanks. Uh... It's my fight. I want to get down into the grove and... Uh be alone for a while. If you, if you ever come up to San Francisco... I'll look you up. I promise. Goodbye, and good luck. Goodbye, McKeever. Get up there, boy. Take care of yourself, daughter. J. Carver. 1785... 1822. Priscilla Carver. 1795. 1822. Dear Lord, blessed be their memory. Senor, what are you doing here? I, I, I just come to place the flowers on the grave, Senor. The, the, these people, they were my friends. Sancho, you... You must be Sancho. Si, si, senor. I am Sancho. But I, I, I do not recall ever seeing this senor before. Sancho, you remember me. I'm Brad Carver. Bradito? You, you are the little Brad Carver? Oh, senor Brad. Don't call me senor. Not you, Sancho. I knew I'd find you. Oh, I, I, I prayed this would happen. I, I have been living in the ruins of the old house... Uh, but you should not be near the house. You must go away from here. For a long time, they tried to find you. The men used to come at night. But that was years ago. They wouldn't know me now. Seeing you near the old house, they might suspect. A stranger come from nowhere. A stranger of your age. No, 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 Bradito. You must go. They would kill you as they killed your father. That's why I'm back, Sancho. Because they killed my father. And I'm going to stay. Then you must go into town like any other stranger. Hey, there is an inn, the inn of San Bonaventure. Hey, you must also change your name. You cannot use the name of Carver in Monterey. You're right. At the inn, I'll be Senor Bradford. Bueno, bueno, but we must not stand here talking. A rider might pass. Come, Bradito, I lead your horse, eh? But you said being near the house is dangerous. No, we do not go to the house. I will show you something that you never saw before. <laughs> Even when you were a little boy... Hey, through the grove and behind these bushes, huh? But, but this is the base of a cliff. It's solid rock. No, no, not solid, Bradito. Here, you help me push this big rock here, huh? All right. It's a cave. See, si, see, si, but even without the rock, the bushes hide the entrance. Hey, it's best now to leave it open in case you should need shelter, suddenly. Let's go in. Uh, wait, I strike a light for you. Now you take the torch from the wall. Sancho, these... These things. I remember them from the house. <laughs> si, si, Bradito. I say what I could so that one day you could have them. Here, look over here. The portraits of your mother and your father. I never knew this cave existed. Nobody ever told me. Uh, your father wished it so. Only he and I knew. Ah, uh, see. I see now by the portrait your resemblance to him. My father. See. You know, Sancho, I never believed that anything had happened to him. He was strong. That gave me faith. 
You gave me more faith with your fairy tales. No, I never told you fairy tales, Gradito. You don't remember. The stories about El Diablo, the devil himself, and the scarlet cloak who came riding at night to punish the wicked. It's too bad your El Diablo wasn't around the night my father was killed, Sancho. A child builds up a lot of hope in a legend. Gradito, El Diablo was not a legend. He defended the good against the bad. Perhaps you're right. When stories are told often enough, people begin to believe them. Mm, they were not just stories. I did not deceive you. Ah, turn and look at the wall behind you. Masks. Masks in the image of the devil. See, yeah, and beneath the masks, a trunk. Open it. Sancho. Open it, brother, to I know the truth. Scarlet cloak, black sombrero, and a rapier. Yeah, do you remember, brother, when you were a little child? Bad men who did bad things in this land. Then one morning they would be found dead wearing the mask of the devil who had come to claim them. That was the work of El Diablo. And he lived in Monterrey while your father lived. Because, Bradito, your father was El Diablo. El Diablo? Si. And that's why he was killed. Because they found out that he stood in the way of their robbing and plundering. And they were strong enough to destroy him and they will also destroy you. Bradito, you must go away, please. No, Sancho. This cave is mine now. And so is my father's rapier. But you have been raised in Boston. What do you know of such a weapon? I lived in Europe too, Sancho. I fenced with the greatest swordsmen in the world. Fenced with them until I could beat them. Because I knew that someday I must come back here to kill a man with a rapier. Now I have to find that man. Sancho, if I need you, I'll come here. But if you ever need me, ask for Senor Bradford at the Inn of St. Bonaventure. You slept well, Senor Bradford? Yes, very well. Say, uh, what is that mob doing outside? Some kind of celebration? No, senor, there is much trouble. American gunboats from your country, they are in the harbor of Monterey. They have taken down the Mexican flag and put up the American colors. Oh, I don't believe it. Not unless there's war. We have heard nothing of a war, but they say other nations would like to seize California. Oh, that's no secret. Half the world is after this territory. I am Mexican, senor. But Mexico is weak, and this land is too big. Many of us would welcome the American flag. It is our hope for peace. That mob outside doesn't seem to agree with you. That mob outside is not led by Mexican, senor. It is led by American. Oh, really? See. Si. Say, at times I don't return for the night, think nothing of it. But if I'm ever gone for more than two nights, there's a note for one of your countrymen under my pillow. Please deliver it. See, si, senor. Oh, muchas gracias. They say they brought them gunboats in to protect the country. Protect it from what? I don't see nobody else trying to grab it. Damn it, boy! I hear that get more than they bargained for. I got men riding in from all over the countryside. Men with guts and guns. Are you going to join them? Here come some of them now. Go across the room. Look out there. I'll get her. That was fast moving, stranger. She's fainted. Somebody get some water from the... Thank you, Charlie. That gal's Maria Alvarez. There'll be the devil to pay for this. There's always the devil to pay when a mob like this cuts loose. Yeah, but this just isn't a girl, stranger. This is the niece of Don Raymond de la Torres, the richest man in California. Thanks. Come on, miss. Drink this. Gabriel, que paso? A horseman almost ran you down. Yes, would have, too, if this fella hadn't grabbed you. Oh, gracias. I will be all right now. Let my horse through. Let me through. Maria. Oh. Maria, what has happened? I was almost trampled, but this gentleman has saved me. My uncle, Don Ramon de la Torres. Senor? Bradford. I am most grateful, Senor Bradford. Who were the horsemen? It isn't the horsemen you want. Some madman named Daggard has been inciting this mob or it wouldn't have happened. Daggard! I'm here, Don Ramon. All right, sir. Stand back. Clear that path from our horse. 
Who gave you the right to endanger the lives of the people of Monterey? Have you appointed yourself governor of this territory? They changed the flag at the customs house and waited. And you will let the officials determine what action is to be taken. Disperse this crowd at once, but I shall ask the governor to place you under arrest. All right. I guess we made a mistake, man. The governor's job. If you cannot stay in town peacefully, get out. Now move on. Move on, all of you. You should not have come into town, my dear. Daggett is an impetuous fool. I am all right, thanks to Senor Bradford. I have invited him to visit with us this evening. By all means, you will be most welcome, Senor. And we shall try to erase this sad impression of Monterey. It's not Monterey I'm worried about, Don Ramon. It's that man Daggett. He was planning to lead an attack on the customs house tonight. Well, please, do not be so concerned. The mob has scattered. They will drink and gamble. And by night, they will have forgotten. Now, come, Maria. I will take you home. Adios, Senor Bradford. Adios, Senor. Until tonight? Until tonight. Sancho. I am here, Brady. There's trouble in town. I know, I know. I was there this morning. Senor Doggett finds their anger. He was stopped by Don Ramon de la Torres. But I think he still plans to go through with an attack. I do not think there will be an attack. Not in the town. If there is one, it will be out here in the country. In the country? See? Si. I don't understand. Well, the American ships have cannon. They have also taken the cannon in the customs house. And Doggett knows that. An attack would be hopeless. But why is he bringing in armed men from all over the countryside? Well, perhaps to leave the countryside itself unprotected. Uh, do you remember Don Castillo and the Senora, your father's old friends and neighbors? Oh, of course I do. They have been receiving threats. Somebody wishes to drive them from their land. There has been no open attack against them because they have more than 30 men working on their place. But tonight, Bradito, Daggett will have those men in town. The old couple will be alone. You're right, Sancho. But they won't be alone. Oh, Bratito, you are only one man. It will take the devil himself. That's what I mean. El Diablo, the devil himself. Tonight I wear my father's scarlet cloak, black sombrero, and his rapier. If the Castillo Hacienda is attacked, it will be protected, just as it would have been 20 years ago, by El Diablo. Let's take just a minute now to mention one or two of the many advantages this program provides for an astute advertiser. It's a Western-type story, utilizing the basic success pattern of galloping horses, gunfights, and high adventure. However, through its authenticity, believability, and imaginative presentation, we have widened its appeal to attract the young and the adult audience. The locale of Monterey, a hundred years ago, which will be kept historically accurate revives the romantic flavor of beautiful senoritas, colorful habits and costumes, old-world weapons such as the rapier, and interesting characters of Spanish, English, Mexican, and American origin. It gives you a dramatic, exciting radio program, but is even more suited to a filmed television series. The performers have been selected for their ability and experience, and also for their appearance, so that the television picture will bring you most of the same people you are hearing on this record. Our star for both the radio and television programs probably has talked to more people more often than any man who ever lived. The name of Wendell Niles is familiar to everyone. For 20 years, he has announced and performed several times a week on the highest-rated radio shows. The name is already universally associated with a pleasant, sincere, convincing voice. Through these programs... We now associate that familiar name with a likable, virile, adventurous personality who will quickly spring to life in the hearts of millions of Americans. As you listen to the second act, imagine, if you will, a television screen where you can watch this believable, exciting, romantic man of action, the wearer of the scarlet cloak and rapier, as he rides against the evil to bring hope to the oppressed.
Returning to Monterey after a 20-year absence, Brad Carver has learned that his murdered father was the legendary El Diablo, protector of the weak and helpless. Through his father's old friend and servant, Sancho, he also learns that an attack by night riders is planned against the neighboring hacienda. Donning the scarlet cloak, black sombrero, and red gear that his father wore, Brad and Sancho ride to a hill overlooking the threatened hacienda. The lamps of the hacienda are out for some time now. And still no signs of a raid. They would wait for sleep to come in the house. I hope you're right. Oh, Bradito, I bless myself. Here in the moonlight with your father's cloak and sombrero, I feel that once again I ride with El Diablo. Let's hope the raiders feel the same, Sancho. Uh, there may be many of them. We'll have help. Come on. Uh, where do we go? Down to the corrals to release the livestock. You have a plan? Yes. If they expect no resistance, they'll take the easy approach to the hacienda. That means they'll ride in on the road from town and across the bridge that forged the stream down there. See, see, that is the way they should come. Now, we'll herd the oxen and cattle and horses into that blind pass between the hills, just this side of the bridge. When they approach from the other side, I'll charge the bridge. From there on, it's up to you. Bueno, just tell me what to do. I want you to stampede the herd behind me. Drive them toward the bridge. In this life of the sound of the stampede, they won't know what's coming at them. They'll scatter and run. Ah, here is the main corral. Uh, move them out as quietly as possible. I'll get the horses from the stables. You drive them into the blind pass, and I'll meet you there. I feel something, Bradito. Horsemen, about ten of them. Look, coming over the hills. They're carrying torches. Good. They're on the road to the bridge. Just as they approach the far side, I'll make my ride. Turn the stock toward the bridge and stampede them behind me. Then keep after them and keep them moving. See, I understand. And luck ride with you. El Diablo. Here they come. When you get across the bridge, cut into the hills. I'll double back and meet you near the old mission. See, be careful, Paradipo. Now's the time, Sancho. Adios. Yeah! Oh, boy. Sancho? Here, Pratito. I am here. Are you all right? See, si. All but my leg. I was caught for a little while in the stampede. It was just squeezed a little, that's all. I told you to stay behind the herd. See, si, I know, but I wanted to be closer to you in case they made a fight. Oh, but you were just like your father. Just like him. They were frightened. I'll help you back to the cave. No, no, no. You must not go there. Tonight you must be in the company of others, so they will not suspect. But I can't leave you while you're injured. Pratito, you have taken your father's place. El Diablo returns on the same day a stranger comes to the town. They could make much of this unless you spend the evening with others. Yes. Senorita Maria, the niece of Don Ramon de la Torres, invited me to call. Ah, bueno, then you must go there. He is known and respected. It will be perfect. I will take the cloak and sombrero. I'm the rapier. Ah, now you are, once again, Senor Bradford, a stranger who stops at the inn of San Bonaventure. My niece plays that music box incessantly, Senor Bradford. I am afraid we are poor competition. It is so new and exciting. And has come all the way from Paris. Yes, I know. I've seen them there. You have been to Paris? Our Senor Bradford seems to have seen a great deal of the world. I was in Europe about two years ago. I thought I noted traces of European culture. Do you fence, Senor? 
A little. It's part of a gentleman's training. Excellent. I enjoy the sport. We must try it someday. It is fortunate for me I have the music box to entertain me. Oh, forgive me, my dear. I have been monopolizing the conversation. Now I have some work in my study. I will leave you alone. Why don't you show Senor Bradford the gardens? Perhaps the Senor wouldn't care for... I'd like to see the gardens. They are very lovely. Adios, Senor Bradford. You must honor us again. My pleasure, sir. You must find Monterey different from your native Boston, Senor. Different in many ways. Do you plan to stay here for a time? Do you think I should? I'm sure my wishes would not influence a man who has seen so much of the world. Are you... Will your family join you here? No, and aunt and uncle in Boston are the only family I have. Oh, I have not known many Americans. The man I am engaged to marry is an official of the Mexican government. Our families arranged it when we were both children. Oh, I see. I hope he isn't riding the horse that's headed this way. No, he's in Mexico. That is probably some friend of my uncle's coming to play chase. Good. Because I want to stay here a while longer, Maria. I'm very much taken with this... this garden. That is nice to know, senor. Fool, why do you come here? Let me in. I had to see you right away. Did something go wrong at the Castillo Hacienda? Did something go wrong? Everything went wrong. We were driven off by El Diablo. He's back. Tiger, have you been drinking? El Diablo has been dead for 20 years. Well, he wasn't dead tonight. I saw him as clearly as I'm seeing you. You let yourself be frightened by an apparition? I tell you, the man is dead. You saw him die. Yeah? Well, maybe we were wrong. Maybe we killed the wrong man, or... Maybe somebody's taking his place. Oh, that's impossible. Is it? How about the fellow who tried to make trouble for us in town today? Uh, don't be an idiot. His name is Bradford. He comes from Boston and he is stopping at the inn. Besides, he is here in the garden with my niece at this moment. And he must not find you here when they come in. Now go. I talk to you tomorrow. I ain't waiting till tomorrow. I'm going to see what I can find out tonight. Sancho. Is that you, Bradito? Is something wrong? Were you in town looking for me? I have been waiting here in the cave. I left De La Torres and rode to the inn. My room had been searched. A note I'd left for you was missing. A note with money for you to get out of California if I were discovered. Oh, then somebody knows about you now, Bradito. Yeah, I'm afraid so, Sancho. Uh, yeah. Got to do something about that leg of yours. Uh, it will be all right in a few days. We haven't got a few days. We've got to get you away from here to a safer place. No, no. You are the one who must go. Someday when the Americans really come, then the land will be safe and you may return. Now, the Americans are here now, Sancho. No, no. I met men returning from town after I left you at the mission. The raising of the flag was a mistake. The command of the ships had a false report of a war. Mexico again controls California. Shh. Quiet, somebody calls. Quickly, Sancho. Get down behind that trunk. All right, Bradford, don't move. Well, this is quite a layout, ain't it? So this was El Diablo's hideout, and you took it over. How did you find this place? I had to look through your room at the inn. And I stayed around until you came. I figured you'd run for cover when you found that note was missing, and I was right. So the devil had a son. Might have figured you'd come back, only you're not going to last as long as your father did. You can what? drop your guns, Senor Dagger. All right, Dagger, I'll take that. Pretty tricky, ain't you? Throwing down on me behind my back. Brave when you got an unarmed man. That yeah, didn't bother you when I was unarmed. Take this gun, Sancho. Throw it outside. Why? And throw your own out, too. What, brother? Do as I say. There's still two of you against one, you know. No, Dagger, just you and me. Sancho won't interfere. Can you use a rapier, Dagger? Yeah. I can use one. There's one on the wall behind you, under the devil masks. Take it. You've seen those masks in the past, haven't you, Daggett? 
My father's mark for men like you. Yes, I've seen him. But you'll never put one on me. He's right, El Diablo. This is your last mistake. Then you are good, aren't you, Dagger? Yeah. Next one, you you won't be talking. I had the pleasure of killing your father. And this blade will do for you. I'm glad to know that, Dagger. Because that's going to cost you your life. This is your finish. Oh, good. You know, Bernadito. Yes. There's a chance nobody else has seen it. I want to look at his shoulder. There must be a rapier mark there. See, si, Bradito, see. Si. No mark, Sancho. Dagger was one of the mob that killed my father, but he wasn't the leader. And so from now on, you play a game of death in the dark with a, a man whose face you do not know? Yes. But at least I know that the man responsible for the death of my family is still alive. Bradito, Daggett's men will search for him tomorrow. We must bury him. No, Sancho, he must be found. With the mark of El Diablo, the mask of the devil. I'll put the mask on him and strap his body to his horse and leave him near the town. They, they will put a price on your head. There's already a price on my head, Sancho. The price of a life for a life. Because men like Daggett must die for every innocent and helpless person they kill. My father could carry that price on his head and pay it, then so can I. As long as there's injustice, as long as the good people of this country are at the mercy of the lawless, they'll have El Diablo to protect them. You have just heard An Adventure of the Scarlet Cloak, starring Wendell Niles. Music by Lynn Murray, story by Joel Murcott. Produced by Vic Hunter and directed by D. Engelbach. Log entry. The schooner Black Parrot. Matthew Kincaid, master. 6 May, 1950. Position, 17 degrees, 5 minutes south, 147 degrees west. Course, 43 degrees. Fresh breeze, sky overcast. Barometer, 310 and falling. Passengers, two. One restricted to quarters. Cargo, explosives in number two hold. Number one, trade goods. of the Black Parrot, with Elliot Lewis starred as Captain Matthew Kincaid, and written by the masters of the sea story, Gil Dowd and Anthony Ellis. The passage of a black schooner, sailing the southern oceans, sailing into adventure with a strange and restless man who is her master, has set down in the log of the Black Parrot. One's batting skipper, and this is the last for number two. Well, I'll be glad to see the cargo aboard. Right. It's coming over dirty, Red, but at this rate, we'll beat the wind. Well, that's all right with me. I don't want to run into anything with that stuff aboard. What's a doctor doing with explosives anyway? He wants to get rid of a reef. Hey, Red. Yeah? Do you have any trouble ashore? Trouble? Me? He's a skipper. Take a look. Gendarmes. Oh, they're coming aboard. I'll be checking the dunnage in number one. Have we done, King Kate? What's the trouble? Will you come ashore, please? Why? Come and request your presence. Why? I cannot say. I only have my orders. I got mine from the harbor master. There's weather moving in. I got to clear for Petey in an hour. I'm sorry, monsieur. You have the papers? Crowder, tell Mr. Gallagher I've gone ashore. Come on, you. We walked away from the waterfront through the warm, dull rain, back into Papiti. And I knew I'd been in the place too long. The feeling of being held, being watched, was there again. And now the police, 
Always the curious police who ask too many questions. Captain Kincaid. Yeah. That's on the door. We'll be sure to come along. What's the matter with you? Captain Kincaid, I'm so sorry to inconvenience you. Please sit down. Oh, thanks. The cigar? Look, I'm in a hurry. What do you want? You are sailing for Iwa Oa. Yeah. Then I have a favor to ask, unofficially. You make out forms and triplicate for a favor? I'm sorry, monsieur. It is most important. I know you are anxious come to on, stay. Come on, come on. I want to get out of here before the wind hits. I wish you to carry a passenger to the Marquesas. We will pay the passage. I guess I can take another 2,000 francs. It is a girl. Forget it. Not on my ship. I will pay you 3,000 francs. She is a daughter of a very good friend of mine in Iwa Oa. He sent her here to school when she was 15, three years ago. Now she must leave. I can't take an 18-year-old girl on my ship. She's in a great deal of trouble. And she'll have to go to prison if she stays here. Why? She learned too much. But I think not in school. Men, among others, a sailor. She shot him. Hmm? She's half caste. Her mother was Marquesa. That happens. Is the sailor dead? Ah, uh, no, no. He will recover, and he will prosecute. You want her to be away before that? Yes. Mm-hmm. What happens if I get caught? Ah, you will not be caught. I shall see to that. All right, have the girl and her gear aboard in 45 minutes. And Three thousand, monsieur le capitaine, three thousand francs. Et merci mille fois. I said two thousand. So long. I didn't see the girl come aboard. I was too busy. He's away on the bow, Spring! Hi! My first passenger, Dr. John Mitchell, stood near me at the wheel. His thinning blonde hair ruffled by the breeze. The eyes in his scarred face following the movements of the crewman. course the clearing weather and the tuamotos, sailing full and by. I turned the wheel over to Gallagher and went below to enter our departure in the lob. Are you busy, Matthew? Oh, nothing important. Come on in, John. Sit down. Thank you. You wouldn't have... Uh... I'm afraid I left the top of my head in the pit. <laughs> You had a good time, huh? Splendidly depraved. But after all, two weeks out of two years. Uh-huh. And now back to Mohotani for another two. Oh, yes. I obtained some excellent books this trip. One particularly, I hope you have a chance to read it on the way up. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. Manager's Man Against Himself. There's good and bad in it. I think you'll like it. Well, bung up and bilge free. <sighs> I saw your other passenger, the female. That's so? Yes. Her father is Robert Bonnet, the government resident of the Marquesas. You haven't seen her yet? Not yet. Gallagher put her in her cabin. She's older than when I saw her last. Very nice. Awfully nice. Hands off, John. She's trouble. Yes, I heard about it. Amazing what happens to these children when civilization gets its cultured talons into them. It's a shame she couldn't have left her Marquesan blood at home. Another one, John? Uh, no, thanks. I think I'll go up on deck and say goodbye to Pepito. Um, I'll bring you the book at dinner. Right. Captain Kincaid. Come in. You 
Comfortable? Comfortable? Yes. Look, I know about your trouble in Papiti. Let's forget about it. We've got nine or ten days ahead of us. Everything will be fine. I don't want to go back to Hiva or... I'm sorry. I want you to stay in your cabin as much as possible. We eat at six in my cabin, okay? Okay. I was angry when I left. Because she was the loveliest thing I'd ever seen. And because she knew I couldn't look at her without staring. I didn't want to stare. So I didn't look at her very much. I relieved Gallagher at the wheel. The feel of a ship in deep water again is a good thing, but it wasn't this time. I knew there were too many explosives aboard. I should have turned the wheel back to Tahiti then. Salt, skipper. Yeah. Excuse me. Of course. Red, you check the generator? Since when did I forget? I was asking, mate. I checked it. You know, Matthew, I don't think Miss Benet remembers me. I used to see her running on the beach when she was a very little child. Oh, I remember you, Doctor. You would be so difficult to forget. I mean, those terrible scars on your face. Have you finished? Yes, thank you. Now get back to your cabin. What's the matter, Skipper? She didn't mean anything, you know that. Forget it, Red. Isn't she good enough for your company? She's good enough for mine. Forget it. Why don't you let her out of that coop, get her up on deck? You know it's hot in there. Drink your coffee, mate. Stay away from her, mister! I'm sorry, John. Doesn't matter. No, no, no. Really. It doesn't. I've lived with this face for a long time. One gets used to surface scars. And those inside? Well, I've got my island, old Tony. I don't have to see people for years on end if I don't want to. And you, Matthew, you've got your ship. That's right. I've often wondered what you're running... I picked up some cognac. Let's have a drink. Love to. I say, I, um, I brought you the book, Man Against Himself. From that first night on, she was fed in her cabin. I didn't want to see her. And I didn't want Gallagher or anybody else to see her. Three days out, we raised the two Omotos and began the dirty business of picking our way through the hundreds of coral reefs and heads, which, with the islands, make up the group. But with those boxes in hold number two, it was like the first time. Left. Five. Five deep. Four. Caught your helm. Steady as she goes. For three years, Gallagher and I had sailed and worked the southern waters. By the mouth. There have been words before. And women, too. But now, except for ship talk, there weren't any words. And that was bad. By the mark! Six! By nightfall, we'd cleared the reefs and were sailing free with the southeast trades on our starboard quarter. I stood the 8 to 12 wheel watch. What are you doing on deck? Sorry. It was hot. I hope you don't mind the way I dressed. It was so hot. I don't mind the way you're dressed. What do you want? I want to go back. Back? Anywhere. I don't want to go to Hiva or... We've been through that. Take me back. 
please. Go on below. Don't you like me? I'm pretty. I've looked at myself in the mirror, I know. Take me back. To the sailor in Papiti? No. I go with you anywhere. Look, you go back to Hivaoa. You belong there. Papiti is no good for you. Anywhere is no good for you. You belong on your island with your own people. I have learned what it is to be French. I know what it is to be a French lady. The way I am now. I'm not good for my people and Hiva Oa. Go below. Take me back. I want to be a French lady. Why don't you look at me? Because you're so beautiful, you make me sick. Get away from me or I'll kill you. Kill me? <laughs> you. Get away from me. It's midnight, Skip. I'll take over. <laughs> Listening to Elliot Lewis as Captain Matthew Kincaid in Gil Dowd and Anthony Ellis's exciting story of the sea, The Log of the Black Parrot. I turned the wheel over to Red, gave him the course, and he repeated it. But he was looking something else. I went below. The girl was in her cabin, and I locked her there. Went into my own quarters, tried to sleep. And the next night, tried to sleep. And the next. And the morning came. We were one day off the Marquesas. And our cabin door was open. Pat! Wait a moment. I'm in a hurry. Well, what, Matthew? Get out of my way. You're too late. She's been out since the down. Leave her alone, It's Matthew. not her, it's Gallagher. The ship, what's happening to it? Get out of my way before I finish off what's left of your face. Oh. Get out of my way, will you? Where's the mate, Crowder? Uh, he's up for it, I think. You think, Crowder? Uh, he's up for it, sir. What's that bucket doing on the deck? I don't know. It's your business to know. Stow it where it belongs. Are you kidding? I'm not a deckhand. Stow it away. You! Get below to your cabin. All right. Wait a minute. We're going back to Pepitis. I got a cargo for Hivo, and Mr. I'm taking it there. All right. But she stays on the ship. I'll pay her passage back. She gets off with the cargo. She's with me now. I told you to stay away from her. You told me. You. I've wanted to do this for a long time. You had your chance, mister. Feel better now, Matthew? Shut up! Bring him around. He takes the wheel in a half an hour. Yeah. What do you want, John? Gallagher won't be able to stand his wife. Oh, he'll be all right. 
But he'll have to stay in his cabin until tomorrow. Okay. Sure, I'll take it. Help yourself. Sit down, Matthew. I want to have a look at you. Yeah. Hmm. A little more work on your face, and you'd have looked like me. I'm sorry about that. Turn your head this way. Yeah. This is going to hurt. Yeah, that'll be different. Uh, no, John, I wish I was a kid right now. No? Why? Yeah. So I could bore my ears off. I must be a little drunk. Perhaps we should all be drunk. All the time. Is she... Is she in her cabin? Yes. Should I have taken her back to Papiti? What's the matter with her? I don't think it's me and I don't think it's Red. What does she want? I don't know. If I knew why she so desperately doesn't want to go home, I could tell you, but I don't know. <sighs> i got to take the wheel. Now, just a moment. Huh? It's only plaster, but it may hold your ear on. <laughs> Thanks, John. There was a difference in the ship Almost a relief The crew was easier I could feel a lightness again in the deck under my feet A strength in the pulling canvas Perhaps it was the fight Whatever it was There was a difference in the ship The girl came out on deck later, in the afternoon. I looked at her because I couldn't. I saw for the first time her hair. Her black, black hair. And how tiny she was. The blackness of her eyes. The gracefulness in her hands. The delicacy of her feet. Her eyes were on me, but I knew she didn't see me as she passed. I moved forward toward the waist of the ship. The crewmen no more than glanced at her and then turned back to their work. She went to the rail. No! Crowder, stop her! Go ahead and take the wheel! Give me that. Quit it now. Quit it. Take it easy. All right, I got her. She, she went for my deck noise. Come on. I want the doctor to take care of that cut. Don't take me back. Please don't make me go home. Come on. <laughs> John John What's the matter? Here, put her over here Tried to go overboard Crowder stopped her But she got mixed up with his knife Move over, let me see yeah. Hmm, that's not too bad I just hold still That's right uh, just a uh, minute. Uh, there we are. Huh. Ah. That didn't hurt very much, did it? No. Ah, let me see that. May I? That hurt? No. That? No. Matthew. Yeah. You knew about this, didn't you? No. You won't make me go to Hiva over. How long has it been? Half a year, I think. I made even Papi to told me. It'll be all right. <laughs> now, don't worry. I'm going to give you something to make you sleep for a while. I guess there isn't much choice, is it? There may be another way. What do you mean? She could live on Mohotane. There's nobody else on the island. Except you. That's right. Oh, I'd, I'd marry her if she wanted to. If not, I'd build her a place. That's not what I mean, John. Oh, it's not that bad. There's always a chance. You know what you're saying? My dear chap, of course I do. As a matter of fact, I'm being rather selfish about the whole thing. She's quite beautiful. You've noticed it. Uh, so is Mr. Gallagher. I can't let you do it, John. Then you know what's left. 
Look here, I'm not very prepossessing to look at. I know that. But in a few years, she may not be either. It would be a great comfort to one another. Stop it, will you? You're a strange chap. I think you almost worship beauty. You don't like the idea of her becoming undutiful, do you? Do you? Surface scars, Matthew. Surface scars. Well, does she stay with me and Mahutani? I don't know. I'll have to think. The next morning, we anchored off the emerald-shaped island of Mohotani. Hiva'oa, our final destination, was a cloud-rimmed hump on the northwest horizon. The longboat was put over the side, and loading of John Mitchell's gear and explosives got underway. I looked at the little island, thought of the girl. Mitchell could go aboard now, Captain. All right, mate. John... You're ready to go ashore. Here. I'll give you a hand with that. Thanks. Uh, you made up your mind, Matthew? Yes. Parrish! Steady the ladder. He's coming down. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, man. Uh, drop in when you pass this way again. I'll see you. Gallagher. Yeah? Hold the boat for a few minutes. I'm going below. Right. Mohotani. I know. Dr. Mitchell is ready to go ashore. You want to go with him? With him? Yesterday we talked about you. He wants to take care of you on his island. He'll marry you if you like. Or build your house. You'll be close to your people on Hivaoa. He wants this? He wants it. Otherwise it would mean the island for you. I can't take you back to Papiti or anywhere else. He's a very kind man, isn't he? Yeah. You would tell my father? Yes, about this. Not about Papiti. Oh. There's a priest on here, Oa. You will send him here. Sure. watched the flash of oar blades in the sun as the longboat pulled shoreward. And I thought of Gallagher. I found him on the port side, looking out at the open sea. She's better off with him, Gallagher. She would have been better off with me. Maybe she would if you had an island, lived alone, didn't care. Didn't care? Are you crazy? She has leprosy, Red. That's why she didn't want to go home. Did I do the right thing, Red? It would have meant a leper colony, but he wanted to take care of her and I let him. Did I do the right thing, Red? You did the right thing, Skipper. I... I'm not sure, Red. Forget it. Forget it. We'll have a good breeze, Skipper. Yeah. Yeah, she holds. Come on, let's not waste time. Break out the crew, Red. We'll get the hook off the bottom. And stand by for the longboat under power. Right, Skipper. Let's get it! boat came aboard, and we moved out from the lee of the island, and heeled over, close hauled on a starboard tack, under the southeast wind. The bow dipped and rose again in the swell, throwing spray high in the rigging. And then open water, the horizon, and a new course to Port Moresby, island of New Guinea. A 
log entry. The schooner Black Parrot. 5.30 p.m. Wind fresh. Sky fair. Sea cresting with high cross swell. Main and fossil reefed. Ship secure for night. Signed, Matthew Kincaid. Master. Invited to sail into further adventure with a log of the Black Parrot next week at the same time. Ed Max is heard as Red Gallagher, and featured in the cast were Ted Osborne, Lillian Bioff, Harold Hughes, Jack Crucian, and Ben Wright. Music was conducted by Walter Schumann and composed by Nathan Scott. The Black Parrot was produced by Elliot Lewis and directed by Gil Dowd. Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Crucian and Ben Wright. Music was conducted by Walter Schumann and composed by Nathan Scott. The Black Parrot was produced by Elliot Lewis and directed by Gil Dowd. Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Frank Theron presents Fantasy. of creation he crawled to force a wavering path through fetid jungle until his footsteps echoed through his own self-made canyons whereupon he dared to face eternity and call himself man. Look within yourself, O mind of man. Of what worth are your fleeting impressions? What philosophy dares decide between the real and the unreal, the true and the false, without thought to the strange happenings in the universe? A caution to your puny wisdom, O mind of man. Do you dare to say that this is truth and that is fantasy? Quite obviously, it's time for the sponsor's opening commercial message. So, in the absence of said sponsor, we will use this space to tell you about fantasy. Our message is short. As you consider this program, bear two points in mind. One, fantasy has the same high listener appeal as that enjoyed by the current cycle of murder mysteries without the objectionable qualities of the murder mystery. Two, fantasy offers a source of radio material virtually untapped since Orson Welles skyrocketed to fame with his men from Mars. But don't misunderstand. Fantasy is not a series dependent on the space void. For fantasy can happen in your own backyard. And now, as you listen to our story, we ask that you decide for yourself. Is it truth or is it fantasy? Listen to Entity from the Void. Father, you old sweet. Did you come to have a glass of punch with me? I did indeed. Why aren't you dancing, dear? I did earlier. Oh, I'd love to dance, but Fred... Oh, he's drunk again. He's been very drunk oh, for two hours. Look, darling, again, I ask. Why don't you divorce Fred? 
After all, there can't be much left. There's nothing left. But marriage meant so much to me, Father. It was a new life, a useful life. Children, a home to me. Oh, my child, you can marry again. Perhaps. But you see, Father, there's no one else. <laughs> Think I'll hang on to my frayed threads a while. Very well, my dear. Well, I'll run along. I'm playing cards with Carl. Bye, darling. <laughs> Be careful, Plunger. Nada. Hello. Oh. You love to dance. Will you dance with me? <laughs> I don't think we've met. Does that matter so much? We might still enjoy dancing together. Yes, we might. Very well. Do you hear a strange sound? I hear intriguing music. Shall we go to the dance floor? Why hasn't someone introduced us earlier? I was not here. Oh, then you came late. No. I was near you. I've been near you often. You have? <laughs> I don't understand. I swam in the surf with you yesterday. Yesterday? <laughs> now I know you're having fun with me. I swam alone. Yes, out to the old breakwater. I was there when you tore your swimming clothes on the rusty nail. You saw that? How terrible of you. I was mortified even though I was alone. But you couldn't have been there. I would have seen you. It's no fault of yours. I did not let you see me. Who are you? What is your name? It is a name of any importance. Isn't it pleasant just to be together, dancing, <laughs> talking? How strangely persuasive you are. Yes, I admit it. I find it pleasant. Now I am happy. Now I feel that I can say more to you. Let's step out on the terrace. Now I want you to tell me... Who... Where did he go? How strange. Seems almost as though he... He disappeared. Oh, well, here you are, darling. Oh, Fred. Oh, Fred. Yes, dear. Your husband. Is there anything wrong with that? Please, Fred. Please, Fred. Please, Fred. I've been looking all over for you. I want to dance. Everybody dancing. I want to dance, too. Fred, please. Fred, you're hurting my arm. Oh, now, don't start crying again. I want to talk to you. I'll talk to you when you're sober. I'm going to walk on the beach. You were too busy with your tears, dear. I saw you come out here to the beach, so I followed. Tell me about it. Oh, nothing, Father, really. Fred, he, he just tried to kiss me. And after all, he is my husband. My dear, I know that your loyalty is badly misplaced. You're chained to a besotted fool, and I'll not stand by any longer. But there must be something we can do for him. Perhaps a good punch in the jaw, which I would like to administer personally. Now you're giving away to your feelings, Father. If we could get him away from liquor Wait. for a while. My southern queen is sailing for Rio in three days, carrying steel plates for me. The ship has accommodation for two dozen passengers. It's quite comfortable. Carries a doctor and an excellent chef. But no bar. Oh, Father, you darling, I... I'd like to try it. If I could keep Fred sober for two weeks, it, it might just be enough to bring him back to reason. Well, I'll, I'll arrange it in the morning. Now, how about drying your eyes and coming back to the party? In a moment. Father. Father, did you see the man I danced with just after you left me? Uh, why, no, dear. I went to play bridge. Oh, I'm sorry. I wanted at least to know his name. Well, what did he look like? Describe him. I can probably name him. Well, well, he was tall, with wonderful shoulders and, and crisp brown hair with, with just a little bit of a wave in it. And the bluest eyes I've ever seen. And, and, and there was a cleft in his chin. And... Oh, darling, how many fillings in his teeth. <laughs> you certainly looked this young man over. Oh, Father, I didn't really. I, I don't recognize this paragon. I'm sorry, dear. Well, it 
doesn't really matter. But at least I... I would have liked to know his name. He was strange. Strange. I had an odd feeling of... of godliness. After three days, this cruise begins to look a little better. Martini? Fred, where did you get the liquor? I had it in my steamer trunk. Excellent martinis. You sure you care for one, darling? Really, no. Martinis are a boon to mankind. I should like to soliloquize or write a poem to them. Unfortunately, I can never think of words that rhyme. However, if I do not have the pen, I do have the soul of a poet. Don't you think I have the soul of a poet, Nada? Really, now? Please, Fred. I'd rather you didn't put your arm around me now. My dear child, may I point out that drunk or sober, I'm still your husband. And you're doing an excellent job of bringing that to an end. Really? My little chickadee planning to fly a nest? I don't think I would. And why not? Because I'll simply take it upon myself to make your life as miserable as a life could be from then on. How hateful you can be. <laughs> Darling, you've no idea. You're quite sure you don't want a martini? No? Well, then I'll drink it myself. Nectar of the gods. Solace of the lonely. Companion of the dilettante. Fred. Fred, I'm going to take a walk on deck. Don't you want to come with me? Of course I don't want to come with you. In the first place, it's blowing some weather. And in the second place, all I want of this miserable tub is a view of Rio Harbor as soon as possible. Then I shall take a plane home. I'm sorry we came. I had hope that... Oh, well, I'm sure the whole cruise was an idea of that stupid parent of yours. Please, we'll have nothing to say about my father. And why not? He's a dull businessman. And I suspect an interfering busybody. I notice you don't hesitate to spend his money. <laughs> why should I? He has plenty of it. You don't think the only attractive thing about you was your beauty, do you, darling? Fred, Fred, stop it. Stop it at once. Please try to retain some of the manners of a gentleman. Gentleman? Why, I'm the perfect gentleman. All the society columns say that. Now, you'll notice the cut of my suit. Because <laughs> it's bought with your father's money, the ass. That's enough. Leaving so soon, my dear? I'm... I'm going on deck. Oh, it's very foolish of you. You might be blown over the rail and get very drowned. That might be just what I want, Fred. Fred, please, Fred. <laughs> Slap me, will you? I'll show you. I'll take you down a peg or two. Please, do not be afraid. Only trust me. Who are you? Where did you come from? What manner of strange creature are you to, to come out of the sky? Nada, look at me. Look into my eyes. There you will see that you have nothing to fear. You, you were frightening. But, but now I... Yes. Now you are happy, as you were when we danced. That is, as it should be. Nada. Tell me. I understand, but believe me, I mean for you only the greatest of good. I am not of your world, Nada. I am an entity out of the void.
And now, let us return to Entity from the Void. What is fantasy? A lonely girl, a fog-bound ship in mid-ocean, and the mind-shattering appearance of a godlike creature. Is this fantasy? Or the strange, strange story which he had for lovely Nada? Was this perhaps truth? And my world was called Kor. There? And from a world called Kor? This is so hard to understand. Patience, my dear, and you will understand. Kor was a planet in the fifth galaxy beyond this. My world has been destroyed for a thousand years. Yet the light from it still shines upon your Earth, for the distance is so great that two thousand light years are required to bring its glow this far. This... These things you tell me, they're, they're staggering. My, my mind, it's, it's in a whirl. But you believe me? Yes. Oddly, I do believe you. My people, though much like the people of your earth, far surpassed you in intellect. And yet, our science, our culture, our developments of all kinds were of no use when the end came. The end of a tired, worn-out planet. I alone survived, for I alone was given the power. This is frightening, and it's unbelievable. Nada, it is frightening and unbelievable only because your mind is bound by the conventions of an unbelieving world. Let me show you my story. Please do. Tell me your story. Show you my story, Nada. Hold my hands. So. Now clear your mind of all thought. Clear it. I will help you. I cannot. One's mind continues to function. The thought processes go on. Clear your mind. Refuse your mind the privilege of thinking. I help you now. Think only as I tell you. See now a great hall. A hall of science. A hall wherein are gathered the greatest minds in the whole universe. See them, handsome men, some young, some grey-bearded, thinking, thinking, wishing. Oh, there's Scar now. Look at Scar. He'll know. Men of Core! Yes, sure. I beg your indulgence for having kept you waiting. <coughs> Will someone report any further progress? Raga, you are in charge of ministry. I have little to report, Gar. Ah, yes. A pitiful shell, this planet of ours. No longer capable of producing even the simplest needs of science. We have gone a step further in the disintegration and reassembly of matter. It would be simple to transport every person on core to another planet in a matter of seconds. But first, we must have a station and a power plant on the newly selected world. And that is impossible? Quite impossible, Gar. Then my solution is the only one, though it presages death to Kor and the people of Kor. My friends, it is inevitable that we die, for I tell you this, that already has the breakup of our planetary mass begun. Within twelve nods... Our world will have disintegrated, and all upon it will be dead. Oh, no, it's Wait! That's so Wait. We must not let die what we have accomplished. We must preserve our sciences, our arts, our cultural advantages. I, I can send one man to another world. I am ready to teach one man the secret of the free entity. Why only one man? To one man... Can I give the ability to free himself from his mortal body 
And as a free will, a free entity, he can roam the universe with a thought and settle where he will. Men of Kor, if we are to send abroad our science, then I say that Gar himself is the one to go. Yes, yes, yes. Hold! Hold! The severance of the free will from the body will bring about shock of tremendous proportions. We need a young, strong man whose intellect is as well developed as his body. I call upon the young man. Sir. I am here, Gar. Then step forward. Sir. There is grave danger for you in this transmigration. You have the courage? I am ready. Then join hands with me and clear your mind of all thoughts. I will give you the power by impression the more quickly to accomplish the freeing of your entity. When your mind is cleared, tell me. Begin. I do not believe so. Wait. Thur! Thur! I am safe, God. Describe for us your surroundings, your emotions. Where are you? I am in this room. Yet I am gone from our world. I am in the void. I have the feeling of being everywhere. I move a billion miles with a thought. I have no emotion, only a feeling of tremendous power. It is a success. The transmigration of the will from the prison of a body to free entity. What is that sound? It is the crashing of disintegration. Our world is breaking up. I hear you, God. Go, go quickly. Lest in the coming cataclysm you will be drawn from your free entity to the husk of your body and consumed with us. Quickly! You have your mission. Go! I go, God. Courage, men of call. And thus it has been, my Nada. For a thousand years, I have searched for a world to give the science and culture of Kor. Fantastic and wonderful story. And I have no doubt now, third of your wonderful powers. Then you will give these great powers, these sciences and this culture of Kor to our world, to the Earth? No, my Nada. No? I said I searched for a world. I examined the planet you call Venus and which we call Mech. The great monsters which people displace, the horrid things still crawling in the steaming slime. They have millions of years ahead of them before they'll reach even a remote stage of intelligence. And the hairy creatures who scuttle about on six ugly legs and the great ball you have named Jupiter are intelligent enough, but the arts and sciences of Kor are best suited to a race of our physical proportions. But then... This world of mine, why do you not give these things to us? No, my Nada. On this earth, I have found only greed and selfishness and destruction. Man is pitted against man in hatred and lust. Were my powers given to him, man on this earth would destroy himself and his world. I understand. Then you must go on searching... No. No, in finding you, my search is completed. I have a plan. Far out in space, beyond this galaxy, I have come upon a perfect world. It is verdant and beautiful. You would call it paradise. No harmful being exists upon it. From the tiniest creature to the largest, 
Each one is gentle and kindly. My new world wants only man. You have more to say, sir. In your Christian belief, one man and one woman gave life to this earth. Yes, that is our common belief. Then why cannot one man and one woman give life to my new world? My Nada, only you have measured up to the standards I have set. In your nobility of thought, your gentleness, your loyalty, your goodness, and your beauty. Come with me. How amazing and beautiful. A new race. A new beginning for mankind. Oh, uh, how glorious. My Nada, with all the great powers at my command, I find that none is great enough to conquer the gentlest of all emotions. I find myself completely and utterly in love with you. I know. And... And I love you, sir. My darling... Oh, sir, please. My Nada, what is wrong? Sir, I am already given to a man. I cannot even think of... The weakling that dissipate? Well, you hate him, I know this. Forget him. I cannot. Since childhood, marriage has been sacred to me. I cannot break a vow. In sickness and in death. For better or worse. No, sir. Without you, my power is worthless to me. Sir, sir, if you love me, perhaps you could find among your great powers a way to strengthen my husband against his weaknesses. And of course, I could do so with a thought. Then, then will you, for me, my dear one, there can be nothing else. Very well, my Nada. Let me bring him to mine. A moment. So. Now that your husband is no longer a problem. Come, let us go to your cabin. Oh, he... He's sleeping. Let me wake him. Fred. Fred. Your husband is not sleeping, my Nada. He is dead. Dead? Fred? Oh, no, no. I am sorry, my dear. But, but why did he die? I have no answer to that. It is strange. I feel little emotion. I feel no sorrow. Only pity. Pity for the pathetic wastrel whose unhappy life I shared... feel some emotion. There, there it is hateful of me, but I cannot conquer it. I feel a sense of, of elation. Perhaps my nada at the thought that there is no longer a barrier between us. I think. Yes, my darling. There is no longer a barrier between us. You will go with me. I will go with you to the end of the universe. There is grave danger, nada, for you. First, we must bring about the freedom of your entity. We must unshackle your will from your body. In that, there is danger. I am ready. Join hands with me. So, now, clear your mind of all thought. I will help you. Look into my mind. Try. Try hard. I will try. Soon your mind will clear of all thought. Only the thought to tell me when to begin the transmigration. My sir, begin. It's 
God, what a terrible thing. That girl's father is the owner of this ship. She, she and her husband here are socially prominent. Doctor, what killed them? Captain, this man died of acute alcoholism. I saw him at dinner in the salon. And already the signs were there. But Mrs. Westgate and this stranger, whoever he is, what killed them? You're the ship's doctor. You must find out. I have no idea. There are no marks of violence. And see their faces. Captain, they are, they are supremely happy in death. <sighs> One of these love pacts. This will be a terrible scandal. Somehow I don't believe it was a suicide pact. Captain, they have been dead less than half an hour. We know that. And yet these two bodies are cold. Strangely cold. Why, it is comparable only to... to what is called absolute cold. The cold of the space void. Life's enigma. Whether he lives in town or farm, in cottage or penthouse, or locked in the narrow confines of a bottle. Or locked in the narrow confines. In the narrow confines of a bottle? Yes, it's hard to believe that anyone could live in a bottle. Our fantasy next week will be The Bottle Party, adapted for radio from a story by John Collier. Fantasy is produced in Hollywood by Frank Farron. Tonight's fantasy was written and directed by Hobart Donovan. Special music for fantasy was written and arranged by John Duffy and Ken Cameron. The theremin was played by Dr. S.J. Hoffman. This is Ken Nile speaking. <laughs> is an audition transcription. And now, The Hunters, starring tonight, Mr. Victor Jolly. Yes, I'm a hunter, and I'm hunting the most dangerous and tricky game in the world, man. <laughs> Since the dawn of time, human beings have loved the chase, the hunt. Every Sunday night at this time, the Columbia Broadcasting System brings you the greatest chase stories of all time. Stories of the hunter and the hunted, from the annals of history, from the world of adventure fiction, from yesterday's headlines. Tonight's story is Cornell Woolrich's exciting tale of suspicion and murder, You Take Ballistics. And tonight's hunter is the star of stage and screen, Victor Jory. I am a hunter, in a manner of speaking. My name is Harvey, Inspector Harvey of Scotland Yard. The hunted man acts very much like the hunted beast. In the case of Clarence Coleman, for example, the hunt was in the stalking phase. This was no chase, yet. I knew where the murderer was hiding, and I was waiting for him to run. Only he wasn't exactly hiding, nor did he seem to be inclined to run. And the waiting had begun to become tedious. By this time it was night, rather late. I walked down towards the buildings on the opposite side of the street like I had a dozen times before that day. This time, I had to count the doorways. I knew that Sergeant Cass was on watch in the tenth one down from the corner. I knew he was there, but I also knew I'd never see him. It was too dark, and Cass knew his job too well. Has he made any moves yet? Hmm? Oh, it's you, sir. No, sir. Not to move. How about the rear? No, sir. Peters is covering that. He'd warn us. Anyway, I'm sure he's still up there. Every now and then you can see his shadow against the blind. There. Uh -huh. See? Uh-huh. What shall we do, Inspector? It's my guess he's not going to run for it. I think he's set for the night. Shall we, uh, stay here like this? No. This isn't getting us anywhere. 
We'd better take him in now. Come on up with me and we'll see what we've got. Yes, sir. Oh, it's good to stretch. <clears throat> my knees were beginning to give way, sir. <laughs> yes, I know. I had my share of stakeouts myself. Eh, fortunately, it's warm tonight. That's a help. Yes, that's always a help. You know what I think, Inspector? No, what? I think that chap's waiting for something. Or for someone. Like who? Us. Mm. He's a brainy chap, eh? Clever. Very clever. I don't like it. Yes, sir, gentlemen. Coleman. Clarence Coleman. Take us up, please. Yes, sir. <sighs> this has been a long day. Mm, I need to shave. Mm, it's not very noticeable, sir. How long has he been living here? Who? Coleman. Oh, him. About two years, I'd say. Uh-huh. Second door to your left. Thank you. We know the way. Uh, what a hole. Inspector, shall I... Uh... What? Oh, no, no, no. I, I don't believe he'll give us any trouble. He's too sharp for that. Are you Clarence Coleman? That's right. We're from Scotland Yard. You don't say... You want to come in, or do you just want to talk to me out here? We want to talk to you at the yard. First, we want to come in. Come right here. Nobody's stopping you. Look around, Cass. Yes, sir. I suppose you've got a search warrant. <laughs> I suppose you've got a witness to say that we don't. <laughs> Go ahead, look. I just want you to know I'm not so dumb, that's all. Oh, we're not underestimating you. You're clever enough. I was doing a crossword puzzle. You don't mind, do you? Go ahead. I wanted to get that one down before I forget. You find it, Cass? No, sir. You own a gun? Me? Why, yes. Where is it? Tell him to look in the bottom drawer of the chest in there under my winter underwear. You hear that, Cass? Yes, sir. I've got a permit for it, too. You fired it recently? That's right, I fired it recently. Uh, here it is, Inspector. Careful you don't rub off any fingerprints. I told you he was clever. Maybe too clever. Thirty-eight. That one shell gone. Only last night. Why should I lie to you? You're going to give me the nitrate test anyway as soon as you get me to the yard? Only last night. Right into Edmund Lombard's body. Wrong. Right into the floor here. Oh, you've got all the answers, haven't you? I only know what I know. Can't do better than that for my own brother. If you fire the gun into the floor, where's the hole? You see that little scout rug? Just kick it aside. Mm. See it? I can do better than a hole. If you dig in with your pen knife, you can probably get the slug. <laughs> Now, what are you doing that for, Cass? <laughs> Our friend here's pulling your leg. Maybe. <laughs> but we'd better have this slug just the same. Inspector. All right. You, Coleman. Yes? Take your hands out of your pockets and get your favorite hat and start moving towards the door. You're coming with us. I'm up, Inspector. I'm up. You get it, Cass? Yes, sir. 38, all right. Already? Am I under arrest? If you must have a name for it, no, not yet. You're just a guest of Scotland Yard for the rest of the night. <laughs> I hope the bed's comfortable. Take him downstairs, Cass. I want to talk to our lift friend for a bit. Right, Speaker. Come along, you. Step right in, sir. Uh, thank you. Tell me, uh, did a gun go off anywhere in this building last night? A gun? Mm -hmm. Now, let me see. Gas. I believe his did. Who's? Coleman's? Mr. Coleman. The people downstairs complained, so I went up. He fired it into the floor by mistake, he said. He was quite alarmed. Is anything the matter, sir? Oh, I would say so. Just a little thing called murder. Yes. Murder, the motive for the manhunt. The hunted man whom you've just met is not only inspired by the instinct for self-preservation, but also by an evil desire to outwit the law. And these two forces bring out in him not only every while of the desperate, primitive beast, but also every trick of the fertile human brain. The hunter, then, has his work cut out for him. We continue the chase now as Victor Jory, in the role of Inspector Harvey of Scotland Yard, the hunter... Matches wits with Clarence Coleman, the hunted, in this first of the new CBS series, The Hunters. I've been a member of Scotland Yard for some years now, 
often I brought in my share of criminals, big and small. Yet I never made an arrest that looked better and that I liked less than this slippery chap Coleman. I had everything. I had to make the arrest. And yet I knew it was going to turn sour the moment I walked into his flat. And a sour murder charge is something an old hand like me doesn't care for. We didn't take him down to the yard. Instead, we took him to a police station in the West End. And we didn't charge him. We simply left him in the black back room to... Mm, to stew a bit. Chief Inspector Lettinger, my superior, arrived there about ten minutes later. You brought him in, Harvey? Yes, sir. He's in back. Here's his gun. Claims it went off on the floor last night by mistake. And he beat us to the paraffin task, huh? Well, he could have arranged it that way after he killed Lombard. He could have. Here's a slug, sir. Oh, 38. Suppose you turn those over to ballistics. Yes, sir. Any report on the one they dug out of Lombard's body? Probably on its way now. Who are those two chances? The night lift operator who took him up to Lombard's apartment and the night attendant at a small sandwich shop half a block away. They recognize him? Positive. Well, let's go to work. Sergeant. Yes, sir. We'll want to surprise him with these witnesses. So one buzz, send in the lift man. Two buzzes, the other chap. Yes, sir. Mm, you think he'll break, sir? Do you? No. All right, Coleman. Sit over there. Right, sir. Perhaps we better put some light on him, O'Farrell. Yes, sir. All right, Coleman. Suppose you tell us what you did last night. Uh, beginning when? When you left your flat. Well, I went out about nine o'clock and I walked over to the Edgware Road. There's a tobacconist there. I made a phone call. To whom? To Edmund Lombard. So you did contact Lombard? Why, certainly. Did I say different? Go ahead. Well... Do you know what business Lombard was in? Suppose you tell us. I don't mind. He collected bets on the horses. Only the long shots he wouldn't turn in. They never come in anyway, so uh, who knows the difference? Only this one time I received a tip on a filly that did come in. At 20 to 1. Lombard couldn't pay off and he disappeared. I just caught up with him last night. On the phone I told him I want my money and I told him to meet me in an hour. Did he meet you? I didn't give him a chance. I went up to his place. You went up to his place? That's right. There's no use for me to lie. I know you got witnesses to place me up there. So you did go up to his place? Yeah. He was already packing. He was getting ready to run away again. He kind of laughed and said, uh, you can't blame a chap for trying. And I said, I want my money. Okay, he says, you win. And he asked me for a receipt, so I can't come at him again. Fair enough, so I write one out for him on the hotel station. Go on. And let's hear how good you can make it. Well, that's all. He started to unpack, thinking he might just as well stay where he was now. And I left. So that's how it worked. But are you sure you didn't leave out anything? No. I... Why did you leave out the fact that you killed him? Because it belonged out, because I didn't. You didn't have a gun with you when you went up there? You can bet your last shilling I did. Why'd you take a gun if you didn't plan to shoot him? So he wouldn't pull one on me. You think a chap like Eddie Lombard is going to cough up 500 quid just like that? Unless he has to? Don't you lie to us now. When we bring you in here, we want the truth. You shot him first and collected your money afterwards. No. And then you wrote out your receipt to a dead man. No. That's how it happened, isn't it? No. Answer me. Isn't it? Cass. Uh. Yes, sir? Never mind those other witnesses. We won't need them. Come in here and give us a hand. Yes, sir. All right, now bring him out. He seems to have a rather delicate constitution. <laughs> Come on, come on, you. Get up there. Yeah, now, that's better. Now, why did you tell the night man that Lombard was staying and not to bother about his luggage? Because I was afraid he'd go up there. Lombard might think it was me again and take a shot at him. Because he was dead in there, and you wanted to get clear of the building before he was found. If I did, I didn't go very far. I stayed in the sandwich shop down the street for 15 or 20 minutes afterwards. Why'd you take the money? Why'd you take it from him after you killed him? The money he gave me? I put it in the bank first thing this morning. Oh, take over, Cass. Come on, Hobby. Well, if I'd stayed in there much longer, I'd have been tempted to hurt him. Now, see what I mean? Yes, I do. But how is it that no one heard the shots? People next door were out. Down below, they were asleep. I don't like it. You notice how he beats us to the punch every time... We have witnesses for everything except the killing. Which seems to indicate that we have nothing but circumstantial evidence. It wouldn't stand up in court five minutes. Well, maybe the ballistics people will tie it up for us. Uh, 
Maybe. What's the matter, Harvey? Don't you believe in ballistics? I do. But you heard the chap. He's got every other angle covered. He wouldn't be likely to slip up on anything as obvious as ballistics. Don't you think he's guilty? I don't think. I know he's guilty of sin. I went back to Coleman's flat. I dislike this part of any job, but it's elementary when you're following a trail and there's always a slight chance that it may turn up something. So it has to be done. It's one of the processes of the manhunt. Nothing came of it. Just a lot of junk. In the living room, items... The crossword puzzle he'd been working on and the pencil stub and the stub of the cigarette he'd been smoking and the package it came out of. The bathroom. Items. The usual assortment in the medicine cabinet and 15 rusty razor blades under the bathtub. The kitchen. Items. Two empty whiskey bottles. The bedroom. Items. A chest full of linen and three suits in the wardrobe. One of them was the great plaid he'd been wearing the night he called on Lombard. There was nothing in the pockets but a Canadian penny, a faded snapshot of a faded blonde, and a book of cigarette papers. These latter items from his pockets I put in the regulation brown envelope, for no very good reason, and went back to the station. Chief Inspector Lettinger was still there and close to the end of his patience. Get anything? If I did, I don't know it. How's he doing? Much better than we are, I'd say. Only so far, though. You're still sure of him, Harvey? I was never so sure of an arrest in my life. I see. Well, I decided to let it go through on circumstantial evidence. Ballistics will be certain to match his gun to the bullet that killed Lombard, and that should be enough to do it without anything else. I don't know. I say, what are you driving at? Yes. Yes, this is Levinger. And it's about time. I've been waiting for this report. Yes. What? All right. Ballistics. Coleman's gun was a thirty-eight. I know that. You know that. Well, then maybe you know that the bullet that they took out of Lombard was a thirty-two. So now what do you know? That does it. Indeed, and what does it do? It proves he's our man. I'm convinced of it. Oh, that's fine. Except that the court isn't likely to convict on your word alone. And especially when ballistics disagrees with you. I'm not telling you different, but ballistics is... It's a case of theory against fact, and ballistics don't lie. Are you setting yourself up above ballistics? You take ballistics, I'll take human nature. That doesn't lie either. You mean he did it with a thirty-two and then threw it away? You're wrong. I know he didn't. Otherwise, he wouldn't have shot that slug into the floor. But the slug in the floor was a thirty-eight. Chief, I've had occasion to call on important members of Parliament, even lords of the realm. And they, even they, got a little pale and discomforted when I said Scotland Yard. But not this chap. He was waiting for us. He was calm. He was doing crossword puzzles. He was too calm. He's too clever. He's got everything covered. He's been ahead of us all the way. Now, he's our man, I tell you. He's our man. Well, if he's our man, you haven't proved it. And I must warn you, it'll take more than words to convict him. I know that. Then do something about it. How long will I have? Tomorrow morning. But I can't wait. We can't hold him forever without charging him. Tomorrow morning? What can I do at this time of night, Chief? Give me a fair chance and make it noon. All right, noon. I'm stretching it for you. Thanks. Father, you're not concealing anything from me now, are you? I wish I were. I don't know a thing more than you do, Chief. I'm just convinced we're right, that's all. Uh Uh-huh. I think I'll take another look at him before I go. Look here, Coleman. We know you did it. Why don't you make it easy for yourself? Yeah, make it easy for you? You mean I know you anything for a pinch? What do you care if you got the wrong chap? All right. Skip it, Cass. You can leave him alone now. Have you got something new, Inspector? Possibly. The bullet that killed Lombard was a thirty-two. What? Yes, Coleman's gun here is a thirty-eight. <laughs> what? But take him to his cell and let him try our beds. We'll probably have to turn him loose in the morning. Morning? What's the matter with tonight? What's the matter? Don't you like it here? All right, dear chappy. But you'll have a sweet case of false arrest on your end by morning. Now, you remember that, Inspector, when you're a sergeant again. Oh, I won't forget you, Coleman. You're too smart. A uh, cigarette? I got my own. Oh, go ahead. Have one. I wouldn't take a smoke from a copper if it was the last one before I die. You may have a chance to prove that one day. Will I now? You will. When you go to the gallows. <laughs> That sounded good. 
but I wasn't too certain. They say every criminal makes at least one mistake, but well, I couldn't be too certain of that either. All I was certain of was that he'd done it and that I had to keep hunting for a way to prove it. First, I went back up to his apartment again. I went over the place with a fine-tooth comb. Nothing new. Then, I thought of that suit in the wardrobe, and I got it out and went over it inch by inch. I turned the pockets inside out. And right there was where I found something that gave me an idea. Or maybe, maybe it was what I didn't find that I should have. I went out to Coleman's kitchen and made a pot of tea and sat down to think. And the more I thought, the better I liked it. It might not mean a thing. It might not even be possible. But it was all I had. The next step was the yard, headquarters, and the pistol range in the basement. By the time I got there, it was daylight. At a quarter to seven, I was waiting outside that tobacconist shop on Edgware Road where Coleman had made his phone call to Lombard. It was run by a small chap named Truhawk. We'd questioned him before. However, this was different. The shop wasn't opened yet, but finally, after what seemed at least an hour and a half, I saw Truhawk come puffing down the street. Inspector, Jim's a real early bird, eh? <laughs> You're late. <laughs> late? <laughs> what time do you want to shop to open? The middle of the night? <laughs> Uh, let's go inside. I want to ask you a few questions, eh? Oh, more questions. Didn't you already ask me everything but my grandmother's middle name? Well, that's the point. I forgot that. <laughs> yeah, that's why I came back. Uh, so now what? Well, about this Coleman. When he was here that night... Yes, yes, it... He telephones from the box back there, but how can I hear what he says from way up here? Well, I don't care about that now. He used to buy a cigarette from you, though. You said that... That's right. Every day, almost. Any particular brand? I certainly always the same for two years. These, um... Yes. These here. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Always machined made cigarettes, huh? Always. Why not? What did he buy from you the night he was in here phoning? Well, the same. Why not? You're sure he didn't buy... These? Oh, wait. Yes. Now, if I hadn't seen them in your hand, I wouldn't ever remember... Cigarette papers. For a change, he said to cut down expenses. Did he buy any loose tobacco to go with them? I don't know. No, I don't. Yeah. He didn't ask me, so I thought he'd got some already. <sighs> All right. You can give me some now. <laughs> Be happy to. <laughs> I see you. Uh, what is it all of a sudden with you, Inspector? You look like you just swallowed the cat that ate the canary. <laughs> You're all right, Dad. And I'm going to arrange some things for you. <laughs> Is that so? What? Why, to be a witness at a nice big murder trial, free. I started back to the police station. Now that the hunt was nearly over, except for the kill, I suddenly felt tired. Tired as an old foxhound at the end of the chase. I tried breakfast, but that didn't help much. So I went on over to the station. Chief Inspector Leffinger was right on deck and cranky as ever. But I could see he was worried. We'd held this chap nearly 24 hours and His Majesty's courts don't favor false arrests. Well, I hope you've got something. Where have you been all night? You look like you slept on a park bench. I didn't sleep anyway. I've just been doing some hunting. I hope you bagged something. Otherwise, Coleman's next move is out. His next move is arraignment after what I'm going to show you. Oh, excellent. I'm just in the mood for lantern slides. Shall we have him in? Oh, yes, by all means. Well, bring him in. Yes, sir. Now, first. First, I'd like you to watch how he rolls a cigarette. Oh, what are we doing? Playing parlor games? Just watch him, Chief, that's all. And remember, I found these cigarette papers in the pocket of his suit... The suit he wore the night he went to see Lombard. Are you suggesting he gassed him to death with cheap tobacco? Here he is, Inspector. Uh, good morning. You woke me up just to move me to another ride out. Uh, don't you get wise to yourself? You know you're going to have to charge me or turn me loose sooner or later. All right, enough of that. We're turning you loose. All we want you to do is sign a waiver that nothing has happened to you here. Blimey, I signed nothing. Now, now, take it easy, Clarence. We got the chap who did it. You've nothing to worry about. 
We just don't want any suits for false arrest, that's all. You took the words right out of my mouth, copper, because my first stop after here is a solicitor. Oh, now, wait a minute now. Suppose we talk this over, eh? Smoke? Uh, not one of them things that... Well, you smoke thieves, don't you? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Well, here's some tobacco. Go ahead. Roll one. Yeah. Thanks. That's not the way. I'm a, I'm a little out of practice. A little out of practice, he says. It doesn't look to me as if he'd ever rolled one before in his life. Does it to you, Chief? All right, but you can't hang a man for that. Just the same. He bought these cigarette papers the night he went to see Lombard at the tobacconist where he phoned where he bought all his cigarettes. The first time he ever bought any. And no tobacco to go with them. And not a shred of loose tobacco in any of his pockets. Now, why do you suppose he bought those cigarette papers that night? You're telling it, Harvey. I'm listening. Are you listening, Coleman? Yeah, you're talking in your sleep. I'll tell you why he bought them. Better than that. I'll show you. Loan me a gun a minute, will you, Chief? Yes. Ah, uh, 38. Right. The same caliber as Coleman's gun. Right. Now, here's a 32 caliber bullet. The same caliber as the one that killed Lombard. Care to see it? I know a 32 when I see him. All right. We take the 38 bullets out of your gun... Now we take this 32 bullet and about three of these cigarette papers, double them over, wrap them around the bullet. See how snug that 32 fits in your 38 gun now. Uh, now yes. watch how a 38 gun will fire a 32 bullet. I'll put it in the baseboard over there. That's ballistics, Chief. How'd you like it? Ballistics? Ballistics? Oh, you take ballistics. I'll take human nature every time. <laughs> Three months later, Coleman went to the gallows, as you must have read in your newspapers. It wasn't a very spectacular case, and they didn't waste any space telling you about it. Nor did they mention whether Coleman took a cigarette from a copper before he died. Well, I don't know whether he did or not either. But I do know that this case demonstrated the imagination, the patience, the relentless attention to detail required when a man hunts the most dangerous game of all. Man. Thank you, Victor Jory, for playing the first hunter in our new series, The Hunters. Tonight's script for The Hunters was based on Cornell Woolrich's famous short story and with music by Lud Gluskin, was produced and directed by Tony Leader. Be sure to listen again next week when CBS presents George Sanders as The Hunter in Green Summit. The celebrated tale of danger and pursuit in which a man chases his best friend until he... <laughs> but perhaps you'd better tune in yourself and find out next week on... The Hunters. <laughs> This is CBS, the Columbia... If a dead man reappears on the scene just to get into the spirit of things... Isn't it a crime? WNEW presents the 13th in a series of famous mystery stories relating to the gentle art of mayhem and the less gentle art of murder. Isn't it a crime? This is Jerry Marshall speaking. Now, not only will you hear the exciting story of speaking of murder, but you will be invited to join our radio detective force and be given a chance to solve the crime before the answer is revealed, just as if you might have been there on the scene. When all the clues are in, we'll return to the scene of the crime for the solution of tonight's mystery, Speaking of Murder. It's nearly noon. Sunlight pokes inquisitive fingers under the window blinds of the penthouse apartment of Glenn Winthrop, writer of mystery stories. But Glenn isn't having any. His face is buried in the pillow and he sleeps with sound effects. The door opens, framing a lean, melancholy face. 
The owner of the face peers the figure on the bed, then approaches, holding at arm's length an infernal machine, destroyer of sleep, shatterer of nerves. Answer the door, Smithers. It's not the door, Mr. Winthrop. Then answer the phone. I want to sleep. It's not the phone, sir. Whatever it is, answer it. It's an alarm clock, sir. Oh, no. No alarm clocks. The curfew shall not ring tonight. But it isn't night, sir. It's nearly noon. It's merely a figure of speech, Smithers. I don't care if it's night, morning, or midwinter. Go away and take that instrument of Satan with you. For heaven's sake, Smithers, turn that confounded thing off. Yes, sir. Now, go away. But, Mr. Winthrop, sir, I must shave you. You just sit over there. I'll grow a beard. I'm not going to shave for a month. But you must, sir. Archibald, what's got into you? I do wish, sir, that you wouldn't call me Archibald. As I told you, sir, when I entered your service, I detest the name. My name is Archie. And I wish, Archibald, that you'd go away and let me sleep. I detest alarm clocks, and I'm beginning to detest you. Surely, sir, you don't want to entertain a lady with that ghastly stubble on your chin, especially your fiancée. What? What's my fiancée got to do with it? She's in Florida. Oh, no, sir. Miss Southwood phoned a few minutes ago. Francis phoned? Well, why didn't she say so? I hadn't as yet had the opportunity to do so, sir. She said she'd be here in 30 minutes. Here in 30 minutes? Yes, sir. Just my luck, and I was all set to go on a hunting trip tomorrow. Oh, I didn't realize that you didn't wish to see her, sir. Shall I refuse her entrance, sir? Shall you what? Shall I turn her away, sir? Of course not, you dope. Where's my robe? Here, sir. If you'll just sit over here... I'll shave you in no time. I have everything ready. Archie, I apologize. I'll never call you Archibald again. You're a lifesaver. Thank you, sir. Now, just sit here, sir. <sighs> I wonder what brought Francis back. She didn't say, sir. Now, if you'll just turn your head so, I'll lather your face. In the middle of the season, too. I think... <clears throat> oh, God, it, Archie, you put the shaving soap in my mouth. I'm sorry, sir. You keep your mouth closed, it won't happen again. Oh, Glenn, darling, I'm so glad to see you. Kiss me again. <clears throat> what is it, Archibald? Uh, shall I bring some coffee, Mr. Winthrop? Mm. Darling, I'm afraid Archie doesn't approve of romance before breakfast. Well, he'll just have to approve. After we're married, I'm sure I shall insist upon being kissed before breakfast. Shall I bring the coffee, sir? Oh, yes. By all means, Archibald, bring the coffee. Thank you, sir. You're a... Uh... The valet is sort of, sort of weird, darling. Oh, he's all right. He's fussy about his name, that's all. I don't think he liked it when you called him Archibald. But you just called him that yourself. I always do when I'm annoyed with him. And uh, you were annoyed with him just now? When anyone interrupts the most beautiful woman in the land and the best actress, just when she's about to kiss me, why shouldn't I be annoyed? <laughs> oh, you're crazy, but I love it. Oh, tell me, darling. What brings you back to the city so soon? When your show closed last week, you told me you were going away for a month. I got a wire from Robert that I must be at my uncle's house tonight. In that gloomy old ruin out in the suburbs? But why? I thought that house was closed after your uncle died. It was, but Robert stayed on there. Who's Robert? He was Uncle Ned's confidential secretary. He had charge of all my uncle's affairs. He and my cousin Irma nursed uncle during his last illness. Robert wired that it was urgent that I come to the house tonight. Irma's to be there, too. Be taken care of by mail. I don't know what it is, but Robert's wire states that if I hoped to participate in uncle's estate, I had to be there tonight. Anyway, there's, there's something funny about the way uncle died. I almost think sometimes that... That it was murder. Mm, that sounds like the beginning of one of my mystery stories. I know. I dread going out there. The place has always made me so uneasy. That's why I want you to come with me. Ah, oh, I see. I just spent three months writing a book about a spooky old house. Now I have to visit one. And me on my vacation. <laughs> Is this 
the place, mister? Yeah, this is it. Oh, thanks, mister. Yeah. Gosh, what a spooky dive. You wouldn't catch me going into a place like that. Are you hinting for an invitation? Oh, no, not me, buddy. Well, tastes differ. Be seeing you, cabby. I hope so, but uh, I ain't holding my breath. Cab driver gives me the creeps the way he said he hoped so when you told him you'd be seeing him. Oh, he was just kidding. But this is a spooky-looking place. Why'd your uncle with all his dough want to live in a house way back from the street like that? He built the wall all around the ground so he'd have privacy. Well, he might as well have lost himself in the jungle. Oh, here's the gate. Oh, watch out you don't stumble, Fran. Gee, it's sure dark around this place. Oh, what was that? Oh, it's just a hoot owl, darling. We're really in the jungle. But don't let it get on your nerves. Oh, but it is scary. After that gate shuts us off from the street, we might as well be in another world. Say, by the way, is there a dog here? Oh, yes. Yes, Uncle's dog, Hamlet. Robert kept him after Uncle died. He's a great Dane. Hamlet. <laughs> Hamlet, I mean, not Robert. <laughs> That's not so good. Well, why? Don't you like great Danes? I don't mind them in the daylight, but I certainly don't fancy a young elephant jumping on me in the dark. <laughs> oh, Hamlet won't hurt us. He knows me. Yeah, but he doesn't know me. I can't understand, though, why he hasn't barked. He usually raises the roof when anyone comes into the grounds at night. Look. Look, Glenn. There, there by the tree in the porch, there's a, there's a huge dark shadow and something white. Oh, Glenn, let's get out of here. No, no, wait a minute. I'm going to see what it is. No, no, darling, don't. Yeah. Come out of there, whoever you are. Uh, is that you, Mr. Winthrop? Archie. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When Miss Southwood screamed, it nearly scared the wits out of me. Well, Archie, I can't say that your sudden appearance was a sedative to our nerves. Oh. That outlandish creature it seems to be a bird, sir. It's been roosting over my head ever since I got here. Incidentally, Archie, what are you doing here anyway? Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. It quite slipped my mind in my discomposure. You see, sir, after you and Miss Southwood left for dinner, I discovered an appalling thing, a terrible oversight. What is it? I hope you'll forgive me, sir, but when you were dressing, I was guilty of a terrible bit of negligence. Well, well, Archie, what is it? It was an oversight, sir, and I'm terribly sorry. I didn't know where you were dining, so I came out here to meet you. Here, Archie, what are you talking about? Oh, it's horrible, sir. I let you come out in public without a handkerchief in your breast pocket. Oh. And here it is, sir. Well, I'll forgive you this time, Archie. Just so you don't let me go out in public someday without my <clears throat> pants. Huh? Oh, no, sir. Oh, come on, Glenn. Let's go inside. This dark yard frightens me. Well, that house looks just as dark. Are you sure Robert said he'd meet you here? Yes, I'm sure. Look, look, there's a light, that window at the side. That used to be Uncle's den. Uh, I, I beg pardon, sir. Robert said he'd meet you here? Yes, I'm sure. You'd mind walking to the gate with me. It seems that uh, the nocturnal aspect of this place appalls me. I, I feel that my uh, nervous system has been sadly deranged. Well, you may as well come in with us, Archie. We shan't be here long. I hope. Miss Southworth is planning to fly back to Florida tomorrow, and I want to start on that hunting trip. Ah, God! I almost fell down, confound it. Somebody left a rolled-up rug or something on that porch. Why can't they have lights on when they're expecting company? Well, there never was any furniture on the porch when Uncle was alive. Where in blazes is that bell? <laughs> there isn't a bell, dear. Uncle could never stand bells ringing. He wouldn't even have a telephone for that reason. Here, the big door knocker. Well, let's see how this contraption works. Yeah, I've got it. Well, echoes through the house like the crack of doom. Do you suppose there's anybody there? Well, I'm sure I saw a light in the den. Knock again. Okay. It's as silent as a mausoleum, sir. Archibald, your choice of words is unfortunate under the circumstances, but you're right. Fran, I think someone's been playing a practical joke on you. Bringing me out to this gloomy old house when there's nobody here isn't my idea of a joke. That isn't funny. Practical jokes rarely are. I beg pardon, sir, but there seems to be someone with a candle moving around inside. Oh, good evening, Miss Francis. You're a little early. Good evening, Robert. This is my fiancé, Mr. Winthrop. Good evening. Good evening. Why, why the candle? What's happened to the electric lights? A fuse blew out, Miss Francis, and I had no spare. We'll have to make out with candles tonight. 
Who is this other gentleman? Oh, I'm sorry. This is Smithers, Mr. Winthrop's man. Great Scott, Archie. What's the matter with you? You're shaking like a leaf. Uh, look, sir. There on the porch. That's what you stumbled over. Hold the light higher, will you, Robert, please? Thanks. It's a dog. It's Hamlet. No wonder he didn't bark at us. He's, he's dead. There's not a mark on him. Wonder what happened to him. The dog grieved for his master. Probably died of grief. He was very old. No, no. Glenn, Glenn, I'm frightened. There's, there's menace in the air here tonight. I can feel it. Something terrible will happen here tonight. Midnight. I wonder where Irma is. She's probably coming with Dr. Blade. Perhaps he's been detained on a call. Dr. Blade? You you mean young Dick Blade, uncle's doctor? Why is he coming? Irma's been working in his office since your uncle died. He promised to bring her. I never liked Dick Blade. He's been very kind to Irma. Yes, probably feathering his nest. Probably wants to marry her for her share of uncle's fortune. Perhaps if you had been your uncle's nurse instead of Irma, you might feel differently about Dr. Blade. Oh, I'm sorry, Robert. That was a terrible thing to say. I... Oh, I'm not myself tonight. This place gives me the creeps. It almost seems that Uncle is here tonight reproaching me because I wasn't with him when he died. I'm sure your uncle understood that you would have been with him had it been possible. You were very thoughtful. You sent fruit and flowers nearly every day. Fruit and flowers. It meant nothing. Oh, I should have left the show and come here. Your uncle wouldn't have wanted that. He was proud of your career. Oh, why doesn't Irma come? It was just a month ago tonight that he died. At one o'clock, it's just an hour from the... Why, Miss Francis, you're shivering. Are you cold? No, no, I... I was just listening to that wind. It has an eerie sound. It's been a sultry day. Probably a storm brewing. <coughs> what was that? I didn't hear anything. Oh, listen... You're upset, my dear. I heard nothing. But I tell you, I heard something. It was the sound of something banging, like like someone pounding on the wall. There it is again. Miss Francis, you're overwrought. You're imagining things. I must have Dr. Blade prescribe something. No, no, no. I don't trust that man. (laughs) Hello, darling. Sorry I scared you. Glenn, where have you been? Archie and I were moving Hamlet's body so your cousin wouldn't get a scare when she arrived. Oh, by the way, Robert, Smithers is out in the hall... If you'll be so kind as to show us where we can wash up. No, no, don't leave me, Glenn. Why, Francis, what's wrong? I don't know. I I just don't want to be left alone. All right, I'll stay. I'll show Smithers the way upstairs. Thanks. Oh, darling, I'm so glad you came back when you did that. That man gives me the creeps. Oh, Robert? Yeah, he is sort of strange. I suppose it's just his way. Gee, you're sort of nervous. I've never seen you like this before. Oh, that wind... That unearthly screeching wind. It, it's almost as though Uncle were trying to speak to me from his grave. I'll oh, see here, young lady. You've got to get a grip on yourself. You mustn't go to pieces this way. If only Irma would come. Then we could get this, this business of Robert's over with and go home. I thought you said that your uncle never had a phone. Give me a start, too. I guess I'm developing your nerves. Oh, all right, all right. I'm coming. Well, where is the confounded thing? It's over in this corner somewhere, but I can't find it. Oh, there it is, in the wastebasket. That's a fine place to keep a phone. Hello? 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 <laughs> that's funny. Did they hang up? No, oh, that's the funny part of it. There wasn't even a dial tone. The line's dead. Glenn, darling, take me out of here. There's something horrible going on in this place. I'm beginning to agree with you. There's something mighty funny about a phone hidden in a wastebasket ringing when the line is dead. And, and Hamlet, I'm sure somebody killed him. There wasn't a mark on the dog's body. He could have been poisoned. Yes, that's true. Did Robert tell you why he sent for you to come here tonight? Well, he said we'd have to wait until Irma got here. She and I are uncle's only surviving relatives, and it has something to do with the will. Robert drew it up, you know. Yeah, but why should your uncle's secretary draw up his will? Why not a lawyer? Well, Robert was more than uncle's secretary. He was an old friend. He gave up his law practice to handle uncle's affairs. You know, Francis, 
This is all very strange. I feel as though I'm living in the pages of one of my own crazy books. I've written this story a dozen times myself. Your man will be down in a minute, Mr. Winthrop. Thanks, Robert. Robert, when did you have a phone installed in this house? Phone? Yes. A little while ago, a phone rang. Oh. I had trouble locating it, but finally found it in the wastebasket. When I answered, the line was dead. It did seem rather strange. I had the phone put in shortly after your uncle's death, Miss Francis. I was working at the desk today and remember putting it in the basket to clear the desktop. As to the line being dead, are you sure of that, Mr. Winthrop? Quite sure. Try it yourself. Oh, that's probably Irma. Excuse me, I'll let her in. You know, Francis, I believe you're right. There is something fishy about that man. That strange gliding walk. That flat voice. And that pale face. Glenn, he, he looks like a dead man. So you're Glenn. Dear Francis has told me so much about you. Mm-hmm. Never mind trying to make a play for him, dear Emma. He's mine. Oh, you talk, Francis. Well, Robert, suppose we get down to business. Jake and I want to get back to town. Phew, we had a wet trip out. It's pouring in town. Bad storm. I tried to call you, but couldn't get you. Saw the reason later. There's a tree down right across the telephone line. Must have fallen while you were calling. The phone rang, but when I answered, the line was dead. Oh, don't talk about dead things. This house always gives me the willies. I don't see, Robert, why we had to come out here. Why couldn't we meet in town? This really concerns only Miss Irma and Miss Francis. But the rest of you may as well hear it. You know, of course, that I drew up your uncle's will. Yes, of course. And you know, too, that for some time before his death, your uncle was interested in in spiritualism. Yes. It always gave me the creeps to hear him talk about it. Well, your uncle's will contained a strange clause. I, as executor, was instructed to request his heirs to be present here tonight, exactly one month after his death. Cute little idea Uncle had. Did he order a storm, too? Please, Miss Irma. <laughs> I was further instructed to inform you of the terms of his will. I'll read it. Oh, skip all the legal stuff. Just tell us how it affects us. Very well. Aside from some minor bequests, the bulk of the property is to be divided between you two girls. And you hauled us out here to hear that. Wait, Miss Irma. Let me read the paragraph which refers to your inheritance. In the event... That at exactly one month from the hour of my death, my two nieces, Francis and Irma, are living and unmarried. And in the event they have not been involved in any scandal that would besmirch the name of Southworth, the residue of my estate shall be divided equally between them. But should either of my nieces fail in these conditions, said niece shall forfeit her inheritance, and the entire estate shall go to my niece who fulfills said conditions." But both nieces fail... Oh, no need to read the rest of it. We're both alive, we've been in no scandals, and I'm certainly not married. How about you, Francis? Of course not. Then that's that. Come on, Dick, let's start back to town. One moment. Your uncle specified that both Francis and Irma should be here in this house at exactly one month from the time of his death. He died at 1 a.m. one month ago. We've still half an hour to wait. The conditions of the will are not effective... Till 1 a.m. Well, that's pretty silly. Neither of the girls is going to die or get into a scandal in half an hour. Well, as a doctor, I grant you that marriage or scandal are unlikely, but who can be sure about death? minutes of one. Now we must fulfill the final conditions of the will. What do you mean, final conditions? I will explain. Your uncle's interest in spiritualism prompted one other request. We are all to sit around this table. Miss Irma, sit here beside me. Uh, Dr. Blade on my other side. Very well. Thank you. Miss Francis, next to Dr. Blade. Mr. Winthrop and Smithers at the foot of the table. Thank you. Good. 
Now I am instructed to place this loaded revolver on the table in front of me. So. What's this all about? At exactly one o'clock, the hour of his death, your uncle will endeavor to speak to us from the grave. Oh, this is so silly. If you wish to forfeit your inheritance, you may withdraw. Oh, not on your life. You will note that a fire is laid in the grate. If your uncle succeeds in returning to us, he will light that fire. Must we go through with this ridiculous farce, Robert? You have heard the terms of your uncle's will. Oh, that's a lot of tommy rot. Perhaps. But it was your uncle's wish. I intend to carry out his wishes. Oh, all right. Get on with it, then. Now, each one clasp his neighbor's hand. All right? Yes. Then our circle is complete. I will now blow out the candle. That clock, the monotonous clock, tick, 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 it's driving me crazy. Your uncle was very fond of that clock. Well, I don't like it. It must be nearly one. It must be quiet. I tell you, I can't stand this. Shh, quiet, please. Robert. Robert. Oh. Yes? You have done well. Is that you, Mr. Southworth? On earth, that was my name. Now I have no name. I cannot free myself from earth until my work is done. Your work? What is your work? Vengeance. Only one here need fear me. The one who murdered me. Murdered? Yes, with a slow poison. One of you murdered me. Robert, you brought me whiskey. Was the poison in that? Uh, I... Or was it in the medicine Dr. Blade gave me? Francis, you sent me the fruit nearly every day. Was it the fruit of death? No, no. Irma, you cooked my food. One of you murdered me. It wasn't I, I tell you. I didn't do it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jerry Marshall speaking. We take time out now, in fact, 60 seconds time, to allow you amateur detectives to solve the mystery of tonight's story. To help you along with the solution, here are a few leading or misleading clues. First, is there anything that Robert said that might shed light on his innocence or guilt? The dog grieved for his master. Probably died of grief. He was very old. Now, how about Dr. Blade? Do you recall him saying... Well, as a doctor, I grant that marriage or scandal are unlikely. But who can be sure about death? Then there is Francis, a very definite heir to Uncle Shekels. There's menace in the air here tonight. I can feel it. Something terrible will happen here tonight. Or could it have been Irma who was heard to say... Must we go through with this ridiculous farce, Robert? Well, the 60 seconds are up. Do you think you have the answer? All right. Hold on to it. And we'll return to our play and see if you're right. It wasn't I. I tell you I didn't do it. Ned. Ned. Don't you know who killed you? I do not know. But I have ways of learning. At the stroke of one... I will light that fire in the fireplace, and the finger of death will touch my murderer. The flame will sear into the treacherous brain that planned my death. Robert, Robert, light that candle. Quiet. Tell me, Ned, who killed you? I can't tell you, but in a moment you will know. In a moment the finger of death will touch the guilty one. There is a gun on the table. That is the only chance for the murderer. That is the only escape from eternal suffering. That is the only expiation. No, no. The finger of death is approaching. Confess your crime. Confess your crime. You murdered me. Confess. Confess before it's too late. The hour is at hand. Confess. Look. 
A fire is lit. The finger of death is upon you. I did it. I killed him. I hated him. He made me a slave. Robert, oh, quick, the lights. Oh, it's Emma. She shot herself. Doctor, is she? Yes, she's dead. for a long time that his death was not natural. And so Dick Blade and I got an exhumation order and Dick found signs of poison in the body. We suspected both of you, Miss Francis. It had to be either you or Miss Irma. So we set the stage for our ghost. The banging shutter, the candlelight, the seance. It was all staged. But uh, Hamlet... Well, the dog died this afternoon. I... Put the body on the porch. Oh, and the, uh, the fire lighting itself? Dick released my hand and I set off a charge of flashlight powder. What about the ghost boys? <laughs> that was Dick. We planned to scare a confession from the guilty one. And it worked. Poor Irma. It's horrible. It's better the way it happened. Won't there be legal complications and publicity about all this? After all, Irma committed a murder and then committed suicide. No, the police have informed me that no one need remain for questioning. No charges will be pressed. There will be no publicity. In fact, an inspector from the homicide squad was present in the West Room. It was he who removed the body. Oh, Glenn, I'll be so happy to get out of this awful house. Listen, darling, I'm not going to go back to Florida. Let's get married tomorrow. Francis, you darling, of course. I beg your pardon, sir. What is it, Archie? Uh, Mr. Winthrop, sir, speaking of tomorrow, have you considered you were going on a hunting trip? Speaking of murder, have you considered what a swell corpse you'd make, Archibald? Please, don't call me Archibald, sir. We have brought you the 13th of a series of mystery stories. Tonight's drama, Speaking of Murder, was written by Don Thompson and directed by Milton Bernard Kay. The cast featured Casey Allen, Eleonora Reed, Leonard Scherer, Jason Johnson, Eileen Court, and Merrill E. Joels. Musical settings were by Kay Reed. This is Jerry Marshall speaking and saying goodnight for Isn't It a Crime? This is W. entry, The Schooner Black Parrot, Matthew Kincaid, Master, 6 May 1950. Position, 17 degrees 5 minutes south, 147 degrees west. Course, 43 degrees. Fresh breeze, sky overcast. Barometer, 310 and falling. Passengers, 2. 1 restricted to quarters. Cargo, Explosives in number two hold. Number one, trade goods. The Log of the Black Parrot, with Elliot Lewis starred as Captain Matthew Kincaid, and written by the masters of the sea story, Gil Dowd and Anthony Ellis. <laughs> Passage of a black schooner sailing the southern oceans, sailing into adventure with a strange and restless man who is her master, has set down in the log of the black parrot. Number one's batten skipper, and this is the last for number two. I'll be glad to see the cargo aboard. Right. It's coming over dirty, Red, but at this rate, we'll beat the wind. That's all right with me. I don't want to run into anything with that stuff aboard. What's a doctor doing with explosives anyway? He wants to get rid of a reef. Hey, Red. Yeah? Do you have any trouble ashore? Trouble? Me? Who's a skipper? Take a look. Gendarmes. Oh, a 
Coming aboard. I'll be checking the dunnage in number one. Have we King Kincaid? What's the trouble? Will you come ashore, please? Why? Commandant requests your presence. Why? I cannot say. I only have my orders. I got mine from the harbor master. There's weather moving in. I got a clear for Petey in an hour. I'm sorry, monsieur. Got the papers? Router, tell Mr. Gallagher I've gone ashore. Come on, you. We walked away from the waterfront through the warm, dull rain, back into Papiti. And I knew I'd been in the place too long. The feeling of being held, being watched, was there again. And now the police, always the curious police, who ask too many questions. Capitan Kincaid. Yeah. Attendez d'ailleurs. Oui, monsieur le commandant. What's the matter with you? Captain Kincaid, I'm so sorry to inconvenience you. Please sit down. No, thanks. The cigar? Look, I'm in a hurry. What do you want? You are sailing for Iva Oa. Yeah. Then I have a favor to ask, unofficially. You make out forms and triplicate for a favor? I'm sorry, monsieur. It is most important. I know you are anxious come to Come on, sailing, come on. But... I want to get out of here before the wind hits. I wish you to carry a passenger to the Marquesas. We will pay the passage. I guess I can take another 2,000 francs. It is a girl. Forget it. Not on my ship. I will pay you 3,000 francs. She is a daughter of a very good friend of mine in Hiva Oa. He sent her here to school when she was 15, three years ago. Now she must leave. I can't take an 18-year-old girl on my ship. She's in a great deal of trouble. And she'll have to go to prison if she stays here. Why? She learned too much. But I think not in school. Men... Among others, a sailor. She shot him. Mm -hmm. She's half caste. Her mother was Marquesan. It happens. Is the sailor dead? Ah, no. No. He will recover and he will prosecute. You want her to be away before then? Yes. Mm -hmm. What happens if I get caught? Ah, You will not be caught. I shall see to that. All right. Have the girl and her gear aboard in 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Three thousand, monsieur le capitaine, three thousand francs. Et merci mille fois. I said two thousand. So long. I didn't see the girl come aboard. I was too busy. My first passenger, Dr. John Mitchell, stood near me at the wheel, his thinning blonde hair ruffled by the breeze, the eyes in his scarred face following the movements of the crewman. Across the clearing weather and the two Amutus, sailing full and by. I turned the wheel over to Gallagher and went below to enter our departure in the log. Are you busy, Matthew? No, oh, nothing important. Come on in, John. Sit down. Thank you. You wouldn't have. Uh... I'm afraid I left the top of my head in the pit. <laughs> You had a good time, huh? Splendidly depraved. But after all, two weeks out of two years. Uh-huh. And now back to Mohotani for another two. Oh, yes. I obtained some excellent books this trip. One particularly. I hope you have a chance to read it on the way up. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. Manager's Man Against Himself. There's good and bad in it. I think you'll like it. Well, bung up and bilge free. Uh. I saw your other passenger, the female. That so? Yes. Her father is Robert Bonnet, the government resident of the Marquesas. You haven't seen her yet? Not yet. Gallagher put her in her cabin. 
She's older than when I saw her last. Very nice. Awfully nice. Hands off, John. She's trouble. Yes, I heard about it. Amazing what happens to these children when civilization gets its cultured talons into them. It's a shame she couldn't have left her Marques and Blood at home. Another one, John? Uh, no, thanks. I think I'll go up on deck and say goodbye to Pepita. Um, I'll bring you the book at dinner. Right. Captain Kincaid. Come in. You comfortable? Comfortable? Yes. Look, I know about your trouble in Papiti. Let's forget about it. We've got nine or ten days ahead of us. Everything will be fine. I don't want to go back to Hiva Oa. I'm sorry. I want you to stay in your cabin as much as possible. We eat at six in my cabin, okay? Okay. I was angry when I left Because she was the loveliest thing I'd ever seen And because she knew I couldn't look at her without staring I didn't want to stare So I didn't look at her very much I relieved Gallagher at the wheel the feel of a ship in deep water again is a good thing, but it wasn't this time. I knew there were too many explosives aboard. I should have turned the wheel back to Tahiti then. Salt, skipper. Yeah. Excuse me. Red, did you check the generator? Since when did I forget? I was asking, mate. I checked it. You know, Matthew, I don't think Miss Bonet remembers me. I used to see her running on the beach when she was a very little child. Oh, I remember you, Doctor. You would be so difficult to forget. I mean, those terrible scars on your face. Have you finished? Yes, thank you. Now get back to your cabin. What's the matter, Skipper? She didn't mean anything, you know that. Forget it, Red. Isn't she good enough for your company? She's good enough for mine. Forget it. Why don't you let her out of that coop, get her up on deck? You know it's hot in there. Drink your coffee, mate. Yes. Stay away from her, mister! I'm sorry, John. It doesn't matter. No, no, no. Really. It doesn't. I've lived with this face for a long time. One gets used to surface scars. And those inside? Well, I've got my island, old Tony. I don't have to see people for years on end if I don't want to. And you, Matthew, you've got your ship. That's right. I've often wondered what you're running... I picked up some cognac. Let's have a drink. Love to. I say, I, um, I brought you the book, Man Against Himself. From that first night on, she was fed in her cabin. I didn't want to see her. And I didn't want Gallagher or anybody else to see her. Three days out, we raised the two Omotos and began the dirty business of picking our way through the hundreds of coral reefs and heads, which, with the islands, make up the group. I the ah. But with those boxes in hold number two, it was like the first time... Quarter left. Five. Five, the deep. Four. Four, your helm. Steady as she goes. The 
three years, Gallagher and I had sailed and worked the southern waters. By the mouth! Hey! There'd been words before. And women, too. But now, except for ship talk, there weren't any words. And that was bad. By the mouth! Sit! By nightfall, we'd cleared the reefs and were sailing free with the southeast trades on our starboard quarter. I stood the 8 to 12 wheel watch. What are you doing on deck? Sorry. It was hot. I hope you don't mind the way I dressed. It was so hot. I don't mind the way you're dressed. What do you want? I want to go back. Back? Anywhere. I don't want to go to Hiva or... We've been through that. Take me back. Please. Go on below. Don't you like me? I'm pretty. I've looked at myself in the mirror, I know. Take me back. To the sailor in Papiti? No. I go with you. Anywhere. Look, you go back to Hiva Oa. You belong there. Papiti is no good for you. Anywhere is no good for you. You belong on your island with your own people. I have learned what it is to be French. I know what it is to be a French lady. The way I am now, I'm not good for my people and Hiva Oa. Go below. Take me back. I want to be a French lady. Why don't you look at me? Because you're so beautiful, you make me sick. Get away from me or I'll kill you. Kill me? <laughs> you. Get away from me. It's midnight, Skip. I'll take over. <laughs> You are listening to Elliot Lewis as Captain Matthew Kincaid in Gil Dowd and Anthony Ellis' exciting story of the sea, The Log of the Black Parrot. I turned the wheel over to Red, gave him the course, and he repeated it. But he was looking something else. I went below. The girl was in her cabin, and I locked her there. Went into my own quarters, tried to sleep. And the next night, tried to sleep. And the next. And the morning came. We were one day off the Marquesas. And our cabin door was open. Matt, wait a moment. I'm in a hurry. For what, Matthew? Get out of my way. You're too late. She's been out since the four down. Leave her alone, It's Matthew. not her, it's Gallagher. The ship, what's happening to it? Get out of my way before I finish off what's left of your face. Oh. Get out of my way, will you? Where's the mate, Crowder? Uh, he's up for it, I think. You think, Crowder? Uh, he's up for it, sir. Mister! What's that bucket doing on the deck? I don't know. It's your business to know. Stow it where it belongs. Are you kidding? I'm not a deckhand. Stow it away. You! Get below to your cabin. All right. Wait a minute. We're going back to Papiti. I got a cargo for Hiva Oa, mister. I'm taking it there. All right. But she stays on the ship. I'll pay her passage back. She gets off with the cargo. She's with me now. I told you to stay away from her. You told me. You... Time. You had your chance, Mister. 
Feel better now, Matthew? Shut up! Bring him around. He takes the wheel in a half an hour. Yeah. What do you want, John? Gallagher won't be able to stand his watch. Oh? He'll be all right. But he'll have to stay in his cabin until tomorrow. Okay. Sure, I'll tell you. Help yourself. Sit down, Matthew. Want to have a look at you? Yeah. Hmm. A little more work on your face, and you'd have looked like me. I'm sorry about that. Turn your head this way. Yeah. This is going to hurt. And it'll be different. Well, no, John, I wish I was a kid right now. No? Why? Yeah. So I could bawl my ears off. I must be a little drunk. Perhaps we should all be drunk. All the time. Is she... She in her cabin? Yes. Should I have taken her back to Papiti? What's the matter with her? I don't think it's me and I don't think it's Red. What does she want? I don't know. If I knew why she so desperately doesn't want to go home, I could tell you, but I don't know. i got to take the wheel. Now, just a moment. Huh? It's only plaster, but it may hold your ear on. <laughs> Thanks, John. There was a difference in the ship. Almost a relief. The crew was easier. I could feel a lightness again in the deck under my feet, a strength in the pulling canvas. Perhaps it was the fight. Whatever it was, there was a difference in the ship. The girl came out on deck later, in the afternoon. I looked at her because I couldn't. I saw for the first time her hair. Her black, black hair. And how tiny she was. The blackness of her eyes. The gracefulness in her hands. The delicacy of her feet. Her eyes were on me, but I knew she didn't see me as she passed. And moved forward toward the waist of the ship. The crewmen no more than glanced at her and then turned back to their work. She went to the rail. No! Crowder, stop her! Gordon, take the wheel! Give me that. Quit it now. Quit it. Take it easy. All right, I got her. She, she went for more deck noise. Come on. I want the doctor to take care of that cut. Don't take me back. Please don't make me go home. Come on. <laughs> John John What's the matter? Uh, here, put her over here Tried to go overboard Crowder stopped her But she got mixed up with his knife Move over, let me see yeah. Hmm, that's not too bad I just hold still That's right uh, Justin uh, there we are. Ah. That didn't hurt very much, did it? No. Ah, let me see that. May I? That hurt? No. That? No. Matthew. Yeah. You knew about this, didn't you? No. You won't make me go to Hiva over. How long has it been? Half a year, I think. And maybe even Papi did told me. It'll be all right. 
Now, don't worry. I'm going to give you something to make you sleep for a while. I guess there isn't much choice, is it? There may be another way. What do you mean? She could live on Mohotane. There's nobody else on the island. Except you. That's right. Oh, I'd, I'd marry her if she wanted to. If not, I'd build her a place. That's not what I mean, John. Oh, it's not that bad. There's always a chance. You know what you're saying? My dear chap, of course I do. As a matter of fact, I'm being rather selfish about the whole thing. She's quite beautiful. You've noticed it. Uh, so is Mr. Gallagher. I can't let you do it, John. Then you know what's left. Look here, I'm not very prepossessing to look at. I know that. But in a few years, she may not be either. It would be a great comfort to one another. Stop it, will you? You're a strange chap. I think you almost worship beauty. You don't like the idea of her becoming undutiful, do you? Do you? Surface scars, Matthew. Surface scars. Well... Does she stay with me on Mahutani? I don't know. I'll have to think. The next morning, we anchored off the emerald-shaped island of Mahutani. Hiva'oa, our final destination, was a cloud-rimmed hump on the northwest horizon. The longboat was put over the side and loading of John Mitchell's gear and explosives got underway. I looked at the little island, thought of the girl. Mitchell can go aboard now, Captain. All right, mate. John, you're ready to go ashore. Here, I'll give you a hand with that. Thanks. So you made up your mind, Matthew? Yes. Parish. Steady the ladder. He's coming down. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, man. Uh, drop in when you pass this way again. I'll see you. Gallagher. Yeah? Hold the boat for a few minutes. I'm going below. Right. We're at Mohotani. I know. Dr. Mitchell is ready to go ashore. You want to go with him? With him? Yesterday we talked about you. He wants to take care of you on his island. He'll marry you if you like, or build your house. You'll be close to your people on Hivaoa. He wants this? He wants it. Otherwise, it would mean the island for you. I can't take you back to Papiti or anywhere else. Kind man, isn't he? Yeah. You would tell my father? Yes, about this. Not about Papiti. There is a priest on here, Oa. You will send him here. Sure. watched the flash of oar blades in the sun as the longboat pulled shoreward. Then I thought of Gallagher. I found him on the port side, looking out at the open sea. She's better off with him, Gallagher. She would have been better off with me. Maybe she would if you had an island, lived alone, didn't care. Didn't care? Are you crazy? She has leprosy, Red. That's why she didn't want to go home. Oh, Skip. Did I do the right thing, Red? It would have meant a leper colony, but he wanted to take care of her and I let him. Did I do the right thing, Red? You did the right thing, Skipper. I... I'm not sure, Red. Forget it. Forget it. 
We'll have a good breeze, Skipper. Yeah. Yeah, she holds. Come on, let's not waste time. Break out the crew, Red. We'll get the hook off the bottom. And stand by for the longboat under power. Right, Skipper. Let's get out of here. The longboat came aboard, and we moved out from the lee of the island and heeled over, close hauled on a starboard tack, under the southeast wind. The bow dipped and rose again in the swell, throwing spray high in the rigging. And then open water, the horizon, and a new course to Port Moresby, island of New Guinea. entry. The schooner Black Parrot. 5.30 p.m. Wind fresh. Sky fair. Sea cresting with high cross swell. Main and fossil reefed. Ship secure for night. Signed, Matthew Kincaid. Master. invited to sail into further adventure with a log of the Black Parrot next week at this same time. Ed Max is heard as Red Gallagher and featured in the cast were Ted Osborne, Lillian Bioff, Harold Hughes, Jack Crucian, and Ben Wright. Music was conducted by Walter Schumann and composed by Nathan Scott. The Black Parrot was produced by Elliot Lewis and directed by Gil Dowd. Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcast. Time. Time for your crime correspondent. Good evening, citizens. This is Larry Mitchell with the latest news of the world. The Underworld Bulletin. Los Angeles, California. Police tonight were close to the solution of the lurid Black Dahlia killing. After several hours of intensive grilling, Harry Forbes, 28, broke down and admitted he had known Elizabeth Short in... The Columbia Broadcasting System presents Crime Correspondent, starring Paul Fries as Larry Mitchell. Police broke up attempted tavern robbery tonight, but a running gun battle ensued in which two policemen were wounded and one bandit was killed. To Officer Ryan, we say, good shooting. Exclusive. Now, it can be told. The dramatic inside story, which I call The Chair for Dino. You saw it in your morning paper, citizen. Read the story of cop killer Dino Cerotti, who barricaded himself in a rooming house on East Lancy Street last night. Kept the police of your city at bay for almost two hours. Yes, it was there in your morning paper. And on page one, you saw the photograph. You saw the figure of a man sprawled out on the front steps. He was Sergeant Frank Vixen of your police department, who died by a killer's gun. And here, by tape recorder, is how he died, as told to your crime correspondent by the witnesses. First, Mrs. Dillon, the landlady. Well, it, it was a few minutes after eight when the two police officers came to the house and asked about Mr. Cerati. He must have heard them because suddenly he opened his door and started shooting. Um, the officer standing next to me, Sergeant Dixon, uh, staggered and stumbled out the front door and fell down the steps. Right away, I knew he was dead. And so, dear citizens, death came to Sergeant Frank Vixen on the steps of an old brownstone house at 721 East Lancy Street. Death 
on a quiet Saturday night. Exactly one hour, 55 minutes later, Lieutenant Steve McCoy of your police department had this story to tell. When Detective Williams, Bernstein, and I started running for the house, we expected Cerrone to start shooting again. <coughs> Excuse me. But he didn't. After we worked our way inside the house and up to the front room where he was, we found him slumped over in a chair. The gun in his hand, there was a bullet hole in his right temple. He was dead. Yes, Dino Cerrone, cop killer, was dead. Dead by his own hand. And up and down the street, the citizens of East Lancy breathed a sigh of relief. Happiest citizen was one Charlie Simmons, who'd been trapped in the rooming house with Killer Cerrone through it all. Well, I was taking a nap in my room here uh, when I heard the shooting. I uh, went out in the hall to see what was going on. That's when I saw Cerrone with a gun. I uh, ducked back into my room and locked the door. And I stayed there until the cops came. Oh, boy, am I sure glad it's over. Yes, it was over, ladies and gentlemen. Over for Charlie Simmons, who'd been trapped in the rooming house. Over for Dino Cerrone, cop killer who was dead. Over for the citizens of East Lancy Street. Ladies and gentlemen, it was not over. Because all the facts were not there in your morning paper. There was more to the death of Dino Cerrone. There were other facts your police department would not, could not reveal. And here are those facts, reported exclusively here. Yes, now it can be told. <laughs> When the peace and quiet of East Lancy Street had been restored, the body of Dino Cerrone delivered to the morgue, there was one question on everybody's mind. Why? Why had the police come to Mrs. Dillon's boarding house in the first place? What had they wanted with Dino Cerrone? Well, that question was on my mind, too, last night when I dropped around police headquarters. I was certain Lieutenant McCoy could give me the answer. Look, Mitchell, I've already told this to every reporter in town. We only wanted to ask Cerrone some questions. Like what? I can't go into that. Now, run along like a good boy, huh? I got things to do. Oh, come on, McCoy. Break down. Cerrone was wanted for questioning. Let it go at that. Kind of touchy tonight, McCoy. Your ulcers again? Beat it, will you? Okay, okay. Oh, uh, who's Joshua Spear? Spear? How'd you know about Joshua Spear? Surprise. My leg man, Jeff Hayes, collared him down at the morgue half hour ago. He got his name before you boys whisked him inside. Uh, maybe Spear went in to take a look at Cerrone, huh? Maybe. Friend? Relative? Call it morbid curiosity. Look, McCoy, what's going on? What's all this hocus pocus? Who's Joshua Spear? What's he to Dino Cerrone? Why don't you go back to the morgue? Maybe the boys there will tell you. Only you don't think they will, huh? Okay, McCoy, I'll give it another try. See you later. Well, Jeff, Spears still inside the morgue? Uh, I don't think so. I've got a hunch the cops slipped him out the back way. How'd you make out with McCoy? I didn't. Oh, uh, did you look up Joshua Spear in the phone book? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Here's the number. But Larry, what's all this runaround we're getting? Maybe I'll tell you. After I call this number. <laughs> I'll get it. Hang around the morgue all day, look up a guy's number. Maybe he knows what he's doing. I don't know. Hello? Mrs. Spear? Yes? Uh, this is an old friend of your husband's. Just got into town. I thought I'd look him up. Well, I'm sorry. He isn't in just now. Oh, that's too bad. Say, uh, how's he doing with his bakery? Bakery? Oh, I'm afraid you've made a mistake. My husband works for the Fallon Construction Company. He... Huh? Mrs. Spear? Who is this? Hello? Hello, who is this? <laughs> well, 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 what happened? Lieutenant McCoy was out there. He grabbed the phone from Mrs. Spear. McCoy? Say, what are the cops up to anyways? Maybe Mrs. Spear said something she shouldn't have. Yeah, like what? Ever hear of the Fallon Construction Company? Well, sure, sure. They're building that new cutoff, the tunnel road up. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, two nights ago, somebody broke into the storage sheds, tied up the night watchman. A guy named Spear, that's right. Spear was the night watchman. And now the cops bring in Spear to have a look at Cerrote. Why? You think Cerrote is the guy who broke into the storage sheds? Could be, Jeff. Come on, let's get back to Mrs. Dillon's boarding house. She might have something interesting to tell us. Well, uh, I can't say I ever really felt at ease, you know, with the likes of Cerrote in my house. 
There was something about him that, well, gave me the creeps. Are you sure, Mrs. Dillon, that you didn't see Sirodi leave the house night before last? No, no, I didn't. But I did see him go out tonight. Oh, well, it was around six, just getting dark. Had two suitcases with him. Oh? Oh, I was so relieved I didn't even ask him for the rent. He owed me a day, you know. But I didn't care. I was so glad he was checking out. As it turned out, he wasn't checking out. Came back about an hour later and stayed in his room. Then around eight, the police showed up. About the suitcases, Mrs. Dillon. Did he... He didn't have them with him when he returned. I see. I don't know what he was doing with those suitcases. All his clothes are still in the room. Now I ask you, Mr. Mitchell, what am I supposed to do with these things? And who's going to pay for my chair? It's ruined, you know, completely ruined. Hmm? Uh, what was that, Miss Dillon? Well, my chair, the one Sorotti was sitting in when he killed himself, covered with blood stains. It's no good to me. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, thank you, Mrs. Dillon. Are you leaving? Sorry to rush off like this. I suddenly remember I have some business to take care of down at police headquarters. That's what I said, Rourke. Get every squad car in that neighborhood on it right away. We haven't got all night. Well, you back again? You find the TNT yet, Lieutenant? What? What did you say? I said you find the TNT. You know, the stuff Sirotti swiped from the Fallon Construction Company night before last. I don't know what you're talking about, Mitchell. Let me try this on you for size, McCoy. You had Joshua Spear brought down here to see if he could identify Sirotti as the guy who broke into the sheds of the construction company the other night, right? Go on, smart boy. Sirotti was the guy, wasn't he? Sure, maybe you had a hunch, a lead on Sirotti. So that's why you send a couple of your boys around to Mrs. Dillon's rooming house. That's when the shooting happened. You're in a weed field, Mitchell. What happened after that, we can all read about in the papers, can't we, McCoy? Except there's one little item you didn't mention to the press. You didn't tell us about the TNT. You didn't find it in Sirotti's room, did you? You're raving. I don't think so. I think it'll make a great story. See you around, Lieutenant. Uh, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Come back here. All right. Let's have it. Why did he steal that TNT, McCoy? I don't know. But there's one thing I do know, Mitchell. If you let that story out, I'll see to it personally that you never get near another microphone as long as you live. Oh, Lieutenant, do you think I'm that stupid? If that story gets out, we'll have the biggest panic on our hands this town has ever seen. So Sirotti did plant the stuff somewhere. Yeah, yeah, here. Here. Take a look at this. We found this piece of paper in Sirotti's hand. Hmm? You'll be hearing from me again, coppers. Too bad you'll never find it in time. McCoy, does this mean... Yeah, yeah, somewhere in this town there's a time bomb, Mitchell, ready to go. We don't know how soon or where it is. It's taken off right now and there's enough TNT in that bomb to blow up an entire city block. <laughs> We'll return to the second act of Crime Correspondent in just a moment. But first, may we remind you of the great lineup of adventure shows on your CBS station every Saturday night. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, followed by Gangbusters, one of the most famous crime shows on the air. Then there's the highly unusual adventure show, Escape. Be sure to listen every Saturday night to your CBS station for High Adventure. Now, back to Larry Mitchell, your crime correspondent. Yes, citizens, last night, somewhere in your city, a bomb had been planted. A bomb that would blow up an entire city block. Only one man knew where it was, Dino Cerotti, cop killer. But he wouldn't, couldn't talk for a very good reason. He was stretched out on a marble slab at the morgue. Why had he planted that time bomb? That was the very big, big question. And there was another important question. Would your police find it in time? Um, what do you think this crazy Sirotti had on his mind, Larry? Revenge, Jeff. What else? Ah, had a grudge against somebody, huh? Any idea who? No. No leads at all, huh? Not a one. Oh, fine, fine. And that bomb's liable to go off any sec. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's the Dillon boarding house up ahead, Jeff. Oh, okay. Hey, hey, isn't that somebody sitting there on the steps? Yeah, Charlie Simmons, the guy who was trapped in the building with Cerrone. <laughs> if I was him, I wouldn't be sitting on my rooming house steps. I'd be out getting drunk. 
Uh, wait for me, Jeff. Oh, and Jeff, if I leave here without you... Sure, sure, I know. I'll follow you. Right. Hi, Charlie. Huh? Oh, Mr. Mitchell. <laughs> Didn't recognize you for a minute. How are you feeling? Still a little shaky. I've been thinking I ought to go out and get drunk. I don't blame you. That was quite an experience you had. If it never happens again, it'll be too soon. Yeah. Oh, is Mrs. Dillon in? Uh, she went out. Be back soon, though. Why don't you wait? Oh, thanks. By the way, I understand this Sorotti wasn't much of a mixer, was he? Mm. That's right. It wasn't a friendly sort. Yeah, the rumors here stayed away from him. Didn't you? No. Maybe it was because I felt sorry for the little guy. He really wasn't so bad. I'm sure he acted kind of crazy at times. Once you got to talk to him and found out what made him tick, he wasn't such a screwball. He was smart. Mm. You get to know him pretty well? <laughs> I didn't say that, Mr. Mitchell. I, I don't think anybody could ever get to know Sorotti real well. He, well, I guess he had a mad on. Somebody must have done him a bad turn once, I guess. He didn't happen to mention who it was, did he? Nope. The police asked the same thing. Yeah, I couldn't remember him ever mentioning anyone by name. So what's, what's going on? The law seems mighty interested in Sorotti. The law is, Charlie. Yeah. I was getting a little chilly here. Uh, let's go back to my room if you want to wait for Mrs. Dillon. Oh, all right. <laughs> Police sure are busy tonight, ain't they? It sure sounds that way. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Mitchell, after you. It's way back at the end of the hall. Oh, thanks, Charlie. I'll turn on the light. Yeah. There we are. Well, make yourself at home, Mr. Mitchell. Sit down. Uh, here, move that chair. Oh, this is fine. <laughs> I'd offer you a little snort on you don't have any stuff around. And Mrs. Dillon don't like for rumors to have liquor on the premises. One reason, I guess, why she didn't take my sister Rody. Hey, you listening? Hmm? Oh, uh, what'd you say? Mrs. Dillon didn't take the Cerrote much. She doesn't like drinkers, you know, and Cerrote always had a bottle in his room. Guess he drank to forget his troubles. You know, it seemed to me like it made him worse instead. Like a week ago when I ran into him on the street. He was plastered. Loosen his tongue, any? Mm, a little. He was griping about how he'd been given the fast shuffle. First, I thought he was talking about the girl. Girl? What girl? Uh, the one in the nightclub. What nightclub? Well, the one he came out of when I ran into him. Say, that's something I forgot to tell the police. Well, <laughs> slipped my mind completely. I knew there was something. Charlie, what about this girl? Who is she? Uh, well, a friend of his, he said. Uh, worked there. A cigarette girl, I think, uh... I can't remember her name. Where is this nightclub? Oh, uh, well, let me see now. It seems like it was back a few blocks near uh, 54th, I think. Charlie, could you find it again? Oh, I suppose so. Say, I hit on something important? You certainly did. Come on, Charlie, the drinks are on me. What'll it be, gents? Oh, uh, scotch and water for me. How about you, Charlie? Well, as long as you're buying. Make that two, bartender. Two scotch and water coming up. Oh, by the way, Charlie, I don't see the cigarette girl around. Yeah. I don't know where she could be. <laughs> you sure this is the place? Well, 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 well. You look like a couple of friendly characters. Let's say we'll have a little drink, huh? Someone you know, Charlie? Never saw him before. Oh, now that's no Sorry, way to Sorry, talk... pal, we're talking business. Do you mind? Oh, all right. If you want to be unfriendly, I can take a hand. Yeah, shove off. I'll get as far away as possible. Way down at the end of this bar. Bartender! Scotch! No! Is that character bothering you? No, no, he's all right. Say, bartender, uh, I don't see the cigarette girl around. That's right, you don't. She quit a couple hours ago. What? She's entitled to quit if she wants to, ain't she? Oh, all right. Where she live? I wouldn't know. Come on, come on, barkeep. You can remember if you tried real hard, huh? Put your money away, Buster. I don't know where she lives. And leave her alone. She's a nice kid. You still want the scotch? Yeah, sure. Okay. Hey, Gus. Gus, take care of the two gents there at the end of the bar, will you? Teachers and water. I gotta make a phone call. Okay, Vic. <laughs> well, you get the phone number, Jeff? <laughs> sure. Sure. How could I miss with that bartender dialing the phone right under my nose? Hey, here it is. That was a good act you put on. <laughs> okay, let's go. Hey, uh, where's friend Charlie? Uh, leave him in the bar? 
Yeah, I think he's in the mood now to tie one on. Come on, let's get down to headquarters. I want McCoy to trace this phone number. Yeah, but McCoy will stick his nose in. I've got another bit of information that'll keep him busy. Come on. When we get that address, we're going to call on a lady. Yes? Hello? Do... Do I know you? No. I'm just curious about a guy called Sorotti. <gasps> you police? Just a reporter, Larry Mitchell. Oh. Look, I, I don't know anything about Sure you do. Oh. oh, get out of here. Give me a break, will you? I don't want to get mixed up in this. You won't if you'll answer a few questions and fast. I'll tell you anything you want to know, only you've got to keep me out of this. Was he your boyfriend? No. No, but he kept coming around to the club bothering me. He wouldn't leave me alone. We, well, we used to go around together back east years ago. Before I got married. Oh, married? Yeah, my husband's been overseas. He's coming back in a week. Look, I don't want to get mixed up in anything. Okay, okay, relax. Sorotti carried a big, fat grudge around with him. He was good and sore at somebody. Who was it? A grudge? Oh, sure. Sure, that'd be a a man named Malcolm. Yeah. J.V. Malcolm. J.V. Ma- Malcolm Wholesale Drugs? Yeah. It was something that happened several years back ago back east. Dino said the company had gypped him. Wait a minute. This doesn't add up. Malcolm lives in New York, doesn't he? Oh, no, he and his family moved out here a week ago. Oh, this is it. You sure? Yeah. Dino told me a couple of nights ago. They're living out on River Road. That's all I wanted to know, honey. I hope you're telling me the truth. Oh, I am. All right. Mr. Mitchell, you promised you wouldn't involve me. Yeah, yeah. You know something, honey? I've already forgotten your name. Good night. Good night. Yes, sir? The name's Larry Mitchell. I have to see Mr. Malcolm right away. Well, I'm sorry, but Mr. Malcolm's in conference. At this time of night, cut it out. Well, I'm Mr. Malcolm's general manager. Perhaps I can... Look, you won't be for long if you don't clear out of this house. See here, is this some sort of a joke? Ever hear of a guy called Sorotti? Sorotti? Why not? Hey, what's going on out there? Those cars pulling into the driveway. The police. I called them ten minutes ago. I've got a good hunch there's a load of TNT somewhere in this house, and we're going to find it before it finds us. TNT? What a great scut. Come along, Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Malcolm's in the library, executive board meeting. Mr. Malcolm's selling his interests, retiring. All the big shots of Malcolm drugs collected under one roof, huh? That figures. Perfect setup for a guy with a grudge. Sorotti had it all figured out. Who is this, this Sorotti? It's a long story, Mr. Gargan. Let's get everybody out of this house first. I'll fill you in on details later. Any luck on your side of the house, Jeff? Not a thing, Larry, no. Oh, what time is it? One o'clock. And that bomb isn't going to wait forever. It's got to be around here, somewhere. Look, the cops have been all over the house half a dozen times. Hey, Mitchell! Uh-oh, here comes the chief of police, and he doesn't look happy. Well, Mitchell, you got any more bright ideas? Oh, now, look, Connolly. You and your hot tip. We've wasted enough time around here. We're pulling out right now. Oh, but, Chief... If you think the bomb is in there, hop to it. You'll have the whole house to yourself. Okay, boys, let's roll. Come on, Larry, let's get back to town, huh? Yeah, sure, sure. The car's right over here. Huh? Where to now? We're not licked yet, Jeff. We better see if we can locate McCoy. Hmm? Want to find out if he made any headway with that tip I gave him. Larry, you think there's really something to that... Bu- hey. What? Hey, isn't that somebody sitting in our car? Well, it looks like a girl. a ride back into town. In the excitement, the others went off and left me. Others? I'm Judy Carson, just one of the Malcolm office slaves. We came out for the conference. <laughs> well, do I get a lift? I live on 76th Street off Shelby. Yeah, sure, it's all right. All right, get in, Jess. Oh. The whole thing sort of turned out to be a big, fat dud, didn't it? Hey, look, honey, uh, don't rub it in, huh? Did I say something wrong? I'm sorry. Okay, Jeff, let's go. That's 
my apartment house up ahead. Uh, okay. You two boys always as talkative. Mm. Oh, we got problems, honey, and not much time to solve. <laughs> well, thanks for the lift anyway. Yeah. Uh-oh. There's the boyfriend. What? We're sitting in his car up ahead. He's going to be a little disturbed, I'm afraid. Had a break of day, though. No, but I told him to pick me up tonight at the warehouse. That's where the meeting was going to be, but Mr. Gargan changed his mind. Decided that the last minute would be nicer to get together at the Malcolm estate. Well, I'm sure your boyfriend will understand. Good night. Night. Thanks again. Oh. All right, Jeff. Let's get... What's the matter? Wait a minute. Huh? Did she say the meeting was scheduled to be held at the warehouse and the plans would change at the last minute? Yeah, yeah, that's right. She... she... Uh-oh. Yeah. Come on, Jeff. Get this thing rolling. Let's get to that warehouse. Okay. Okay, Larry, so here's the warehouse. How do we get in? There's a window over here. Must be the office. Come on. Let's have a look. Give me the flashlight, Jeff. Yeah. See anything in there? Yeah. Yeah. Take a look. There in the center of the floor. Let me see. Uh-oh. Two suitcases. Uh-huh. That's what we've been looking for. We better break in this window. That won't be necessary, gentlemen. Hmm? Hey, look. The office door is open. Let's all go inside. Well, Mr. Gargan. Mr. Mitchell. Jeff, the man with the gun is Mr. Malcolm's general manager. Well, that's fine. Shall we go inside, gentlemen? Go on. Go right on through. Into the warehouse. Anything you say, Gargan. Too bad you got here so soon, Mitchell. I'm afraid you'll have to be detained. For good. Sounds ominous. Well, what's that mean? You've been just a little too clever for your own good, Mitchell. Now, that's far enough. We'll stop here. Yeah, it's beginning to add up, Gargan. Malcolm and his bigwigs weren't scheduled for the big blow after all, were they? You figured that out, have you? Sure. You knew the meeting place had been changed. You changed it. You could have had the TNT moved over to the Malcolm estate, but you didn't. Go on. So it was the warehouse you were after. Insurance? No, no, that wouldn't be it. Maybe, uh, covering up something, huh, Mr. Gargan? <laughs> You're quite good at these things, aren't you, Mitchell? My batting average isn't bad. Oh, company, Mr. Gargan. Open those doors behind you, quickly. All right, come on, Jeff. Let's do as the man says. Uh, yeah, yeah. Larry. Larry, you see who's driving that truck? Yeah, Charlie Simmons. Hello, Charlie. Hello, Mitchell. You know, Charlie, I figured you were in on this somehow. You're just smart, boy. I knew you were the minute you left your room tonight. When you took me over to that bar. Mm, that's so? You wanted me to find that cigarette girl, didn't you? But you were certain I wouldn't reach her until after the explosion. Then when she talked, Sir Rody would be blamed for everything. It would have to do with his grudge against Malcolm. <laughs> he sure is clever, ain't he, Gagan? Only a little scheme backfired. I found the girl too soon. That was a break for me. All right, let's cut out the talk. This has been going on for quite some time, huh, Gargan? Lifting stuff out of Malcolm's warehouse? I said cut out the talk. So now you need a cover-up. Maybe with Malcolm suddenly retiring, there was going to be an inventory, huh? You couldn't let that happen. <laughs> you are crazy. The warehouse had to be destroyed completely. You couldn't trust a fire to do that. You know something, Mitchell? You and your little friend here are going to go up with it. I don't think so. Uh, uh, Stop it! Look out, McCoy! <laughs> All right, hold it, Charlie. You're not going anywhere. Ah, that's a pretty good left you have, Mitchell. Thanks, McCoy. Thanks for showing up. Don't mention it. Look, are we going to stand around here, Gavin? What about those suitcases back there? Relax, Jeff. I've already taken care of them. What? Before Man. Charlie and G <laughs> before Charlie and Gargan arrive. Oh. Okay, Charlie. On your feet. You're not hurt. Uh, let go on me. Looks like your tip paid off, Mitchell. I've been tagging Simmons ever since I got your lead. Took a look at his room. What are you talking about? You overlooked something, Charlie, when you killed Sorotti. What? You did kill him, didn't you, Charlie? 
Maybe Cerrone got panicky, wanted to give himself up. You were afraid he'd spill everything to the police. You're crazy. He shot himself. No, you shot him in your room. My room? Look, the cops found him in his room. That's right, only because you moved him there. You had to move the chair, too, because it was covered with blood. You didn't want anyone to find it in your room. So you just switched chairs, Simmons, took the one in Cerrone's room and brought it back to your own. You didn't think anybody would notice the switch of chairs because all of them in the boarding house are exactly alike. You're crazy. There was one thing you didn't notice, Charlie. There was a small hole, a bullet hole, in the back of the chair you took from Cerrone's room. What? That's right. And when I spotted it in your room, I wondered how it got there. With a gun battle raging at the front of the house, how could a bullet have lodged itself into a chair in your room at the rear of the house? But don't worry, Charlie. You'll get your chair. A hot one. Yes, citizens, it all began with the death of a police sergeant on the steps of a rooming house on East Lancy Street. Ended just a few minutes before your crime correspondent came on the air tonight. The late word from police headquarters... Charlie Simmons has confessed to the murder of Dino Cerrone. And there it is, citizens, the exclusive story. Yes, and society gladly accepts the resignation of members Gargan, Simmons, Cerrone, mourns the loss of gallant police officer Frank Vixen, who lived in your service, died for your protection. Crime Correspondent is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Paul Fries as Larry Mitchell. Script is by Adrian John Doe and original music by Marlon Skiles. Here once again, Larry Mitchell. Next week, Death in an Alley, a woman's laugh, and a silver key open the door to Hangman's House. Till then, and at this very same microphone, this is Larry Mitchell reminding you that truth, like the sun, submits to being obscured, but like the sun, only for a time. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I attest, I insist that Joseph Moriano was wrongly and unjustly convicted of murder. No matter how long it takes, I'm going to prove it. It will be then, and only then, that the defense rests. National Broadcasting Company is proud to present Miss Mercedes McCambridge in The Defense Rests, the first in a new and exciting series of cases from the files of an outstanding woman attorney, Martha Ellis Bryant. When young, attractive Martha Ellis Bryant chose law as a career... She was expected to take advantage of her prominent family background and attend to the minor legal needs of the rich. Instead, she accepted the challenge of defending the defenseless. Joseph Moriano was one of the defenseless. So was the elderly, poorly dressed, grimly determined man who came to her office on the night of May 6, 1950. He opened the door without knocking. Who's there? Excuse me. Yes? I... Uh... I'm looking for Martha Ellis Bryant. I'm Miss Bryant, but the office is closed. I thought that door was locked. And my friends tell me you are the one I should see. Yes, well, it's very late, and I was just leaving. I have a dinner engagement. No, please. I take only a minute. I've come about Joe. Joe? Joseph Mariano. They say he killed a man named Freddy Cellini. You know about this? No, no, I don't think I do. When did it happen? In December, uh, December 10th, 1939. 1939? 
But that was almost 12 years ago. Yes. It happened in a restaurant uh, run by Bella Groton. It's down on State Street. You remember now? No. No, I'm afraid I don't. Yeah. In the back of Bella's restaurant, there was a gambling room. But the police were after Bella, so... On the night of Freddy Cholini was murdered, the back room it was closed up tight. Hi, fella. I, uh, I, I come in and get warm. Yeah, Freddy. Yeah. No, honest. That uh, wind out there really cuts you up. Boys, call us December 10th on record, you know that? Yeah. Ready to close up. It's late. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Um... No customers tonight? Not the kind of customers you mean. Oh, sure. Sure, I know. Gotta be careful, fella. Yeah. Come on out to the kitchen, Freddy. I'll give you something to warm you up. Okay. All right. What makes you so nervous? Nervous? I'm not nervous. What's that? Someone. What's that? Who? There's a man coming in the restaurant. Who? Who? Look, Bella. Some of the boys have been saying I went to the cops about places like Shut this. up, he's coming back here. Yeah, but it ain't true. But they're after me, see? He's got his face covered up. He's got a gun, it's a stick-up. No, no. Guns for me. I was one of them. Look, t- tell him, brother. Tell him I didn't do it. Freddy! 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 So that was the end of Freddy Cellini. Yes, Mr. Bryan. Nobody really know why he was killed. Nobody much cared. He was not a good man. But then uh, one day the police come for Joe Moriano and they say he killed Freddy. Uh, Joe is not at home, only his wife and the two bambinos. The police will look for Joe, but they don't find him. And then uh, Joe, he's uh, here. The police look for him. He goes to a police station to say he did not uh, do it. Yes, and then what happened? Joe is sent to prison for the rest of his life. He's there 12 years now. But he's a no do it. I tell you, he's a not do it. Do you have proof? I am Tony Mariano. Joe is my son. My son not kill Freddy Cellini. My boy is not a murderer. I know. Oh, I see. That's your proof. Well, uh, you not believe me. Mr. Mariano, I'm very sorry. I know it's hard for a father to believe... But if he was convicted and sentenced for life, there must have been good reason. My boy, he don't do it. Some day, somehow he get out. I see to that. I live for nothing else. Why did you wait for 12 years before taking any action? If my friends they tell me it take big money to find a man who really killed Freddy Cellini. Now I got the big money. Five thousand dollar. Five thousand dollar? That is a lot of money. Not if it buy freedom for my boy. Suppose it doesn't. Well, then uh, somehow I get more. Someday, somehow Joe is a get out. Crane speaking. Hello, Judd. Oh, I'm glad you answered the phone. I, I Hello, wait. Don't tell me. Let me guess. It's Martha Ellis Bryant. Yeah. I hate to mention this, old friend, but you stood me up tonight. We had a date for dinner. Yes, remember? I'm terribly sorry, Judd. I'm still at the office. I was detained and I couldn't call. Mm-hmm. Another man? Yes. A man with $5,000. Well, that's the breaks. But how could I hold your interest forever in a mere reporter's salary? Judd, listen oh, to me. I don't think I'm bitter. If I can ever be of help... You I can would... be of help. You can meet me at Bishop's Steakhouse in an hour with some information. Information about what? About a 12-year-old murder. Anyway, after this Freddy Cellini was killed, the police moved in fast. This all had something to do with an official war and small rackets. I guess the cops were afraid his death would cause an outbreak of gang killings. They got a tip on this Moriano. For... Where did it come from? Well, it was never brought out. At least there's nothing on it in the files of the dispatch. 
They just got the tip on him, and at first they couldn't find him. Later, he surrendered. That's right. Voluntarily. Yeah, protesting his innocence every inch of the way. How did you know? I'll tell you in a minute. The point I'm trying to make, Judd, is this. If a man is innocent, he surrenders to clear himself. Otherwise, he lets the cops find him. Mm, maybe. But Moriana was brought to trial. But on what basis? I think I'll have some coffee now. Okay. Eddie? Yeah? Uh, some hot coffee for Miss Bryant. Coming right up. Well, the basis was confused testimony about what he was doing on the night of the murder. He told one story, the wife another. Then, till he had a record, he was on probation. Oh? It was enough to get him life in the state penitentiary. Life? On such flimsy evidence? No. Bella Groton sinks the conviction. She identified him as the killer. She'd have identified anybody as the killer to save her own skin. She was tied up with every petty racket in town. Didn't the court question her testimony? Oh, Bella was nobody's fool. The minute the police put the heat on, she slapped a padlock on her back room and became respectable citizen number one. Yes, but even so... Yeah, that... but it all boils down to this, Marty. The state wanted to make an example of Moriano. Like I told you, they didn't want a repeat of the bloody gang wars of 1932. I still think the sentence Here's was a little... coffee, Miss Bryant. It's nice and hot. Thanks, Eddie. You like the little music, too? Uh, uh, sure, sure. So how about a nickel? Uh, okay. Here. Judd, it was Joe Moriano's father who came to my office tonight. The guy with 5,000 bucks? He said he had 5,000 bucks. He wanted me to use it to get Joe out of the penitentiary. He says the kid didn't do it, that he was framed. Oh, come now, you don't No, he was it... so sincere, so on the level. Why did the old man wait 12 years? It took him that long to get the money. Hmm. Where'd he get it? The money? Yeah. Well, he didn't say. Oh. You'd make a fine reporter. There might be a good story here. Do you have old Moriano's address? Yes, he gave it to me. He wrote it out on a slip of paper, and I put it in my purse. He tried to send here, here it is. Oh, this can't be it. This just says Tony, Box 32. <laughs> Box 32? Oh, baby, did you get taken? Taken? Sure, so sincere, so on the level. If anyone was framed, it was you. Almost. What are you talking about? Just this. The old man's probably a front for young Moriano's mom. They've obviously decided the kid's cooled his heels long enough... So they've cooked up some phony idea to spring him. I still don't see what Marty, that is. Marty, Box 32 is the post office address of a little village out on the flats near the river. You know the place. It's made up of packing crates, burlap, and busted hopes. Oh. Pauper's Paradise. Mm-hmm. Now, how would a guy who lives in Pauper's Paradise get 5,000 bucks? Come on, Judd. Let's find out. <laughs> We just want to know one thing, Mr. Moriano. Where did you get the money? The 5000 Well, here, there. It's uh, not important. Oh, but it is important. Did Joe have it uh, hidden away somewhere? Or is it from some mob who's trying to spring him? A mob? No. No, that the money is mine. For 12 years, I worked for it. Day, night. Finally, I even sell my home. Why do you think I live here, in this place, hmm? And now Joe has no home when he get out. But he get out some day. Somehow. I get him out of it, take the rest of my life. Life? That can be a long, long time. Yes. That's what my boy think when he get a son is for killing he don't do. Life can be a long, long time. <laughs> Marty. Oh, I've been looking through the paper for your yarn on Moriano. What's the matter? Isn't a father's faith in his son even good for a human interest story? Oh, lay off, Marty. I told you how I feel. I don't believe a word the old man said. I still think he's a tool for young Moriano's mom. The setup just isn't on the level. And I'm not going to write a sob story just to glorify a killer. Oh. Have you got proof that he is a killer? They didn't give him life for shooting pool. Besides, he had a record. He was on probation. Sure, I just read the transcript of the trial. He was public enemy number one. He robbed a grocery store. He got two bucks and a record. Look, Marty, can't 
Can you prove he isn't a killer? I don't know. But I'm going to try. NBC is bringing you The Defense Rest, starring Miss Mercedes McCambridge as the outstanding woman attorney, Martha Ellis Bryant. An old man's dogged faith in the innocence of his son is a poor substitute for concrete facts. Still, it was that faith, and that alone, that drove Martha Ellis Bryant to state penitentiary, where she is talking to Joseph Moriano. You say you're not guilty, Joe. But I read the transcript of your trial. And you couldn't prove your innocence then. No, ma'am. My lawyer wasn't much good. He, he didn't even let me understand. He was afraid. I, I don't know why. But Judge Clinton knew I wasn't guilty. He said so. The judge who gave you life? Yeah, in his chambers after the trial. Oh. He said it after the trial. You can check on that, Miss Bryant. He, he'll tell you that it's so. I'm afraid not, Joe. Judge Clinton died several years ago. Are there any other facts that didn't come out in the trial? They took me from one police station to another every few hours. Taking me around the horn, they call it, so my lawyer couldn't get me out. Anything else? No... Only Bella Groton. What about her? Well, the first two times she saw me, she said I wasn't the man. Then all of a sudden, she said I was. Uh-huh. Joe, uh, what about your wife? I'd like to talk to her. Do you ever see her? No, ma'am. She... Rosie's dead, too. She died having a baby about four months after I got sent up. I'm sorry. Where are the children? In the home. I try not to think about him. Hmm. Miss Bryant, do you think you can help me? Do you believe that I'm telling the truth? For your sake, Joe, you better be telling the truth. Hmm? Oh, hi. Hi. I'm sorry to bother you here at the paper, but I want to talk to you for a minute. Oh, sure. Right. Sit down. Well, isn't there somewhere more private? Oh, in a newspaper office? Mm. Well, is this about Moriano? Yeah. I haven't changed my mind, Marty. I swear. No, Judd, listen. He's innocent. I'd swear to it. Yesterday, he passed a lie detector oh, test. What kind of proof is that? I know. It doesn't count legally, but it counts with me. Well, were you able to get any other evidence of his innocence? No, nothing. Not concrete evidence, that is. But the judge who sent him up told him that he wasn't guilty. Well, is that Moriano's word? Or did you check with the judge? I couldn't check with the judge. The judge is dead. Mm. How handy for Moriano. So it's just his word. Yes. And it was just his word that the examining officer tried to get him mixed up on his testimony prior to the trial. They hammered questions at him for hours. Then they forced him to say one thing when he met another. And they dragged him from station to station so that his lawyer couldn't spring him. And then... There was Bella Groton. On two tries, she couldn't identify Joe. But the third time, she did. Uh, what do you mean? That was all, just his word. Didn't you examine the police records? No, that's why I came to see you. I was stopped today from examining those records. Does that mean anything to you? Oh, no, 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 wait, Marty. This conviction was legitimate. It was upheld by the Supreme Court. I don't care if it was. That boy was put behind bars by an administration that had to get a conviction. And couldn't admit it was wrong. For what reason? I don't know. That doesn't interest me. But what does interest me is this. Joe Moriano is doing life for a crime he did not commit. He was a victim of the worst mess of political corruption I have ever you seen. You don't have to write it out for me. No. I want you to write it out for me. Bryant against corruption in Moriano case. The state's attorney's office today endeavored to stop prominent attorney Martha Ellis Bryant from examining records behind the conviction of Joseph Moriano in 1939. Miss Bryant says that she was... Oh, 
Police still withholding vital information, says Martha Ellis Bryant. Today, in another exclusive interview with this paper, the well-known woman lawyer who was attempting to reopen the Moriano case stated that... Hello? Judd, Marty. Oh, I've been waiting for you to call. Gee, how can I ever thank you? Oh, for what? For helping me speak my piece through your paper. Oh, you're always good copy, Marty. Oh, that's nice of you to say so. But the copy has come to an end. What? You're pulling out? On the contrary. I just got to look at those records. I found what I was looking for. Yeah, what? Oh, it's a Lulu Judd. Uh-oh. Judd Stan Ellenson from the state's attorney's office just walked in the outer door. I'll call you. So let's get together at the steakhouse about seven. It's a date. All right. I'll tell you about it then. Miss Bryant? Hello, Mr. Ellenson. Won't you sit down? I won't take much of your time, Miss Bryant. I think you know why I've come. Certainly. It's about the Moriano case. You've been doing a lot of talking. I know, and I gather the state's attorney doesn't care much for the things I've said, which doesn't surprise me. It's not only Hendricks. It's the commissioner and the governor. I've only told the truth. You've been smearing the police force and discrediting the present regime for what happened in another regime. If I have, it's because I want action, Mr. Ellenson. You're going to get it, Miss Bryant. That's why I came here today. That's it, Judd. The governor wants to settle this thing once and for all. He'll set up a special hearing of the pardon board next week, and if I can prove that Moriano is innocent, he'll get a pardon. And if not, I'm to drop the whole matter at once. Yeah. But will you? No. Moriano is innocent. I know it beyond any doubt. Your folks want to order? What? Hmm? Oh, yeah, a hamburger, Eddie. Well done with everything. And coffee, black. Yeah, yeah, I'll have the same. No onions on the burger. Cancel the onions on mine, too. Ah, you sly vixen, you. Well. that be all? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, that's all. No music? No music. Okay, so no music. Now, uh, just what evidence do you have that Moriano is innocent? Well, after I got at those records, I found the bailiff of the court where Joe was tried. Mm-hmm. And he gave me a signed affidavit that Judge Clinton had promised Moriano a new trial. Of course, that evidence is inconclusive. Judge Clinton is dead. Yeah. And the lie detector test is inadmissible. I know. That was just for my own morale. But I do have the picture I lifted from the police record files. What picture? Judd. Bella Groton testified that she didn't see Moriano from the time of the murder until she identified him on the 31st. Well? Well, this picture shows a cop taking Moriano into a precinct station, and with them is Bella Groton. Bella Groton? When was the picture taken? On the 30th, obviously. That's when he surrendered. That's when they were taking him from station to station. Now, Marty, you can't say obviously it was taken then. You have to prove it. But it's right... It could easily have been taken after she identified him. Admit it. You have no evidence. You've got no case. Well, then I've got to find Bella Groton. Where? After all the stuff that's been printed, she would have come out to defend herself. If she were around. She lied. She knows she lied. She's kept hidden so that she wouldn't have to admit it. Then what makes you think you can change her testimony? I'll meet that problem when I get to it. Well, how are you going to get to it? That's what I want to know. Where are you going to find Bella Groton? I got an idea. She used to run around with a fellow who ran a carnival. That's a good place to hide. Those people take care of their own. Yeah, those outfits float all over the country. This one floated, but it was a local affair. But you can't... I'll find it if I got to cover every carnival in the state. And Judd... I'd like you to cover me. What? Talk to your city editor about it. See if he'll give this search a big build-up in the paper. Well, I'll build it. My driver farther into hiding. But it might smoke her out. Anyhow, I gotta risk it. I've only got a week. Never heard of Bella Groton, huh? Thanks anyway, mister. You were my last hope. Hey, sister. You calling me? Come on over and try the game. Just look at them beautiful prizes. And the prize with every toss in the ring. Oh, no, thanks. I don't like to... Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. Play the game. Hey, are you that Bryant dame, ain't you? Yes, why? Uh, I've been reading about you. Step right up, folks. A prize with every toss of the ring. You, uh... You want to know about Bella Groton? Can you tell me? Come on, folks. Don't be bashful. Don't be afraid to take a chance. Come on. Uh, what's in it for me? That depends. 
What do you want? Oh, me? <laughs> I want to marry Sam. She should not have took him from me. I told her she'd pay. Where is she? Oh, I'm with Sam. I quit the carny business months ago. She never thought I'd find her. <laughs> Here you are, sister. The address is on this card. Thanks. Here's something for you. Oh, okay. I am much obliged. Okay, folks. Let's go now. See the beautiful prize. Step up and call the Come in, come in. Who are you, sister? My name is Martha Ellis Get Bryant. out, you're wasting your I time. I want to talk to Bella Groton. Get out, she ain't here. I only want to know if she could have been mistaken when she identified Joe Moriano. I said she it ain't here. It won't do any good to hide her. I intend to find her, you know. Oh, that's a good story. Get out. Now, look. You caused me enough trouble. I don't see why it's Bella I want, and she's caused a little trouble herself. I want her to change her testimony about Joe Moriano. I want her to tell the truth. She'll never change her testimony. You get that? Never. Well, why not? Surely she... Okay, sister, okay. I'll tell you why not. Last week, Bella took poison. She's dead? Yeah, she's dead. Out in the graveyard. Now, get out of here. All right. I'm going. I didn't want you to read about it from the paper, Mr. Moriano. That's why I came out here to tell you. But I'll have to call off the hearing. And you better take that money, get yourself another house. I, I, I still don't understand. Mr. Moriano, there's not a chance in the world to get Joe a pardon. No chance? No chance. Without Bella Groton, there's nothing I can do. I'm going before the pardon board in an hour and request that the petition be withdrawn. My, my, my joy is to not get out. Not ever. I'm sorry, Mr. Mariano. Sorrier than I can say. Miss Bryant. What? Oh, the State Board of Appeals, Al. 1911 Hanover Street. Okay. Hey, I've just been reading the afternoon paper. You seen it? No. Nope. A good article in about a forgery. Yeah. Yeah, the, the cops broke a forgery case by enlarging some writing on a check a thousand times. They proved. Hey, wait a that... minute. Enlarging a thousand times? Yeah. What chance has the guy got to Hey, this picture I've got of Bella and Joe together. Al, take me to the police lab. Fast as you can. The special hearing of the Board of Pardons is now in session. Where is Miss Bryant? Well, is anyone here to speak for Miss Bryant? I... Gentlemen, I'm very sorry to be late. I apologize. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Miss Bryant? May I address the board? You may. Thank you. As you know, I've been assembling evidence in the Moriano case. Such debatable items as a lie detector test, a signed affidavit from the bailiff of the court where Moriano was tried... An affidavit saying that Judge Clinton had promised the boy a new trial. Well, there we... I know you're unable to accept these things. You want only evidence. But sometimes, the weight of evidence, just because it's on the record, is heavy enough to crush the truth. We'll discuss the shortcomings of our judicial system some other time. Yes, I know. All you want are facts. And, gentlemen, I have them. About an hour ago, I uncovered conclusive evidence in support of Moriano's petition. You may produce the evidence. Well, gentlemen... Bella Groton is dead. A suicide. What? But she was the one responsible for Moriano's conviction, and I know that she lied. Can you prove that? Moriano was arrested on December the 30th at 5 a.m. He was not booked until 6 p.m. of the 31st, a day and a half later. That often happens. I know, but I ask you to look at this picture. It shows Joe Moriano and Bella Groton... Entering a precinct police station together. Well? If I prove that this picture was taken on December 30th, 
the day before Bella Groton identified Moriano at the police lineup, what then? In that event, we might be obliged to render a favorable decision. That's all I wanted to know. The police lab has enlarged a section of this picture for me. Oh, a close-up of Bella Groton? No, it's a close-up of a clock on the building across the street from Bella Groton. Will you all look at it, gentlemen? Yes, let me see it. It proves that Bella Groton did see Joe Moriano on the 30th. It proves that Joe Moriano was convicted on perjured testimony. Gentlemen, look at the face of that clock. There's a mechanical date line right across the middle. The sign above it says, this date is always correct. And the date, gentlemen, is December 30th, 1939. Members of the pardon board, the defense rests. You have been listening to The Defense Rests, starring Miss Mercedes McCambridge, the first in a new and exciting series of cases from the files of an outstanding woman attorney, Martha Ellis Bryant. Mercedes McCambridge may currently be seen in Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's Inside Straight, Warner Brothers' Lightning Strikes Twice, and the United Artists' production The Scarf, currently having its premiere at the Park Avenue Theater in New York. The Defense Rests was written by Cameron Blake, produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Your announcer is... The WOR Special Features Division presents a program in observance of the annual award by the Drama Critics Circle of New York to the best play of the season. The award for the 1947-48 season went to Tennessee Williams' play, A Streetcar Named Desire. And on this program, you will hear several scenes from this prize-winning production with Jessica Tandy, Kim Hunter, Marlon Brando, and Carl Molden playing the roles they created on Broadway. Mrs. Irene M. Selznick, producer of the play, is here with us. And Elia Kazan, who directed the drama, will accept the award for Mr. Williams, who is in Italy. The presentation will be made by John Mason Brown, distinguished critic and president of the Drama Critic Circle. Mr. Brown. Let the first robin come bob, bob, bobbing along, and all of us can be certain, even in the contemporary world, of one thing. The season for prize-giving is upon us. There are Americans... More loved and less abused. More loving and less abusive, too. But even we, regardless of our mounting ages, seem susceptible to the spring. For then it is that we meet, as we did on Wednesday last, at the Algonquin, to vote upon what, in our group opinion, has been the season's best play on Broadway. Our sessions in the past have often been stormy enough to make the Executive Council of the UN look to its laurels. Last Wednesday, however, we met without raised voices, bloody noses, pierced hearts, or even wounded feelings. A group of Quakers could not have been friendlier or less warlike. This year, it was Terence Rattigan's moving and well-written drama, The Winslow Boy, which was chosen as the season's best foreign play. The circle's choice for the season's best American play was A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. It is the second time a drama by Tennessee Williams has been honored by the reviewers, the first time being in 1945 with the Glass Menagerie. A Streetcar Named Desire is a fascinating and unflinching study of the disintegration of a southern school teacher who has not confined her professional activities to the classroom. This school teacher is a woman who, well, in deference to the radio's extreme sensibilities, can perhaps most safely be described as having lost her amateur standing. It is her descent into madness that Mr. Williams follows. He writes of her and her days in New Orleans with both force and sensitivity. Mr. Williams passes no moral judgment on his schoolteacher. He does not condemn her. He allows her to destroy herself and invites us to watch her in the process. The circle is proud to uh, bestow its prize again upon Tennessee Williams. He, alas, is in Europe at this moment. 
As a matter of fact, just this morning from Rome, the Critics Circle has received from Mr. Williams a cable reading to all of you my deepest and most heartfelt thanks, which I will try to express in good work since I cannot in words. But though Tennessee Williams is absent, the Circle is proud to have Ilya Kazan present to accept its award in Mr. Williams' name. Mr. Kazan is one of the finest directors our theater knows. It was he, after all, who directed All My Sons, which won last year's Critics Prize. His direction of this year, on a streetcar named Desire, is as sensitive and creative as Mr. Williams' writing of the play. Mr. Kazan. Thank you, John. Of course, I'm most sorry that Tennessee himself can't be here to be honored. On the other hand, I do have an opportunity to say a few things about him that I could never say to him or even if he were listening. You may not know it, but every director secretly prides himself on his ability, generally unappreciated, he believes, as a play constructionist or script expert. I was no exception. But unfortunately, in the differences that Tennessee and I had in rehearsal, most of which time has mercifully erased from my memory, experiment in the first audience proved him right too often for my comfort. I also found that while I didn't know as much as I thought about playmaking, he knew considerable about staging plays, particularly his own. I found him an inexhaustible source of stage business. I finally arranged to keep him tethered to the footlights and have his food and liquid refreshment brought him to him. I wanted him there constantly and used him as a cook uses a superbly stocked larder. The significance of this might escape you unless I add that too often the only thought the director has for the author after a couple of days of his company at rehearsals is, oh, please, where can I send this man for two weeks while I stage his play? But not so here. Tennessee knows as if by instinct that the theater is the collective expression of many arts and crafts, and it conveys what it does to the audience through a full repertoire of these means. Words, of course, but action as much, and also music, props, paint and light, sound and color. And so I'm sure today Tennessee would want me to express on his behalf his great debt not only to the actors who are seen and applauded, but to other craftsmen as well. To Joe Mazzina for a setting which successfully and superbly houses both the action and the spirit of Streetcar Named Desire. And to Lucinda Ballard, who found just the right thing to put on the back of each actor to make him meaningful and still humble and right. And now, speaking for myself, allow me to note that for the second year in succession, a young and comparatively fresh playwright, playwright has been honored in this forum. Both Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams are at the threshold of their careers. And it makes me particularly happy that our New York theater is so richly replenishing itself, is so fertile and growing. It makes me proud to be part of it. Thank you, Mr. Kazan. The circle is also pleased today to have Mrs. Irene M. Selznick present. Mrs. Selznick had the discernment and the courage to produce A Streetcar Named Desire. We would like to hear from you, Mrs. Selznick. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I'm humbly and gratefully aware that my brief career in the theater has been blessed with great good fortune. First, that rare artist, Tennessee Williams, entrusted me with the production of A Streetcar Named Desire, which was a true privilege. Then to secure the extraordinary talents of Ilya Kazan made it seem that the guards of the drama were watching over Streetcar. To prove it, they brought us the brilliant performances of Jessica Tandy, Marlon Brando, Kim Hunter, Carl Malden, others of our cast, and the splendid contributions of Joe Milzina and Lucinda Ballard. For all of them, and for the many others to whom the production was a labor of love, I want to express the happiness and appreciation we feel to be permitted to share in this tribute to Tennessee. To you, Mr. Brown, and your eminent colleagues, I must speak bluntly. I simply love the critics of this year. Thank you, Mrs. Helsnick. And now to the play itself, with Mr. Kazan serving as narrator. The Sabbath being the Sabbath, and the radio being the radio, A Streetcar Named Desire is not an easy drama to present on the air of a Sunday afternoon. That is one of its virtues. I trust that what follows will not be too inhibited or diluted to suggest the full strength and power of a streetcar named Desire when it is seen on the stage. Blanche Dubois has come from Laurel, Mississippi to visit her sister Stella in New Orleans. To reach Stella's home, Blanche has taken the streetcar named Desire 
which bangs up one narrow street of the French Quarter and down another. She finds her sister living in a shabby two-room apartment with her Polish-American husband, Stanley Kowalski. Stanley has no background and little education, but he does possess a strong animal magnetism. And Stella is so deeply in love with him, in spite of the contrast between them. Oh, stop, Tutti Frutti. Oh, Stanley. Hey, what's all this monkey doing? Uh, Stan, I'm taking Blanche to Galatoire's for supper and then to a show because it's your poker night. Hey, how about my supper? I'm not going to Galatoire's tonight. I put your cold plate on ice. Well, I ain't this just standing. I- I'm going to try to keep Blanche out till your poker party breaks up because she's very sensitive and I don't know how she'd take it. Oh, you better give me some money. Yeah, help yourself. Hey, where is she? She's in the bathroom soaking in a hot tub to quiet her nerves. She is terribly upset. My uh, over what? Well, she's been through such an ordeal. Yeah, well, that singing doesn't sound like she was upset. Well, she is. Stan Blanche says we've lost Belle Reeve. Uh, what do you mean? A place in the country? Mm-hmm. Well, how? Oh, it had to be sacrificed or something. Yeah, well, uh, let's have a gander at the bill of sale. I haven't seen any. Uh, what do you mean? She didn't show you no papers, no deed of sale, or nothing like that? Well, it seems like it wasn't sold. Well, then what was it, then? Give away the charity? She'll hear you. Well, I don't care if she hears me. Let's see the papers. There weren't any papers. She didn't show any papers. I don't care about papers. Uh, have you ever heard of the Napoleonic Code, Stella? No, Stanley. I haven't heard of the Napoleonic Code. No, all right. Code. Will you just let me enlighten you on a point or two? Yes. Now, in the state of Louisiana, we have what's known as the Napoleonic Code, according to which that what belongs to the wife belongs to the husband also, and vice versa. Like, you know, it looks to me like you've been swindled, baby. And when you get swindled on the Napoleonic Court, I get swindled, too, and I don't like to get swindled. Look, there's plenty of time to ask her questions later. But if you do now, she'll only go to pieces again. I don't understand what happened to Belle Reed, but you don't know how ridiculous you're being when you suggest that my sister or I, anyone else of our family, could have perpetrated a swindle. Now, where's the money if the place was sold? Not sold. Lost. Lost. You're lost, huh? Yeah, no, no. Look at, look at all these clothes in her trunk. Well, you think she got the, them out of teacher's pay? Hush, Dan. Well, will you look at these fine feathers and furs? Right there, what is that? This is a solid gold dress, I believe. Now, look at this one. Oh, please, Dan. And, and what's this here? Genuine fur fox pieces are half a mile long. Uh, where, uh, where are your fox pieces, Stella? That's ridiculous, Dan. Uh, what do we got here in this jewel box? We got pearls, ropes of them. Well, now, what is this, sister? Is a deep-sea diver? Stanley, you don't know what you're Yeah, bracelets, solid gold. And where are your pearls and gold bracelets, Be Stella? Be still, Stanley. Are you kidding? Like, the, here, here's your plantation or right here, what's left of it. Oh, you've no idea how stupid and hard you're being. I'm going outside and get some air. Oh, well, go ahead. You come on out with me while Blanche is getting dressed. Look, uh, since when do you give me orders? Are you going to stay here and insult her? darn tootin' I'm going to stay here. Look, Stan, try to understand and be nice to her. Admire her dress and tell her she's looking wonderful. That's important to Blanche, her little weakness. Yeah, yeah, I get the idea. Hello, Stan. Hi, Blanche. Here I am, all freshly bathed and scented and feeling like a brand new human being. Well, that's good. Where's Stella? She's outside getting some air. How do I look? Look okay. Many thanks. Well, looks like my trunk has exploded. Yeah, me and Stella was helping you unpack. Well, you certainly did a fast and thorough job of it. Well, it certainly looks like you raided some stylish shops in Paris. Yes, clothes are my passion. Yeah, what does it cost for a string of furs like that? Why, those were a tribute from an admirer of mine. Well, he must have a lot of admiration. In my youth, I excited some admiration. But look at me now. Would you think it possible that I was ever considered to be attractive? You look so okay. I was fishing for compliments, Stanley. Look, no, I don't go in for that stuff. What stuff? Compliments to women about their looks. I'm, I never met a woman yet that didn't know she was good looking or not without being told. You know, and there's some of them that give themselves credit for more than they've got. You know, some men are took in by this Hollywood glamour stuff, and there's some men that are not. I'm sure you belong in the second category. 
That's right. I cannot imagine any witch of a woman casting a spell over you. That's right. You're simple, straightforward, honest. But on the primitive side, I should think. To interest you, a woman would... Lay her cards on the table. Well, I never cared for wishy-washy people. That's why when you walked in here last night, I said to myself, my sister's married a man. Of course, that was all I could tell about you at the moment. Why, Ange, in the state of Louisiana, there's such a thing as the Napoleonic Code. They, according to which whatever belongs to my wife is also mine and vice versa. Oh. Cards on the table. Well, that suits me. I know I fib a good deal. After all, a woman's charm is 50% illusion. But when a thing is important, I tell the truth. And this is the truth. I haven't cheated my sister. Nor you, nor anyone else, as long as I'm... All right, where are the papers? In your trunk? Everything I own is in that trunk. I keep my papers mostly in this tin box. Uh, What's them underneath? Those are love letters. Yellowing with antiquity. All from one boy. Let me see them. (gasps) Give those back to me. Now, I'm just going to have a look at these first. Uh, The touch of your hand. Don't pull that stuff. Well, what are they? Poems. A dead boy wrote them. I heard him the way you'd like to hurt me, but you can't. I'm not young and vulnerable anymore, but my young husband was. Never mind about that. Give them back to me. Well, take them. Well, what's so special about them? I'm sorry. Everyone has something he won't let others touch because of their, their intimate nature. Here are the papers you want. No. Uh, who was that? It's Ambler and Ambler. The firm that made loans on the place. Well, then it was lost on a mortgage. That must have been what happened. No, I don't want no if ands, or buts. Now, what is the rest of them papers? There are thousands of papers stretching back hundreds of years affecting Bell Reeve. I hereby endow you with them. Take them, peruse them, commit them to memory. I think it's wonderfully fitting that Bell Reeve should finally be this bunch of old papers in your big, capable hands. <laughs> Weeks pass, and Blanche has become a fixture in the Kowalski household, with tension constantly mounting between her and Stanley. Knowing she must find a way out, Blanche clutches eagerly at the possibility of a romance with Harold Mitchell, a young man who works with Stanley. One evening, Blanche and Mitch return after an evening at an amusement park. I I guess it must be pretty late, and you're tired. Mitch... See if you can locate my door key in this purse. When I'm so tired, my fingers are all thumbs. Here, is this it? No, honey, that's the key to my trunk, which I'm as soon be packing. Why, you mean you're leaving here soon? I've outstayed my welcome. Oh, is, is this one it? Eureka! Honey, will you open the door? Well... I guess you want to go now. Can I, uh, I mean, well, can I kiss you goodnight? Why do you always ask me if you may? Well, I don't know whether you want me to or not. Why should you be so doubtful? Well, that night when I parked by the lake and kissed you, you told me that... it wasn't the kiss I objected to. I liked the kiss very much. Honey, you know as well as I do that a single girl, a girl alone in the world, has got to keep a firm hold in her emotions or she'd be lost. Lost? Uh, I like you to be exactly the way that you are. Because in all my experience, I have never known anyone like you. <laughs> Are you laughing at me? Oh, no, 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 honey. I, I'm not laughing at you. <laughs> Come on in. The Lord and Lady of the House have not returned. We have a nightcap. Let's see the lights off, shall we? Uh-huh. Uh, you, you want a drink? I want you to have a drink. You've been so anxious and solemn all evening. We've both been anxious and solemn. And now for these last few remaining moments of our lives together, I want to create one of you. I'm lighting the candle. Oh, that's good. We're going to be very bohemian. We're going to pretend that we're sitting in a little artist cafe on the left bank of Paris. Here. Here, I found some liquor. Just enough for two shots without any dividends, honey. There. Oh, oh boy. That's good. Sit down. Why don't you take off your coat and loosen your collar? Oh, no, no, no I... Well, I... 
All right, if you say so. This is a nice coat. What kind of material is it? Oh, it it's a very lightweight alpaca. Oh, lightweight alpaca. Uh, a, a man with a heavy build like mine has to be careful of what he puts on him so he don't look too clumsy. Well, you're not the delicate type. You have a massive bone structure and a very impressive physique. I thank you. Blanche. Blanche, guess how much I weigh. Oh, I'd say in the vicinity of the 180. Oh, no, no, no. I weigh 207 pounds, and I'm six feet one and one half inches tall on my bare feet. Oh. Without shoes on, and that is what I weigh stripped. My goodness, that's awe-inspiring. <laughs> well, my weight is not a very interesting subject to talk about. What is yours? You guess. Well, let me lift you. Oh, Samson. Well, go on, lift me. Uh, oh, well? My, you're light as a feather. <laughs> well, you may put me down now. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> well, unhand me, sir. Oh, Blanche. Now, now, uh, Mitch, Mitch. No, Blanche. Mitch, just because Danny and Stella are not home is no reason you, should, you, you shouldn't behave no, like a I, gentleman. I, I tell you, Blanche, I just... Just give me a slap whenever I step out of bounds. Well, that won't be necessary. Why, you're a natural gentleman, one of the very few there are left in the world. No, I... No, I, I, I don't want you to think that I'm severe or old maid school teachers or anything like that. It's, it's just, well... Well, what? I guess it's just that I have... Old-fashioned ideals. Oh. Oh. Mm. Oh. Where's Stanley and Stella tonight? Oh, they've gone out with Mr. and Mrs. Hubble upstairs. Uh, you're an old friend of Stanley's. Well, we was together in the 241st. Has he talked to you about me? Well, why do you ask that? Well. Don't you get along with him? That is putting it mildly. If it weren't for Stella about to have a baby, I wouldn't be able to endure things here. Well, he isn't nice to you? He's insufferably rude. He goes out of his way to offend me. No, Blanche. Yes, honey? Blanche, how old are you? Why do you want to know? Well, I... I talked to my mother about you, and she said, How old is Blanche? You talked to your mother about mm -hmm, you? Yes. Why? Well, I, I told her how nice you were, and I liked you. Were you sincere about that? Oh, you know I was. Well, why did your mother want to know my age? Well, um, my mother is sick. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that badly. Well, she won't live long, maybe just a few months. Oh. You know. Well, she worries because I'm not settled. She she wants to see me settle down before she... You love her very much, don't you? I think you have a great capacity for devotion. You'll be lonely when she passes on, won't you? I understand what that is. To be lonely? I loved someone, too, and the person I loved, I lost. Dead? Mm -hmm. A man? He was a boy. Just a boy when I was a very young girl. When I was 16, I made this discovery. Love. All at once and much, much too completely. It was like you suddenly turned a blinding light onto something that had always been half in shadow. That's how it struck the world for me. But I was unlucky. And with his death, the searchlight that had been turned on the world was turned off again. And never for one moment since has there been any light stronger than this kitchen candle. Blanche, you need somebody. And I need somebody, too. Well... Could it be you and me? It could be. Oh, Mitch. Sometimes there's, there's heaven so quickly. Several weeks pass. And the relations between Stella and Blanche get progressively worse, in spite of Stella's efforts to keep them on a friendly basis. But as Stanley comes home to, di to dinner one night, he finds Blanche, as usual, in the bathroom, soaking in a hot tub, and singing to herself. It's only a paper moon, shining over the, well, the temperature is 100 on the nose, and she's soaking herself in a hot tub. She says it cools her off for the evening. 
Well, I got the dope on your big sister, Stella. Stanley, stop picking on Blanche. Hey, you know, she has been feeding us a pack of lies here. No, I don't, and I don't want to hear any more. She has, however. But now the cat's out of the bag. I found out some things. What things? Yeah, the things I already suspected, but now I've got the proof from the most reliable source, which I have checked on. Well, please tell me quickly just what you think you found out about my sister. <clears throat> okay. Line number one. All this squeamishness that she puts on there. That, uh, you should know the line that she has been feeding to Mitch. You know, that he thought that she'd never even more kiss by a fella. You know, Sister Blanche is no lily. What have you heard and who from? Our supply man down at the plant has been going through your town of Laurel for years and he knows all about her. Yeah, and everybody else in the town of Laurel knows all about her. That she is as famous in law as if she was the president of the United States. <laughs> Now, this supply man stops at a hotel called the Flamingo. What about the Flamingo? She stayed there, too. My sister lived at Belle Reve. Uh, this is after she let the place slip to her lily white fingers. She moved to the Flamingo, which is a second class hotel, and it has the advantages of not interfering with the private and social life of the personalities there. Now, the Flamingo is used to all kinds of goings on, see? But even the management of Flamingo was impressed by Dame Blanche. In fact, they were so impressed that they requested her to turn in a room key, honey, for permanently. And this happened a couple of weeks before she showed here. A few minutes later, Blanche finally appears for dinner. And Stanley tells her she is to pack her things and go back to Laurel the following day. And he gives her a bus ticket he has bought for her. Later that evening, he takes his wife to the hospital as the baby is expected momentarily. While he is gone, Mitch shows up and tells Blanche in no uncertain terms that he's through with her. And why? As soon as he is gone, Blanche feverishly searches through her wardrobe. And when Stanley returns, he finds her dressed in an elaborate but crumpled white satin evening gown, preening herself before her mirror. Stanley. Yeah, it's me, Blanche. How's my sister? She's doing okay. How's the baby? Well, the baby won't come before morning, so they told me to go home and get a little shut-eye. Does that mean that we're to be alone in here? Yeah, it's just you and me, Blanche. Hey, what have you got all them fine feathers on for? I received a telegram from an old admirer of mine. Oh, yeah? Anything good? I think so. An invitation. To what? A cruise of the Caribbean on a yacht. Well, what do you know? I've never been so surprised in all my life. I guess not. Came like a bolt out of the blue. Uh, uh, who did you say it was from? An old bow of mine. Oh, sure. I want to give you them white fox fur, please. Mr. Shep Huntley. I wore his fraternity pin my last year at college. I hadn't seen him again till, till last Christmas. I ran into him on Biscayne Boulevard. And then, just now, this wire invited me on a cruise of the Caribbean. The problem was clothes. I yeah. tore into my tongue to see what I had that was suitable for the tropics. Well, it just goes to show you, Blanche, you never know what's coming. When I think how divine it's going to be to have such a thing as privacy once more, I could weep with joy. Yeah, this uh, millionaire isn't going to interfere with your privacy now. This man is a gentleman. He respects me. What he wants is my companionship. A cultivated woman, a woman of intelligence and breeding, can enrich a man's life immeasurably. Physical beauty is passing, a transitory possession. The beauty of the mind and, and richness of the spirit and tenderness of the heart. I have all these treasures locked in my heart. I think of myself as a very, very rich woman. But I have been foolish, casting my pearls... A swine, upon... huh? Yes, swine. Fine. And I'm thinking not only of you, but of your friend, Mr. Mitchell. Mm -hmm. He came to see me this evening. He dared to come here in his work clothes. He repeated slander to me, vicious stories that he'd gotten from you. I gave him his walking papers. Oh, you did, When huh? he came back, he returned with a box of roses, begging my forgiveness. He implored me to forgive him. But some things are not forgivable. Deliberate cruelty is not forgivable. Uh, was this before or after you got the telegram from Texas? What telegram? No. No, after. Yeah. As a matter of fact... Yeah, as a matter of fact, there wasn't no wire at all. No. 
And there isn't no millionaire. And Miss Stink come back with roses because I know where he is. There's no darn thing but imagination and lies and conceit and tricks. And uh, look at yourself. Now, look at yourself in a sworn-out Mardi Gras outfit running for 50 oh. cents of some rag picker. Please. You know, I, I've been on the youth from the start, and not once did you pull the wool over this boy's eyes. You come in here and you sprinkle a place with powder and spray perfume, you stick a paper lantern over the light bulb. And lo and behold, the place has turned into Egypt, and you're the queen of the Nile, sitting on your throne, <laughs> swilling down my licking. You know what I say? Ha-ha! <laughs> did you hear what I said? Ha-ha-ha! <laughs> I'm going into the bathroom and get ready for bed. Operator, 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 give me long distance, please. I, I want to get in touch with Mr. Shep Hunty of Dallas. He's so well known, he doesn't require any address. Just ask anybody. No, wait, wait, please. I, I No, I couldn't find it right now. Please, please understand. No, wait, operator, operator, never mind long distance. Get me Western Union. There isn't time to... Western Union. Union, take down this message. In desperate, desperate circumstances. Help me. Caught in a trap. Caught... Oh, Stanley. What's the matter? Do I interfere with you? You know, come to think of it, maybe you wouldn't be bad to interfere with Stay me. back. Don't you come toward me another step you or... You know what? Something awful will happen. It will. What kind of act are you what putting kind... on now? Don't, don't. I, I'm in danger. <laughs> you smash the bottle for? So I could twist the broken ends in your face. I bet you would do that. I would. I will. Oh, you want some rough house, huh? All right, let's have a little rough house. Not that bottle top, you tiger. Rough it. We've had this state with each other from the beginning. The WOR Special Features Division has brought you the presentation of the annual Drama Critics Circle Award to the best play of the 1947-1948 season, A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. The award was made by John Mason Brown, president of the Drama Critics Circle. The entire broadcast was under the direction of Jock McGregor. You also heard Mrs. Irene M. Selznick, the producer, and several scenes from the play. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I am Judge A.J. Adams. For almost 40 years, I presided over one of the highest criminal courts in the land, and I have learned, above all, that no crime is perfect. <laughs> Judge. Each week at this time, Judge A.J. Adams solves another nearly perfect crime. Relying on the fact that mistakes are repeated, that criminal motives do not vary, the judge, now retired, draws upon his vast courtroom experience to fight another battle for justice. <laughs> This evening, just outside the palatial home of Mrs. Agatha Winters, one of the town's wealthiest widows. Mrs. Winters lives with her stepson, Ronald, and her secretary, Catherine Shaw. A high, solid brick wall surrounds the Winters' estate, cutting it off from the rest of the neighborhood. It's 9.30 when a long, sleek convertible pulls up the driveway in front of the mansion and stops. The car door opens, and a young man steps out. He starts up the stairs toward the house as a voice from out of the shadows says, Ronnie! What? Ronnie! Wait. Julie, what are you doing here? I had to talk to you. Ronnie, why haven't you been to the nightclub to see me? It's been almost a week. I've told you, Julie, it's no use. Ronnie, have you forgotten? We were going to be married. Well, you're only making this more difficult. I'm sorry if I sound brutal, but there's no other way. But, Ronnie, you, you can't end this. Good with night, Julie. Judge. Or perhaps I should say goodbye. Ronnie. Ronnie. Ronnie? Oh, hello, Catherine. Is my stepmother still up? No, she's retired for the evening. Oh. Well, I have some news for her. 
She won't have to worry about Julie Young anymore. I know she'll be pleased to hear that. Your stepmother did worry, so... Yes, I'm sure she did. Good night, Catherine. Good night, Ronnie. It's good to be home. It's stuffy in this room. I'll just open the window. It's a beautiful night. Hello. Looks as though there's someone down in the garden. Who's there? Who's... Oh, it's you. Hey, wait. Put down that... It is 30 minutes later. Not many miles away, sitting in his study, is Judge A.J. Adams. Once one of the nation's most fearless fighters against crime, Judge Adams is now retired. However, from time to time, the good judge is pleased to lend his brilliant judicial mind to the cause of justice when called upon by the police. Now the telephone just outside Judge Adams' study rings suddenly. A short, plump woman of about 50 wipes her hands on her apron and walks towards the phone. She is Mrs. Maloney, Judge Adams' faithful housekeeper. She lifts the receiver. Judge Adams' residence? Mrs. Maloney, this is Lieutenant Tommy Ross of the police department. Oh. I wonder if I could disturb the judge for a moment. Well, he's resting in his study, Lieutenant. Can it not wait till the morning? I'm afraid it can't, Mrs. Maloney. This time it's really important. Would you call him to the phone? Well, seeing as how you're an old friend, Lieutenant, but next time... Mrs. Maloney. I'll get him right away. It's them police again, Judge. Bothering you at all hours. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, Mrs. Maloney. I'll take it on this extension. Uh, Judge Adams speaking. Hello, Judge. This is Tommy Ross. Well, hello, Tommy. What can I do for you? Judge, does the name Agatha Winters register with you? Oh, indeed it does. Mrs. Winters represents one of our very prominent families. In fact, she is the leader of the reform movement in the coming city elections. Exactly, Judge. Mrs. Agatha Winters is chairman of the Citizens Committee Against Crime. Yes. Right now, she's a murder suspect. She what? If this thing breaks in the newspapers, it'll blow the lid off City Hall. Now, uh, Tommy, suppose you try being a little more explicit. Uh, Judge, I called to ask if you'd mind coming over to the Winters' home right away. I could use your help. You see, Mrs. Agatha Winters' stepson, Ronnie, has just been murdered. Oh, here you are, Judge Adams. Well, I'm sorry I took so long, Tommy. <laughs> the old car doesn't start as easily as it used to. Uh, Judge, perhaps we could talk in the library. You are the policeman, Lieutenant. Now, about 45 minutes ago, Ronnie Winters was shot through the heart. As best we can tell, he was standing at the window of his bedroom upstairs when it happened. There were no powder burns on the body, and from the angle of the wound, it's our opinion young Winters was shot from the garden below. He was at home alone? Oh, no. Now, there were two other people in the house. His stepmother, Mrs. Winters, and her secretary, Catherine Shaw. Now, Mrs. Winters claims she was in bed asleep at the time. And Catherine Shaw tells me she was in the kitchen making some coffee. Mm -hmm. Well, then neither can alibi for the other. Right, Judge. Uh, Tommy, what about the murder weapon? I was afraid you were going to ask me that. Oh? It can't be found. I've got ten men on this case, Judge. They've searched every inch of the grounds in the house. The gun that killed Ronnie Winters has disappeared. I see. Now, tell me, Tommy, who telephoned the police? Mrs. Winters. She says she was awakened by the shots and called us immediately. Yes. And luckily, there was a squad car patrolling only two blocks away. They arrived here within minutes after the shooting. Then there is an excellent chance that the murderer at this moment is on the Winters' estate. All huh? right, Judge. Yes. Neither Mrs. Winters nor Miss Shaw heard a car leave after the shooting, and the grounds around this mansion cover almost five acres. Also, I've got four squad cars patrolling the area bordering the Winters' home. No one has been seen leaving the estate. Well, Lieutenant Ross, I must say you are doing a thorough job. <laughs> Coming from you, Judge Adams, that means something. <laughs> now, there's just one more thing. Yes, Tommy? If the newspapers get wind of this murder, they're going to spread the Winters family all over the front page, Judge. You know what that'll do to this town's reform movement. Well, with Mrs. Winters a murder suspect, I should imagine it would be a severe blow. Well, that's why I called you, Judge. We're working against time. Tommy, this matter affects our entire community. 
They'll come along now. I think we'd better have another chat with Miss Shaw and Mrs. Winters. There's Catherine Shaw coming out of Mrs. Winters' room now, Judge. Good. Perhaps Miss Shaw can talk to us. Yeah. Mm. Oh, Miss Shaw. Yes, Lieutenant Ross. I would like you to meet Judge A.J. Adams. Oh, I'm deeply honored, Judge Adams. How do you do, Miss Shaw? I've read a great deal about your work with the police. Oh, thank you, Miss Shaw. Well, I see right now you are reading Emil Zola's fascinating book, The Human Beast. I think it's one of Zola's best works, Judge Adams. You sure? I wonder if I might speak with you for a few moments. Why, of course. Did you discover the body of Ronald Winters? Yes, sir. Hmm. I was in the kitchen when I heard the shots. I ran upstairs immediately and found Ronnie lying there, beneath the windowsill. And Mrs. Winters, when did she arrive? Just a few moments later. She was awakened out of a sound sleep. Miss Shaw, I'm going to ask you a very important question, and I must have a completely frank answer. I'll be glad to answer, Judge Adams. Thank you. Did Mrs. Winters and her stepson get along well? Most of the time, yes, sir. But some of the time they did not, um... Well, there was one minor matter. Mm. Oh, please, continue. Well, Ronnie was going with a nightclub singer, Julie Young. Mrs. Winters didn't approve. She asked Ronnie to stop seeing the girl. And did he? Well, well th- there was a scene. At first, Ronnie refused. Then, then when Mrs. Winters said she wouldn't let Ronnie disgrace the family name, she, she said... Uh, go on. She'd rather see him dead. Miss Shaw, why haven't you revealed this information to the police? Lieutenant, Mrs. Winters is not only my employer. She's my close personal friend. I'd hate to see her involved. Miss Shaw, that's for the police to decide. Uh, Lieutenant Ross is quite correct, but I understand your loyalty. Now, Miss Shaw, tell me, did you know Julie Young? I've never met her. However, tonight when Ronnie came in... He told me he'd broken off with the girl. I checked on this Julia Young, Judge. She works at the Bluebird Cafe. That's a night spot on the other side of town. Misha, do either you or Mrs. Winters own a gun? Oh, no, Judge. We've never had one in the house. How long have you lived in this house with Mrs. Winters? Almost four years. Uh, since Mrs. Winters' husband died. Oh, thank you, Miss Shaw. You've been most cooperative. Anything I can do to help, Judge Adams. Anything at all. I shall be happy to call on you. Oh... Uh, Keeps going in circles, Judge. And still no sign of the murder weapon. Tommy, regarding this Miss Julie Young... Yes, sir? I think you'd better send for her right away. Meanwhile, I'm going to have a talk with Mrs. Agatha Winters. And... And he was there. Beneath the windowsill, Ronnie... Dead. No, there, there, Mrs. Winters. Please, try to calm yourself. Oh, I'm so glad you're here, Judge Adams. I know you'll help us. Oh, I shall try my best. Uh, Mrs. Winters, exactly what were the terms of your late husband's will? I'm afraid I, I can't recall the terms of his will. Well, to whom did the bulk of the estate go? Uh, to Ronnie. Oh, oh, poor Ronnie. I... And he, he received his inheritance four years ago? No. No, it was held in trust until his 25th birthday. I I was named executor of the estate until then. And when would Ronald have become 25? On Thursday. Just three days from now. And uh, if he died before his birthday, you retain control of the estate, hmm? Well, yes. Thank you, Mrs. Winters. I hope it won't be necessary to trouble you again. Oh, please, Judge Adams, please help the police to find the person who killed my son. Your stepson, Mrs. Winters. Yes, my step... Judge, you... you don't think that I... that I... Mrs. Winters, I shall do everything in my power to see that the murderer of Ronald Winters is apprehended. Oh, Judge, I have to talk to you. Yes, yes, Tommy. I sent a squad car down to the Bluebird nightclub to pick up Julie Young. And? The men just got back. The manager of the Bluebird told them Julie Young disappeared at 9 o'clock. She hasn't been seen since. How about her residence? We checked there. They said she left sometime this afternoon, hasn't been back. Besides that, she was due at the Bluebird for the 9.30 show. 9.30? Yes. Approximately the time of the murder of Ronald Winters. Tommy, why don't you and I take a stroll outside? 
I'd like to look over the grounds. Right, Judge. I've doubled the men searching out there. Somewhere in these five acres, we're going to find that gun. And when we do, it's my guess we'll find the murderer still holding it. Well, Lieutenant Ross, it appears you have half the city's police force searching for one gun. Oh, I'd have more if they weren't needed elsewhere. Uh, Judge, this case has got to be cracked, and soon we can't hold the reporters off much longer. Yes, sir. No, no, no. Every racketeer in this town would like nothing better than a scandal involving Mrs. Winters, the reform uh, leader. Uh, hold it. Tommy, I believe one of your men has discovered something. Uh. All right. Come out of those bushes with your hands up. Judge, someone hiding in the shrubs. Yeah. You better get back in the house. They could be shooting. Well, if there he is, you'll need every man of us. I'm going to count three. If you aren't out of there with your hands up, we open fire. One. Two. No, no. Judge, it's a girl. She's coming this way, Tommy. Don't shoot, please. Don't shoot, Tommy. <laughs> now, well, young lady. Hold your fire, man. <laughs> Judge, you okay? She ran right into you. <laughs> Luckily, I'm in better shape than most men my age. All right, now, miss, suppose you tell us your no, name. Now, no, she's frightened, Tommy. Here, let me try it. Come here. Miss? Yes? Who are you? My name is Julie. Julie Young. Julie Young, the nightclub singer. Please, please, couldn't we go inside? I'm... We'll do better than I... that, Miss Young. I'm arresting you for the murder of Ronnie Winters. <laughs> We will return to the judge in just a moment. But first, March 15th can be just like any other day in the year. If you send your income tax returns in early, don't be harassed, worried, and nervous as that day draws near. Remember, you receive refunds sooner if you file early. It's worth it. Get your returns filed right now. And now the second act of The Judge. And today's story, The Death of the Playboy. Playboy Ronald Winters, stepson of the wealthy Mrs. Agatha Winters, has been found murdered. Because Mrs. Winters is leader of the city's reform movement, Police Lieutenant Tommy Ross has called upon Judge A.J. Adams to assist him in solving the case. Both the police and the judge realize that should the newspapers play up the role of Mrs. Winters in this case, the city's much-needed reform movement would collapse. Thus, the judge and Tommy Ross continue their investigation at the Winters' home, even though the hour is very late. Lieutenant Ross is now questioning singer Julie Young, who is in love with the murdered playboy. All right, Miss Young. If you're as innocent as you say you are, why were you discovered just a few minutes ago hiding on the Winters estate? I, I was afraid. Afraid of what? Well, after I left Ronnie earlier tonight, I heard shots. I ran down the driveway and then suddenly there were headlights coming toward me and I, I hid in the shrubs. When the car passed, I saw it was the police. I I was too frightened to move. Uh, Miss Young. Yes, Judge? Would you please describe the scene that took place between you and Ronald Winters earlier this evening? I came to the house to see Rodney. It was about 9.30, I guess. Just as I arrived, he drove up in his car. I asked him why he hadn't come to the club to see me. And he said... He said it was all over between us. He left me, standing there, and he went in the house. And you're asking us to believe that after being jilted by Ronnie Winters, you turned meekly and walked away? It's true, Lieutenant. I swear it. I wouldn't have killed Ronnie, no matter what he did. I loved him. Okay, okay. Sanders, take her in the other room. Come along, Miss. Well, Judge, I'm licked. None of these people killed Ronnie Winters, but he's dead. You know, Tommy, it's entirely possible Julie Young is telling the truth. Well, Judge, she's sincere, she's innocent-looking, but she had the perfect motive. 
And furthermore, she was found hiding on the ground. If Julie Young murdered young Winters, wouldn't the gun have been found either on her person or somewhere on the grounds? Well, now, Judge, do you realize I've got more than 20 policemen on this case now? And every single one of them are looking for a small hunk of metal. A gun. The gun that killed Ronnie Winters. Oh, easy, Tommy, my boy. I realize this is an extremely unusual case, but I assure you, there is some logical explanation. Oh, yeah? But where do we find it? I recall a case of some years back during which the solution hinged upon the finding of the murder weapon. I believe I have the history of that case at home in my study. Now, what has a case years ago got to do with the murder of Ronnie Winters tonight? Tommy, it is my opinion that there is very little new under the sun, and that includes murder. For each criminal investigation, there is one in the record books that has many similar factors. You might even say that it is upon this premise that our system of law is based. That is why lawyers and judges alike so often refer to older cases during a trial. Okay, judge, okay, so somebody else once had trouble finding a gun. Now, where does that leave us? With your permission, Lieutenant, I would like to return to my home and study my law books. I believe something vital will come of it. I'll do better than that, Judge Adams. I'll give you a squad car and two men to help you. But let me warn you in advance, Judge. I've got my murderer, and her name is Julie Young. You finally came home, Judge Adams. Why, Mrs. Maloney, perhaps I might ask what my housekeeper is doing up at this hour of the night? Keeping track of you, that's what. And where is your hat? Hmm? I, I beg your pardon? Judge, I said, where is your hat? Do you want to catch your death on such a cold night? Uh, Mrs. Maloney, if you'll excuse me, I have an urgent matter. Urgent or not, it's about time you got some sense in your head. Staying up to all hours uh, and going bareheaded in this weather. Mrs. Maloney... See here, Judge Adams. You may be very intelligent, like them policemen and newspapers yeah. is always saying, but to me, you're just a man who needs taken care of. No hat, indeed. Uh, good night, Mrs. Maloney. In the future, I shall check with you regarding my haberdashery. Now... Yeah, now, let me see. Where is that book? Yes, here's the volume I need. I see. Case of... Yes, yes, that's just the case I had in mind. The State of Illinois versus Cartwright. Page. Why, yes. Of course. It's a very important point. Uh, what now, Mrs. Maloney? It's a telephone for you, Judge. Lieutenant Ross. And he says it's very urgent. All right, Mrs. Maloney, thank you. Yes? Judge, Tommy Ross. Yes? You better come back to the Winters' home right away. Is something wrong, Tommy? It's that Julie Young dame. She was a bundle of nerves, Judge, so I let her lie down in a spare bedroom. Hey, go on. Well, I used my sympathy instead of my head. Julie Young has escaped. He what? I'll be right there. Soup, the reporters are outside screaming for blood, and my number one suspect just flew the coop. Easy, Tommy. She couldn't have gotten very far. Oh, I suppose you're right, Judge. I've got every man searching the grounds for her. But so far as I'm concerned, this proves it. Just as soon as Julie Young is recaptured, she's getting a nice, cozy cell. Tommy, I wonder if I could ask one more favor of oh, you. Oh, Judge, it's getting late. At... Oh, well, for you, sure. Go ahead. Thank you, Tommy. Could you have your men bring Mrs. Winters and Miss Shaw into the library now? I'm sure you will find it highly informative. I'm going to have to ask you, Mrs. Winters and Miss Shaw, to give Judge Adams your complete cooperation. All right, Judge, the floor is yours. Thank you. From the very beginning of this case, certain factors seemed familiar to me. Primarily the matter of the missing weapon. Thanks to the kindness of Lieutenant Ross, I was able to return to my study and engage in some research. That research has borne fruit. Judge. Oh, Judge, please. Have you discovered who killed my stepson? In, in a moment, Mrs. Winters. The basic problem in the murder case is generally the motive. But in this case, there were many motives available. Mrs. Winters, 
Yes, Judge Adams. By your own admission, your husband's vast estate would have been turned over to your stepson in but three days had he lived. That's true, Judge, but you certainly don't think that I... In addition, there is the known fact that you informed your stepson, Ronald, that you would prefer to see him dead rather than disgrace the family name. Is that not correct? Well, yes. Motive and circumstantial evidence. Now, Miss Shaw. Yes, sir. I believe you stated you had been in Mrs. Witter's employ for four years. That's true, Judge. And during that time, you have served her faithfully. In fact, you have become more her companion than secretary. Well, yes, I suppose so. Thank you. With Ronald Winters now dead, a new will is in effect. Uh, yours, Mrs. Winters. With no children of your own, could you please tell me how you have planned to distribute your estate? Well, the, a great part of it is to go to charity. And the remainder? To Catherine Shaw. Did Miss Shaw know that? Well, yes, Judge. I told Catherine I'd take care of her for the rest of her life. In other words, a strong motive for Miss Shaw. If you, Mrs. Winters, were convicted of the murder of your stepson, Catherine Shaw would inherit the entire fortune. Judge Adams, I didn't kill Ronnie. Yes? Lieutenant Ross, I've got Julie Young. Julie Young? Bring her in, Sanders. Well, Miss Young, I imagine you're ready to sign a statement now. I, I had to run. You made everything point to me, but I didn't kill Ronnie. Judge Adams, okay, if we bust up this little gathering now, we've got the guilty party. I'm afraid I can't agree with you, Tommy. You, what? what? If you'll give me another minute, I'm sure you will understand why. Okay. Okay, Judge, another minute. <sighs> Now we have the motives established for three people. Miss Young here, the scorned lover. Mrs. Winters, facing what she felt to be family disgrace and loss of control of the family money. And Miss Shaw, also a matter of large inheritance. But what of the murder weapon? Twenty policemen have covered this entire estate, have searched this home from attic to cellar. The gun is still missing. It's no use, Judge. We've covered every inch of the ground. Yes, yeah, and very efficiently, too, Tommy. That is why I wanted to check my law books. And it was while studying the case of the state of Illinois versus Cartwright that I found my answer. Answer, Judge? Exactly. In the Cartwright case, as in this one, during the entire investigation, the murderer concealed the weapon on his person. Oh, but, Judge, all these people were searched. Well, I'm sure they were, Tommy. Nonetheless, in this room, right now, we have a murderer carrying the gun that killed Ronald Winters. <sighs> Miss Shaw. Yes, Judge Adams? Do you enjoy reading Emil Zola's novel, The Human Beast? Why, why, of course. You do? You asked me that once before. Well, uh, would you tell me about the book, please? Well, it's... It's about a Frenchman uh, uh? who is a human beast. Uh, very interesting, Miss Shaw. You've enjoyed reading the book so much that you do not know the human beast described by Zola is actually a locomotive and not a man at all. Locomotive. You have enjoyed the book so much you have carried it in your right hand since the moment Ronald Winters was murdered. All right, Judge. You're right. I've got the gun. Here. The gun that killed Ronnie. The gun was inside your book. By carefully cutting out the pages of this large novel, Miss Catherine Shaw has been able to conceal the gun with which she killed Ronald Winters. That book and the murder weapon never left her person. And I still have it in my right hand, ladies and gentlemen. Only I won't need this book anymore. All right, Lieutenant Ross, call off your men. I'm leaving this house and no one dares stop me. You see, Tommy, a book may conceal a dangerous weapon, just as darkness conceals an attack. Right, Judge? Don't move or I'll shoot! And since this light switch is near my hand... Oh, right. Quick, Tommy! All right, Judge! Uh, I'll grab her! Uh, stop uh, that now! Now, I'll get the lights. Oh, let go of I've got a judge. Good work, Tommy. Well, Miss Shaw, yours was a diabolical plot. You killed Ronald Winters and hoped Mrs. Winters would be executed for the crime so that you would inherit a large portion of the estate. Ah, take her away. Yes, Sanders, take her out of here. Come along, you. Come along. Oh, Judge Adams. I don't know how to thank you. Well, Judge, as usual... I owe you more than I can tell. Oh, <laughs> nonsense, Tommy. We merely used a stuffy old law book to help us solve a difficult riddle. No, no, not we, Judge Adams, you. I'm sure Mrs. Winters and all the others in the reform movement won't forget your brilliant work in solving this crime. Tommy, Chief Justice Holmes of the Supreme Court once taught me 
Every criminal makes the initial mistake of believing he has discovered a new way to beat the law. Yet, like Catherine Shaw, they too must learn any way to crime will end in prison. The Judge, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars John Daner and is written by Richard Pettuccini and William Frug. Featured in today's cast were Georgia Ellis, June Whitley, and Sarah Selby, with Byron Kane and Vivi Janis. Lieutenant Ross is played by Larry Dobkin. Editorial supervision is by John Meston. And the special music is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. <laughs> The meanest man in the world is one who steals your radio just before it's time for the Jack Benny Show. America's favorite miser, a man with more flaws in his character than Swiss cheese has holes, Jack Benny is yours for delight every Sunday on CBS Radio. Tonight again, be sure to be listening and laughing at Jack Benny Time. Be sure to join us again next week when Judge A.J. Adams uses his vast knowledge and experience to solve one of the most unusual crimes on record, the cat's paw. Your announcer, Clarence Cassell. This is the CBS Radio Network. Tonight, as number 11 in the series Let's Face the Facts, the Director of Public Information has the honor to present to the Canadian people the world premiere of the radio adaptation of a great play. The name of the play is There Shall Be No Night. Its stage version is a current Broadway success. The author is Robert Emmett Sherwood, whose notable address in this series you heard on August 25th. Mr. Sherwood himself has written the radio adaptation of tonight's play. The central characters will be portrayed tonight by Mr. Alfred Lunt and Miss Lynn Fontaine, two of the most distinguished artists of the English-speaking stage. They are co-starring in the Broadway production. Assisting them this evening will be a supporting cast drawn from their Broadway company. Until tonight, Mr. Sherwood has declined many flattering offers to allow this play of his to be performed on the air. For the people of Canada, not only has he prepared tonight's production without charge... But Mr. Lunt, Miss Fontaine, and the fine cast supporting them are giving their services. Early in November, Mr. Lunt and Miss Fontaine will appear in the stage version of this play in Ottawa and Toronto. During their Canadian visit, they will devote their share of the money which the play will earn in the Dominion toward the building of a spitfire. Mr. Sherwood intends to do the same with all his royalties from Canadian performances. Ladies and gentlemen, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and the Director of Public Information have the honor to present There Shall Be No Night by Robert Sherwood and starring Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine. The first voice you hear will be that of Mr. Lunt. Mr. Sherwood's play, There Shall Be No Night, is about a war. The war between Finland and Soviet Russia, which was fought last winter. When the play begins, the threat of war is still far away. The very thought that war may come is unthinkable. The scene is in the home of Dr. Carlo Valkonen in Helsinki in Finland. Dr. Valkonen is a neurologist who has won the Nobel Prize for his studies of the human brain. His wife, Miranda, is an American, a New Englander. They have a son, Eric, 19 years old. They have a lovely, quiet, civilized home. They are very happy. They are at peace. Dr. Valkonen is devoted to his work, which he hopes and believes may be of benefit to the whole human race. Miranda Valkonen is devoted to her house and her family. Eric Volkanen is devoted to his own studies and his volunteer military training and to his young sweetheart named Katri. The story of There Shall Be No Night is the story of the human spirit, the free spirit, assailed by the brutal aggression of the makers of war. Naturally, we can bring you but a few random scenes from the play in the half hour that the Canadian Broadcasting Company has so kindly given us tonight, but we are deeply grateful for this opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. 
The first scene that you will hear is in the living room of the Balkan and House on an evening late in November 1939. On that day, the Red Army has started the invasion of Finland. Helsinki has been savagely bombed and many civilians killed. The Valkanin's son, Eric, has gone to the north to fight for the volunteer ski troops. Dr. Valkanin has been warned by a friend, the German consul general, to leave Finland, leave Europe at once, before it is too late. The German consul knows that this Soviet-Finnish war is only one phase of Hitler's vast scheme for world revolution. Dr. Valkanin refuses to go. He must abandon his own experiments and join the Army Medical Corps to do what he can for his suffering country. But he is determined to do anything and everything to persuade his wife to leave Finland. And now, a scene from There Shall Be No Night, with Mr. Alfred Lunt as Dr. Carlo Valkanen and Miss Lynn Fontan as his wife, Miranda. Carlo. Yes? I've made some coffee. I had to make it myself because the cook has gone. Will you have some, Carlo? No, thank you. I want to talk to you, Miranda. Why? Do you want to talk about Eric? No, I don't want to talk about Eric. Miranda, I have to tell you that the time has come when you must go home. Home? This is my home. No, I mean to your own country, to America. Why? Because I do not wish you to stay here. Mr. Walsh at the American legation can make all the necessary arrangements. You go to Boston and stay with your aunt. No, no. Going with me? Naturally not. I'm needed here. You will stay in America until this business is over. And when it is over, what then? Why, then you'll come back and we'll go right on living as we always have. I might even go to America to fetch you. And supposing you're killed? I killed. I'm a doctor. Do you think a Russian in a bombing plane 10,000 feet up can tell the difference between an ordinary person and a winner of the Nobel Prize? No, it's out of the question that I should go. Freud left Vienna after the Nazi occupation. He went to London where he was welcomed and honored. But he couldn't speak. He knew that if he told the truth, it would be printed, and that his own people still living in Austria would be made to suffer for it horribly. So Freud was technically free, but he was silenced. What did he then have to live for? Nothing. And so he died. No, I'll not leave. You must go alone. And if I left, what would I have to live for? Oh, you will manage very well in your own great, secure, distant country. Why, Carlo, what is the truth of this? Why do you want me to go? What can you do here? This is a war for the defense of Finland. And all of us know what he must do or she must do, and we have been trained to do it. Now, what have you been trained for except to wear lovely clothes and be a charming hostess? You are an intelligent woman, Miranda. Reason this out. And you will see that at a time like this, everyone who eats bread must have work to earn it. And God help us, there is only one kind of work that matters now. Resistance. Desperate resistance. You think it's impossible for me to contribute anything, then? To help in any way? Why do I have to tell you what you know yourself? This is nothing you should be ashamed of. This is not your country. This is not your war. The country of my husband and my son. Do you think that I and Eric want you caught here in these ruins? Don't speak for Eric. I don't think he'd be particularly happy or or proud to think his mother's courage to safety at the first sound was shot fired. Eric has American blood in his veins. He'll understand. So that's it. His American blood will tell him it's perfectly reasonable for me to run away. Oh, you evidently share Cartridge's opinion oh, of me. Please don't put words into my mouth I haven't uttered. Well, then why don't you come out and say what you mean? I'm incompetent, a parasite, a non-essential. In all the years we've been together, nothing has happened before to disturb the lovely serenity of our home. And now comes this great calamity, and you suddenly realize you don't want me, you don't need me any longer. I didn't say that. What did you say, then? You don't understand why I want you to go. Maybe I don't understand. But one thing I do know, and you may as well know it too, I'm not going. Probably you don't need me. You have important work to do, and I'm sure that's enough for you. But the time may come when Eric will need me, and when that time comes, I intend to be here. Please, don't keep on bringing Eric into this. Wasn't it enough seeing him go away like that in that uniform? That poor, hopeful, defenseless boy. Oh, Oh, I'm sorry, darling, I'm sorry. You must see that I've been making a desperate attempt to drive you to safety with lies. Well, it's no use. You always can make me tell the truth. The real trouble is you've had too much confidence in me. How could you know that I have been living in a dream, a beautiful, wishful dream, in which you played your own unsubstantial but exciting part? And now there is war, 
And our own son has to fight. Oh, don't, don't. And I wake up to discover that reality itself is a hideous nightmare. What has happened, Carlo? I what have you heard? I realize where I am and what I am. I am a man working in the apparent security of a laboratory. I am working on a theory so tentative that it may take hundreds of years of research and generations of workers to prove it. I am trying to defeat insanity, the degeneration of the human race. And then a band of pyromaniacs enters the building in which I work. And that building is the world, the whole planet, not just Finland. They set fire to it. What can I do? Until that fire is put out, there can be no peace... No freedom from fear, no hope of progress for mankind. And it isn't just us, not just this one little breed that wants to be free. This is a war for everybody. Yes, even for the scientists who thought themselves immune behind their test tubes. Darling, I think I can stand this ordeal if I know it is for myself alone. Yes, I can stand it. If I know that you are safe and beyond their reach. You see, I love you. And that is the only reality left to me. I can stand it too, darling. Whatever it is. I can stand it so long as I know that you love me, that you need me, that I'm essential. Even if I'm a woman who's nothing but a woman. Even at a time like this when the whole life of the world is marching with men. I'm sorry, Fran. I hadn't intended to talk like Why that. shouldn't you talk to me? You always have. Nothing has changed, my darling. Nothing. Now come and have some coffee. Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. It's not very warm. Oh. oh, that's all right. It's all right. The Soviet-Finnish war goes on for one month, two months. The heroic resistance of little Finland thrills the world. But the Russians are pouring in more and more troops in overwhelming numbers. Dr. Valkonen finds that he must leave his own important work and put on a uniform. He goes to Vipuri, behind the Mannerheim line, as an officer of the Army Medical Corps. The next scene that you will hear is in the little hotel room in Helsinki. It is the room of an American broadcaster, Dave Corween played by Mr. Richard Worf. Dave has come to Finland to report the war over the radio to America. He has become a great friend of the Valkonens. Come in. Mrs. Valkonen. Hello, Dave. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Mr. Schumann told me I might come up. I met him in the lobby. Why, of course, Mrs. Valkonen. I must apologize for the mess here. Would you like anything to drink? No, thank you, Dave. I've come to ask for some help. Anything that I can do. I want to get my daughter-in-law, Cartre, out of this country. She's going to have a baby. Can you persuade her to go? I couldn't have as long as Eric was alive. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I know. You're sorry, Dave. Cartre and I were with him in the hospital when he died. Poor Cartre. She's very ill. I've made all arrangements to get her to Norway and then to New York, but she must leave right away. I need some American money, Dave. Could you lend me $50? It'll be paid back. Will that be enough? Oh, plenty, plenty. Here's the dress, the dress of my aunt in Boston. When you get to America, write her and tell her where to send the money. You see, Finnish money is worth very little now in foreign exchange, and by the time Carter gets to New York, it may be completely worthless. That's why I had to have dollars. Now, if this is inconvenient... Dave, say so, because I can surely get it elsewhere. It's perfectly convenient. I'm very much flattered that you came to me. Thank you. We had the most awful time persuading Carter to leave. We never could have if she hadn't been too ill to resist. She's a very strong girl, really. But, oh, Dave, there are limits. I wish you were going with her. I wish I were. I'd love to be present at the birth of my grandchild. Poor Carter. She'll have a bad time of it there all alone. I don't imagine my relatives will be much help. Oh, well, perhaps she'll have a son. And he'll grow up to be a nice, respectable New Englander. And go to Harvard and wonder why he has an odd name like Valkonen. 
You know, Dave, Eric wasn't badly wounded. He could easily have pulled through if he hadn't been in such a state of terrible exhaustion. I was lucky we found out where he was and got to him. I sent word to Carlo. I don't know where he is. Somewhere around Vipuri, I think. There's terrible fighting at Vipuri, isn't there, Dave? Yes. They're getting closer, aren't they? Yes. Well, I'm very grateful for that loan. Come and see Uncle Valdemar and me. We're always there. Thank you, Mrs. Vulcan. And I wish to God you'd really let me do something. Oh, Dave, you've done a lot. That fifty dollars. Well, it's not much satisfaction to know that fifty dollars is the best I can do. It's all I wanted. All I could use. I had to get her out of this country. It means one little link with the future. Gives us an illusion of survival. And perhaps it isn't just an illusion. Well, goodbye, Dave. Goodbye, Mrs. Vulcan. The next scene is in a little country schoolhouse near Vipuri Bay. The Russians are breaking through the Monarheim line. The characters in this scene, Sergeant Gosden, an English volunteer in the Finnish Army, played by Mr. Claude Horton, two American ambulance drivers, played by Mr. Thomas Gomez and Mr. William La Messina, and an American aviator, played by Mr. Charles Ansley. The little schoolhouse where they have taken refuge is within sound and range of the Russian guns. Who are you? Friends, we're not Russians and we're not armed. Glad to see you. Sorry, but I'm a bit jumpy these days. Oh, that's all right, pal. Americans, eh? Uh, that's right. What are you, English? Yes. The name's Goston. I don't rightly know what my rank is in this army, but I call myself Sergeant. Glad to know you, Sergeant. My name's Ben Gitchner. This is Frank Olmsted. I'm glad to know you. It's a pleasure to have your company. I was getting the wind up all alone here. You chaps in the medical corps? Yes, we're ambulance drivers, only we've lost our ambulance. It's frozen stiff as a goat in a snowdrift. When the Russians occupy this territory, they'll come into possession of a Buick. How far are the Russians from here? I wish I knew. Nice little schoolhouse, this, eh? How long have you been in this war? I joined up in London just after Christmas. My wife and two kiddies were sent to Cornwall in the evacuation. Then I lost my job. I was working in the furniture department as Harrods. Who wants to buy furniture in wartime? I couldn't join up with our own army. Too old. All I could do was walk the streets looking at nothing. There was no news to read in the papers except about heroic little Finland. So I thought, why not have a go at heroic little Finland? And here I am. Where I should be tomorrow, I really couldn't say. Who's that? Oh, it's all right. It's Dr. Volkerman. How do you do? How do you do, sir? I gather that things here are a bit disorganized. And no wonder, sir. It's a miracle there's any sign of an army left the way they've been pushing us. Do you think there's a chance we'll get out of here alive? If you're asking me for the truth, I'll have to say no, I don't. Well, I asked only out of idle curiosity. You know, the children must have left this school very quickly. Right in the middle of an arithmetic lesson. Children were probably delighted. How old would the kids be at a school like this, Doctor? Oh, from seven to twelve, I should judge. It's just a little country school. I wish you could see it when the children are here. The boys on that side, the girls there. When the teacher comes in, the boys all rise and bow stiffly. The girls make their little curtsies. Maybe in their hearts they loathe the teacher, but they are always very polite. And all full of moral preachments. Oh, yes. You see that inscription around the walls? That's from the Kalevala. That is the epic poem of Finland. It had its beginnings in the songs of our minstrels a thousand years ago. Your poet Longfellow knew the Kalevala and used its rhythm for high water. Let us clasp our hands together. Let us interlock our fingers. Let us sing a cheerful measure. Let us use our best endeavors while our dear ones hearken to us. And our loved ones are instructed. While the young are standing round us of the rising generation, let them learn the words of magic and recall our songs and legends. 
Oh, yes. All Finnish children learn about the Kalevala, just as all Americans learn those words about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Dr. Valkanen. Yes, Frank. I wanted to ask you a question yes. about your book. Have oh, you been carrying that around with you? Yes, I bought it in Vipery when we first went there. Frank is more worried about your book, Doctor, than he is about the Russians. There's a lot of it I don't understand, but what I wanted to ask you about mostly is the very end. Well, what is it, the very end? Read it to me. How long, O oh Lord, before we shall hear the sound of the seventh angel of the apocalypse? Have you forgotten the promise of St. John? And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. How long, O Lord, before we shall be given to see the true revelation? Why did you conclude a scientific work with biblical words? And what do you mean by a true revelation? It is the revealing to us of ourselves, of what we are and what we may be. Of course, we can all use the book of Revelation to substantiate our own theories. It is an eternally effective device. But there is something profound in those words I quoted. The unknown Jewish mystic who wrote that somehow unconsciously knew that man would find the true name of God in his own forehead in the mysteries of his own mind. And there shall be no night. There. You see, that's the basis of all the work I've done. But how do you feel about that work now, Dr. Valkyrie? Oh, I think I've learned a great deal in the last few months. Research in the field, I never dreamed I'd have such a vast laboratory or so many specimens. Have you arrived at any new conclusions, Doctor? No, new conclusions, I'm afraid. Just somewhat stronger suspicions. It is very wonderful to see what men are capable of, what courage, what endurance, what an utter lack of selfishness, and what a tragedy it is that all these heroic qualities can only be tested by disease. For that's what this is, you know, disease. All of this reasonless war, this aimless revolution, it is a psychological epidemic. We had seen it coming for a long time, long before 1914, but we had no conception of its extent. And now the very belief of men that they can insulate themselves against it is in itself a sign of lunacy. The germs of that disease travel on the airwaves. The only defenses are still here, behind the forehead. I want to apologize for carrying on a conversation which must be extremely boring to you. Doctor, I'm an ignorant man, sir. I haven't read this book. Didn't even know I was in the presence of anyone who'd written a book. And from what you've said... I have a feeling it's all hopeless. I shouldn't like to die believing that. Then you won't die believing it's hopeless. That's the point, my friend. You have lived in faith. The light is in you, and it is that light which gives the strength that defeats death. It is only the fearful, the unbelieving, those who have sold themselves to the murderers and the liars. Those are the only ones who will really die. But how can you deny that the light is going out? It's going fast it everywhere. It is just beginning to burn with a healthy flame. I know this because I have seen it. I have seen it in all kinds of men, of all races, of all varieties of faith. They are coming to consciousness. Look at the millions of men under arms today, and look at all those who are fearful that arms will be thrust upon them. Are there any illusions of glory among any of them? None whatsoever. Well, isn't that progress? Well, far be it for me to argue, Doctor, but I can't see what difference it makes whether men go to war because of illusions of glory or just in a spirit of grim resignation. No, but there is all the difference. Because those illusions, when shattered, leave men hollow. They say, oh, what's the use? What have we got to live for? They are devitalized by a conviction of futility. But grim resignation, as you call it, that makes a man say, this is an evil job, but I have to do it. And when a man says that... He is already beginning to ask, but why do I have to do it? Why must this evil go on forever? And when men start asking questions, they are not satisfied until they find the answers. That is consciousness. And for the first time in history, consciousness is not the privilege of a few secluded philosophers. It is free for all. For the first time, individual man is fighting to know himself. Oh, forgive me, gentlemen, I forget my scuffle. I think I'm still lecturing at the Medical Institute, but the Russians are only one kilometer away, and this may be my last lecture, so... Oh, please let me finish. Listen.
listen. What you hear now, this terrible sound that fills the earth, is the death rattle. One may say easily and dramatically that it is the death rattle of civilization. I choose to believe differently. I believe it is the long deferred death rattle of the primordial beast. We can conquer bestiality, not with our muscles and our swords, but with the power of the light that is in our minds. What a thrilling challenge this is to all science. To play its part in the ultimate triumph of evolution. To help speed the day when man shall become genuinely human, instead of that synthetic creature, bogus angel, half actual brute, that he has always imagined himself to be in the dark past. Is that an aeroplane? No, that's a motorbike. A dispatch rider, I expect, sir. Maybe it's orders. Hello, Ben. Hello, Frank. Joe. Oh, Hello, well, Dr. Where Baldwin. did you drop from? I saw Major Rakoski up the road. He said you were in here. Mr. Burnett, I'm delighted to see you. Are you flying in this front now? I was up until a half hour ago. I was shot down. It's the first time that ever happened to me. I just managed to make a landing behind our lines. I got a motorcycle, and I'm going back to headquarters to see if they have any more planes. Have you been in Helsinki lately, Joe? Yeah, I was there a few days ago. I saw Dave Corween. I hope you called at my house, Mr. Burnett. Did you see my wife? No, I didn't. I don't quite know how to say this, Dr. Valkonen, although God knows I've said it plenty of times before, but I want you to know you have my sympathy. Your sympathy? Why have I got your sympathy? You don't know about your son? No. He's dead. Yes, sir. Killed in action. I believe he died in the hospital of wounds. When was this? I don't quite know, sir. I heard it only from Dave. He'd seen Mrs. Valkman. Is my wife well? Oh, yes, doctor. She told Dave that she'd been with your son in the hospital. Your son's wife has gone to America. I didn't know, doctor, that I should be the bearer of this news. I should like, sir, to be permitted to put in my word of sympathy, too. And mine also, doctor. Wouldn't you like us to get out of here, doctor? No. No, thank you. I have been expecting that news for a long time. I was prepared for it. My son had a good character. Part Finnish, part American. He was not afraid. And now, if there's still time, I must write a letter to my wife. If you'll excuse me. The final scene is again in the Valkonen home. Miranda has received Carlo's letter and the news that he was killed in the fierce fighting around Vipuri. Dave Corween comes to see her. I've come to say goodbye, Mrs. Valkonen. I've been ordered home. Oh, I'm sorry you're going, Dave. So am I. But I'll never forget you or Dr. Valkonen. You'll have a great book to write, won't you, Dave? Your own personal history. Oh, I'm afraid it'll be too much for me. I'd love to read it. Oh, Dave, when you get back to America, will you do me another favor? Of course, Mrs. Balkan. I have a package here that I want you to take. And the letter that Carlo wrote in the little schoolhouse just before he was killed. The package contains photographs of Pavlov, Freud, Carell, the Mayos, all of them signed, you know. Carlo was very proud of those photographs. There's also the Nobel gold medal. I want you to take the package and the letter and deliver them to Cartre to keep for her child. You have that address in Boston. The aunt who's going to pay you the $50 I borrowed? Yes, I have the address. Carlo had just heard about Eric when he wrote this. He wanted to comfort me in his curious way. Do you mind if I read it to you, Dave? Please do. In this time of our own grief... It's not easy to summon up the philosophy which has been formed from long study of the suffering of others. But I must do it, and you must help me. You see, Dave, he wanted to make me feel that I'm stronger and wiser. I have often read the words which Pericles spoke over the bodies of the dead in the dark hour when the light of Athenian democracy was being extinguished by the Spartans. He told the morning people 
that he could not give them any of the old words which tell how fair and noble it is to die in battle. Those empty words were old even then, 24 centuries ago. But he urged them to find revival in the memory of the commonwealth which they together had achieved. And he promised them that the story of their commonwealth would never die, but would live on far away, woven into the fabric of other men's lives. I believe that these words can be said now of our own dead and our own commonwealth. I have always believed in the mystic truth of the resurrection. The great leaders of the mind and the spirit, Socrates, Christ, Lincoln, were all done to death that the full measure of their contribution to human experience might never be lost. Now the death of our son is only a fragment in the death of our country, but Eric and the others who give their lives are also giving to mankind a symbol, a little symbol to be sure, but a clear one of man's unconquerable aspiration to dignity and freedom and purity in the sight of God. When I made that radio speech, you remember? I quoted from St. Paul. I repeat those words to you now, darling. We glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation work is patience, and patience, experience, and experience, hope. There are men here from all different countries Fine men, those Americans who were at our house on New Year's Day, they're all here. They're waiting for me now. So I must close with all my love. There it is, Dave. Take good care of it. I shall, Mrs. Balkan. But it may be a long time before I can deliver it. Huh. It'll be a long time before my grandchild learns to read. Goodbye, Dave. Oh, my, we shall miss you. Why, you've become quite a part of our life here in Helsinki. Goodbye, Mrs. Balkan. <laughs> And now, before this program comes to an end, Mr. Lunt has a final message for you. I cannot possibly tell you what a great privilege it has been for us to read these lines from Mr. Sherwood's play, knowing that they could be heard by you brave and noble people who today are defending the cause of human freedom, human dignity on this earth. We who have had the honor of speaking to you tonight are actors and therefore like to believe the assurance of William Shakespeare that all the worlds of stage and all the men and women merely players. If that is true, then we can say with deepest conviction that never in all the great drama of history has any race of men and women enacted so heroic a role as you of the British Empire today. We, at the moment, are only your audience. We beg to say thank you, and God bless you. You have been listening to number 11 in the series Let's Face the Facts. Tonight you heard the world radio premiere of the current Broadway success, There Shall Be No Night. The radio adaptation was written by the author of the stage play, Robert Emmett Sherwood. And the principal roles were performed by two of the most distinguished artists of the English-speaking stage, Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine. They were supported by a cast drawn from their Broadway production. Copies of tonight's talk play will not be available to the public. If you have written for printed copies of talks given in this series and have not been receiving them, will you please renew your request? But print your name and address plainly. Illegible writing has prevented the Director of Public Information from fulfilling many requests. All requests 
should be sent to the Director of Public Information, Ottawa. Let's Face the Facts will be heard again next Sunday night at 9.30 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time or 8.30 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. The speaker will be Mr. Lawrence Hunt. This is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. 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 This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This is the McCoy. The National Broadcasting Company presents The McCoy, starring Howard Duff. door open. What do you want me to say to your door? Sesame? All right. Sesame. There's anything I hate is a door that has to be coaxed. Take that. Mike McCoy, Criminal Investigations, file number 354, 22 April 1951, Los Angeles, California, where else? Case, the uh, three wayward girls. It was 520 of a dirty day. The sun beat through the smog and still had strength enough to kiss the summer dresses walking Sunset Strip. The girls walking their poodles home to Daddy, who'd had a hard day at the office. Having nothing better to do, the dogs and I chatted. I uh, took my leave, and I tiptoed through the Cadillacs, patted their saucy fishtails, watched my hand turn green, then walked into Shea Mason's on the strip. The kindly picture folk were already there, exchanging pills from matching cloisonne pill boxes and discussing the high cost of nervous breakdowns. Then Herm, the maitre d', saw me, ad-libbed his way through all that box office gold, offered me two things. Mabel, knew she'd phoned three times, and the specialty of the house, Admiral Haughty Goulash with matzo balls. I took the matzo ball. The fork was cutting through their delicate contours when there was a hand on my hand. Fool that I am, it annoyed me. But when I saw that the moist hand on mine belonged to Phil Gardner, peddler, talent agent, shill for plaid dinner jackets, it annoyed me even more. Only a minute, Mike. Scooch over a little bit. I'll sit down next to you. You want something, huh, Phil? I'll tell you how I know. You keep licking your lips, your handshakes, which reminds me, take back your hand. I've had it. Mike, I want you to go to work for me. Right now. From this minute, you're on salary. Yeah, with expenses. Per diem. Philzy, my monster balls are growing colder. It's for Toby. Toby Drake. I'm putting you on the payroll. You remember Toby built you up to her, gave you a knockdown to her... You had a season's pass with her. You remember, Toby. What's the matter, Phil? The girl getting lonely for the McCoy again? Mm -hmm. Lonelier than you know, Mike. The girl's being threatened with phone calls, with poison letters. You're doing real good, Phil. Mike, Mike, listen. Listen close because I'm going to almost whisper. Well, that should be refreshing, but not so close. Somebody's going to kill her. Yeah, murder her dead. Toby's my client. It shouldn't happen to my client to die from an anonymous threat. You tried, Phil. You really did. Hey, Mr. Gardner, there's a phone call for you. Will you take it here? Thanks, Charlie. Mike, you've got to pay attention to me. you got to. I got, uh, matzo balls. Gardner speaking. Snap it out. I'm busy. Huh? Huh? No. Yeah, huh? No. Yeah. Phil, why don't you talk to me like that when you talk to me? You're dynamite with monosyllables. Oh, but now you'll believe, skeptic. Toby's dead. No jokes, Phil. I'm not in the mood. Her boyfriend just called. I should be the first to know. I tell you, she's dead. Dead? If you're kidding me... Look, I'll drive you over in my cab. I'll put the top down, Mike. Sure. Sure. You wouldn't want to go to a funeral any other way, would you, Phil? Here's where... There, you see? You see, Mike? What did I tell you? She's dead. My client... Shut up. The place was swarming with new things. 
New chintz curtains, fresh upholstery, and Beverly Hills Oriental knickknacks cluttering the Grand Rapids high boy. There was a big overstuffed chair near the door that I remembered. And Phil climbed into it and put his chin in his hands to watch. I walked over to the three-piece sectional. Toby Drake was lying there, her hand trailing down on the floor. I couldn't see her face until the big man stood up. Somebody wrapped that black silk stocking too tight around her neck. You know her, Mike? Yeah, I knew her when she looked better. I liked it. She laughed at my jokes. You wrapped the stocking? You only ask because you're a cop, huh, Koska? I only ask because if I were a cop, I'd ask. The call came and said get here because there was a dead girl named Toby Drake. And on the way down, I toyed with the name. Then I remembered she used to laugh at your jokes. And all of a sudden, you're here. Why? Ask him. What is it? Something they have around town. An agent. He's Toby's. He's an agent? Hmm. I gotta look. You're an agent, eh? Well, now. Well, well. Let me bend my face close because I've never seen one of you before. Talk to me, agent. I want to hear. Well, Lieutenant. Just Detective Koska. Go ahead, go ahead. It, it was like this. Mike and me sit there at Mason's, two and five. And the phone was brought over. The man on the other end says it's Roy Fulton. And he says his girlfriend's dead. Honest, I, I'm broken up about this. Well, now. Well, well. You wrap the stocking agent? Me wrap? Leave him alone, Koska. Leave him alone. Agents only kill other agents. Thanks a lot, Mike. I'll jot it down in the book. You've been hired, Mike? I was, but I don't know if I'm still working. You're working? All the way, Mike. Find out for me who killed my client, Toby. Oh, you're hired. Are these guys employ you, huh? Look, Koska, I got a crummy license and I'm in a crummy business because people sneak up dark alleys, because people hate, people rob, people strangle... That's where my money comes from, because people do all those things. What do you want me to do? Apologize for earning a buck? You want me to crawl? Or maybe just bow low enough so you can pat me on top of the head and say, Oh, now, Mike. Oh, now, Mike. Yeah. Where's her boyfriend? He's in the bedroom. He's a guy by the name of Roy Fulton. He hardly says a word to me. Maybe you're not his type. Well, go talk to him, Mike. Go tell him it's okay that you should talk to him. Let me count the ways I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight I... Go on, go on. I like it. Who are you? I'm uh, Mike McCoy. I'm a criminal investigator. Toby's dead. She was murdered, Mr. Fulton. I'm trying to find out who did it. We had a date. I came here. I saw her. I didn't lose my head. I called her agent. Then I called the police. Did you kill her? No. But she should have been more careful. Girls like her. What kind of a girl did you think she was? Very pretty. In my old griefs, in my childhood faith, I love thee with a love... Uh, Mr. Fulton... I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath... Mr. Fulton, I... Smile, tears of all my life, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after his death. I couldn't get through to him anymore. The poetry he spotted stood between us. In his own way, Mr. Fulton was grieving. So I got out of the place. Then a fascinating 20 minutes on the center lane of Pico Boulevard, getting dared by the pedestrians and the swarms of cars on both sides of me. The parking lots had just hung their 50 cents till closing signs when I drove up to the office building on Olive. Then to the corner of Beanery and a few reminiscences about Toby Drake. Toby, a kid who had once won a title, something like Miss Donegal Tweed of Patterson, New Jersey. Expenses paid to Hollywood, shake hands with the stars, lunch at the Derby. A nice kid, a pretty kid. Now dead. I bought a paper and went upstairs. Sesame. I had to rent an office that once belonged to a Persian rug merchant. Question call service. McCoy, baby. Any calls for me? You know who, Mike? Mabel? Four times. What happens to a girl when she goes out with you? She's got a call every half hour and a half hour? I'm delicate. They worry. You worry about me, Judy? Cut it out, Mike. You worry about me, don't you, kid? You got another call with a message. You want it? Sure, Judy, sure. Go ahead. I'll listen. Goes like this. First, Toby, then Stella Martin. You can't stop it, McCoy. First, Toby, then Stella Martin. You add living this, Judy? It says right here. Who left the message? The man said it and hung up. What's Stella Martin to me? 
I wish I knew, baby. We had a Stella Martin who used this service a long time ago, an actress or something. I used to get calls for her. You discontinued. You got an address on her? No more. Why don't you try central casting? They'd know. Yeah, yeah, I should have thought of that. Thanks a lot. Take this card, Mr. McCoy. Take it. Uh, yes, Miss Ford. Fill it out. Central Casting wants to know your age, weight, height, color of eyes. They do? Uh, it does? Gosh. You're fresh. You're new. They'll eat you up. Hmm? Uh, for color of eyes, put heart chattering robin's egg blue. I haven't been well. Uh, the space where it says experience? Leave it blank. I'll fill it in myself. Steady girl. Two can play at that game. It'll all be so simple. You put yourself in these two hands. I devote myself to you, heart and brain. Mm -hmm. Make you the most exciting thing in pictures. The most exciting. Uh, study, girl. Heal, heal. Don't back away from me. Don't be frightened of me, Mr. McCoy. It's not that I'm frightened, Miss Ford. It's just that my metabolism's a little sluggish today. You're a fool. Worse. A hard-headed, stupid, moronic, cretin fool. Hard-headed? They'll tell you outside what you want to know. Get out. No, no, now you tell me, baby. Hmm, baby? What do you want? Well, right now, the address of Stella Martin, actress, after that, we'll uh, meet in conclave, shall we? I'll have to look it up. In the files. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Stella Martin dropped from our ready file. Non payment of dues. Oh. Uh -huh. Well, there must be an address where you done it. Las Flores Hotel on Selma. Oh, Las Flores Hotel. Well, that burned down last month. It should happen to you, Mr. McCoy. <sighs> Come on, I'll open a door for you. No hard feelings, huh, baby? Miss Ford, baby? I'll remember you always. Bye. Cute kid. Make a note, McCoy. Must wear a chest protector. Car. I called your phone service, Mike. They told me where you were. I've been looking for you. You're taking my money. You don't even call me on the telephone. You know a girl named Stella Martin, Filsey? Stella. What's she got to do with Toby's gun? You know her, Filsey? Well, a couple of weeks ago, a girl came into my office, Stella Martin, pleaded I should put her on my client's list. Only no talent, you know what I mean? To soothe her tear-stained face, I took her home. Lived all the way to Westchester. I've never been to Westchester. Make it come true, huh, Filsey? <laughs> It was just nine o'clock when Agent Phil let me off in front of a redwood frame house in Westchester. Then he suddenly remembered he had to pick up a client at the airport, and speedy Phil Gardner, game to the core, went back into the traffic again. The walk up to the house was lined with rose trees, carefully tended, and on every fourth one, there was a rose. But there was only one doorbell, so I knew just what to do. You want what, mister? Stella Martin. She live here? Yo who? Mike McCoy, Investigations. You got a card that says that? Let's go inside, huh? Just you got a card. Just show me. Is Miss Martin here? No card. Huh? If I say, yeah, she's here, then what happens? I said inside. <laughs> now, where is she? I'm glad you pushed me, son. Now I got a reason. What? No! Oh! When I opened my eyes, the guy was still there, all seven feet of him. You ain't gonna take me, Shaman. You ain't gonna take me. Oh. This time, I played at Brainy. I peeped first. He was gone. I got to my feet. I got to my feet. Fell down, then finally made it over to the hallway where there should have been a bathroom and a towel and some water. The thing that stopped me was the girl in the negligee. She was sitting on the floor against the wall. She was blonde, and her head was turned to one side as if she was wondering about me. There was a stocking tied around her throat, and she was dead. And now, back to the McCoy. Starring Howard Duff. I didn't know whether I'd been out for a few minutes or a few days. I decided on the minutes because the girl's body was still warm and 
death hadn't taken charge long enough to wipe the prettiness out of her face. I'd seen her a couple of times long ago. In the jungle picture spliced between the main feature and the newsreel, the girl in the puttees who gets chased by the lion, Stella Martin. I stopped trying to convince myself it wasn't real. It was real, all right, and I didn't need the pounding on the door to knock it into my head. I didn't need Koska either, but I had him. What is this, Mike? You want a rampage? You want to know what happened, or you want to be a big man? Now, just be gentle with me. That's all I want you to do, Mike. Fifteen minutes ago, I was in a warm bed. Just be gentle. I got slugged. A man seven feet tall in a black leather jacket. Hmm. Look, Mike. I spent five hours questioning Roy Fulton about the murder of his girlfriend, Toby. Nothing. He quoted poetry. Then I climbed into this warm bed, and I was sleeping fine. Then Sergeant Hurd called. Seems someone phoned in this address to Sergeant Hurd. You were saying what, Mike? She's in the hallway, propped up against the wall. Show me. Here she is. She's young and she's strangled, and her name's Stella Martin. You want to clear it up for me? You want to listen about a guy in a black leather jacket? Seven feet tall, eh? Yes, yeah, seven feet tall. Find him. That shouldn't be tough for a sharp fellow like you. Now, don't be sour on me, Mike. You took some lumps and you... Hmm. You see this, kid? What? This. Holding something in her hand. Well, now. Well, well. Read it, Mike. Read what it says on the paper. There'll be another one tomorrow, McCoy. Another one tomorrow, McCoy. McCoy. Well, now. What makes me so popular, Costco? Why doesn't it say your name? Why doesn't it say Sergeant Hurd? Because it says McCoy. Because it says the name of a guy I stumble over when I get out of a warm bed. Because you know things you're not telling me and you're not going to tell me because you think it's clever to obstruct justice. Oh, what am I going to do with you, Mike? Take you downtown and sweat you? Watch you be a hero because you won't tell me what you know? Get out of here, Mike. Get out. And then to my room in Las Palmas, pull the Murphy bed down, adjust the beaten frame to the broken spring, and lullaby yourself to sleep with what makes two girls dead from a pair of silk stockings. What made Stella Martin and Toby Drake so close they had to hug death in the same way? And the next morning, Saturday, torn out of sleep by the sound of the mockingbird screaming the name of Phil Gardner, agent. I told them to button their bills and went there. Girls drop like flies where you walk, McCoy. Oh, turn your gyp sheet into my girl in the cashier's cage. She'll pay you off. Kiss you goodbye to the firm. She'll also give you all the messages from Mabel we've been taking for you. Uh, what's the matter, Phil? Only yesterday we were in love, you and I. So what does it buy me? A lousy ride to a place where the morning paper says a, a has-been is dead? Call her by name, Phil. Because you must have called her by name lots of times. Stella Martin. Let me hear you say it. Okay. Th keep away from me, Mike. I told you, I, I hardly knew the dame. Say a name, Phil. She's dead. The least you can do for her is to say a name. No. Say it. No. Or else she'll break my arm. Huh? Here, here, and here. Stella. Stella Martin. You kill her, Phil? My arm, Mike. I don't think it's a sign you check. How long have you known Stella? Uh, three months ago, pickup from Dorcas Drive in on Santa Monica. A guy gets lonesome for a car hop like Stella. A friendly pickup, so help me. You did lovely, Phil. Now, tell me one thing more. You know a man who wears a leather jacket who's seven feet tall? Somebody help me. I got a madman loose. Bye, Philzy. For two lovers like we, you've made the morning stink. I got to the drive-in on Santa Monica. A cowgirl with a menu and a pair of heavy-duty sheer dungarees threw a card on my windshield that said Phyllis on it. Dorcas, she asked back. Why, that's old Mel over that away, mixing up a parcel of nuts and cheese for the Super Burgers. I uh, moseyed on over to old Mel, but the critter saw me coming and snapped his galluses at me. Howdy. Yep. Do tell. Uh, Mike McCoy, criminal investigation. Melvin Dorcas, short order fella. Howdy. Howdy. You the manager of this place, Mel? Former. Big is. Hmm? Tenderfoot talk, don't let it throw you. I uh, need some information, Mel. Who'd you say you be? Uh, uh, Mike McCoy, Criminal Investigations, I be. 
Don't be a gravel kicker, son. Speak up. What's on your mind? Know a girl named Toby Drake, Mel? Knowed her. Used to work here. One named Stella Martin? Yep. She's due to work this morning. She ain't gonna make it, though. She's dead. Her and Toby. Choke. Clean it in the Gazette. I need your help, Mel. Oh, deputizing me, huh? Well, I don't know. I just don't know. If you don't help, there's liable to be another dead girl. Yeah, Peggy. Who? What's the matter with you, son? You got monkeys in your ears. I said Peggy. Peggy Bryan. On account of them three girls with thicker than a bobcat's tail. Do tell. Thicker than that even. Peggy used to work here, too. Drove to work in Toby's auto. You know where I can find Peggy? North Hollywood she lives in. You wait a little bit. I'll dig up her address. You want to wait, son, or do you got to be riding on? You'll wait, won't you? I'll wait, Mel. I'll wait. I'll wait. Talk to the neighbors inside, Peggy. Come on. Hush, baby girl, hush. See? I'll let you go. Nothing to be scared of. Don't do that. Scream, but don't do that. Kill me. Get it over with so I can rest. Kill me. Try to understand. I'm an investigator. I'm hired out. Sometimes I keep people from dying. Sometimes I don't make it. Now help me, baby, so I can help you. That way will save us both a lot of pain. So right. Just because I'm so right. Sure. Now, uh, whoever killed Toby and Stella, why would they want to kill you? Tell me, Peggy. Uh, a woman was killed. We killed her. What woman? I don't know. I can't even remember her name. It was three years ago. Toby and Stella and I, we had a little car. A jalopy. One day. One day. One day what? This woman crashed into it. It was her fault. Honest, it was her fault. And she was killed. A married woman. The police said it wasn't our fault. It's the only reason. Why else would anyone want us dead? It's Saturday, Peggy. What do you do with yourself on Saturday? I shop for groceries. For a new house dress sometimes. I, I need a new one. We'll go buy you one. And tonight. What'll we do tonight? You mean you're asking me for a date? Mm hmm. What'll we do tonight, Peggy? Saturday nights, I usually go to Ocean Park. It's fun. Rides and people, the fellas. It's fun. Sure, it is. Saturday night, Ocean Park. We'll have fun. Then I made a lot of phone calls to my call service to tell them I was going to Ocean Park with a girl named Peggy Bryan. They told me that Mabel was keeping her line open for me. I told them to tell Mabel to, uh, to keep it open. Then I called Agent Phil Gardner and let him know where I was going. Next, I got Tosca on the phone. I didn't tell him anything. I asked him something. But no tall man in a black leather jacket was newly arrived in the pokey. Finally, I called Roy Fulton, Toby's boyfriend, the man who quoted poetry, and let him know all about my plans for the evening. And then, nothing daunted, I took Peggy Bryan by the arm, opened the door for her, and bowed her into my car with a flourish. At Ocean Park, I bowed her out. The least I could do was to make it gay for her. After all, she was my personal pigeon. Let's just walk for a while, Mike. Whatever you say. You hungry, Peggy? Uh-uh. Let's run the roller coaster. Sure. Peggy. What? Just stand still for a moment. Look around you. See anybody you know? No, Mike. Let's run the roller coaster. Right. Want to eat now? I 
always have fried shrimp when I come to Ocean Park. Yeah, me too. I know what you're doing, Mike. Sure you do. I'm on a Saturday night date with a nice girl. You think you'll find me here, Mike? You want me to level, don't you? Is he going to kill me? Not while I'm here. Come on, let's eat. <laughs> Two tickets, please. Thanks. Let's go, Peggy. Stay close to me, Mike. A girl can get lost in the fun house. A girl can get lost, period. Mike. Oh, Mike. What's the matter, honey? Nothing. I'm having such a good time. You ever been through that spinning barrel? I always fall down. I'll hold your hand. Mike. What? That man. Huh? That man over there. He watched the fire picket. Which man? The tall one. The one wearing that black leather jacket. Yeah, I see him. Peggy, walk through that spinning barrel. Fall down if you have to, but get right up and get out on the other side. Either Go on. I'm right in back of you. Get out of this thing fast. I'm staying. I've been telling you, son. I've been waiting. Get out of there. Get out of there. All right, now talk. Talk and say, help me. You crazy son. Talk. You think I killed her? I didn't kill Stella. She was dead when I got there. I swear she was dead. Yeah, yeah, sure she was. And you come in, I went crazy. I wanted to kill something to get even. Why are you following me? Because you're a shamus. If you get to the killer, I want a piece of him. I didn't kill Stella. you got to believe me. You've got to... Peggy, what's the matter? The mirror! Look! The mirror! He was in the mirror, all right. His reflection in the crazy, rippled mirror of the front house. Roy Fulton's reflection. Long and thin, as if he'd been squeezed together. This time, there was no poetry, just a gun. I pulled Peggy down on the floor with me. The crowd scattered, and there was nothing in Fulton's way. Mike! It's her! I want Mike! It's her! I was lucky. My shot got to him, but he kept coming. Then it caught up with him. But he didn't fall. Fulton. They killed my wife. They killed Me. Hello, Miss Ford. Remember me? You wanted me for the uh, talking pictures? Yeah. Oh, Mike. Mm hmm. Oh, you saw it in the papers. That's right, Roy Fulton. Yeah, his wife had been killed in the automobile accident, and he blamed those three girls for it. He was uh, definitely off his rocker. Uh, baby, uh, baby Miss Ford, uh, what are you doing tonight? A ballet dancer. Instead of me? But a ballet dancer. Miss Ford, Miss Ford, Miss... I'll be seeing you with all your familiar faces. Hello, uh, Mabel. This is the McCoy. The McCoy, starring Howard Duff, is written, directed, and produced by David Friedkin and Morton Fine with music composed and conducted by Walter Schumann. This has been an NBC Hollywood Program Department presentation.
21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Uh, wait a minute, lady. Talk slower. I can't understand you. A man in the hall? What's he doing there? Yeah? Yeah? Was he drunk? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. I'll send an officer over right away. Well, don't worry about it. He'll be there right away. He'll take care of it. Yes, ma'am. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. It had been a quiet night in the precinct, and after I turned out the platoon for the 12 to 8, as superior officer on duty in the division during the night, I was called to the 23rd precinct to supervise the patrol force on duty at a three-alarm fire near the approach to the Triborough Bridge. I was still out of the precinct at 2.10 a.m. when patrolman William F. Coley, assigned to post number four, approached a call box on York Avenue to make his hourly ring. Sergeant Waters. Patrolman Coley, Box 31. Hold on a second, Coley. I've got something for you. Yes, sir. Listen. Walk around the 341 there. Yeah. A party named Heel has called in. There's a drunk sleeping in the hallway. Okay, Sergeant. When you get it cleaned up, ring in again. You'll take your meal. Yes, sir. Yes? Uh, I hate to bother you, but I'm a little confused. Uh, which way is the subway station? The uh, Lexington Avenue subway? Uh, yes, that'll be all right. That's four blocks this way and one downtown. Oh, thanks. It's all right. I got sort of mixed up. Is um, that a local or, or an express station? A local. Which way are you going? To, to Brooklyn. Well, then take the local to Grand Central, then change for the express station. Oh, thanks. Ah. Uh... Yes? Do you smoke? Yes, ma'am, but uh, not on the job. Look, officer. What? There's just one or two cigarettes smoked out of this package. I'd like to sell it to you for a nickel. But, madam, I Please. Told... I've got ten cents. I need fifteen to ride the subway. Oh. Please take what's in the pack of cigarettes and, and give me a nickel. It's a bargain. It's really a bargain. Look, I don't want your cigarettes, lady. You can see I'm dressed all right. I'm not a tramp. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. That's right. It's really a long, sad story. I'd rather not go into it if you don't mind. But you don't have to. Do you, uh, you want to borrow a nickel? I want to sell you my cigarette. That's not necessary. Here. You, uh, sure you have the dime? That's all I've got. Here you are. Oh. And here are your cigarettes. Oh, forget it, I... I can afford to be that generous. Where can I send it to you? Forget it. It's nothing. Look, I certainly appreciate it. You you don't know how much I appreciate it. It's all right. I know how you feel. I don't know what to say. You you can not a tramp. It's okay, lady. Oh, uh, I've got a job in this building. Now, you just walk over to Lexington Avenue in downtown one block. Well, thanks a lot. It's okay. I certainly appreciate it. Really? Yeah. Are you the policeman? Yeah, that's right. He's on the second floor landing, passed out drunk, right outside of my door almost. Look, the downstairs door is locked. Can you press the buzzer? Uh, all right. J- just a second. Okay. He's still here. 
still passed out. All right, I'm coming. How'd he get in here? I don't know. Well, don't worry about it. I'll take care of him. An old man like that will lose all his self-respect. Hey, Pop. Pop, come on, wake up. Uh, what's the matter? Come on, Pop, sit up. Oh, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Ashamed uh, of yourself. That's it, Pop. That's it. What are you doing here? Oh, sleeping, that's all. Just sleeping. Look, don't you know better than to get drunk in other people's hallways? No, I'm not drunk. I was just sleeping. Look, Pop, you can kid yourself, but you can't kid me. No, I'm not drunk. I'm 78 years old. I never had a drink in my life. Then what were you doing here? What were you doing in this hallway? I was sleeping. Can you stand up? Of course I can stand up, but... The idea... Coming into a hallway and sleeping. Well, I wanted to sleep someplace. Don't you have a home? No, not anymore. You live someplace, Pop. Where? If I lived someplace, I'd be there. I wouldn't be sleeping in the hallway. Why did you have to pick my hallway right outside of my door? I'm sorry. I didn't know it was your hallway. Any hallway had been good enough. What's your name, Pop? You called me Pop. Now, come on, will you? Pop is good enough. Look, old timer, it's two o'clock in the morning and we're going to wake up the whole building now. What's your name and where do you live? My name is Pop and I don't live any place. Look, I can't stand here and waste time with you. I can take you down to the station house and we'll get it settled there. He's not drunk. What do you want to do that for? Lady, you sent for the police. I thought he was drunk. You can take me to the station house if you want to. I don't care. Look, I want to be reasonable. Just tell me your name and where you live and what you were doing here. And we'll see if we can get the whole thing straightened out. You saw what I was doing here. I was sleeping. Well, what's your name? Pop. All right. You, uh, you have a phone, don't you, Mrs... Uh... Healer. Mrs. Bertha Healer. You have a phone? Uh, yes, I have a phone. We go inside so I can ring in. Uh, yes, we can go inside. But what are you going to do with him? He wasn't drunk. I, I was mistaken about that. Look, I don't know what to do with him. That's what I want to ring in for. Let them tell me. Patrolman Coley rang into the station house and explained the situation to Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer on duty. He was instructed to bring the man to the station house, and for this purpose, an RMP car was sent by radio to the address. In the meantime, the fire in the 23rd precinct had been extinguished, and I returned to the 21st. It was 2.25 a.m. when I got out of the car, crossed the sidewalk, and walked up the three stone steps into the muster room of the precinct house. It is required by the manual of procedure that the commanding officer sign the blotter immediately upon leaving or entering the station house. And I went around the desk to comply. Hello, Captain. Sergeant? 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Hello, Red. Captain? All right, hold on. Lieutenant? Yes? Gay Hill is bringing in. Reports one mail at Roseville Hospital in that auto wreck. Tesla went over in the ambulance. All right, tell him to resume patrol until Kessler rings in that he's ready to be picked up. Yes, sir. Okay, Red, it's all yours. Resume patrol. Big fire up there, Captain? Yeah, Red. Call when you're to pick up Kessler. It uh, burned out this one building almost completely. Ran about 30 families out on the street. Lucky it's a warm night. Yeah. And uh, we had to reroute bridge traffic. Nobody hurt, was there? No, the alarm was turned in fast. Come on, Pop. Right up to the desk. Where? Where do you want to? Uh, right here is all right. Here he is, Lieutenant. Hello, Captain. Coley? You still won't tell you his name, Coley? No, sir. Will you tell me, Pop? Well, if I wouldn't tell him, why should I tell you? What's this all about, Coley? Well, he was sleeping in the hallway, Captain. The lady who called in thought he was drunk. All right. Boy. I wasn't drunk. I never had a drink in my life. Well, uh, what were you doing there, Pop? Sleeping. Now, look, Pop, we don't want to put you in jail. Let's get it straightened out. What's your name? Well, I'm not so sure jail would be so bad. At least there's a bed in jail. The floor in that hall is kind of hard. Well, what about your family? What about them? Well, where are they? Can we get in touch with them? I'd, I'd rather go to jail. Well, it wouldn't be any problem. Sleeping in a hallway, that's disorderly conduct. Maybe you call it disorderly conduct. I was just sleeping because I was tired. How old are you? 78. I was 78 in March. Don't you have any money? Well, I've got three, four dollars. Look, don't you want to tell us your name? No, no, I thought I made that clear. Well, then, how can we help you out? I don't know that you're trying to help me. If you are trying, I don't know that I want your help. We are trying to help you. Well, maybe so, but I'm still not going to tell you my name. All right, Coley. 
Let's see what's in his pockets. Put your hands up on the rail, Pop. Well, I don't want to let you search me. Oh, look, it's the law, Pop. We're required to search all prisoners. Well, if it's the law, I, I don't want to go against that. Oh, Lieutenant. Uh, yeah. Thank you, I think I saw an alarm yesterday. Missing persons report on a 78-year-old man. Did you? I think so. All right, and go see if you can locate it. Yes, sir. Uh, right away, Captain. $3.88. Gee, I was pretty close about the money. I said between 3 and $4. A pipe, some tobacco. You're not going to take that pipe away from me. I've had that 16 years. You'll get it back, Pop. One key, a door key. Well, you can throw that away. I don't know why I'm carrying it around. Well, that's all. No identification, Coley? Not a thing, sir. Look inside his suit coat pocket, see if there's a label. Yes, sir. You won't find the thing now. There's no use looking. No, no label, Captain. Nothing here. I think I found the alarm, Captain. Now, come on, Pop. We don't want to waste any more time. Description fits. We should be out catching robbers. i better get that. Uh, excuse me, Captain. Yeah? Put me in jail if you want to. Pop, is your name John W. Lowfield? 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Is it? We have a missing persons alarm for a John W. Lowfield, age 78 years old. Put out yesterday morning by his daughter, Mrs. Elizabeth Heppel, 42 West 79th Street. She, uh, she says he's missing from home and describes him as 5 feet 8 inches tall, 145 pounds, medium build, gray, almost white hair, glasses, wearing a... Brown suit, gray sweater. Well, this suit's brown, isn't it? And the sweater's gray. Are you John W. Lowfield? The uh, description says he has a two-inch cut scar in the palm of his right hand. Let's see your right hand, Pop. He's got a cap. I'm not going back there now. There's no use you calling her. I'm not going back there. I, I'm, I'm just not. Why not? They don't want me. She's your daughter, isn't she? That doesn't make her want me. She got worried that you were missing. What did you do? Run away? No, I, I didn't run. I'm too old to run. I just walked. You are listening to 21st Precinct. A factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. If you were to sit down and list some of the rights and freedoms that you have, you would probably list the big things like, oh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, and others. Well, those are mighty important. But what about the little things? Things you don't think about much because you pretty well accept them as a matter of course, like choosing the business or profession you want to go into. You know, in some countries... You work at the job assigned to you with no free choice at all. Or like getting as much education as you can in schools that are open to all. In some countries, education is only for the privileged few. Or take a little thing like buying a house or renting an apartment for your family. There are places in this world where you live right where you're told. Have you ever thought about why you're allowed these free choices? Why you accept it as your right? It's because such free choices are guaranteed to you and your children and to generations in the future. To be exact, it's in Article 9 of our Bill of Rights. The men who wrote our Constitution and our Bill of Rights put this in just in case they forgot to mention something important in the other. It says, The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. You get that? It's not left to Congress or the President or any special group. These rights belong to all of us, to the people. It's one of our freedoms. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. Because John W. Lowfield, the 78-year-old man found sleeping in the hallway at 2 o'clock in the morning, was the subject of a missing persons alarm, he was not booked in on the charge of disorderly conduct. Instead, he was taken upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad to await disposition of the case. In the meantime, Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, informed the Manhattan Communications Bureau, which in turn put out a cancellation of the alarm on the teletype. According to established procedure, the desk officer in the 20th Precinct on the west side of Manhattan sent a patrolman to the residence of Mrs. Elizabeth Heppel, the daughter of John W. Lowfield, 
who reported him missing, to notify her that he'd been located. At 3.15 a.m., while I was out on patrol of the precinct, Detective Edward D. McInerney returned from his meal. Carrying a paper bag, he walked in the front door of the station house, through the back room, and up the stairs to the 21st Detective Squad. Here you are, Pop. Brought you a container of coffee and a Danish. Oh, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. I didn't know how much sugar you wanted, so I brought three lumps. No, I don't use any sugar. Now, how much do I owe you? Oh, you don't owe me a thing. No, no, you're, you're not supposed to buy food for me now. Forget no, it. No, no, how, how much is it? Forget it, Pop. I've got money. <laughs> Save it for your old age. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, excuse me. Yeah? Uh, are you sure they notified my daughter? Well, that's what the desk officer says. Says you'll be here in a little while. Uh, I didn't want them to do that. Well, Pop, that's life. We can't have things the way we want them all the time. Yeah, that's, that's life. Is that about me? Why? Is what you're writing there about me? Oh, no, Pop. It's about something else. It's 61. Oh, th- that's so? Yeah, it's a crime report. It's about a lady who left a package in the car and the door is unlocked. She came back. She was very surprised to find the package gone. Oh. Do you have to do that with every little thing? With every little thing, yeah. yeah. This day and age, Sherlock Holmes make a lousy detective. He couldn't type. Hello, Ed. Lieutenant. Did Fitzpatrick ring in? No, sir. You were up early this morning, Lieutenant. Yeah. I hope it wasn't anything I did. No, it wasn't anything you did, Pop. Lieutenant King, Mr. John W. Lofi. Uh, how do you do, Lofi? He was the uh, subject of missing persons report. Daughter's on her way over here to get him. I didn't ask her to come. I don't want her to come. I wish they'd just take me back where they found me. That's all right, Pop. You'll be better off at home. If I had a home. Now look, Ed. Yes, sir. Who's on the job? Goldman, Vitali. Where are they? Out making an investigation. Have them ring in here. Yes, sir. I don't want her to come for me. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Uh, Sergeant, would you have CB put out a call for 419 to ring in, please? Okay. Thanks. What have you got hanging in? Nothing much, Lieutenant. Just pop here. All right, Ed, you come with us. I'll take care of him downstairs. No, no one has to take care of me. I can take care of myself. Oh, Matt. Captain. Well, at six o'clock, you said you were going home to get a good night's sleep. Yeah, that's what I planned, Captain. What's doing? Ed. Yes, sir? Go in my office and ring up Cassidy and DeLuca at their homes. Yes, sir. Tell them to meet us at the 44th squad at four o'clock. Yes, sir. Right away. Well, I just came up to see that you were getting taken care of, Mr. Lowfield. Oh, I'm getting taken care of. I'm getting taken care of fine. Except you won't let me go. Well, your daughter will be here right away. That's the reason I want to go. Oh. What's doing, man? Well, the two boys that stuck up the laundry on York Avenue last week, remember them? Yeah. Fitzpatrick got a line on them, traced them out to a flat up on the 44th. He's got the place planted, rang in, rang into me at home. We're going up there to see if we can collar them. Well, are you sure they're the right ones? Well, according to Fitz, they are. He said he had some good information on them. He said he woke up the super of the building they're staying in. They answer the description of the boys we want. Well, it'll be a good collar. They're probably right for a lot more beside that laundry. Yes, sir, I know they are. Here, where can I put this? In? Right in the wastebasket there, Pop. 21st Squad, Lieutenant King. Where are you, Goldman? All right. Come on in here right away. We've got a job. I wanted to pay that detective for the coffee and the sweet roll, but he, he wouldn't take the money. I don't want anyone to pay for me out of their own pocket. <laughs> he comes from a rich family, Pop. Uh, still, I wish he'd take the money. You're not going to leave home anymore, are you, Mr. Lowfield? All you do is wind up in the police station. Well, now I haven't made up my mind that I'm going home. I, I don't think I am. Why did you leave in the first place? You're half my age, aren't you? Well, a little more than half. Everyone gets old, Pop. Old, yes. But old and in the way. 
Good night, everyone. After Lieutenant King and his detectives left for the 44th Precinct, John W. Lowfield was brought downstairs where he was told to wait in the back room for the arrival of his daughter at the station house. I went into my office where I occupied myself reading and signing reports and communications which would be forwarded to division at the completion of the tour. At 3.40 a.m., the muster room was quiet except for an occasional call heard over the monitor of KEA 394, the police radio. The desk officer assigned to the 12 to 8 tour has the added job of classifying and filing various reports turned in during the preceding 24 hours, and Lieutenant Gorman was busy at this task. Sergeant Waters was at the telephone switchboard. Sergeant. Yes, sir. What time is Coley due to ring? 48, Lieutenant. When he rings, I want to talk to him. Yes, sir. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, there's nobody up in the detective, sir. They're all out on a job. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, hold on a second. I'll give you the 124 man. Maybe he can help you. Sergeant Waters, Fallon. A lieutenant from the Manhattan West Homicide Squad is ringing in for some information about an armed robbery we had in the 21st last week. Well, the detectives are all out. See if you can help them. Okay, hold on. Go ahead. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Give me a line on there, would you please? Yes, sir. You want some coffee, Lieutenant? Uh, no, not right now. Hello. Uh, Miss Reynolds Sturgis? Uh, this is Lieutenant Gorman of the 21st Precinct. Yes, that's right, the police department. We're holding a Joseph Killiam here. Uh, yes, he's been arrested. Simple assault. He got in a fight in a bar and grill on 3rd Avenue. He asked that we notify you. He's being held in $200 bail. Yes, we'll accept the bail here. Well, you better get here before 8... Yeah, eight, 8 in the morning. He goes to court then. Okay. Okay, I'll tell him. Okay. You'll have to wait until the lieutenant gets off yeah. the phone, lady. I'll tell him. Oh, thank you. Bye. All right. You can talk to him now. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm Miss Elizabeth Heppel. Oh, yes. I was notified my father was here. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Where? Well, he's in the back room, but the captain wants to talk to you first. Is anything the matter? No, he just wants to talk to you. Uh, cross the room and in that door. All right, thank you. Just knock on the door. Thank you. Yes, come in. Oh, come in, please. Thank you. That's all right. Just leave it open. I'm Miss Heffel. Oh, yes. Uh, won't you sit down? Where's my father? He's in the back. We've been worried. We've been worried to death. He left the house yesterday morning before breakfast. We didn't know what happened to him. We didn't hear from him all day. We thought he was sick or hurt in an accident or something. He's 78 years old, you know. Yes, I know. We uh, found him sleeping in a hallway. In a hallway? That's right. It doesn't sound like my father. It is. I don't understand him. He doesn't want to go back. He doesn't? No. Well, he has to come back. There's no place else for him to go. Why did he leave? You know? He's been living with us eight years since my mother died. He's never done this before, never. Well, he must have had a pretty good reason. Especially if he doesn't want to go back. I don't understand him. Do you want him back? Well, yes, of course we want him back. Of course we do. Where else is he going to go? After all, he's my father. Why did he leave? It was my fault, I guess. My fault, my husband. Yes? We had an argument the other night. About him? No, no, not the way it started anyway. It was about something I served for dinner, meatloaf. My husband doesn't like meatloaf, not the way I fixed it. Well, he got started on the meatloaf right at the dinner table. Was your father there? Yeah, we were all eating together. My husband, myself, my father, and my two sons. One thing led to another, and Harry and I... Oh, Harry, that's my husband. We started screaming at each other. 
He said he pays the bills. All he gets is meatloaf that he doesn't even like. And the first thing you know, we were screaming back and forth about my father, and he was sitting right there. Guess we didn't even realize it. Harry says he's been living with us all these years, and we've been supporting him, and my sister does nothing about it. You know how those things lead one to the other. Yes, I know. Harry really likes my father. They get along swell. They, they play chess. They watch the ball games together. They, they, they really get along swell. Sure, he didn't mean anything. Uh, it must have sounded like he meant something. Yes, it did. Yes, it sounded like I meant something, too. I said I'd been trying to get my sister to take him for a while. Got so we didn't even realize he was sitting there listening. I guess it's just got beyond control. We were both sorry right away, right away. We said so. We told him. He said, that's all right. He went in his room. We thought everything was okay. Except when we woke up in the morning, he was gone. I see. Well, he'd never done that before. Like I said, we didn't know what to do, so... I waited a couple of hours until after lunch. He didn't show up then. I knew he didn't take any of his clothes except what he wore. I started to get worried. Called Harry at his office, and he told me to call the police, and that's what I did. You're sure you want him to come home? Of course I'm sure. He's my father. He seems determined not to go. Well, where is he? Can I talk to him? Yes. Oh, we'll have to go in the back. Uh -huh. I don't know where he'd go if he doesn't come home. He has no place to go. My sister's out in Ohio. He's got no money. No money at all except what we give him. I, I don't know how I can explain to him what happened. You understand, don't you, Captain? Yes, I understand. In back, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. He slept in a hallway tonight. He must have slept in another one last night. He must have, yes. Right in here. Oh. Hello, Papa. I'm sorry to cause you more trouble, Elizabeth. I'm sorry you had to get up in the middle of the night. It's all right, Papa. Why'd you run away? Oh, because I didn't want to be any more trouble. You're no trouble, Papa. Yes, I am. An old man. An old man with no money living in his daughter's house, making more work. Causing arguments with her husband. That, that, that's trouble. That's a lot of trouble. You know, we were sorry we had the argument. We told you. Right away, we told you that. Well, because you told me that doesn't make me less trouble. Please come home. We want you to come home. Harry and me and the boys, we all want you to come home. Well, where's Harry? Why didn't he come and tell me himself? Well, one of us had to stay with the boys. Well, he should have come and told me himself. He's sorry. You know he's sorry. No, I, I don't, Elizabeth. Not for sure. Uh, I can only hope that he is. He is, believe me. Well, all right. If you want me... We want you. Captain, thank you. That's all right, Mr. Lofi. Come on, Papa. We'll get a taxi cab. Uh, a taxi cab? I guess they really want me back, Captain. Thanks, Cap. Yes, sir. I guess they do, Mr. Lowfield. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. He caught a thief or he saw a thief? Yeah? Yeah? Where is it? And oh. so it goes, around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. Today and every Saturday morning, the sun-kissed drawers of California and Arizona present transcribed for boys and girls the thrilling adventures of Billy Swift, the boy detective. This week, the boy detective upholds law and justice high in the mountains. J. 
Jeff Buckley, a young mountaineer, has been mysteriously shot. Good morning, Sun-Kissed Timers and members of the Sun-Kissed Secret Service. Good morning, Ken Carpenter. Good morning, Bill Goodwin and boys and girls. And of course, it's always good morning when you begin with a big glass of delicious, fresh, Sun-Kissed orange juice. It has a keen taste that starts the day right. But more than that, it's helpful in keeping those three important training rules. Plenty of exercise, plenty of sleep, and plenty of good food. It helps you make the right kind of gains in height and weight. Helps you build sturdy bones. Helps you have strong, sound teeth. Gives you a better appetite for other good foods. So be sure to start every day the right way with a big glass of delicious, fresh, sun-kissed orange juice. And be sure to listen at the end of this program when Billy Swift tells you how to join the sun-kissed secret service. So here we go for the 17th episode of The Boy Detective. Certain that his son Jeff has been murdered by Lem Cole another young mountaineer, old John Buckley is determined that Cole shall be found and made to pay the penalty for his crime. Outside his cabin, Buckley, mounted on his horse, is preparing to join in the hunt for the murderer when he is halted by his daughter. Oh, where are you going? I reckon you knows where I'm going, Sally. Are you joining up with those men to hunt for Lamb? Joining up? I'm leading them. We'll beat these hills till we find that cuss. Oh, Paul, if you do find him, promise you won't do all to him. At least twice if he's had a chance to talk. I ain't promising nothing. Shame on you, Sally, for standing up for the cuss what killed your brother. He never done it, Paul. I knows he never done it. Hold on. Who's that yonder coming along the trail? What? See him? Coming along on a horse. Oh, sure enough. I never seen him before. He's a foreigner. Yes, sir. Well, he ain't going no further than these hills that I know who he is. I'm a riding down there to stop him. Get it. I'm coming along too, Paul. Oh, oh. Yonder he comes, Paul. Hold up there. Where are you going? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Speak up. Where are you going? I'm going up to see Tom Wallace. What's the idea of poking that rifle at me? What's your business with Wallace? I don't know that it's any of your affair. Come on, let me buy. Stay where you be. We ain't allowing no foreigners in these mountains unless we know who they are and their business. All right. My name's Billy Swift. I'm spending a few days with Wallace to do some hunting and fishing. Does that satisfy you? Huh? I don't know you ain't a liar. So you think I'm lying? All right, wait a minute. Here's the letter Wallace wrote me asking me to come up. Go ahead and read it. Show it to my gab. I ain't had no book learning. I allow it's all right, Paul. Else he wouldn't be aiming to show it to us. Why don't you leave and go on? Mm-hmm. Well, go along with you then. But see you go right to Wallace's place. Don't worry, I will. Get up then, boy. Come on, get along. Mm. Appears to me like Wallace be too busy to go a having visiting, folks. Well, being a furner himself, I know he wants a furner for company once in a while. Uh, uh, maybe. Maybe. Uh, ain't this preacher coming? Howdy, folks. Howdy, Pritchard. Who's that yonder that just rid off? Oh, some foreigners going in to visit Tom Wallace. Yeah. So? Well, look here, Paul. You draft something. Who? That boy. It's a card. Well, like as not it fell out in his pocket when he took that letter out. And what did the printing say? It says, Billy Swift, detective. Detective? Detective? What does that mean? It means that there is business, I reckon. A detective's a fellow what tracks down thieves and murderers and the like. So that's what he uh, He's come here to meddle in the affairs of us mountain folk. No, he ain't, Pritchard. Wallace invited him in to do some hunting and fishing. Ah, uh, that's so, Pritchard. He had a letter from Wallace. Well, got to be getting on. We ends are starting out to hunt for Lem Cole. You coming along, Pritchard? No, Buckley, I can't. I got other matters to tend to. Uh, 
Later in Tom Wallace's cabin. So old man Buckley stuffed you with the rifle, did he, Billy? I don't know if his name was Buckley, Tom, but... Well, he... you say the girl's name was Sally, so it must have been Buckley. Well, I'm not surprised. Do these mountaineers stop everybody like that? Generally, they do if they don't know you. They're fine people, Billy, but very independent. You see, they've lived in these hills since Revolutionary War days. They haven't had much contact with the outside world, and they don't want any. I see. They like to mind their own business and be let alone. And that's why they keep their eyes open for furriners, as they call them. Well, in a way, you can't blame them. Would you like a cup of coffee, Billy? I can make some in a very few minutes. Oh, no, Tom, don't bother. What's oh, no trouble. No, really, I wouldn't care for any. You know, that rifle old Buckley had was the strangest-looking weapon I ever saw in my life. <laughs> well, chances are it was an old flintlock. A flintlock? Yes, Billy. The old-timers in this country still use them. A regular old flintlock musket that loads with a ramrod. Well, they mold their own bullets. Well, can you beat that? Yes, you've got to realize that you're stepping back about a hundred years when you come into these hills. <laughs> You'd be surprised at the superstition some of the older folks have. Yeah? Some of them still believe in witches, as a matter of fact. Is that right? Yes. Oh, and speaking of flintlocks, there's a legend to the effect that the only satisfactory way to kill a witch is with a silver bullet. You don't mean to say they actually shoot women they suspect of being witches. Well, no, it hasn't been done in recent years. But the belief about the witch bullet still hangs on. Oh, I guess we've got a caller. Come in. Oh, hello, Sally. Howdy, Mr. Wallace. Howdy, Mr. Swift. I see how you got here all right. Oh, you're the girl I met down on the trail. Yes. Uh, sit down, Sally. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Looks like rain now. Oh, is that so? Yeah, but I'll I come anyhow. I, I just had to come. Well, say, Mr. Wallace, have you told Mr. Swift all about Lynn? Why, no, I haven't, Sally. He just got here a little while ago. Don't you want him to know about Lynn? Oh, yes, I sure do. That's why I come here. Mr. Swift, I, I ain't aiming to be forward. And I know you're a foreigner and all, but but I was a thinking you might help me out, being your detective. How do you know I'm a detective? In case you draft this card over to our place. Oh. But, Sally, Billy came up here for a vacation, you know. Yes, I'm a known there. What's it all about, Tom? Well, day before yesterday, Sally's brother was killed, Billy. He was shot from ambush over near the coal cabin and died a few hours later. And there is saying Lim Cole done it, Mr. Swift, but he never, he couldn't have done it. The young Cole's the fellow Sally's been keeping company with. Oh, I see. We, we were going to get married, Mr. Swift, but, but now I reckon it can never be... You say they accuse Lem Cole of this crime? What do you mean by they? Oh, everybody. Paul, mostly. Paul and, and some of the men is out of hunting for Lem right now. Hunting for him? Yes, Billy. You see, right after the shooting, Lem disappeared. Why, after the shooting? He went away before the shooting. Well, now, Sally, I'm just telling Billy the story as I heard it. Maybe you've got a different version oh, of it. Oh, I sure have. Mr. Swift, Lem told me two days before the shooting that he was aiming to leave for a while. Because he couldn't stand Miss Millie no longer. He said he was a going to hunt for a job someplace so he could take me out of the mountains after we was married. Who's Mrs. Millie? She or old woman would come to live with the Coles long before Lamb's poor and more died. She ain't no blood kin of Lamb's. She's sure been making his life miserable because he was keeping company with me. You see, Billy, there's been bad feeling between the Coles and the Buckleys for years. And even though Millie isn't really a Cole, she hates the Buckleys just the same. I see. And I suppose the Buckleys haven't liked the idea of Lem going with Sally either. Uh, hardly. A few days before he was killed, Jeff threatened to get Lem if he didn't keep away from his sister. But that ain't no proof Lem shot him. Lem wouldn't kill my own blood brother, loving me the way he did. Uh, nevertheless, Sally, that's the reason folks think he shot him. Oh, Mr. Swift, can't you see it ain't true? Oh, if, if you'll only help me out, I'll be everlastingly bouncing to you. You mean you want me to prove that Lem's innocent? Yes, sir. It'll have to be done mighty quick, too. He might come back on these mountains most any time now, and, and they'll string him up sure as you're born. Did they recover the bullet that killed your brother, Sally? Well, you'd have to ask Pritchard about that, Mr. Swift. He took care of Jeff after he was shot. Is Pritchard a doctor? Oh, he's the nearest thing to a doctor they've got around here. But if you ask me, he's a greedy, unscrupulous old skin flint. Yeah? And he makes these people give him the very clothes off their back in exchange for his quack medical services. Uh-oh. There comes your rain, Sally. Say, I'd better get my horse under shelter. Yes, I'll get my coat. No, sit still, Tom. I'll take care of it. Where can I put the horse? Well, there's a lean-to around back. You'll see my horse there, but uh, I'd better come with no, you. No, no, I've got my coat on. No use of our both getting wet. Mr. Wallace, do you reckon he will help me out? Well, I don't know, Sally. You must remember it's pretty hard for an outsider to do any investigating in these mountains. 
Wasn't that a shot? Yes, it was. Billy! Billy! Here I am. We hear the shot. I'll say. It went right by my head. Look there where it hit the side of the cabin. I see who done it. Yonder he goes. Where? Heading into the timber on a horse. It's old man Pritchard. Pritchard? It certainly is, Billy. What would he be shooting at me for? He never saw me before in his life. Yes, he did. He's seen you riding away from our place. Does he know I'm a detective? He was there when I picked up the cord. Well, I guess he doesn't want a detective in these mountains. Yeah, evidently not. Look, Sally, you bet I'll help you out. You go on home and wait. Tom, let's get our horses and go to Pritchard's place. I want to ask that guy a few questions. <laughs> Thirty minutes later, Billy and Tom are well on their way to the Pritchard cabin. I'm glad the rain's let up for a little while, Tom. Oh, so am I. We'll get some more of it, though. Oh, by the way, there's the coal cabin back there through the trees. Is that so? I didn't know we'd pass the coal place on the way to Pritchard's. Yes, yeah, right along here some places where Sally and Jeff were walking when Jeff was shot. Was Sally with him when he was shot? Oh, I guess she forgot to tell you about that. Let's stop here. I want to size up this place. Whoa, boy. Yeah, whoa, whoa easy. So that's where Lem and old Millie live. Yep. You can see how easy it would have been for Lem to shoot through a window and hit Jeff. Yeah, but I'm not so sure Lem did it, Tom. Well, neither am I. I'm just showing you one reason why the mountain people suspect him. Say, is that Millie over by that shed? Yes, it is. And by George, there's Pritchard, too. Yeah? See him standing there in the doorway of the shed? So that's Pritchard. What's he doing here, I wonder? Well, I don't know. Looks like he and Millie are having an argument about something. They certainly are. Gee, I wish we could take it in. Can't we ride around behind the place and get close to that shed? We can try, Billy. Come on, I'll show you the way. During this pause in our story, we hear from Ken Carpenter. You know, there are many delicious foods and many that are good for you. But it isn't often you find one that's both as delicious and healthful as sun-kissed oranges. A big sun-kissed orange is just the thing for dessert with your school lunch. It's a good thing for between meals eating in the morning or afternoon. Gives you quick energy, but doesn't spoil your appetite for lunch or dinner. Ask your mother. Back to our story. Behind the underbrush near the shed, Billy and Tom listened to Pritchard and Millie talking. Well, it ain't gonna do you no good to take on about it. Oh, hate it. All I got to say to you, Pritchard, is that you're a scoundrel and a thief. That's about enough now. Well, yeah. You ain't going to be satisfied just taking my cow. Next thing I know, you'll be making me give you my chickens and hogs. Well, you'd be getting off lucky if I did. Now, get out of my way whilst I leave this cow out of here. There he goes down the track. Millie, this is Billy Swift, a friend of mine. Howdy. How do you do? We saw Pritchard leading your cow down the trail. Well, what about it? Oh, nothing. Only we were just wondering if you'd sold her. No, I ain't sold her. The cow's sick. He's taking her over to his place to give her some medicine. Well, couldn't he bring the medicine here? What business is it a yearn? What did you come here for, bringing that boy? Well, Harry, where'd he go? Here I am. Say, Tom, what's this thing here? Why, that's Millie's bullet mold, Billy. You keep away from there. I had an idea that's what it was. Get away from there. What business you got prowling around my cabin? Now, Millie, don't get so mad. Is that any way to treat company? I ain't a want to no company. I want you both to clear out. All right, let's go, Tom. Well, I guess we better. I hope you're in a better humor next time we call, Millie. Get out! Well, that's that. Did you hear what she said about the cow? Yeah, I did. She's afraid to tell the truth, Tom. She's afraid of Pritchard. Yeah, she must be. But what's it all about, anyway? That's for us to find out. In the meantime, I found something that may help a little. Yeah? Look here. I found this in a crack in the floor, right under that bullet mold. Why, it's silver. Sure. She's been molding a silver bullet, Tom. Remember the story you told me about the witch bullets? Yes, but I don't see any connection between a witch bullet and the murder of Jeff. I think I do. Come on, let's get our horses and go to Pritchard's place. (laughs) 
Meanwhile, in a dense thicket near the Buckley cabin. Liam! Liam! It's you! No, Sally. I thought you never were going to hear me. Liam, has anybody seen you? No, Sally. Oh, thank the Lord for that. Oh, Liam, the terrible thing has happened whilst you was away. I know, honey. I heard about Jeff down at Weaver Crossing. I hear they think I done it. They do, Liam. Paul and the men are out of hunting for you right now. Yeah, I see them. You see them? Uh-huh. They was just down a little piece down the mountain from here. But they never seen me, honey. I was on foot, and I cut around through the timber. Oh, I was wanting to see you, Sally, to, to tell you I never done it. I know you never done it. But you can't stay in these mountains. They'll get you. What are I going to do? Oh, oh, I don't know. I reckon you'll have to go fur off someplace. Might be I could join you later on. Oh, you you have to join me, Sally. But you can't make a move till nightfall. You stay right here in the brush. After supper, I'll All come right, out. Come out, man. Come out, man. No. Yeah, we better want to give him quite a spell, you mud and sneak. Oh, no. No. Get up on your legs, Liam. We're taking you to Oak Creek. Oh, no. There's good hanging trees oh, no, down there. Please, 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 oh, Come no. On, get no, along. Paul. Back to Billy and Tom. Arriving at Pritchard's cabin, they open the door and walk in. Well, you're here, I see, Pritchard. What do you mean, walking in my house without knocking? We want to talk to you, and we're not standing on ceremony. Yeah. What was the idea of taking a shot at me a while ago? Oh. You, don't try to deny it. Tom saw you, and Sally Buckley saw you. You're crazy. Oh, no, I'm not. You wanted to get me out of the way, didn't you? You'll get out of my house. Get out. Watch him, Tom. Never mind that rifle, Pritchard. I've got you covered. Stop aiming that gun at me. You'll sit right there till we find out what we want to know. Where's the bullet that killed Jeff Buckley? Bullet? Yeah, the bullet. We know you've got it. Well, I ain't. What'd you do with it? I throw it away. Oh, no, you didn't. You might as well tell us where it is, because we're going to get it. It ain't here, I tell you. I guess you better have a look for it, Billy. You bet I'll have a look for it. You'll get run out of the country for this. We'll see about that. Uh, try some of the drawers in that old cupboard over there, Billy. I'm going to. I swear I'll have you both raw hided down the mountain for this. I'll line you how to come in an honest man's house. Honest? Why, you old crook, you've been cheating the people around here for years. I found it, Tom. I found Good. it. Good. Here it is. Here's your silver bullet. So you threw it away, did you, Bridget? That ain't the bullet that killed Jeff Buckley. No? You'd be surprised if I proved it was, wouldn't you? Billy! Billy, Mr. Wallace! It's Sally. Come in, Sally. Oh, Billy. Billy, they caught Liam. What? Yes, Billy, they found him. They're taking him to Oak Creek to hang him. Oh, can't you do something? Can't you stop him? You bet I can do something. Oh, Billy. Can we get there in time? I don't, Billy. Tom, I'm going with Sally. You bring Pritchard to Oak Creek. I don't care how you do it, but get him there. Bring old Millie, too. And bring a rifle. Get there as fast as you can, Tom. the driving rain once more descends over the hill country, the angry mountaineers with Lem Cole in custody arrive at Oak Creek. Right here is a good tree, man. Oh, boy. All right. Getting down off in that horse, lad. Man, you throw this yard rope over that limb. And be sure to make a good slip knot. Hey, you leave that to me, John. No, I never tell you, I tell you. I never. Get down off that horse before I drag you down. You all are making a bad mistake. You'll be sorry. Oh, can't you even give me a chance to say nothing? Chance? A chance you want. What chance did you give my poor boy, Jeff? Eh? Hey, answer me that. None whatsoever. You shot him in the back. I never. I swear to heaven, I never. You got that rope ready, Ben? Yep, it is ready. Good. 
Hit him over there, man. You all are going to be sorry for this. You're going to be plumb sorry. Get the noose around his neck, then. You're hanging an innocent man, I no, tell you. No, no, you ain't. You're guilty of sin. I never done it. I was on my way to Weaver Crossing when Jeff was shot. You ask Millie. We don't ask Millie. She says you lit out right out of the shooting. She, she said that? Sure. Sure, Millie said that. Now, what do you got to say for yourself? No, 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 it ain't true, I tell you. Let's not listen to no more of his puppy dog whining. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, lads. Get on this rope and string him up. Get on, string him up. Hold on. Hmm? Hold on. Who are they coming yonder? Why? Oh, it's Sally. And that foreigner. Stop. Don't hang that man. Oh, Oh, wait. Thank goodness we got here in time. Look, Buckley, Lem Cole didn't kill your son. What do you mean, Sally, bringing this meddling foreigner here? We uns ain't standing for no interference. Oh, we sure ain't. Now, wait a minute. Sure, Miss Stranger, but I'm going to see that justice is done. If you men are the men I think you are, you'll want to see that justice is done, too. Sure, sure we want to see justice done. That's why we're hanging Lem. Lem didn't kill Jeff, I tell you, Mr. Buckley. Old Millie did. Millie? What's he talking about? Yes, she did. See this bullet? See this silver bullet? Why? Why, that air, a witch bullet. Certainly it's a witch bullet. Millie molded it herself and killed Jeff with it. He's trying to tell Wins old Millie took Jeff for a witch. Hang him! String up Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, man. She didn't say anything of the kind. Sally was walking right beside Jeff when he was shot. Sally, you tell him about Aunt Millie. Well, she hated me because... If I married Lamb, she wouldn't have no support. She's been telling folks I was bewitched. You see, she molded the witch bullet for Sally, and she intended to kill Sally. But her aim wasn't very good, and she hit Jeff. That air a crazy story you're telling? Oh, no, it isn't. I think I can prove it when Tom Wallace gets here with Millie and Pritchard. What? Yeah. Pritchard? Yeah. Millie? We're going to have a showdown on this all the way around. Well, what's Pritchard got to do with it? Plenty. He's known all along that Millie killed Jeff with this silver bullet, and he's held it as a threat over Millie's head. A threat? What do you mean? I mean he's been blackmailing her, threatening to expose her if she didn't give him a property. Wallace and I saw him taking Millie's cow away from her this afternoon. Well, Father, come now, Billy. Show sure enough. There's Wallace bringing him into part of a gun. Whoa! Here they are, Billy. Everything all right? So far, Tom. I play this as an outrage. Hold on a minute, Pritchard. Hold on. Now, look here, Millie. This fella says you shot my boy with a witch bullet. You hear a lie! Oh, yeah? And Pritchard. Pritchard is a saying you knowed it all along. Occasion you took the witch bullet out of my boy. Here a lion foreigner. He stole a silver bullet from my place, but it weren't took out of Jeff. Oh, no? Listen, man. I'm so sure I'm right about this that I'm going to prove it to you right now. Tom, did you bring Millie's flintlock? Yes, Billy, here it is. All right. There's a way of telling if a certain bullet came out of a certain gun yeah. by the marks on the bullet after it's fired. And so? So I'm going to fire a shot from this flintlock into one of these trees. Then we'll dig it out and compare it with the silver bullet. What are you doing? Get him! 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 Get
You got my blessing. Oh, Paul. Well, Tom, I guess we better get back to your cabin. We've got a lot of hunting and fishing to do. Boys and girls, right now, here's Billy Swift to give us a few words about the Sunkissed Secret Service. I should say so. A lot of members are writing us that they are forming Sunkissed Secret Service Club in their neighborhoods with everybody joining. And that's fine, because we want to have every boy and girl who has a liking for adventure, mystery, and detective work. When you join, we send you the official Sunkissed Secret Service membership card and tell you how to get your detective's badge, your fingerprint outfit, your secret automatic code maker, and lots of other equipment you need in secret service work. But the first thing to do is to send for your membership card. And if you listen carefully, I'll tell you the easy things to do to get it. First, write down the passwords, Sunkissed Secret Service, on a card. Second, below that, print your name and address. Third, cut the trademark from the skin of one Sunkissed orange. Fourth, Put the card and trademark in an envelope and mail it to Sunkissed Care of this radio station. That's all there is to it. But be sure to do it right and right away so that you'll get your operative's card with Billy Swift's picture on it, be a member, and enjoy all the advantages of the Sunkissed Secret Service. And so that's the end of Chapter 17 of Billy Swift, the Boy Detective, and Chapter 294 of Sunkissed Time. And here's Ken Carpenter. With a reminder to keep those training rules. Plenty of exercise, plenty of sleep, plenty of good food. And be sure to start every day the right way with a great big glass of delicious, fresh, sun-kissed orange juice. Like sun-kissed time, it'll bring a... Good morning to you. Good sun-kissed morning to you. Have you noticed the hands of the clock? Yeah. Time for a love story. Now look at your own hands. Lonely, aren't they? Folded together on your own lap. So, just use one to dim the light. And reach for the hand of your favorite person with the other. And then, don't do anything till you hear from me. Did you ever stop to think what multi-facet means? Well, a facet is a surface, a little face. So multi-facet means many-surfaced. A multi-facet diamond is a many-surfaced jewel. The only diamond with 40 extra sparkle surfaces around the rim, where other stones are left unpolished. And did you ever think that with those additional planes of brilliance, a multifaceted diamond is very much like love itself? 
For perfect love, too, is a thing of many facets. Of passion, tenderness, hope and trust and affection. Now, in olden days, lovers searched the world for love potions to help them win the hearts of their adored ones. But never was there a love potion so effective as a dazzling multifaceted diamond to capture the love of the girl you want. Never before the invention of the patented multifaceted process were their jewels so packed with color and depth and radiance. So, if you really want to see the love light in her eyes, try Dr. Cupid's prescription, a multifaceted diamond, spelled M U L T I F A C E T. Multi facet. <laughs> Stand by for a sigh, and lest remain, alias Romeo. Hello. You know, last night I met a girl who liked music, so I sang for her. <laughs> I really sent her home, but I caught up with her. And this time I didn't sing. I talked of love, of romance. Of the moon gold in her hair by moonlight, and then, oh, but I know you're just waiting for our story, so here it is. Hey, old timer. Eh? You seen a girl here? Maybe you know her, Miss Scott. Eh. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, say, look, is there a phone inside the general store? Eh. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, long distance? I'm calling New York, Murray Hill 35834. Thank you. Hello? Henrietta, this is Scott. Good heavens, what are you doing in New York? Scott, darling, where are you? I'm in High Point, remember? You and your father were supposed to meet me here. Henrietta, this oh, is God, a... Oh, God, honey, I'm so sorry. You see, I didn't get home until late last night. Well, how am I supposed to get in the cabin? Silly. Hodgkins, our housekeeper, will be there. And we'll have a wonderful week together when I meet you tomorrow. Yeah. All right, I'll see you tomorrow, darling. For a week of good outdoor sport in the mountains. <laughs> Mr. Scott? No, I'm Scott... St I'm Scott Stewart. Uh, you're, uh... I'm Hodgkins. Hodgkins, huh? Eh? Yes. Well, I, uh, I expected, uh... <laughs> well, that is, I, I expected... Uh, someone older? Someone older. I see. Come in, Mr. Stewart. Thank you, thank you. I'll get my bag. Miss Henrietta called me about instructions. Oh, yes, yes, she was supposed to meet the me. Fact the fact is, can't... Mr. Stewart, I can't cook. You can't cook. No. And guns terrified me, and the woods frightened me, Does the and... prospect of showing me to my room horrify you? Oh, no, Mr. Stewart. Then lead the way, woman. Oh, and have some kind of food ready for me. In one hour, I'm hungry. Here, here you are, Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Hodgkins. Well, it looks, uh... <clears throat> It looks, uh... Good? Uh, yes, yes, uh, good. Is it stew? Uh, lamb stew. Oh, lamb stew. Huh? Uh. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, uh, awfully good. But, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not hungry. Uh. I, I think I need some fresh air. Sorry, Hodgkins. I, I'm going outside. <laughs> So good to see you, darling. I'm sorry I couldn't meet you yesterday. Well, it doesn't matter now, darling. Oh, Scott. 
Be careful. You're wrinkling my new suit. Oh, with me, clothes don't matter. Nothing matters except you and me and the big outdoors. <laughs> yes, sir, this week together in the mountains. Well, it's, it's, it's just what we needed to prove that we were meant to be together. <laughs> uh, where's your father? Oh, father? Yeah. Oh, well, he, uh, he had some business to attend to in New York. Stock exchange, you know, big business. <laughs> well, maybe he'll be here later in the week, darling. Well, I don't know, Henry. Oh, nonsense, dear. We have Hodgkins to chaperone us. Hodgkins? Do you know that that girl doesn't even know how to cook a, a lamb stew? I know. <laughs> but tonight I'll cook. And, Scott, you've never tasted cooking until you've tasted mine. Oh, Henrietta, I... Oh, hello, Hodgkins. Uh, uh, this evening, for a change, we're going to have a good meal for Mr. Stewart. And, uh, Hodgkins, I'll want you to help me in the kitchen. Who knows? Maybe you'll be ideal at peeling potatoes. <laughs> Henrietta, this is the best meal I've eaten since I... <laughs> now, dear, you just go out on the porch and smoke. I'll take care of the dishes. All right. I can't trust Hodgkins with a thing, you know. <laughs> I'll see you later, darling. <laughs> that you, Henrietta? No. It's Ellen. Ellen? Well, Ellen, I, I don't think I... Hodgkins to you. Oh. <laughs> nice night, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you're a funny girl. In what way? Oh, I mean staying up here in this cabin when you could be... When I could be what? Well, you're young and pretty and... Well, when, when you look at me like that, I... Hodgkins. Ellen, I, 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 I shouldn't have done that. No? It's ridiculous. I like a woman who loves the outdoors, who can handle a gun, who can... Cook? Uh, yes, cook. It sounds as if you're talking about me, what? Scott. Oh, oh, well, now, now, Henrietta, I, I, I know this looks very funny, but I, I can explain. There's nothing uh, to explain, Scott. I uh, often find my housekeeper in the arms of my fiancé. You needn't worry, Miss Lewis. It was a mistake. The heck it was. I'd do it again. Scott! You still needn't worry, Miss Lewis. Because Mr. Stewart is never going to get the chance. Ah, oh, me. Some outdoor man that Scott Stewart is. He wants a woman who can handle a gun. But his trouble is, he can't handle the woman. Oh, if that Hodgkins could only cook. Well, maybe she'll cook up something. So stick around for a while, hmm? The next time you go into a jewelry store, set your sights on a multifaceted diamond. Ask to see these gorgeous, shining jewels, each one with its flashing rim of 40 extra facets, the extra sparkle surfaces that give greater color, depth, and brilliance to the diamond, the extra sparkle surfaces that make a multifaceted diamond seem larger, more impressive, if you haven't seen a multifaceted engagement ring, you're missing something. If you haven't given your one and only a multifaceted, you're missing something more. You're missing the chance to say by deed, as well as word, I love you. To start a lifetime of happiness together, give her a multifaceted. <laughs> Now, back to our story, and alias Romeo. Well, Scott Stewart wants to marry an outdoor girl who's equally handy at shooting a rifle and roasting a chicken. His wealthy fiancée, Henrietta, seems to fit the bill all right, but now Scott finds himself attracted to Ellen Hodgkins, Henrietta's beautiful young housekeeper. But, oh me, Ellen can't cook, and she claims she hates the big outdoors. Well, it's the following day now, and Henrietta and Scott are out for an early morning walk. And suddenly... Oh, Scott, look. It's a kitten. Kitten, my eye. That's a mountain lion <laughs> oh. cub. Henrietta, come back here. Leave it alone. Oh, don't be a fuss, budget, Scott. It's cute. I'm going to take it home. Put it down. If the cub's mother sees you, she'll tear you to pieces. <laughs> Put the cub down and run. Oh, oh. oh, fine. She's fainted. 
back, you lion. Hell yeah, for Christ's sake. What in the dickens is going on? Is she all right? Helen! You fired that shot? Yes. And I also did all the cooking that Henrietta took credit for. Oh, Ellen, And I, now I... you better pick up your outdoor girl before she catches the cold. She'll keep for a minute. Ellen. What? Ellen, when I kissed you last night, something... Something happened that... To you, too? You mean you, too? Uh-huh. Oh, Ellen. Darling. <laughs> what happened? Hmm? Oh, Scott, Hodgkins, you stop this minute. Stop interrupting, Henrietta. Scott, you're out of your mind. Will you stop kissing my housekeeper this minute? Stop? Yes. Henrietta, my sweet, you don't seem to get the idea. We're just getting started. Oh, love. Well, it looks as if Ellen is one catch that Scott is going to bring back alive. Incidentally, if you're having trouble capturing a certain lady's heart, there's one weapon that never fails. It's a multifaceted diamond engagement ring. Even an inexperienced marksman can score a bullseye with a multifaceted. And if she hasn't said yes tonight, well... Why don't you ask her again? Hmm? take it from here. Just keep the lights dim and be sure to stay close together with your hands softly touching. And by all means, look into each other's eyes. And then, if you're feeling very, very romantic, remember, don't do anything till you hear from me. Mr. Smith, starring Alan Jocelyn as Jeffrey Smith and Ed Brophy as Herbie. <laughs> Jeffrey Smith, so you all will know, is a young man about Hollywood who has the amazing faculty for attracting trouble in various and unexpected forms. From his family, Jeff Smith has inherited a comfortable income. While from his army career, he has inherited his ex-sergeant, Herbie, who has since become a devoted valet, chauffeur, and bodyguard. Our story starts late Friday evening, as we find Jeff and Herbie speeding up the coast highway toward Loon Point, a small peninsula jutting out into the Pacific north of Santa Barbara. They are to spend the weekend as the invited house guests of Patricia Gilmore. And so begins the story of the Hooting Owl. <laughs> Herbie, we should have been at Pat Gilmore's place hours ago. I don't mind being late, but do we have to be lost, too? I'm sorry, boss. The reason we started late was because my watch stopped. Your watch stopped? Honest, it's the first time in my life I ever got five o'clock shadow at seven o'clock. <laughs> Herbie, how would you like 30 days with Abbott and Costello? Hey, wait a minute. There's a gas station up ahead. We can stop and ask for directions. Yes, sir. Something I can do for you, mister. Well, we have enough gas, thanks. Can you tell us how to get to Loon Point? We're looking for the Gilmore place. You mean Greystone? Gravestone? 
Did you say great... Oh, Greystone. Oh, yes, I thought you said Greystone. It could be grave, mister. The owl's been hooting up there. All right, Orson. But how do we get there? <laughs> you get there by staying on this highway for three miles till you hit a dirt road. Turn right for about two miles and keep going. You can't miss Greystone. But if you're smart, you might want to miss it. Oh. Well, uh, thanks very much. When I get back to town, I'll send you a nice vampire. You can joke all you want, mister. But we got a saying around these parts. When the owl hoots twice, beware. Horrible death is in the air. <laughs> well, so long. See you in a bad dream sometime. Hey, boss. Did you hear that poem? When the owl hoots twice, beware, horrible death is in the air. I never heard that nursery rhyme. Sure, Mother Goose Pimples. Well, Herbie, I guess this is the Gilmore house. What a creepy joint. I heard of ivy clinging to a place, but this stuff is strangling it. Yeah, it's quite a house. Looks like a headstone with windows. Well, come on, grab one of the suitcases. We'll make a run for it. It's starting to rain pretty hard. Okay. You know, this house would make a great set for a Charlie Chan picture. You please to come in. Hmm. Perfect casting. <laughs> Miss Gilmore, a gentleman to Rome. Please follow Lee Singh. Uh-huh. <laughs> you unpack the bags, Herbie. I'll be up soon. Okay, boy. Oh, there you are, Jeff. You were a darling to come out in all this rain. Hello, Pat. Hello, Herbie. Hello, Miss Gilmore. Nice night for a murder, isn't it? <laughs> yes, this hallway is a little gloomy. Let's go into the library. The fire's still going. It's right here. Oh, say, this is swell. Nice and warm. Want to hold hands? Oh, Jeff, please be serious. Okay, let's neck. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you don't understand. I've got to have a serious talk with you. Oh, look, Pat, you've known me for years. I'm not the type. You and the gang and I'll have some laughs. We can talk later. But I haven't invited anyone else down here but you. What? That's a fine house party. You, me, and a Chinaman all alone in a haunted house? Oh, well, we can always scare up a fourth for bridge. Oh, I didn't mean to scare it up that fast. Oh, that must be that owl that the fellow was telling me about. Jeff, who told you about the owl? Wait a minute. You mean there is an owl? You mean that road company Dracula was right with that gruesome poem? And I'm in a house that's empty with nothing but Chinamen? That can't happen. I'm getting out of here. Jeff Smith, don't be fantastic. There are some people here. People? Well, bring them in. Let's play gin or scotch or bourbon. Do something. <laughs> Who are these live, uh, these lovely people? Well, there's my younger brother, Dick, and Mr. Grimshaw, the family lawyer, who came down yesterday, and, of course, Uncle Jonathan. Look, Pat, what's it all about? I don't get it. Well, it's pretty hard to explain, but I'll start from the beginning. You see, after Dad died six months ago, the only thing left was this depressing place and the boathouse and the boat. So my brother Dick and I decided to come up here for a while. Well, let's get back to Uncle Jonathan. I never heard about him. We've been living alone here. Well, Dick and I had no place to live, so we moved up here last week. And from the moment we set foot in this house, I felt that something was wrong. Like what? Well, there's the owl, for example. And Lee Singh, Jeff, he terrifies me. Why don't you fire him? Send him back to Warner Brothers. <laughs> when, uh, there's another thing. Do you remember my little spaniel, Tony? Yeah. I found him dead last night. Took him to the vet this morning, and he was poisoned, Jeff. Cyanide. Oh, that's tough, Pat. But after all, why should anybody want to deliberately poison a little puppy? I don't know how to explain it, and I know it sounds crazy, but I could swear that someone's trying to get Dick and me out of this house. That's why I called you down. Jeff, you've got to help me. Pat, you'd better stop listening to those programs. The thin man, the fat man, the cat man, the rat man. <laughs> Jeff, I'm not imagining things. I really... Pat, need... Help somebody! Help! What, help! What's that? That's Dick upstairs. Come on. Dick, what is it? Come on, hurry. I think Uncle Jonathan's been murdered. <laughs> He 
He's all there. right, Pat. Yes, there. See, his eyelids are moving. Well, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. They're giving us a scare like that. I couldn't help it. I was going down the hall to see if Jeff had arrived when I noticed the door to Uncle's room was open. Well, I, I looked in, and there he was, slumped down in the wheelchair, out cold. I thought he was dead. Anything can happen in this house. Whoever attacked him must have hit him on the head with this paperweight on the floor here. That's right, Wood. The guy must have got out through that open window. Herbie, did you hear any noise? No, Lee Sting and me were next door packing the bags in your bedroom. Then we heard some yelling, so we ran out here. Oh, oh, oh. Well, it looks like the smelling salts are working, Jeff. Uh, yes, I guess so. Better give him some more of this. Here you are, Uncle Jonathan. Take a little more of this brandy. Oh, oh. oh must be a scotch drink. <laughs> It's me, Pat. Uh, Pat? What happened? Don't let him get away. Who's this man? Maybe No, no, this is Jeff Smith. He's a good friend of mine. Leave me alone. They're trying to kill me. They're trying to murder me. I know it. What's going on here? What's the trouble here? Grimshaw, they're trying to kill me. Uncle, please. Now everything's going to be all right. What's happened here, Patricia? Won't somebody tell me? Who is this man? This is Jeff Smith, a good friend. Jeff and I were talking down in the library when Dick discovered that Uncle Jonathan had been attacked. We ran up and found him unconscious with that gash on his head and the window wide open. That's right, Mr. Grimshaw, and I suggest we phone the police. Herbie, you better go out and use that phone in the hall. Okay, boss. Pat, I've got to get out of here. This house is driving me crazy. I, I haven't slept a wink since I've been here. Now, Dick, control yourself. No one's going to harm you. Oh, no? Listen, Mr. Grimshaw. Where were you during the last ten minutes? How come you didn't hear all this? My boy, what are you inferring? Dick, please. Well, leave me alone, Pat. I know what I'm saying. Hey, boss. What's the matter? Hey, boss, guess what? Just like a mystery, the wire's been cut. What the wh- phone's dead. A phone? Oh, Herbie, the storm probably blew the wires down. How do you know they've been cut? Boss, are you asking me? I know a good job when I see one. This is crazy. I think we should send Lee Singh down to the village for the police, then go to our rooms, lock the doors, and relax. Is it all right with you if I lock my door tonight and relax tomorrow? <laughs> oh, uh, Lee Singh. Lee Singh, you hear? No, don't do that. I'll never play Chinese checkers again. <laughs> Very sorry, Lee Sing go for please. Come back soon. What do we do now, Jeff? Well, I think we ought to make Uncle Jonathan comfortable and then take Mr. Grimshaw's advice and go to our rooms. Oh, that owl again. Bad luck. Uncle Jonathan's fainted. Never mind. We'll get to him later. Mr. Smith fainted, too. <laughs> What happened? You must have fainted, Jeff. Yeah. The owl hooted twice and you passed out once. Miss Gilmore and me brought you down here to the library. What? Oh, oh. <laughs> must have been the excitement. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have much dinner tonight. Ah, oh, boys, you know you put away a steak for dinner. Well? You were just scared. Scared? Listen, Herbie, just mention one thing that frightens me. An owl. That's enough. <laughs> Pat, while we're waiting for Lee Singh to come back with the police, I want to ask you a couple of things. First of all... What are all those big lamps doing in your uncle's room? You mean the arc lamps? Uncle Jonathan uses them for his photography work. It's his hobby. It's his hobby, huh? Well, who are all these people he thinks are after him, trying to kill him? I don't know, Jeff. Pat, can I ask you a frank question? Certainly. Do you think your uncle's nuts? (laughs) Don't be absurd, Jeff. Although I will admit he's been acting strangely ever since Dick and I arrived. He stays up in his room all day as though we were in deathly fear of something. Hey, boss, how about that lawyer, Grimshaw? He said he was walking around outside in the storm. He could have climbed up those big vines outside Jonathan's window, clunked them a good one, and got out again. That's some walk. Up a wall. But, Jeff, I can't believe anything like that about Mr. Grimshaw. Dick and I have known him ever since we've been children. Look, boss, I got another idea. Pardon me, Miss Gilmore. I'll put your brother Dick. He could have gone in the old guy's room, give him a knock, and let out a yell. That's possible, ain't it? Herbie. Oh, shouldn't have said ain't, huh? <laughs> <laughs> This is all horrible. First Mr. Grimshaw suspected, and now Dick. This house is driving all of us mad. I've got to get out of here. I'm going back to Beverly Hills. No, Pat, I don't know if that's... <laughs> I don't know if that's such a good idea. If somebody really is trying to get you out of the house, you'll be doing exactly what they want. Why don't we wait for Lee Singh to come back with the police? What's taking him so long? He should have been here by now. Maybe I ought to have a take a look around outside the house, huh, boys? Yeah, Herbie, you go ahead. Okay, I'll be back in a moment with Chow Mein Joe. <laughs> It's Lee Singh. Look, it's Lee Singh, I tell you. 
Only Lee Singh. Presently a corpse. Smith, you mean to say that Lee Singh's body was propped up against the library door with a knife in his back? Ridiculous. I refuse to believe he's been murdered. All right, then he wasn't murdered. But if he was my bridge partner, all he could do is play dummy. <laughs> I insist that someone go for the authorities at once. You saw what happened to the last man who tried it. Would you like to go, Mr. Grimshaw? Oh, well, I... <clears throat> That's what I thought. Uh, Anyone else like to go? Don't look at me, boss. Has anyone told Jonathan... Lee Singh was his servant. He might know something about this. We can't just sit here idly by while murder is committed under our very noses. What should we do? Stick out our very nexus? <laughs> You're not very amusing, Smith. I advise all of you to come upstairs with me. Now, we must... All right, come on. Hey, boss. Did you get a good gander at Lee Singh? Yes, yes, Herbie. Did you see something screwy? Quiet. I know what you mean. I noticed it, too. Are you going to tell him? I don't know yet. Jonathan, are you awake? Jonathan! Jonathan! Yes? Who is it? Who's there? It's Grimshaw. May I come in? Yes, yes. Come in. Grimshaw, what happened? Why are you all here? Uncle Jonathan, we must talk to you. It's important. Well, what is it? Something's wrong. Where's Lee Singh? The police! Jonathan, I've, uh, Well, I've bad news for you. Lee Singh never reached the police. He's been murdered. Murdered? Who did it? Why are you all standing around? Why don't you do something? Search the house, the grounds. I don't think there's much use in doing that. Jeff, what do you mean? I mean we all ought to go to our rooms, and this time stay there until morning. And lock the doors, too, huh, boys? Herbie, as my old college professor used to say, et lumen numen in hoc veritas ad valorem. Boss, what's that mean? I'm a Yale man. It means lock the doors. <laughs> what are you driving at? What's on your mind? I'll tell you what's on my mind, Mr. Grimshaw. You all saw Lee Singh's body. Didn't anyone notice that his raincoat was dry? I don't understand, Jeff. What are you trying to say? Well, it's pretty simple, Pat. It's been pouring outside, and if Lee Singh's coat was dry, then he didn't set foot out the front door. In other words, Exactly. You mean... The murderer of Lee Singh must be hiding somewhere in this house. Now I suggest we all go to our rooms and go to bed. Yeah. But if you fall asleep... What suckers? <laughs> Well, let me in. All right. Wait till I move the furniture away from the door. <laughs> How come you're not sleeping? I'd rather worry. Me too. Well, pull up a shiver and sit down. <laughs> you know, Herbie, I think we ought to go back to Beverly Hills. Well, what about Miss Gilmore? She's counting on you. Yeah, and if we hang around here, they'll be counting over me. <laughs> Look, let's handle this thing scientific. You saw all those thin man pictures... In a case like this, what would William Powell do? I don't know. I'm always watching Myrna Loy. <laughs> I tell you, there's one thing, though, I can't get off my mind. You mean about the owl? Yeah. Every time something happens, that owl hoots. And every time that owl hoots, something happens. That boy hoots every hour on the hour. <laughs> this may turn out to be a gruesome watch crime. Oh, oh, oh silly. <laughs> Herbie, who in this house do you think would know that superstition about the owl? I guess the old geezer, Uncle Jonathan, would know all about it. Hey, you mean Lee Singh clipped Jonathan? Then the old guy knifed him back for revenge? But how could he get out of the wheelchair? Uncle Jonathan might have had an accomplice. Yeah, the lawyer Martin Q. Grimshaw. What about Dick? I got it. He's helping Grimshaw. And I was helping Dick and you were helping me? Then I'm the murderer. Herbie, Herbie, remind me to stick your head in a doorbell sometime. Listen, boss. Somebody knocked off Lee Singh. If it ain't the people we know, then there must be another guy. And if he ain't hiding upstairs, then he must be downstairs. That's right, Herbie. We're upstairs and he's downstairs. Good night. Okay, good night. Wait a minute. If the guy is down there, maybe we could catch him. That's what bothers me. Besides, what chance have we got without a gun? I got my gun. Oh. Oh, we'd have to have a flashlight. I got a flashlight. Me and my big mouth. Listen, boys. Suppose there is a guy downstairs. 
It's still two to, two to one. Sure, two to one we don't come back alive. Oh, well, all right. Let's go. Boy, this hallway is pitch black. I can't see a thing. Hey, but boss, when, when you were a little boy, were you ever afraid of the dark? Yes, I am. <laughs> Herbie, I mean, don't, don't, don't be so nervous. Are you kidding? You're funny nervous yourself. Don't be silly. Well, if you ain't nervous, then why are you shaking? I'm not shaking. I just have good rhythm. <laughs> Hardly see up here. Don't fall on the stairs. Oh, don't worry. I won't. Lizzie, look out! Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. I needed some new x-rays anyhow. The kitchen is down this way. Say, that was some fall you took. Those stairs must have been covered with Johnson's glue coat. I only wish I'd landed on my coat. Here's the kitchen, boss. You look at the door. I'll try the window. Everything seems to be okay. The door locked from the inside. Hey, look at those big pantry closets. I wonder. You think the guy's hiding in there? Well, let's try one and see. Get out your gun and I'll open it. Are you ready? Hey! Look at all the grub. Cans of soup and rice and beans. Look at all that stuff. All these other closets are full of food, too. Must be at least 500 cans of soup. Wait a minute. I'm beginning to get a rough idea of what's been happening in this house. You know where the waiter is hiding? Or is that a stab in the dark? Uh, don't say that. Come on, we've got to check the other rooms down here. I'll take the dining room and you try the library. Boss, you know what you're asking me to do? No, what? Leasing was in there. You're asking me to hobnob with a cadaver. Oh, a dead person can't hurt you. I know, but can he do me any good? <laughs> all right, all right, I'll go with you. I'll open the door and you throw your flash around the room. Here goes. Did you see anything? No, no. Hold that flash still. Stop shaking. Boss. The last time Lee Singh was here, where was he? Why, he was right over there next to that. Hey, Lee Singh's body has disappeared. I don't get it. A man goes for the police, he disappears. We find him dead, his body disappears. Dead or alive, that guy is certainly restless. <laughs> I can't figure it. I'm all at sea. At sea? Herbie, maybe you've got something. Sure, the boathouse. What's down at the boathouse? I think we'll find the answer to this whole mystery. Come on. Wait a minute. Take it easy. There's a storm outside. And we don't know who's in that boathouse. Let's not rush into things. But, Herbie, I thought you wanted to help Miss Gilmore. Remember, chivalry's not dead. Sure he ain't. Because he don't stick his nose in other people's business. <laughs> Guess our guy's in there, all right. What do we do now? I want to get a look in that window. With all this rain and wind, we can sneak right up. He'll never hear us. Be careful. Come over here out of the light. Don't make any noise. I'll be as quiet as a ghost. My ghost. Hey, I see him. He's dressed like a sailor. What a tough-looking guy. He's... Say, what's he doing now, boy? He seems to be pushing against that far wall. Yeah, look. The wall's opening up. There's a passageway. Why do they always have to have a passageway? Listen... We gotta work fast. Get over there next to the door. I'm gonna knock on this window. He'll see me and rush out the door after me. Then you let him have it. Are you set? In spades. Here we go. Yeah, who's there? What do you want? Here he comes, Herbie. I'm waiting. Boy, oh, funny. Hey. One good one. Give me like this. Oh. Hey. What? <laughs> One wallop and he... I started to take Seratan before I was 35. <laughs> Here, help me drag it inside. Okay. Mm. Get a load of this guy's puss. What a nasty-looking face. He looks like... Use this rope. I'll tie him up tight. I'll gag him with my handkerchief. Ah, I guess that will hold Mr. X for a while. Come on, we've got some exploring to do in the passageway. Give me a flashlight and get out your gun. Well, here we go. Andy Hardy finds the tunnel... Kind of damp in here. Say, it looks like we're going right up inside the house. 
Do you think this is such a good idea? Yeah. In any second, you should find the body of Lee Saint. I don't like this. I wish Dick Tracy was here with us. I wish Dick Tracy was here without us. <laughs> Herbie. Herbie, look up ahead there. How do you like that? Lee Singh's body, just like you said. Ah, oh, you know he was here all the time. See those stairs over there? Yeah. We're back in the house, I guess. Right. Now I've got a job for you. That wall at the top must work the same way as the one in the boathouse. Follow me and then wait while I go inside. Now, if I'm not out in five minutes, come in and get me. Now, if I do come out, you know what to do. I got you, boys. Watch your step. Yes, when this is over, I'll have my head examined. Again. Well, good luck to me. Won't you come in, Mr. Smith? Huh? I've been expecting you. Huh? Oh, 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 yeah, uh, thanks. I was out for a walk, you see, and I... I must congratulate you. You've been a very astute young man. Uh, and if you don't point that gun at me, I'll remain young a little longer. <laughs> you read my thoughts, Mr. Smith. You will now have the privilege of joining Lee Singh. Well, uh, since you've made up your mind, I hope you won't think me too personal if I ask you just one question. Why did you murder Lee Singh, if you'll pardon the expression? I see no possible harm in answering your question. Lee Singh was my accomplice. He wanted to be my partner. I have no partner. Now turn around and march down that passageway. I'll be right behind you, so... So? Oh. Oh, 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 oh! <laughs> Seems a pity that one so clever as you should die so stupidly. Die and rot in a sandy grave. Say, do you do much work on inner sanctum? <laughs> You're very humorous, Mr. Smith. Now, down those stairs. I haven't much time to... Oh, nice work, Herbie. But, boss, I can't figure it. That's Jonathan. He's paralyzed from the waist down. Did you hit him hard? Yeah, I gave him a good one. Now he's paralyzed from the waist up. <laughs> Boss, we're finally on our way back to civilization. I guess you're glad to get away from there, aren't you, Miss Gilmore? I certainly am, Herbie. And, Jeff, I don't know how to thank you for all you've done. Oh, it was nothing, Pat. I look good in gray hair. Look, not to change the job subject, but I still would like to get the lowdown on what happened to me this weekend. What's puzzling you, Herbie? Well, I deducted that Uncle Jonathan's paralysis was strictly a phony, and that he knocked off Lee Singh. But there's a couple of little items that keep bothering me, like, uh, did Jonathan poison Miss Gilmore's pooch? Who was the guy in the boathouse? How come the boathouse smelled so funny? Why was all that grub in the pantry? And finally, what was Uncle Jonathan's racket? Well, here's the quiz, kid. What sort of business would it be that requires large arc lamps, too strong for taking pictures, and a house that faces the ocean? A business that needs a huge supply of rice, a large boat, a tough-looking sailor, plus a secret passageway from a boathouse that smelled just like a Chinese laundry. What kind of business would that be, Herbie? Well, uh, I deduct that, uh, that is, I deduct That's uh, right. You're right, Herbie. Snuggling Chinese. You see, these poor fellows must have been brought over on tramp steamers. Jonathan used the big lights for signals, and the sailor picked them up in the boat. He kept them up the house, took them up through the tunnel. Jonathan kept them there until they were called for. Yeah. And if they weren't called for in 30 days, they were his. Oh, <laughs> Somewhere between your mouth and your brain, there must be a bottleneck. <laughs> Jeff, I hope you don't think I'm being unintelligent, but one point still puzzles me. How did Uncle Jonathan fix up that fake owl? Pat, that's where you're wrong. You see, there really is a hooting owl at Greystone. What? You mean there really was an owl? What do you mean? Well, you know that wild duck you had for breakfast this morning? Yes. That was no duck. <laughs> This is Ken Niles, inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time to hear another adventure with the amazing Mr. Smith, starring Alan Jocelyn and Ed Brophy. Original music is composed and conducted by Lud Gluskin. These programs are written and produced by Martin Gosh and Howard Harris and come to you from Hollywood. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Meister Brau means the master brew. The Peter Hand Brewery Company, brewers of Meister Brau beer, presents Country Sheriff. <laughs> Hello, Sheriff Ruther Bates speaking. What? A murder? For land's sakes, where? Not at the Jefferson Newell farm, huh? You sure? Positive, huh? Saw the body. Listen, who's this talking? I said, who's this talking? When you report a murder, you've got to give your name. You might be needed as a witness. Hey, are you listening to me? What? That's concern. Hung up on me. Oh, well... Corpses don't get away often, I guess. Probably get along all right without a living complaining. Sheriff Luther Bates, a law enforcement officer who mixes justice with kindness, law with philosophy. Lacking some of these traits, the old sheriff would be a far less effective individual. And by the same token, a beer which lacks any one of the elements of thirst-quenching goodness fails in its purpose of giving you all-round satisfaction. That's why it pays to say, make mine Meisterbrow, please. Yes, Golden Good Meisterbrow beer offers you all of the elements that go into the making of a super-satisfying beer. Rich, full-body, freshly inviting aroma... Sparkling, wholesome liveliness. And flavor. Mmm. Flavor that's right down the alley in taste-tempting goodness. Well, it's useless to try to put this taste goodness into words. You've got to taste Meister Brau yourself to fully appreciate how different, how deliciously different a master-brewed beer can be. Next time, say, make mine Meister Brau, please. <laughs> And now, tonight's story. Death Overdrawn. It's nine o'clock in the morning, and Sheriff Luther Bates has just received a telephone call about a murder. Doggone it, Sarah. Seems like folks can get themselves into more messes. Now, you take Jeff Newell. Who'd ever think he'd get mixed into a murder? Why, who did he kill, Ludie? I don't know. That telephone call is real mysterious. Just a man's voice saying, go out to Jeff Newell's place and grab him. He's guilty of murder. Oh? I wonder if somebody could be playing a joke on me. Well, it's easy enough to find out. Just call Jeff and check with him. Are you joking? I suppose you think he'd admit it if he'd killed somebody. Oh. Oh, yeah, I suppose not. Well, it seemed like there'd be some way you could check. Well, there is a way. Trapes on out there, I guess. Well, try to be back for lunch. I'm baking an angel food cake. I'll make it, don't you worry. Even if there's a dozen murders. <laughs> oh, now let me see. A dozen eggs. Mm-hmm. My, and everything's so high, it seems like you could skimp a little. With a whole dozen eggs, a couple more or less shouldn't make very much difference. Uh, come in! I'm in the kitchen! There. Now, I wonder if I forgot anything. Sugar and... Oh. Who is it? Oh, for heaven's sakes. I'm coming! Well, my gracious, quit ringing. I'm getting there as fast as I can, ain't I? Why, uh, how do you do? You the sheriff's wife? Yes. Something you wanted? Come on in. He isn't here right now, but then he's gone. Yes, went out in the call business. Real important business, I'm afraid. I know. Is there anybody around here can hear us? Well, no, of course not. Uh, if you just come back to the kitchen, young lady, I'm baking an angel food cake, and you can't let them sit around, you know. Oh. But sure, I guess I can talk in the kitchen. Why not? Is there anything serious you wanted? Maybe I could help you. Maybe you could at that. You just go right on talking while I finish mixing up the cake here. The sheriff got a call to go out to the Jeff Newell place, didn't he? Why... Yes. And somebody said there'd been a murder there? 
Well, how did you know? Because it's a frame-up on the sheriff to get him out of town. And I can prove it. There. Now, set the oven, Jeff. A frame-up? A frame-up, you say? Yeah. And I can take you straight to the guys who framed him. Why? Why, I never heard of such a... Why, they could be arrested for a thing like that. Well, that's serious. There's no telling what might happen while he's out there in the country. I'm sorry, these guys. A joke's a joke, but that's gone too far. You want I should show them to you? Well, if you could just give me their name. Oh, that wouldn't do you any good. They're strangers here in town. Well, there wouldn't be any point in my talking to them, but if you could show me where they're staying and point them out to me... Well, sure, I can do that all right. Come on. Well, just a second while I get my hat. Uh, you won't need any. Come on. Oh, well, all right. Well, I don't see what all the rush is about. Ludie can't possibly be back within an hour, even if there's nothing wrong. Ain't you going to lock the door? Oh, what for? I'm not leaving town or anything. Oh, oh yeah, I forgot. Uh, my car's right out here. Oh, my. The beautiful big car, ain't it? Simply gorgeous. It ought to be. You get in the back seat. Oh, no, I'll sit up front with you. Oh, no, you won't, Grandma. Come on. What? Why, you... I wouldn't advise making any fuss if I was you, Grandma. Because Bugs is just busting a try out this new war souvenir. War souvenir? Yeah, German submachine gun. We bought it from a returning soldier. <laughs> Slick, ain't it? Get in, get in, and hurry up. Now, you let go of me. Ouch! All right, come on, let's go, let's go. All right, Hazel, get moving. Right, Squirmy. Oh, what, what do you want of me? My lands, I haven't done anything. I'm a kind of nervous guy, Grandma. I don't rest easy unless I take precautions. You're a precaution. Well, I'll precaution you if you don't let me out of this car. I'll... Sit still. Bugs has a very itchy finger. You might get hurt. Nah, Squirmy. When my finger itches, nobody feels nothing. Morning, Miss Bates. Something I can do for you? Ludy made a deposit yesterday. Need a new checkbook or something? Glad to do anything I can. Well, you can do something all right, Willis. You can press the burglar alarm signal. What? Okay, lady. You know what we told you. Well, You're going to catch us. Yes, slugger. sir. Hold it. We're using her for a shield to get out of this joint. Willis, what's the matter with you anyway? Press that burglar alarm for heaven's sake. I'm going to let you have it, lady. I set my off. You get me nervous when muck the job. My goodness. All right, quiet, everybody. Don't move. Back up against the wall. Shut off that burglar alarm. Oh, I can't. Once it starts ringing, there's no way to stop it. I can stop you, though, mister. Bucks, cut it out. Take the guy with you. Where? To grab the dough. And make sure you don't miss any. We know how much they're supposed to be in if you try to hold out any. You get it right in the head. Is that clear? Why, yes. And hurry. Bugs is a good boy, but he gets awful impatient and restless. Here, give me the machine gun. A rod's enough to handle this guy. Oh, gee, squirmy. I ain't even got to use it yet. Hurry up, you dummy. I might need it in case those hicks gaping around outside get any ideas. Uh, all right. Get going, Willis. Yeah. Always like the banking business. Well, you won't like it when Ludie catches up with you. Shut up. You won't like it either if he catches up with us. That is, if you like living. Huh, quick work. Get it all, did you? The wakes. Okay, come on. Uh, just a minute, Squirmy. I get to carry the machine gun. Yeah, and if you're so anxious to use it, how about practicing on Willis? Yeah, it'll teach him a lesson. No! Uh! Yeah, hope you're satisfied now. Come on. You get in front of us, lady. Just like this, Satan. And don't any of you folks get ideas while we're heading for the door. Bugs is nuts about this new toy of his. All right, right in front, Grandma. Come on, come on. Hey, Bugs... How about playing a tune on that typewriter so nobody gets ideas? Now, look here, Sheriff. There must be some reason for you calling on me like this out in the clear sky, you might say. Well, matter of fact, there is, Jeff. I got a phone call about a murder. Murder? Yeah. Great day. Where? Right here on your place, Jeff. What? You out in your head, Sheriff? You mean there ain't been any murder here, Jeff? I'd like to know who there'd be to murder around this place besides me. 
If you'd used your head, you'd have realized I'm all alone here. I suppose. Well, I guess there's nothing to do but go on back to town. I'm glad it was a false alarm, Jeff. Hey, that's my line. Somebody calling me. Hello? What? This is Jeff Newell. Who'd you want? Huh? Jeff? Well, he's right here. It's for you. All right. Hello? What? Judge Carey? What, Judge? Bank robbed? Willis Parkman murdered? Great suffering catfish. Huh? Sarah? Sarah carted off with him? Using her for a shield? <clears throat> Look, Judge, call all the police and sheriff's officers. Get a description of the car and the man. Get the roads blocked in every direction. Start posses closing in from about 100 miles away. And tell them these men got to be taken alive. You understand? Alive? No shooting. Make that clear. What? What'll I be doing meanwhile? Well, you blame did you? I'll be burning up the road back to town. Bye. <laughs> like this and they're trying to get away. It's just beyond me. You must not be as bright as you think you are. Right enough, lady. Suppose you think by staying on side roads, you keep away from people out looking for you. Maybe. Maybe we ain't even trying to get away. Not trying to get away. That's what the man said, ain't it? But you... Don't worry, baby. You ain't taking a very long trip. We're just about there. What? You mean that this is a spot, Grandma? A nice, quiet farmhouse. I don't think you'll like it, but it's all we can offer. Why, this is Jeff Newell's farm. Why, that's where Ludie went right after he was eating breakfast this morning. You... What? Nothing. She's uh, hoping her old man's still here. I bet he ain't. I right, have the machine gun handy, Bugs, just in case. You know me, Squirmy. Here he comes. Hey, what? Miss Bates, your husband just left here a few minutes ago. What... Hey, I get it. <laughs> He's real bright, Squirmy. You folks are the bank robbers. That is all set in Miss Bates. You're right, Pop. We planted a fake phone call to get the sheriff out of the way while we was out in the bank. He's here while we're doing the job. And we got a time so he leaves here about the time we leave the bank. Maybe a little after. But why'd you pick my place? Because there's two roads coming into it, a back road and a front. The sheriff ain't crazy enough to take the back road either way. We took it. We ain't crazy either. But what'd you come here for? Most bank robbers make saps of themselves trying to get out while the heat's on. Not us. But cops after us a couple of hundred miles around, we stay right here. Here? On my place? It's the can't... one spot in the world they'd never look for us. They'd never dream we'd come to the place we use for the fake phone call. And when the heat dies down, we can leave real quiet. Oh, no, you can't. Because I won't stand for it. No. You and the sheriff's wife ain't going to be around to bother us, Pop. Okay, Bugs. You've been dying to play that machine gun. Go ahead. You won't make me nervous now. Looks as if Sarah Bates and Jefferson Newell are going to furnish a little amusement for Bugs, doesn't it? And wasn't Squirmy right when he said the last place in the world Sheriff Bates would look for the bank robbers would be at the Newell farm? And why should you try Meisterbrow beer? Oh, oh, I almost slipped the commercial right into the story. Well, now that the question has been asked, uh, let's answer it. You should try Meisterbrow beer for your own sake. And for nobody else's. Perhaps you'll find in Meisterbrow the little bit of extra beer goodness you've always looked for. Mind you, the Meisterbrow folks do not say you will positively find it. Mind you, the Meisterbrow folks do not say you will positively find it. For nobody knows better than the brewers of Meisterbrow that everybody's tastes are not exactly alike. However, the odds are exceptionally good that you will find in golden Meisterbrow beer 
a deeper sense of thirst-quenching satisfaction than you've ever found before. Why do we say this? Well, simply because the wholesome goodness, the distinctive difference of Meisterbrow has already won for it such outstanding popularity. You see, Meisterbrow, the master brew, is served more often in Midwest homes than any other beer. With such a recommendation, doesn't it seem a pretty good bet that you too will find Meisterbrow exactly what you want? Treat yourself to Meisterbrow soon. <laughs> Now, act two of Death Overdrawn. Bugs is looking fondly at his German submachine gun. Fondly and expectantly. A dame first, huh, Squirmy? What do I care? We've got to get both of them out of the way. No! Oh, my land. i got to get out of here right this minute. What's eating you, Grandma? Well, i got to get home. When you cutthroats grabbed me, I was so excited I forgot all about it. Forgot about what? I had an angel food cake in the oven. It ought to be done by now. I wouldn't worry about that if I was you, lady. Wouldn't worry. With sugar and eggs the way they now, are now. Now, Squirmy. Go ahead. Don't keep asking questions. You get me nervous again. Just a minute, boys. Huh? What if somebody calls a Newell guy on the phone and him shot? What about it? Who's going to answer the phone? Well, let it ring. Nobody has to answer it. Oh, you saps. You were supposed to have everything figured out so good. If nobody answers the phone, the neighbors get worried about him. They ought to be worried about him. So they come dropping around to see if he's sick or something. So what? So they get sick or something, too. I'm squirmy. Listen, you rod crazy dope. You can't go killing people right and left when you're hiding out. Makes talk. You got any ideas, Hazel? Yeah. We don't kill them. We just watch them till we're ready to leave. Till we're ready to leave. Yeah. But the old dame, what are we going to let her live for? Well, there's no point in killing her yet, either. Who knows? She might be some help to us. Well, I, I could cook for you. I, I'm a pretty good cook. So folks say, at least. Yeah. I wouldn't want to eat anything you fix for me. Oh, quit yapping. we got to divide the money. Ah. Huh. Don't trust us, huh? Well, sure. Sure I trust you. Why wouldn't I? It's just that we've done the job and there ought to be a payoff. Yeah. The bag's out in the car. I'll go out and get it. I oh, know you won't. We all go together. There's your phone, Jeff. My phone? Of course. I... See? We'd been in a nice fix, wouldn't we? Go ahead and answer it, mister. But be awful careful what you say. One mistake and you get one of Bug's fancy wig jobs. Don't you worry. Hello? I said hello. Yes, this is Jeff Newell. Oh, just fine, Marty. No, nothing's wrong. Nothing at all. You say you heard the sheriff was out to my place. Careful, Pop. Well, what if he was? There wasn't anything that concerned you or anybody else. False alarm. I said false alarm. My gracious, it's got so a man can't even bake an angel food cake without the neighbors knowing about it. No, I ain't mad. But I wish folks would mind their own business. Goodbye. Well, how'd I do? Okay, Pop. Now we'll go out and get the dough and put the car away. Come on. Okay, Squirmy, open the satchel. Yeah, there's what I'd call an elegant bunch of lettuce. I bet there's 50 grand there if there's a penny. Well, stop splitting it, Squirmy. Don't worry. I hope this is a better split than I got on the last job, Squirmy. You're doing all right. Say, we hadn't ought to be out here in the open. And the car being out here makes me nervous. Somebody might see it. Uh, let's put it in the barn before we do any dividing. It's a good idea. Now, where's the key to the barn, Noel? I got it. I'll unlock it. Open it in a hurry. Oh, all right. Look out! He's got a typewriter! Oh! Oh! oh. That takes care of bugs. Why, you... I wouldn't try to get his gun if I was you, Mr. Squirmy. You'll get just what he got, and it seems to hit him kind of permanent. Yeah, but where'd you get a machine gun? I had it hit in the barn, right behind the door. How do you like being double-crossed, Squirmy? What? You? Yeah, me. 
Don't think I'm not wise to the way you and Bugs have been beating me out of my fair share of the dough. Me that cases all the layouts, that drives the car because people ain't suspicious of a woman. That does all the real brain work. Brain work? Why, you... Yes, brain work. The brainiest thing I ever did was tell Newell here what was going to happen. I made a deal with him for a 50-50 split. You dirty little rat. I might have known you'd pull something like this sooner or later. Uh, you had it coming, squirmy. And I'd kind of enjoy giving it to you after the way you've cheated me. I think I'll take care of him myself, Newell. No, don't take a step near that gun, Hazel. I'm warning you. Hmm? Listen, we're working together. You... Do you think I'd trust you? No. We worked together up to a point. But the partnership just broke up. Why, you dirty louse. And after me framing this whole thing for you... After you've fallen into a trap, you mean. I'm playing it safe. How do you like it, bright girl? You shut up. Look, Noel, you got to listen to reason. You're you wasting your time, young lady. Jefferson's already got Lizzie on his way here, I hope. What? Oh, your bats. He couldn't. When the phone rang, that wasn't my signal. Signal? You wouldn't know about country lines, I don't suppose. The phone was ringing for Miss Helmet, three miles north of here, and one of the worst gossips in Chinkapin County. It was Miss Donnelly calling her. And the two of them had started blabbing to each other when I picked up the phone. But you were talking to somebody. Talking to myself. With both of them asking me what was wrong, if I'd gone crazy. Oh, what of it? They said they was going to report me if I didn't get off in the line, and I just kept talking. <laughs> Nothing that'd bring the sheriff, though. Why, the instant Ludie hears about Jeff talking about baking an angel food cake, he'll come a-running. There'd only be one way Jefferson Newell could know about that, from talking to me. Uh, Newell's bats. He'll still be in a jam. He was in on the plans for the bank robbery and didn't let anybody know. He's just as guilty as the rest of us. I was afraid to let anyone know. Afraid you cutthroats might find out and kill me. I had to catch you red-handed. A lot of good that'll do you. Don't be a sap. You get nothing. We can still tie you up with the deal. Thanks for letting me know, Mr. Squirmy. I'll save myself some trouble by getting rid of you now. Oh, no. You can't just shoot him down in cold blood, Jefferson. I'd like to know why not. Why? Because that's murder. You had to shoot Mr. Bugs to save our own necks, but I'm you... still shooting to save my own neck, Miss Bates. And if you think I made that fool telephone call to save you, you can guess again. What? You was trying to get Looney out here. Sure I was. He'll come, too. And my call number will be a real convincer that it wasn't me that killed you. Kill me? What are you... With you and them out of the way, I can hide the money and look like quite a guy. Yes, sir. They killed you, but I got them. Even if they had got away with the money somewhere. It might be a good idea to check the dough before you work too hard to get it, mister. Huh? What you talking about? Go ahead. Check it. Don't try making any fast moves while I'm doing it, because this gun works awful easy. Oh, well... Money looks good enough to me. Nice and fresh. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> hey, wait a minute. There's just money on the top. The rest is all wadded up old newspapers. <laughs> I bet there ain't over a thousand dollars here. What are you done with it? <laughs> so it was just like I thought. You were trying to jip me in bugs again, huh, Squirmy? <laughs> trying? Oh, oh, looks like I did it. You doing all your scheming and bugs is killing for dough that wasn't even here. <laughs> but where did you get it? How? I watched that satchel. It was right in plain sight all the time we were riding out here. All right, Mr. Squirmy. You've had your little joke. Now I'll have mine. Where's the rest of the money? You think I'd tell you? You've got to have me to get it. Without me, you'd never get it. Keeping quiet's my life insurance right now. Guess again, Mr. Squirmy. I'll get it without you. I couldn't trust you to find it for me. No! Where you are? Get your cover, Jeff. One move with that machine gun and I'll drill you. Oh, Louie. What in the world? How, how did you get inside that chicken house? I've been there for quite a spell, Sheriff. Dropped the machine gun, Jeff. Uh, okay, Sheriff. I got them for you. Every blamed one of them. Including yourself, Jeff, yeah. Myself? If but... you hadn't been working in cahoots with them, you'd have told me what was up when I was here early this morning. you got to give me some credit for catching the robber, Sheriff. you got to admit I got them. No, Jeff, I got the real robber. Got practically all the money back, too. No, you couldn't. Yeah. This was the blamedest bunch of double and triple crosses I ever seen in my life. Willis Parkland confessed the whole works. Oh, Willis Parkland, the vice president of the bank? Why, Willis was killed. These he... gangsters' idea of his death was kind of like Willis' accounts with the bank, overdrawn. 
You was hit pretty bad by machine gun bullets, but Doc Wagner thinks he'll live. I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Willis thought he was on his deathbed for sure, and he was pretty spiteful. Told me the whole story. I'd kind of like to hear it myself. Well, don't worry. You will. I know Lucy. Oh, so I talk too much, huh? All right, won't say another solitary word. Now, Lucy Bates, you just tell Thrust that story this minute. No, I talk too much. Oh, Lucy. Can't you see we're just dying to know? Come on now, please. Well, all right. <clears throat> this fella called Squirmy found out Willis Parkton was pretty bad off financially, so he kind of worked out the robbery in cahoots with Willis. Why, of all things. Willis was to have the fake bundle of money all ready for him, and he took out the real loot the night before himself. Had it ditched at his house. Oh, oh dirty rat. Well, Noel, I'm glad you got squirmy. He had it coming, a double-crosser, trying to cheat me and Bugs out all our money. The worst double-cross of all was pulled on Willis when squirmy told Bugs to shoot him with that machine gun. Oh, that was a mistake, all right. Lutie, how long have you been here? Well, not long after you got here, I guess. You mean to say that you let me suffer? You let these cutthroats threaten me without, without doing anything about it? That's why I let them alone, Sarah. I figured the minute I started anything, you might get hurt. The fella Bugs was awful quick with the trigger. Squirmy was nervous and tough. Hmm. <laughs> Besides, I was holding back on account of your wanting it that way. My wanting it that way? Luther Bates, whatever do you mean? Well, they're always complaining about not getting in on enough of the excitement. I figured this was a chance for you to get all you wanted. <laughs> More than me, even. Hmm. Sheriff Bates will be back in a moment to tell you about next week's story. Which gives me just a few seconds to remind you that Meister Brow at your favorite night spot is the same delicious Meister Brow you've served with such pride and confidence at home. Yes, gold and good Meister Brow beer is pledged to bring you the best in thirst-quenching satisfaction no matter where you get it. Depend on the Meister Brow label to keep faith with you and your taste. And for those folks who have not yet tried Meister Brow, treat yourself to Meister Brow's sparkling, exciting freshness the very next time you're out. Find out for yourself the extra goodness that has made Meister Brow, the master brew, such an outstanding favorite among those who know truly fine beers. And for your thirst's sake, say, Meister Brow. Hmm, Meister Brow. <laughs> Now, here he is, Sheriff Luther Bates. Thanks, son. Well, sir, folks, next week, I got a story that's hot in the depot stove. It's all about a prominent citizen in the Middle City who committed a murder close to 20 years ago and got away with it real slick till something happened. Something that set off the blameless string of fireworks you ever see. It's a real exciting story that had me guessing right up to the end. And I hope you'll be around to hear it next week, same time, same station, because it's nothing I enjoy more than spinning a yarn. Oh, yes. I call this one Murder in Memory Lane. This is Jack Callahan reminding you to listen to another great Meister Brow mystery, Boston Blackie, broadcast each Monday night at 9.30. If you'd like to see next week's Country Sheriff broadcast, just write the WGN ticket office and your free tickets will be mailed to you. Country Sheriff is produced and directed by Ed Kahn. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Do you believe in ghosts? governor of the great commonwealth sat at his desk in his study, staring at the dying embers of the great fire. The room was in darkness, save for a spot of light from the green-shaded lamp 
which brought his shaggy gray head into sharp relief as he sat with hands clasped on the desk before him. Outside, the wind played a minor harmony and sent sharp gusts of rain beating furiously against the tall windows. In the shadowed recesses of the room, a door opened softly. Mr. Governor? Yes, Dabney? The mother is still waiting, sir. Says she won't leave until she has some further word from you. Yes, I know, Dabney. But it's no use. My decision is unchanged. The boy must hang. Oh, yes, sir. I've told her that. But she insists she be allowed to remain until the last minute. What time is it now? It's nearing midnight, Governor. The Governor rose and crossed to the fireplace. Five hours more. It's a terrible thing to hold a man's life in your hands, Dabney. But I have no other course. The boy had a fair trial. The evidence was conclusive. He went to the house to elope with the girl, against her father's wishes. The father interfered, and the boy shot him. That's murder, Dabney, and the law must take its course. I know what this mother is suffering, but the courts have decided what penalty the boy must meet. And I have no moral right to interfere. For a moment, the governor closed his tired eyes, and the room was still, save for the dreary rhythm of the rain against the glass. Oh, your decision is just, Mr. Governor. There can be no doubt of that. Now, sir, please, won't you go to bed? Not yet, Daphne. And the mother, sir. Shall I let her remain? Oh, yes, yes. Let her remain. If it makes it any easier for her. Alone, the governor sank into the deep leather chair back of his desk and resumed his silent vigil with a dying fire. As he sat there, across his blurred vision fell the shadow of a gallows, a straight young figure mounting the thirteen steps, the black hood around a head held high, the solemn intonation of voices, and a mother weeping. Slowly, the governor's head sank forward on his arms. When he raised it again, the last glow had been drained from the coals, and the wind had died to a low moan. Why, oh, oh I, I beg your pardon. I, I told my secretary to admit no one. A shadowy figure in the chair across the desk relaxed deeper into the darkness beyond the circle of light that fell from the desk lamp. And when he spoke, there was a gentle drawl in his voice. <laughs> Secretaries are to be heard, but not heeded when you want to see a man, Governor. The Governor made a gesture of impatience. And I'm, I'm sorry, my dear sir, but you will understand. Yes, yes, I know. I sort of surmised I might be able to help you tonight, Mr. Governor. Well, it's it's very late. Uh, tomorrow, perhaps. I think maybe it's tonight you need a friend to talk to. You're carrying a big load tonight, Mr. Governor. And it's galling you. Maybe if somebody come along, helped you to heft it just a mite, you'd see your way clearer into what you're doing. You... you mean the boy, of course. I mean that mother who's sitting out there in your anteroom. 
That mother whose son is to be hanged at dawn. The governor's eyes sought the face of this strange visitor, but all he could see was the vague outline of a man's form slouched deep in the chair opposite him. Well, if you've come to plead for reprieve, you're wasting your time. My decision is unalterable. This boy has committed a crime for which society exacts the payment of his life. Yes. Yes, Mr. Governor. I'm quite aware of that. The payment of his life. <laughs> you know, once there was a boy who went to sleep on sentry post in the face of the enemy. Military law said he must die. A court-martial so decided. Secretary of War proved it. And the Secretary of War was right. But the lad's mother didn't agree. So she went to the President of the United States and asked that soft-hearted old meddler to give her back her boy. Now, the president knew right well he shouldn't oppose his secretary of war. Knew he'd send the country to the demnition bow-wows if he did. But he figured it this way. That boy dead was no good to anybody. Alive, he had a chance to pay back his debt to the nation. So, this puddin-headed old president told the mother she could have her boy back. Which was wrong, according to society. But awful right, according to that mother's lights. Oh, but, my dear sir, the cases are not parallel. This lad deliberately killed a man who was defending his home, his family. It's a plain case of murder. Are you right sure of that, Mr. Governor? Pretty hard to be sure sometimes. <laughs> now here, let's suppose that for 18 years a girl had been bullied by a harsh, unloving father. Father who denied her every right to happiness. Suppose that a lad came to her with clean hands and a great love in his heart. Offered her a chance to escape. Suppose that on the very night she was to go with him, she found that her father again was blocking her way. And then suppose that in her hot rebellion, she shot the father. Now, boy arrives a few minutes later. He's a man. He's young. He's in love. So he takes the blame. And tomorrow at dawn, he pays the penalty. Or does he, Mr. Governor? He dies, to be sure. But that gray-haired woman praying outside that door, she dies, but goes on living. Suddenly, the cloud of fatigue seemed to lift itself from the governor's mind. In quick photographic flashes, the evidence in the case came back to him. The father had been brutal to the girl, conclusively established by every witness. The girl's fingerprints had been found on the revolver. Then, there was the boy's reticence on the witness stand, the girl's hysterical heartbreak, and the mother's abiding faith that her son could not have killed anyone. Oh, yes. Yes, that was it. What this strange visitor said was true. The governor looked up and found that his guest had risen. Within the circle of light he stood, tall, angular, stooped. Then the governor's eyes found his face, and with a start... He rose from his chair. Why? Why? Why, sir? 
He was looking at a square, homely face with deep-set, kindly eyes, firm jaw, smiling mouth, and a rugged chin fringed with a thin, dark beard. For an instant, the eyes and lips smiled down on him, and then the governor was alone in the room. A startled Dabney looked up from his desk to see the governor standing over him. Get the warden on the phone at once, Dabney. Tell him an executive reprieve has been granted. From across the room there came a sobbing, triumphant cry, and a white-haired woman stumbled toward the governor and fell at his feet. Oh, oh, my boy, my boy, you, you've saved him. You've given me back <laughs> my boy. Gently, the governor raised her to her feet and took her hands in his. Oh, no. No, madam. I didn't give you back your boy. A man much wiser, much kinder than I, saved your boy for you tonight as surely as he saved another mother's son who went to sleep on sentry post. Why? Why, whom do you mean? The governor's voice was so low she scarce could hear him. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln? Why, sir, he's been dead these many years. Oh, no, madam, no. Not dead. He belongs to the ages. Do you believe in ghosts? Do you? Here's the Chemtone Hour with Dunninger, the master mentalist. Chemtone's the miracle wall finish that paints an average room for only $2.98. Goes on living rooms, dining rooms, bedrooms, and playrooms like magic. Goes right over wallpaper, paint, or wallboard. Mixes with water, dries in an hour, washes easily. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the gentleman who, with his unique skill as his only weapon, invades your mind and reads your thoughts, Dunninger. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn Riggs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. There's one error in Glenn's description. I cannot invade against opposition. I need your cooperation. You must want me to get into your thoughts before I can. What do you say? Do you want me in there? <laughs> well, then, here goes. Concentrate. I receive an impression from some lady or gentleman that is concentrating his or her mind. Upon the initials J.B., I get the name Captain Jim. Does that make sense to anyone? The gentleman about the fifth row center of the auditorium is answered. That is your thought, sir? That's right. Would that be Captain Jim Blair? That's right, sir. You're asking me mentally where he is at this time? Yes, sir. Do you know the answer? I do, sir. You simply wrote the question, where is he? That's right. Do you want me to tell you the answer? Yes, sir. The answer to that question, incidentally, appears only in your mind. It's not placed upon paper. Would that be... Caroline Ireland. That's right, sir. That is correct. I thank you. Caroline Ireland. <laughs> Another impression which I receive comes from someone concentrating his or her mind upon a birthday. A day in the month of July, the 25th day in July. Where does that come from, please? July 25th. Who is thinking of July 25th? The gentleman about the 20th row on the right side of the auditorium. The young man with the mic is going up to him. He has to climb a number of steps to get to him on a long cabled microphone. Is that your thought, sir? Uh, yes, but not a birthday. Your own? Were you born in 1888? Not a birthday. Not a birthday. Were you, were you concentrating upon 1888? 
No, no year concentration. The gentleman here is doing the thinking. Sixth row, center of the auditorium. You see, I can't pick the individual that does the thinking. Would that be correct, sir? The sixth day of June, or rather the 25th day of June, uh, 1888? Correct. correct. Uh, just uh, by form of variation, since I've selected you for this test and had a bit of difficulty locating you, would you take some other number in mind as well? Are you now thinking of a serial number for chance? Is it your own number? Yes or no? My own. Good. I'll see, see if I can get that as well. Would that be 10539? Correct. That is correct. Thank you very much. Uh, say, you're great. <laughs> There's so much good thinking going on that I really hate the stuff. But we have our judges to introduce, Dunninger. I know, so do the honors. Will you, Glenn? Uh, then we'll continue. Tonight's guests represent journalism, music, and the arts. That sounds like a museum. But our judges are too, too much alive for that. They are the famous author, Broadway columnist, and playwright, Dorothy Kilgallen. The popular band leader, Shep Field. <laughs> Our third judge is the great poet of World War II, whose famous poems have appeared in the Saturday Evening Post and Life and thrilled the nation, Joseph Auslander. Miss Kilgallen, you're noted for your insight. Do you have any into Dunninger's methods? Only hunches. Want to tell us? No, thanks. I'd rather have more to base them on first. <laughs> what say, Dunninger? Yes? I'd well, rather have more to base the hunches on first. <laughs> I see. Well, then watch closely. Uh, here we go again. I receive an impression from somebody or Jotham that's concentrating his or her initials upon the uh, name, concentrating upon the initials uh, K-R, rather. Uh, Kelly is the first name. Where does that come from, please? Kelly is the first name. The last name begins with an R. Seems to be Kelly Rogers. Does that make sense to anyone? It does. It makes sense to the gentleman about the 40th roll, center of the auditorium. <coughs> Is that your thoughts, sir? Kelly Rogers? Uh, that's the last two names. There's a first name you haven't gotten yet. Oh, the first one I haven't gotten yet, I see, but that is part of it. Yes. You want the first name as well? Yes. Uh, would that be Pat? That would. It would. <laughs> and, uh, this number you're thinking about, is that Pat's number? Yes. What type of number is that, my son? My dear uh, son. Well, that's... My dog, and that's his license number. <laughs> his dog, and that's his license number. I know this thing will go to the dogs eventually, George. <laughs> well, you want the dog's license number. You want Pat's license number. Would that be 7812? Yes, that's it. Good, <laughs> fine. All right, thank you. <laughs> what lady is concentrating her mind upon a thought? The thought seems to be, what is the name of the phone number I found in my husband's wallet? <laughs> I don't blame you for not raising your hand to that one, madam. <laughs> I wouldn't either if I were you. Don't you trust him? <laughs> <laughs> I see. And you do. You just wanted to no. know. Well, we'll pass that up. Who is thinking of the Westchester Association? You, sir. The gentleman about the 50th row, way up to the center of the... Studio, is that your thoughts, sir? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Did you ask me to give you their phone number? Right. Do you know it? Positively. Oh, Danny, you're very certain about it. Well, I hope that I know it as, <laughs> as well as you do, sir. Would it be uh, White Plains 223? Exactly correct. I thank you, sir. I thank you very much. <laughs> I get an impression of the digits 109, line 14. Where does that come from, please? One, four, nine, line, or dash, 14. That's part of a number. Will you please raise your hand, because I cannot identify it. The rest of the thought seems to be the digits 4901. Whose thought is that, please? Is that yours, young lady? Is that yours? Yes, it is. That is your thought. Thank you very much. I now receive the impression of someone thinking of June 15, 1941. Where does that come from? The young sailor lad on the right side of the auditorium about the 15th or 16th row. Is that your thought, sir? Yes, it is. That is correct. I thank you. And now, who is concentrating his or her mind upon <coughs> the digits 3716? It's an address. Part of an address. 
Oh, uh, 3716, the lady about the 12th row. Is that yours? Th- that is. That is Th- correct, madam. That is. Is that your own that, address? That's my number. Your own number? And the street number was also there. You want me to give you that? Please. You'd like that. Perfect. Will you think of it very hard? Yes. Perfect. I'll try to do that. Would that be 80th Street? Yes. It is. Thank you. Uh, who is concentrating his or her mind upon the number of a bill in his or her possession? Piece of money, a bill. I get the initial B. That is the series B and the digits. Where does it come from, please? Oh, you have a bill also, madam, in your purse? Yes. Good. The lady has a very good mind for this type of work, and she thought she'd put me through a second test. (laughs) Does anyone in the audience know the number of that bill other than you, madam? Are you the only one that knows it? I think so. You're not sure of that? Well, this lady may hear. Oh, Oh, she says she doesn't. There's no one else. (laughs) I see. Well, see if I can help you out and see if I can get it accurately. Would that number be 224-158-52, Series A? It is. 100% accurate. Accurate. I think. (laughs) All the impression which I now receive seems to come from someone concentrating his or her mind upon a name beginning with a C. The name of a place I get C A T O Z E L L A. Where does that come from? That is the lady about the 70th row. It's quite a task getting up there to the young lady. Is that your thought, young lady? That's right. Is that a place in Australia? I want to know whether uh, Mr. Catazella is in Australia. Well, I couldn't answer that. No, I'm no, no fortune teller. Well, I can only give you your thought, and that is your thought, is it not? Right. Thank you. That is all that I can do for you. An impression which I now receive uh, comes from someone concentrating his or her mind upon a question. Shall I return to New York or return to... Where does that come from, please? And the two, the lady about the center of the auditorium, about 20 rows. Is that your thought, young lady? Is that correct? That's right. You made that notation at home, did you, upon your own stationery? No, right here. On your own stationery? That's right. You simply wrote the question. Is that correct? That's right. Not the answer. Is your name Quinn, for chance? Yes. Winnie? Is that initial S? That's right. Good. Uh, I can't answer that question because it has something to do with the future. No man can honestly answer that. You appreciate that fact. I can only give you your thought. That is right, is it not? That is your thought, is it not? That's right. I thank you. What about those hunches oh. now, Miss Kilgallen? After that very convincing performance, my principal hunch is that Dunninger reads thoughts. <laughs> what about you, Mr. Auslander? Uh, Miss Kilgallen's always been noted as an authentic source of information. I wouldn't want to argue with her. Well, that's very gallant of you, Mr. Auslander. Are you going to let the lady have the last word, too? No, I'm not. Die hard, huh? Well, mm-hmm. what's your pleasure, Sheffield? Well, I'd like a little more proof right now. In fact, I think we all would. I see. Well, I'll tell you, I'm gay, Mr. Fields. Oh, uh, but I, I'd like to make a bargain with you. Uh-uh, I've heard that gag before. <laughs> you mean if you read my thoughts, I've got to do something for you. Right. Say, uh, who's doing the thought reading here, anyway? You or, or me? <laughs> you, if you try this. Well, uh, what's it about? It's about fathers. Uh-huh. Miss Kilgallen, Mr. Auslander, and I were discussing Father's Day, which, as you know, is due on Sunday. We decided that if we had a chance, we'd test you on this. What are the three qualities we agreed every father should possess? I see. Uh, that is the simple little job you picked out for me. <laughs> uh, incidentally, I've not asked you to make any notations of these thoughts, have I? No, you uh, haven't. How about you, Miss Kilgallen? No. Perfect. Would you then be kind enough to be the first to concentrate your thoughts upon this one qualification that is paramount in your thoughts, Miss right. Kilgallen? Please, think very hard. You haven't any difficulty in doing that, I'm certain. Would you, perchance, be thinking of the one simple little and ever-important word of patience? I would. That is right. <laughs> uh, Mr. Fields, how about you, sir? Would you be kind enough to concentrate your thoughts upon some quotation that you think acceptable at the moment to the qualifications that Father should exercise? Yes, I will. Think very hard, sir. It's an effort, is it, Mr. Fields? <laughs> Very much of an effort. <laughs> well, sometimes it's hard to concentrate. But aren't you concentrating likewise upon one lone word? One word, not a sentence. Is that right? Yes. Perfect. Is that word, uh, let me see, understanding, would that be accurate? 
That is. That is likewise correct. Understand? <laughs> and uh, now, Mr. Auslander, I'm certain that you have selected a, an unusual thought for us along this particular field of endeavor. Uh, concentrate, please. Well, naturally, you would think of that, wouldn't you? A sense of humor. That's right. That is right. I thank you. Well, Dunninger did it. Now your turn, Mr. Fields. Well, what do you want me to do, Dunninger? Well, I'd like to hear you sing. <laughs> oh, I was afraid of that. I don't sing myself, but I brought my vocalist, Meredith Blake, with me, just in case. I'm sure you'd like to hear Meredith more than me. Besides, she's pretty. You're telling us. Come on up here, Miss Blake. And what will you sing for us? I'll sing Embraceable You. Oh, wonderful. Embrace me, my sweet embraceable you. Embrace me, you irreplaceable you. Just one look at you, my heart grows tipsy in me. You and you alone bring out the gypsy in me. I love all the many charms about you. Above all, I want my arms about you. Don't be a naughty papa. Come to baby, come to baby, do. My sweet embraceable you. I love all. The many charms about you Above all, I want my arms about you Oh, don't be a naughty papa Come to baby, come to baby do Meredith Blake, and good luck to you when you open with Shep Fields and his orchestra at New York's Copacabana Club this Friday. Today is Flag Day. To honor our flag, we have asked Joseph Auslander to tell you about the 6th of June, 1944, D-Day. You are all familiar with his series, The Unconquerables, the epics of our allies that appeared last year in the Saturday Evening Post. Also, with his Invasion Eve sonnets, the last four words that appeared a few weeks ago in life. Now you will hear for the first time Joseph Auslander's poem titled The Sixth of June, which he wrote on Invasion Day. Mr. Auslander. This flag that speaks to us of home, symbol of freedom, faith, and pity... This flag brings liberty to Rome, brings truth to the eternal city. And now upon the soil of France, in the cold, ghostly light of dawn, all glory greets the anxious glance of men who wave our banner on. This flag for which men gladly perish, for which so many men have died, to hold the way of life we cherish by blood of brave men sanctified, This is the flag of Bunker Hill, of Gettysburg, and Bella Wood. The flag for which our heroes still pour without stint their precious blood. From Midway to the Coral Sea, from Attu to the Solomons, this is the banner of the free. This is the flag of free men's sons. 
the flag beneath whose folds tonight our Norman beach and Roman plain, the troops of God and freedom fight evil and tyranny again. Now, let each heart renew its prayer and pledge to that proud flag its all. By land, on sea, and in the air, God grant that flag may never fall. Oh, let us gird our strength and give double our strength that soon may come that day when men in peace shall live. In God's peace, lead our heroes home. Thank you, Mr. Auslander. Our battle station is on the home front. Our job is to buy war bonds. The more bonds we buy, the better our chance to greet the returning soldier with pride. Buy more war bonds. And buy them now. Buy more war bonds tonight. Last week, Dick Powell, noted screen star, suggested a mental miracle in connection with the plot of his new picture, It Happened Tomorrow, directed by Rene Clare. Dunninger will attempt to prove long-distance telepathy. Dunninger will give you tomorrow's headline today. Seated at his desk some distance from here is Herman Thomas, an editor of the New York Daily Mirror. He has not yet completed the headlines for tomorrow morning's late editions, but he is thinking about them. With us is Dorothy Kilgallen. She will call the city desk of the Daily Mirror. The editor will pick up the phone and concentrate on what he will write as the headline. The editor will not speak to Miss Kilgallen. He will only concentrate as Dunninger reads his thoughts and Dunninger writes the headline in bold white type on a dark slate in full view of the audience. Only then will Miss Kilgallen ask the editor for verification. Anything else, Dunninger? No, I think you've described that very, very well indeed. Mr. Gallon is now kindly coming up from the judge's table, has walked to the center of the studio stage, seated herself upon a chair comfortably at the telephone. You're ill. Have you made the contact, Miss Kilgallen? Uh, is it Herman Thomas? Yes, he's on. Perfect. Uh, am I correct Hello? in asking you at this point, Miss Kilgallen? You are not familiar with this headline at this, at this time. No, I'm not even familiar with the man. Oh, I see. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and the other judges, uh, Mr. Fields, Mr. Auslander, neither of you know anything pertaining to this information. Absolutely not. Is that correct? No. Oh, Nothing whatsoever. Inasmuch as that information is entirely unknown to everyone, with the exception of the gentleman on the other end of that phone, the young man in the office, out the mirror, it would be needless for me to ask you if any written notation has been made. No notation could be made of anything that isn't known. Is that not a fact? That's true. Would you now, Mr. Gallon, be kind enough to ask him to concentrate his, his thoughts upon the very first line of the headline that he has selected? All right. Uh, for tomorrow morning's paper. On the first line the first of the headline line. that you've written. I have a large slate here in my hands for the benefit Hello, of my... are you concentrating? Yeah, don't tell me what it is. Don't. Just uh, now, don't let him tell you what line. it is. Simply ask him to think of the first line. First line, yes. Or the first word. Now take the next, please. In his mind. Now think of the next line. That's correct. Now the next. As Miss Kilgallen is asking him to concentrate his thoughts, I am writing the information okay. as I receive it. Well, now, wait a minute. Uh, um, you know, I know. How the many first lines two are letters. Assuming? Yes, the third. His uh, third word, please. Uh, are you thinking of your third word? Think of the third word now. He's thinking of the third word. At this point, you do not know what yes, any of these words are. that'll do any line. It doesn't make any difference. That's correct. You don't know what any of these words are at this no. time, do you, Mr. Gallon? Yes, he's thinking of the third word the now. third. Now the next one, please. Now think of the fourth. I'm writing that upon a large blackboard here. Mr. Gallon cannot see what I am writing, nor can the audience. But I hope to show it to Miss Kilgallen and the audience in a few moments before the verification is made over the phone, which I trust will be 90% accurate. Uh, ask him if he has completed the sentence. Have you completed the sentence? Yes. Perfect. I'll show this to the audience, consisting of over 450 persons. Now I turn my slate 
to the stage for Miss Kilgallen to see. Please do not read my sentence, Miss Kilgallen, but do ask him over the phone to tell you the unwritten headline that he has been concentrating upon at this enormous distance from the studio. Uh, now will you tell me what the headline is? What is it, please? U.S. Yes. Fleet. Yes. The next... Shells. Shells. And the last. Kareli's is the is last that correct? word. That's Am correct. I correct? One hundred percent correct. One hundred percent correct. <laughs> Well, there you are. What do you say to that, Miss Kilgallen? For the first time in my life, I'm speechless. That man is good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Miss Kilgallen. You, Mr. Auslander? I think he's wonderful. And you've had a, an enjoyable and pleasant time. I've had evening, a very enjoyable evening. Thank yes. you, sir. And how do you feel, Mr. Fields? I'm stunned, that's all. Mm-hmm. Dunninger is miraculous. <laughs> Dunninger, it's right back to you again. Thank you, Chef Fields, Dorothy Kilgallen, and Joseph Auslander for being with us. Thank you very much. Now, here are this week's $50 bond winners in Chemtone's final letter-writing contest, which closed June 10th. Mrs. Elizabeth M. Slattery, Albany, New York. Mrs. Melba Beck, Grovetown, Georgia. Staff Sergeant R.M. Eastman, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Miss O.E. Hackman, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Congratulations. Your war bonds are in the mail. In addition to the $300 in war bonds awarded this week... Chemtone is mailing certificates good for one gallon of Chemtone to the writers of the next best 100 letters received. Now is the best of all times to make your rooms new again with Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. Be sure to get genuine Chemtone, the most amazing paint you have ever seen. Next week, we will broadcast from Chicago. And our judges will be... The Honorable Edward J. Kelly, Mayor of Chicago. Lula Fields, better known as Lula Bell, popular star of the National Barn Dance. Franslow P. Scherer, Chairman of the War Finance Committee for the State of Illinois. And Dunninger will attempt to locate and describe an original war bond poster painted by David Mink, winner of the 1943 Victory Award of the Chicago Art Directors Club. Dunninger will also attempt several other mental miracles that promise an outstanding Dunninger night. Now, here's Dunninger to say... George Weist, may I have another moment here? There are one or two little thoughts that have left me somewhat up in the air because I have them in part, and I'm certain to be of interest to my audience to see whether I could work them out accurately. As one person in my audience somewhat disappointed because I did not get the complete impression concentrating his or her mind upon the digit 64. I get 64 Bell Avenue. Whose thought is that, please? That is the lady about the 55th row on the right side of the auditorium. Uh, she's up there with a broad smile spreading over her face. The young man is going up at the mic. Was that your thought, young lady? Yes, it is. Is it I true that when I concluded my readings, you were more or less disappointed? You turned to the job and said, oh, he didn't get mine. Wasn't that yes, so? Yes, that's true. That is true. So I thought I'd try to get yours. Weren't you thinking of this particular address in Lewistown, Pennsylvania? Yes, indeed I was. That is correct. And uh, I likewise got an impression of someone. I'm not certain whether they're on the same mental plane as far as the vibration is concerned, but someone is thinking of Captain Swift. Where does that come from, please? Captain Swift. That is the lady of the... About the 12th row on the left side of the studio. Captain Swift, is that your thought, young lady? That is correct. You asked me to tell you where he is at this time. That's true. Do you know where? Yes. Would that be at in Maine? That is it. Camden, Maine? That's correct. That is correct. And one other thought, please. One other thought. I get the word T-H-E-S-T-L-E. Where does it come from, please? Someone almost fell off a chair there. Jumping about halfway down the studio. Is that your thought, sir? Not exactly. You have well, one letter on. Well, is a certain type of board? Yes. Is that not the name of it? That's correct. Oh, it is accurate now. It's, the second letter, letter is not A. I see. It is not an A. It is an R. It is an R. I thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Now, 
Now, this is Glenn Riggs bidding you a pleasant good night for Dunninger and the makers of Chemtone and its 50,000 dealers throughout the country. Try Chemtone. No muss, no fuss, no bother with Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. <laughs> This is the Blue Network. The American Broadcasting Company presents Exploring the Unknown, starring Maury Amsterdam. This is Andre Baruch inviting you to listen to the most modern program in radio. More truly in step with the time than any other, because it's about the one thing that most affects your life today and tomorrow, science. A new and dramatic use of radio, combining fictional stories with authentic information drawn from the notebooks of science and industry by the Research Institute of America. Look up there, an airplane. That's right, son. It's flying into the cloud. Why is it doing that, Pop? Maybe it's bashful, son. Wants to change its course. Chuckle Charlie and the Christmas Cloud. A special laugh treat. A holiday surprise for our listeners. Science, packaged in a delightful comedy. And featuring Broadway's bright comedian, one of America's top songwriters, Maury Amsterdam. Thanks, Andre. Welcome to Exploring the Unknown, Maury Amsterdam. Thank you. You know, it's going to be interesting listening to you play the part of Chuckle Charlie, a man who met science head-on and has had a headache ever since. Should be absolutely nothing for me, Andre. Do you know that I taught science? You taught science? Yeah, I thought science was easy, but it's hard. <laughs> well, that's a sample of what we're in for tonight, friends. Chuckle Charlie and the Christmas Cloud, with Maury Amsterdam as Chuckle Charlie and our narrator Charles Irving as Injun Pete. Where the bright lights play against the shadows of skyscraper buildings, the Twinkle Twinkle Club of Stars stands out as a dazzling center of gay entertainment. And rolling them in the aisles between the tightly packed tables is the top name of Broadway, the funniest guy in town, Chuckle Charlie! I tell you, I'm dynamite tonight, folks. And boy, is this cafe jammed. Wow, it's so crowded, there isn't even any place for the waiters to sit down. <laughs> hey, incidentally, don't forget this is Christmas, folks. And be sure and give the waiters big tips, because the boys are very kind to animals. They give half their money to the horses. <laughs> oh, you know, horses are smarter than people. I'll prove it. You put 12 horses in a race, and 100,000 people will come to see them. I put 100,000 people in a race, not a horse will show up. <laughs> wow, it sure is smoky in here. Phew. Why don't you folks inhale once in a while? You know, this isn't my only business, folks. I also write songs. They used to send them right into music publishers, and I started tearing them up myself. The first song I wrote I really felt had merit, I sent it to the Leo Feist Music Publishing Company. A week later, I got a letter back saying, your song was so bad, we had to rewrite it before we threw it away. <laughs> oh, but nothing discouraged me. I got a new one. Oh, this will fracture you. Listen to this song. I didn't mean it when I whispered those two love words, drop dead, so get up and go. Or... If you want to make a Venetian blind, stick your finger in his eyes. <laughs> well, that's all for now, folks. I'll be back in an hour. We'll have another show. Meanwhile, if you feel like dancing, I wouldn't recommend it. Not in here. See you later, folks. Hello, Mike. Good to see you. Merry Christmas. Sit down. Sit down. You know dimples. Sure. Hi, honey. Merry Christmas. Great show, Charlie. And uh, Joe Lyons, the sports promoter. Hey, you're acting out, God pal. It's a pleasure. Good to know you, Joe. And uh, Rupert Potter, he writes them highbrow plays. Hey, Rupert, wake up. Here's Chuckle Charlie. Hail to the old thane of Carter. I find only one sad thing to mar this meeting. Oh, oh, you mean you've seen the check, huh? Do not dress. All right, Rupert, what's the sad fact? Christmas. Christmas? Don't you believe in Santa Claus? I believe in nothing. Here we sit in a smoky nightclub, drinking our sorrows away. Charlie, the, there ain't no Santa Claus. There ain't no Christmas spirit. There ain't no miracles. It's all a gag. And you, the greatest gag man of the age, should know it better than anybody. Hey, uh, you're getting very morbid, Rupert. Come on, honey, let you and me dance. Not now, Dimples. Hey, look, Rupert. I don't think it's a gag at all. You know something? 
I believe in Santa Claus. I even believe in miracles. Yep, I even saw a miracle once. It was last year, around about November. I went out to a joint in Arizona for a rest. But before I get to that, let me tell you about a couple guys out there. Horseface Henry Atkins and his kid, name of Puggy. Uh, Puggy had something wrong with him, his heart or something. The doctor said Arizona would be good for his condition, so Horseface got a job at the resort and took the kid along with him. They were a couple of real nice characters. Hey, Pop. Hello, son. How are you feeling today? Swell, Pop. Arizona's not like Vermont, Puggy. Up there, the winters are really something. Snow, ice. Didn't I have a sled once? Sure you did. You've got a good memory. You used to slide down the hill by the maple trees. I wish I had a sled out here. <laughs> you can't use a sled on sand and rocks, son. But I'll tell you what. You'll be a good boy and maybe you'll get a pony for Christmas. A real life pony? Yeah, might be. Gee, that'd be swell. But, Pop... Yes, son? If we had snow, then my pony could pull me on a sled, couldn't he, Pop? Just like it used to be in Vermont. Well, like I said, I I came out to this resort, the Double Bit Ranch it was called. Came out last year just to kind of get away from the Broadway rat racing and breathe some fresh air instead of the smoke and stale jokes. It was about two in the afternoon when I barged into the joint. Here I am out in the Wild West. Hey, what's your name, pal? My name Pete. I Injun, Iroquois tribe. Yeah? My name's Charlie, Schmohawk tribe. <laughs> you look him like Schmo. <laughs> How come city slicker like you come out west? I got pioneer blood in me. My ancestors rode cross country in the first covered wagon. And while passing through Arkansas, a hurricane ripped the top off and they made history. How come they make history? First convertible in America. <laughs> Screw their tops. Get it, Redskin? You very funny pale face. Where you come from? Me? I was born on the sidewalks in New York. But I don't let anybody step on me. I'm a rugged kid. Here, feel these muscles. Go ahead, feel them. Go ahead. Keep feeling. You'll find them. <laughs> Brother, my muscles are tough as shoe leather. Better resole them. Uh, who writes your material? Pocahontas? Hey, I like that shirt you got on. Did you make it yourself? No, make them. Buy them. Yeah? Real Indian shirt. Arrow shirt. Yeah? Hey, I'm wearing an arrow shirt, too. Your arrow looks shot. Because I got on a bow tie. Ah, brother, that Arizona air. <coughs> I guess I'm not used to it. Oh, look who's here, small fry. Who are you, kid? I'm Puggy. Yeah, well, I'm Baggy. But well, you'll get used to it. You're Chuckle Charlie, aren't you? That's right, kid. I hear you on the radio. Hey, they got radios out here? Yeah, that's great. Proves how uncivilized this place really is. I remember the time you had Frank Sinatra on your show. Yeah, good old Frankie boy. He was supposed to come out here to Arizona with me, but he couldn't make it. He's busy giving blood transfusions to mosquitoes. <laughs> I heard that joke before. That's all right. I used it again. It's been used again. Yeah, but... <laughs> hey, you're all right, kid. I can tell we're going to get along like Jack and a Beanstalk. You know, I think you're going to grow on me. Maybe you wonder what all this has got to do with Christmas. But I'm coming to that. I have to kind of tell us my own way. This kid, Puggy, and me, we became very good friends. Well, I've always liked kids. It's so natural, and it's, it's so different from, well, all the characters and the phonies you meet around Broadway. Something about kids, they don't take 10% like the agent. We got along fine, Puggy and me. And then one day, something very tough happened. I'll never forget it. Hey, come fast. Where horse face? What's the matter, Pete? Little boy, little boy. Something happened? Where's father? Where horse face? Horse face! Horse face, hey, come in here. You call me? Uh, Indian uh, Pete, won't you? Your boy. Okay. What about him? Quick. I find him near fence. He lies very still. But he breathe. I got him on porch now. You call doctor. Something very bad happened. <laughs> Puggy's resting now, but, well, he's in a bad way. He's a very sick boy. Right here. You mean, you mean it's ticker, Doc? That's right. But that's why we come out here. The doctors in Vermont said... Yes, I know, Mr. Atkins. It just didn't work out that way. But, little boy, he'd be all right soon. I don't think so, Pete. 
Medicine man, no fix. Why not? It's out of my hands, Pete. Out of your... What do you mean, Doctor? I, I don't understand. It's in the hands of God, Mr. Atkins. In the hands of God. I'll never forget it. All of a sudden, I, I didn't feel like a wise guy anymore. I didn't have any gags. Well, it's... One thing you can't joke about, that's old Mr. Bones, the Grim Reaper. Doc said it might be two or three weeks, and then no puggy, no pal. No little kid to agent for me. The next morning, you let me go in to see him. Oh, I made like everything was all right. Hello, kid, what are you doing in bed? Dusting mattresses? Oh, that's a soft job. <laughs> hey, did you hear the one about the guy who didn't... He didn't want to shoe the flies because he thought it was cheaper to let him run around barefoot? I got another one about... Uh, uh, what's the matter, kid? Tell Uncle Charlie... Come on, what would you like? Anything you want, you just name it. Your Uncle Charlie will buy it for you. Come on, take your mind off your troubles. I don't want anything. Oh, sure you do. Come on, Christmas is coming. You must want something. Tell you what we'll do. You and I will celebrate Christmas early, just the two of us. My pop's going to get me a pony. A pony? You want a pony? I'll get one for you right away. I'll have him hitched right over there by the gate, and you can see him through the window. A pony would be nice, but I don't want him for Christmas. What do you want, Puggy? For Christmas, I'd... I'd like snow. Snow? But this is Arizona, kid. It doesn't snow out here. I know it doesn't, but if I can't have anything I want for Christmas, I, I want some snow, like I used to have. Sure, kid, I understand. You try to get some sleep, and we'll see if Santa Claus can maybe send some. Hmm. How is he this morning? Didn't seem so good when I talked with him. He's about the same, Horsley. He thinks he's going to die. He puts it in children's language, but that's what he means. Well, he good boy. That no happen. I, I don't know what to do. I said I'd buy him anything he wanted, and the kid wants snow. Snow? Like we used to have back home? That's right, snow. How am I going to get him snow? It snowed here once, 11 years ago. Oh, swell. That's great. Well, maybe there's something we can do. Oh, yeah? How are you going to get snow out here in Arizona? Well, not me, but I think I read somewhere uh, something about a scientist who could make it snow. He, he does something with clouds. Yeah? I never read that. I don't believe Variety carried it. I, I think I saw it in some technical journal. What are you doing reading technical journals? I'm a college professor. You should excuse the expression. A college professor? And Einstein? Hey, can you make it snow? I mean, I mean, do you know the trick, the secret, the no, formula? No, no, the... no, no. I'm a student of Celtic literature, but I... Why, George, it was Dr. Updike from the Scientific Laboratories Incorporated in New York. That's the organization. New York, huh? Brother, that's my territory. Where's the telephone? Oh, boy, maybe this is it. Maybe you can get Puggy some snow after all. Oh, brother, I feel ten years younger already. Those scientists do crazy things now. Hello? Hello? Come on, sister, answer. Hello? Your call, please. Look, I want Dr. Updike at Scientific Laboratories Incorporated, New York. One moment, please. Oh, oh if the doctor will make it snow, it'll be tough sledding. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Hello, Dr. Updike? Yes? Can you make it snow? Well, uh, possibly, under certain conditions. Doc, money is no object. I wasn't referring to financial conditions. I was uh, referring to weather conditions. Weather conditions? Doc, we got weather out here we haven't even used yet. Where are you calling from? From Arizona. Why do you want snow in Arizona? Because Christmas is coming. Christmas has been coming out there for years without snowing. So what? I need snow, Doc. I bought shovels and I got a sidewalk and I want to put them to use. Well, if you put it that way, we've a laboratory here where we could put your head to use. Oh, Doc, <laughs> Doc, I'm serious. I want to order two acres of snow, about two, three inches high. I want the finest snow you got and make sure it's white. But snow doesn't come by the acre. Oh, no, who cares? You sell it by the pound or the bucket, anything. I'm trying to tell you we do not sell snow. Only under certain conditions can it be created. Oh, you with conditions. Look, get on an aeroplane and fly out here at my expense to the Double Bit Ranch near Phoenix, Arizona. Got that? Double Bit Ranch near Phoenix. The name is Chuckle Charlie. Well, this is highly unorthodox, but all right, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> You are listening to Chuckle Charlie and the Christmas Cloud, a special holiday treat for our listeners, starring Maury Amsterdam on Exploring the Unknown, radio's award-winning science program, combining fictional stories with authentic information, brought to you by the American Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations. And now, 
Act Two of Chuckle Charlie and the Christmas Cloud, starring Maury Amsterdam as Chuckle Charlie on Exploring the Unknown. <laughs> Uh, you wise guys probably think I was crazy getting a test tube genius to fly all the way out from New York just to make it snow in the Arizona desert. But, brother, I was ready to try anything, even science. Even if I had to pay for it myself. I tell you, I was as jumpy as on an opening performance. Next morning, when Pete landed the Piper Cub he uses to fly guests back and forth from Phoenix, I was right out there on the field. Pete was helping a little moony-faced guy out of the plane, so I ran over. Hi, funny man. This Dr. Updike. Mr. Uh, Chuckle, I presume? Not Fred Allen, brother. Uh, I always talk like this when I got a clothespin on my nose. <laughs> I, uh, I I didn't quite understand on the phone what you wanted, and now I'm more confused than ever, but I thought I'd better find out. You sounded so generous. Look, you do this little thing for me, Doc. Instead of guinea pigs, you can use minks. And maybe I can cross the mink with a kangaroo and end up having a coat with pockets. Look, stop with the jokes, will you, Doc? How soon can you do it? Do what? Make it snow. Make the little flakes fall, like I said on the telephone. You mean uh, here, right on this spot? That's it, right here, and... Well, hear about. And you mean now, uh, today, and uh, not just sometime? Yep, that's right, Doc. You see, there's a little... It's impossible. Up... There's, um, there's... What? It's utterly impossible. There's not a cloud in the sky and the temperature's too warm. I know that. That's why I got you out here. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I thought you was the guy who made it rain or snow whether the weather wanted to or not. But science can't perform miracles. It's got to cooperate with nature. Now, uh, if it were cooler down here on the ground, and if there was a great big thick cloud up above, maybe I could help you. Yeah, sure, sure. All you'd need is a rocking chair. Rocking chair? Yeah, to sit in while you waited for it to snow without your help. Mr. Chuckle, if you're implying... I'm implying I... nothing. I'm saying you're a phony. You're a Mr. fake. Mr. Chuckle, I didn't leave my research and fly. 2,000 miles to be called a fake, yeah. you can rest assured that I will take the next plane back to New York at your expense. Why you got him long face? New look? <laughs> You look so sad, if your face get him any longer, you have five o'clock shadow twice. Uh, take your tommyhawk and get lost in somebody else's hair, will you? Wear medicine man. When him make him snow. Uh, we're all washed up, Pete. No soap. Dirty deal. <laughs> what happened? Oh, Dr. Updike in those conditions. I thought he could make it snow and all he makes is trouble. Who say he make trouble? I said so. In my tribe, I called Big Bear. I think in your tribe, you called Big Donkey. Oh, yeah? In my tribe, I'm called a Big Shot. Big Shot, good name. You always blow top. <laughs> you make Medicine Man angry. What do you want me to do, crawl? If you crawl, maybe worm turn. Old Indian saying, swallow pride, drink happiness. Take Medicine Man to see little boy. Remember, little boy, better agent than you. <laughs> Huggy. Huggy, you awake? Sure, Chuckle. Huggy, I want you to meet Dr. Updike. Hello, Puggy. Hello. What's wrong with the other doctor? Is he sick? <laughs> no. Dr. I Updike, he's a, he's a different kind of a doctor. When it doesn't snow, this doc here just gives this guy some pills and makes it snow. Did you give some pills to the weather today? Well, no, no, I didn't. You mean it won't snow? But Chuckle, you promised. You said today or tonight. I know, kid, but it's up to the doc here. Uh, don't you worry, Puggy. I'll do everything I can. <laughs> what I tell you, folks? The doc is going to do it. Hey, you should have seen Puggy's face. Thank you, Dr. Updike. I, I'm sure grateful. Big medicine man gonna do, I put away rabbit's foot. Save for some other time. Yeah, and I'm the kid who always thought I had nothing but bad luck. Like the time I was alone on a desert island with Lana Turner and there was nobody there to introduce us. 
Maybe, maybe you'd better save that charm after all. Uh, Mr. Atkins, I, I didn't have the heart to tell your boy the truth. Uh, what do you mean? The sky is clear, not a cloud in sight, and the temperature is too warm. I told you... Now, wait, wait, wait a minute, Doc. You, you mean you can't... There's only that. one chance. If the temperature drops and if clouds form, then perhaps I can. I take rabbit's foot. Better medicine than you got. Dr. Updike, is there any chance of conditions you need coming? I don't know. Well, perhaps if we called the weather bureau. Yeah, that's a good idea. Come on, let's call the weather bureau. Weather fair and bright, clear skies, warmer tomorrow. 6 a.m. report, clear and sunny. 12 noon report, continued fair and warmer, skies cloudless. 3 o'clock report, fair and pleasant. Prediction for tomorrow, same. That's great. I came to Arizona for a rest and good weather. Now I got it and I don't want it. Little boy worse. Too bad. It's not going to change, Mr. Chuckles. I think I'll take the six o'clock plane back to New York. Yeah, let me carry your baggage to the plane, Doc. I'm left holding the bag anyway. I'm sorry. There's nothing I... Listen, man. Hey, look. Out window. What's that? It's sky. Big cloud. A cloud? Impossible. Let me see it. Boy, look at it. I don't believe it. Come out on porch, fast. Hey! Hey, Pete's right. Oh, rabbit feet, I love you. And it get colder. Uh, feel wind. I tell you, this is a freak. I, I, I've never heard of such a weather change so quickly. The, the weather bureau Who said... Who that... cares what the weather bureau says? I just hope the temperature drops so low it can only be read by a gopher. But we, we, we haven't got much time. Now, that, that cloud system can't be more than 50 miles wide. At the speed it's traveling, it might be over in a couple or three hours. Well, how much time do you need, Doc? The, uh, the main thing is I need some dry ice. Where am I going to get it? Dry ice? I fly it in from Phoenix twice a week. How would it be if we walked off with about 50 pounds? Okay, I fly some more tomorrow. Now we're getting somewhere. Mr. Chuckle, go dig up a hammer and a thermometer. And Pete, Mm. how would you like to warm up that air flivver you fly around in? Now? Right away, Pete. We're going to give some pills of dry ice to a sick cloud. What's the altimeter say, Pete? 4,000 feet. Oh, way too low. Too low? Are you kidding? We're so high now, all I can get on the radio is Angel Serenade. What's the ceiling on this crate? Don't know. Never tried. Well, let's try now. Take her up. Mr. Chuckle? Yeah? Pull in that thermometer and see what it says. Okay. And if you have any trouble reading it, just remember next time not to bring a kitchen thermometer to read air temperatures. What do we need a thermometer for? It's so cold now. My goose pimples are huddled together just to keep warm. Here. Give it to me. Uh, 25 degrees. 25? Hey, that's way below freezing. It's not cold enough. Not cold enough. If I get any bluer, they'll be putting pens in my ears and starting to drain me. Ordinarily, water freezes at 32 degrees, but the cloud droplets are super cool. They won't freeze until the temperature gets down to about 30 below zero. 30 below? Oh, wow. If I get any stiffer, undertakers will be winking at me. Why does it have to be so cold? Has to do with the high surface tension of the spherical shape. You see the... No sea, but water freeze on wings. Yes, because when the drops splash against the wing... Who wants to know why? I don't think it's serious. You don't think it's serious. My parachute just put on a parachute and you don't think it's serious. Why did I ever come on this trip? Gee, that's two miles. I wonder how long it'll take us to fall. Get hold of yourself, Mr. Chuckles. Grab the hammer and start breaking up one of those blocks of dry ice. All you have them, cocktail or julep size? (laughs) Get them as small as you can. About the size of a pea is perfect. And then what? Then I'm going to scatter them as far as I can out the window. All right, now here goes the first batch. Give me some more. Pete, yeah. fly straight ahead for about six miles, then double back. We'll go back and forth five or six times. Okay. Gee, Doc, this whole thing sounds crazy to me. You mean you expect to freeze a whole cloud with this little bit of dry ice? I hope so. A single pellet of this dry ice falling through the right kind of cloud can produce several tons of snow. A single pellet can produce several tons of snow. Will, will it work with quarters? Not exactly. This dry ice is pretty cold. You're telling me. In fact, it's 110 degrees below zero. No wonder I'm an icicle. So, 
When it falls, it, it cools the air in its path, leaving a trail of millions of tiny ice crystals. And each one of those tiny crystals is a center around which a snowflake builds up, using the water drops around it. Well, that's what happened. That dry ice came down like dandruff on a blue serge suit, and each pellet leaving a trail of snowflakes. We landed the plane and stepped out. I thought for a minute Injun Pete had gotten lost. Looked more like Alaska than Arizona. The rattlesnakes were playing jingle bells. I couldn't wait to see Puggy. Gee, Uncle Charlie, snow. Just like back home. Golly. I told you, kid, I told you your Uncle Charlie would do it. You're super duper. You're great. Ah, uh, you're just saying that because it's true. It's going to be a real merry Christmas. And then a few days later, the town doctor came back. <laughs> Gesundheit. Oh, this snow. Most amazing thing I ever saw. That boy's getting along fine. I think he's going to be all right. I would never have believed it. A real miracle. <laughs> miracle is right. I never would have believed it either, but miracles can happen. Who can tell? I might even be in Hollywood someday. After all, look at me. Take Clark Gable, take Tyrone Power, Gregory Pep, Robert Taylor, roll them into one, and what do you got? Sydney Green Street. Thank you, Maury Amsterdam, for a very fine performance. And now for the Research Institute of America, Mr. Leo M. Chern. Beneath the fun in our holiday broadcast tonight, there lies an important scientific possibility. Namely, that man's age-old dream to control weather is on its way toward being realized. Vincent Schaefer, a brilliant scientist of General Electric's research laboratories, succeeded about a year ago in bringing rain or snow from certain types of clouds by seeding them with dry ice or frozen carbon dioxide, as it is technically known. This is the solid form of the gas that makes your soda pop thin. The future possibilities of Vincent Schaefer's discovery are very exciting. It may be that soon we shall be able to save farmers millions of dollars in hail damage by nipping thunderstorms in the bud. We may also be able to control hurricanes, clear airports of fog and low clouds, and store winter snow and rain in dry regions to relieve drought in the summer. Modern industrial research has given us all a Christmas gift that is truly a miracle of science by exploring the unknown. This is Andre Baruch again. Next week, the Hollywood star of Cass Timberlane and Mildred Pierce, Zachary Scott, will play the role of a fighting detective in a story of medical science titled Murder in Bed. Maury Amsterdam was supported by Johnny Grinnell as Puggy in tonight's ABC presentation of Exploring the Unknown. Frank Behrens played Dr. Updike. Charles Irving, the narrator, also played Injun Pete. Comedy continuity by Stan Burns and Ray Allen. Original music composed and conducted by Ralph Norman. Be sure to listen next week to Murder in Bed. Drawn from the notebooks of science and industry by the Research Institute of America, starring Zachary Scott. Tonight's Exploring the Unknown was written and produced by Sherman H. Dreyer Productions. Stay tuned. Some more of these great old radio Christmas programs coming right up. Johnny, I don't like this. Something tells me we should have ought to mind our own business. Look, Sam, helping a damsel in distress is your business, my business, everybody's business. Oh, what's a damsel? It's, uh, well, a dame. Okay, then it's your business. I want no part of it.
Yes, it's time for another... Johnny Fletcher Mystery. Brought to you by the National Broadcasting Company. And starring Albert Decker as Johnny Fletcher and Mike Mazurki as Sam Cragg. In Frank Gruber's best-selling murder mystery, The Navy Colt. It is mid-afternoon, and we find Johnny and Sam on a busy street in New York making a fast pitch. Their customary method of earning an honest dollar whenever they're broke, which they usually are. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. You see here the strongest man in the world, my pal and partner, Sam Cragg. A short time ago, Sam was a puny weakling who weighed only 98 pounds. Now look at him, a magnificent specimen of manhood, six feet five, 250 pounds of brawn and brawn. As evidence of his enormous strength, Sam is going to fill his mighty lungs with air and snap that two-inch log chain wrapped about his chest. Are you ready, Sam? Yeah. Then go on and break it, my boy, and let the links fall where they may. (laughs) Observe, observe, ladies and gentlemen, the E with which he pulls apart that symbol of slavery. For the love of Pete, bust it. I'm trying to, Johnny. You must have meant that link too strong. But... There you are, my friends, there you are. A miracle of strength has been performed before your very eyes. A broken chain lies at my feet. A man, a real man, has released himself from the fetters of masculine weakness. Ladies and gentlemen, you too can be marvels of strength like Sam Cragg. This book of mine, every man of... Ixnay, Ixnay, here comes that cop again. Where? On the side of the street. Oh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get out of here, Sam. What a life. A man can't try to make an honest living anymore, but what some flat-foot crabs the act. You know something, Johnny? No, what? We wouldn't be broke all the time if you was to stick to one thing or another. Why, you got brains. You got the gift of gab. And you got me. A three-way handicap, if I ever heard one. No fooling, Johnny. You got all the makings of a big business typhoon. Why don't we decide either to be a businessman or an amateur detective? (laughs) One or the other, but not both. Go on, Sam. You interest me strangely. Oh, nuts. You know what I mean, Johnny. (laughs) But it happens continuous all the time. We get a good start selling books or some kind of business that looks easy. And what pursues? Somebody gets their throat cut or found dead in a trunk or something. And you horn your way into the act. That's my way of having fun. I know, Johnny, but a guy can't have much fun in an empty stomach. And that's what usually happens. We got nothing else but... Johnny, something tells me we're being followed. Mister. Oh, mister. Oh, hello, miss. May I speak to you a moment, sir? Why not? Well, I saw you gentlemen break that chain back there. So you must be awfully strong. Oh, you want to buy a book, huh? Get one out, Sam. Oh, no. No, not a book. Do you gentlemen want to earn ten dollars? Lady, right now for ten bucks I'd go over Niagara Falls in a mustache cup. Now, how do we earn the saw book? No, Johnny, no. This is like the way it always starts. You're right, Sam. Sorry, sister. Some other time, maybe. Oh, please. You gentlemen must help me. Look, sister, let's get this straight. We're not gentlemen. I'm just a guy named Johnny Fletcher, and this rugged character is Sam Cragg, my pal. I'm happy to know you, Mr. Fletcher and Mr. Cragg. My name is Hilda Nelson. Oh, yeah? Where do you live? Park Avenue. Park Avenue? Well, is that anything to feel bad about? But Park Avenue is just another word for millionaire. I know what you mean, but honestly, ten dollars is all I can give you. Say, how did you get those nasty-looking bruises? Well, I'd rather not say. You mean somebody did that? Yes. That's why I asked if you wanted to earn ten dollars. Why didn't you say so in the first place? Now, what is it you want us to do? Uh Uh-oh, here we go again. You mean you'll do it? Yep, you've talked us into it. Oh, thank you. Here's the dollar down. Oh, thank you. And what are we supposed to do in return for this shower of wealth? I want you to go to 205 East 63rd Street, Mr. Maxwell's apartment. It's on the 12th floor. You just ring the doorbell. Oh, sure. I'm quite a hand with doorbells. Uh, Is that all? No. When Mr. Maxwell opens the door, I want you to hit him just as hard as you can, right on the nose. Oh, that sounds like fun, doesn't it, Sam? Uh, Anything else? Yes. As you hit him, I want you to say, 
Hilda sends this with her compliments. Better and better. But I'll let Sam hit him. He hits harder than I do, don't you, Sam? Oh, now listen, Johnny, I... Never mind. A man that'll abuse a girl ought to get the stuffings knocked out of him. Just on the nose will be enough. Oh, uh, but I want proof that you did it. Oh, sure. I'll bring you Sam's bruised knuckle. That do? No, that won't be quite enough. Any suggestions? Well, let me see. Mr. Maxwell always wears red neckties. Ugly red ones. That's it. Bring me one of his red neckties. Then I'll give you the other nine dollars. A bust in the nose, a red necktie. Then where do we meet you to get the other nine bucks? Well, how soon can you finish the, uh, uh, the assignment? Oh, Sam and I haven't any really pressing engagements at the moment. Very well. I'll meet you at the Grand Central Station in an hour. Here it is. James Maxwell. Uh, ring the bell, Sam. Now, remember... Remember, when he sticks his puss out, let him have it. Man, what do you guys want? Now, Sam, now. You heard that, Johnny? Oh, nothing the couple of hospitals and a bunch of doctors can't fix. Help me up, Sam. <sighs> what out of rat in cheap clothing. Hitting a guy when he ain't looking. I'll fix him. Oh, you had your chance, Sam. He won't come out again. Then I'll bust the door down. So you two jerks want more of the same, huh? Look, look out, Sam. He's got a gun. Uh, no. Grab the gun while I hold him. Okay. There you go. I trigger. you. I got it. Now I'll suck him. Here you are, fella. Don't. Hilda sends this with her compliments. Now get in there. That was a narrow squeak. I guess he didn't shoot you. I don't see no blood. Of course he shot me, you lunk. Right through the coat sleeve. Look at that hole. Gee. Oh, well, maybe you can get it rewove. Remember that sport coat that I had? What? Yes, sir. Who shut the door down the hall? I don't know. Somebody's been getting an eye for him. No telling who saw us. We gotta get out of here. Let's don't keep Hilda waiting. <laughs> This is John Storm. You're listening to The Navy Colt, a Johnny Fletcher mystery. But before we rejoin Johnny and Sam, you would place your first sales message here. You have presented the first of your sales messages, so we return to our own job of selling you the Johnny Fletcher mystery series. We catch up with Johnny Fletcher and his pal Sam Cragg at the Grand Central Station, where they were to meet Hilda Nelson and collect an additional $9 for hitting, as Miss Nelson so naively put it, a certain Mr. James Maxwell on the nose. That's grand, Johnny. The kid ain't gonna show up. I'm tired sitting here. And besides, I'm hungry. So am I. You got enough to eat on? Well, not great big baskets full. Hey, maybe we can hide that gun you took off Maxwell. And he done that a couple of times. <laughs> Could be. It's big enough. Yeah. What a rod. Must be two feet long. i never seen one that big before. Neither did I, except in a museum. It's what they call a Navy Colt. Colt? It looked rode up to me. Sam, a Colt is a revolver. You know, what's got me puzzled is this microfilm I found in one of the chambers of the gun. What is that stuff? Well, it looks like a photostatic copy of some legal documents. You took the words right out of me mouth. <laughs> they must be important. After we collect our nine bucks from Hilda, we'll take them to a photographer and have them blow them up big enough to read. Uh-oh. Look who's here. Oh, I'm so sorry, Adelaide. I was afraid you'd leave. <laughs> no, we like it here. Well, did you, uh, stalk him? Sister, how can you ask? Look at this thing I used to call a jaw. Oh, dear. Hey, what about our nine bucks? But did you get the red necktie? Red necktie? Red necktie? Sam, did we get his red necktie? No, nah, he wasn't wearing no necktie. That's right, lady. <laughs> Please, the nine bucks. But that's what I came to tell you. I, I couldn't get the rest of the money. Uh-oh. Oh, I'm sorry, really, I am. Here, I'll write a check. Oh, <laughs> not for me, sister. Why not? A check means getting identified. And getting identified means... You get it? Yeah. yeah. Well, come on, Sam. Let's eat. Goodbye, Hilda, dear. Nice to have had the pleasure of your... Gee, with that big bundle of chow me, I'm a new man. Don't tell me you're not going to have another piece of pie. No, I'm filled up clear up to here. Cigarette? Thanks. Hold the light. Sure. Here you are. You know, Johnny, 
You did all right hocking that old gun for four bucks. <laughs> Funny speed it gives that old guy about it belongs to your grandfather. <laughs> Present from Jesse James. You really think him up. <laughs> Paper, mister, read all about the East Side killing. Yeah, yes, son. Thanks, mister. Read all about the big murder. Read all about it. Paper here. It's a late edition. Paper. Uh-oh. Hold on to your chair, Sam. What goes? Get a load of this. James Maxwell, 205 East 63rd Street, was found dead in his apartment late today. According to the police, his death resulted from a gunshot. Hey, that's the guy we popped. And listen to this. Miss Cornelia Spatz, living in an adjoining apartment, told the officers she was an eyewitness to the killing. Say, that's who slammed the door right down the hall. Hey, how do you like this? Miss Spatz testified that one of the men was tall and slender with dark hair. Tall and slender with dark hair. And the other was a huge hook of a man, about six feet four inches, weighing about 250... The nerve of that dame. Saying I'm six feet four. I'm six five. Let's see what else they know. The police say, continued on page four... There it is. An old-time Navy Colt revolver is missing from a gun rack on the wall and may have been the murder weapon. They are scouring the city for such a gun, which may provide a clue to the killers. Come on, we got to move fast. Where are we going? Get the gun out of Hawk before the cops beat us to it. It's got our fingerprints all over. What an alley. Black as your hat. Yeah. Come on, open up. Maybe the old guy don't live in the back. Yes, he does. There goes a the light. Here he comes. The Navy Colt man. I want to get the gun out of Hawk. No. I keep dreaming about Indians. And I got to go back and shoot them. Come in. Let's make this fast, will you, Pop? Here's your four bucks. Getting me up out of such a nice sound sleep. Yes, four dollars it comes to. All right, here's your four, and, and here's your ticket. I'm glad to get rid of this thing. It scares me to look at it. <laughs> See you later, Pop. I hope not. Gee, i never seen an alley so black. Yeah, pretty dark. Hey, Johnny, I forgot our newspaper. I left it laying there on the counter in the hock shop. Oh, I'll let it go. Oh, no, i got to go back and get it. What for? I ain't read the funnies. Oh, for the love of Pete. All right. I'll wait here for you. Hey, Pop, don't lock up yet. I forgot the funny. What a character. At a time like this, he forgets the funny. Hey, Bert, get a match? Yeah. Guess so. Hey, where'd you come from so quick? Never mind that. See what this is, fella? Yeah. Yeah, it's a gun. Anybody could tell that. Stick up, huh? That's right. Well, if it's dough you're after, chum, I'm broke. Take it easy. All I want's that Navy coat. Sure. Help yourself. Okay, bud. Here's your payment. <laughs> hey, Johnny. Where are you? Over here. A uh, guy stuck me up. Which way did he go? I'll go get him. No, don't go after him. All he got was our gun. What's any guy want with that old broken down horse pistol? Sam, do you believe in ghosts? Huh? Ghosts? Well, uh, kind of. I'm human, I, I guess. Why? The guy that held me up was James Maxwell. The man we're supposed to have murdered. Holy cow! Ah, uh, I, two, eight, four, two, two. How do you know that's Hilda's number? Gotta be. The only Nelson in the phone book on Park Avenue. Kind of tough waking the kid up this time of the night. Wake her up, she better wake up. I'll drag her over the head, a little double cross. Hello? This is Johnny Fletcher. I want to see you right away to have a talk. Oh, uh, that's absurd, Mr. Fletcher. I ought to hang up. Smile when you say hang, sister. You got us in plenty of trouble. Well, I didn't tell you to kill Mr. Maxwell. Kill Mr. Maxwell? Are you screwy? Now, look. You meet us in the waiting room of the Grand Central Station in one hour. But, Mr. Fletcher, it's so late. The Grand Central in one hour. And you better be there or else. <laughs> Sit down, Miss Nelson. Sam, keep an eye out for anything that looks like a cop. Okay. 
Now, young lady, what was the idea of trying to frame me and Sam for the murder of this Maxwell guy? Frame you? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, about. you do. You fixed it all up with a spat stain to poke a schnozzle out of a door on time to catch Sam and me doing your rough stuff. Spats? I don't even know her. Don't give me that. Sister, I want to run on the line. Who is this Maxwell and why did you want him socked? Mr. Fletcher, I don't think Look, I... Look, babe, this is no time to kid around. Any minute now, the cops are liable to move in on us. So spill it all. All of it. What about this Maxwell guy? Mr. Fletcher, I've kept it all back for such a long time. It's going to be a relief to tell someone like you. I, I know I shouldn't. Who was Maxwell? Well, he was the son of a man who was once my father's business partner. Well, why did you want Maxwell socked? He kept forcing me to give him money. Lots of money. Blackmail, huh? Yes, well, why did he hit you and put those bruises on you? Because I couldn't get any more money for him. He was furious, so he began to beat me. I managed to get away. It was right after that I saw you and Mr. Craig. You aren't ever in love with this bare boon by any chance, were you? In love with him. I despised him. I loathed him. I always have. Well, how did he force you to give him the dough? Well, he showed me a letter his father wrote when he was dying. It accused my father of killing his father. Why was your father supposed to have killed him? So my father could take over the business they started. Well, who is your father and what business is he in? He's Helmer Nelson, one of the biggest manufacturers of railroad ties in the country. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Well, why didn't you tell your father? Oh, no, I couldn't do that. Mr. Maxwell said he'd kill Dad, and me too, if I ever did. Hilda, there's something maybe you can explain. The man Sam and I socked was not the man who was killed. What? The man we thought was Maxwell, the guy we hit. Held me up last night and took a Navy Colt revolver away from me. The one I took from the guy I thought was Maxwell. Honestly, Mr. Fletcher, I can't explain that. What kind of looking man was he? A oh, big gorilla about the size of Sam there. Had a red mustache and a scar across his forehead. Well, by that, Carl Streeter. He and Mr. Maxwell hated each other. You sure your old man didn't suddenly get wise to what was going on? I don't really know. Who do you think killed Maxwell? Carl Streeter. You know where I can find him? Yes. He lives at 804 West 14th Street. Why? I'd better have a little talk with him. Come on, Sam. Let's go. Looks like Mr. Streeter ain't home. We better try again some other time. Let me have that skeleton key. Now, look, Johnny. That ain't honest. Here. Like the inside of a hothouse. Shut the door, Sam. Hey, that looks like our gun on that table. Yeah. We'll take it along so he can't shoot us with it, like he did Maxwell. Gee, Johnny, what if he used to barge in right now? Shh. You think of the most unpleasant thing. Look, that door's shut. Maybe he's in there. Let's find out. Uh, do you think we'd better? This is housebreaking or something. Open the door and quit pretending you're scared. Who's pretending? Who's pretending? Hey, that's him on the bed. Looks like he's taking a nap. Yeah, a good long one. The guy's dead. Look, he's been shot. <laughs> You are listening to The Navy Colt, a Johnny Fletcher mystery. Here is the place for your second sales message. You have completed your second sales message. Catching up with Johnny Fletcher and Sam Cragg next morning, we find them outside the apartment door of Cornelia Spat, the woman who described them to the police as the killers of James Maxwell. Johnny, I think you're nuts. Sticking your neck out like this. Maybe so, but if this dame can really put the finger on us, it's going to be a tough winter. we got to find out. But I'm worried. So am I. Here's the apartment. Miss Cornelia's back. Get out of sight. Okay, but be careful. How do you do, Miss Spatz? Yes? Yeah. Miss Mallory down on the 10th floor asked me to be sure and see you. I'm selling... Nylons. Nylons? Oh, my goodness. Won't you come in, please? Thank you. You were certainly busy with that typewriter, Miss Spatz. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm just finishing up a story. Oh, a real author. What kind of stories do you write? <laughs> You'd never, never believe it of me, but huh. they're about crime. 
Murders, mostly. A charming young woman like you? Well, somehow you're just not the type. <laughs> well, they're not exactly fiction stories. They're... You see, I'm the New York correspondent for a Chicago magazine called Cunning Crimes. Uh-huh. They use short articles each month about actual crimes. Uh, what crime are you writing about now? Oh, I had such a wonderful experience. I witnessed a murder right out in the hall. You actually saw the murderers? Yes, indeedy. And I gave the police a perfect description of them. You know, <laughs> one of them looked a teensy bit like you. <laughs> like me? <laughs> yes. But uh, he wasn't nearly so good looking. Oh, Miss Pat. I can hardly wait to read your story when it comes out. Now, uh, how about the nylon? Shall I write up your order for, say, six pairs? Oh, no, I'll take a dozen. And I'm sure I can get a lot more orders for you from the girls. You see, I'm president of the Pen and Eraser Club. We're all writers, you know. And they'll be simply thrilled to death when I tell them about you. I, I mean, selling nylon. Oh, that's wonderful of you, Miss Pat. How can I get in touch with you when I've seen the girls? Oh, here, I'll write it down for you. Johnny Fletcher, Eagle Hotel. Oh, thank you, Mr. Fletcher. And I'm awfully glad you stopped in. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, goodbye, Miss Spat. And uh, he'll stop in again. <laughs> Anytime. Thank you. Oh, phew. Well, that's a load off my mind. Didn't recognize you, huh? With those thick cheetahs over her eyes, that crackpot wouldn't recognize her own self in the mirror. Mr. Nelson, I'll get right to the point. You've been paying a lot of dough to a guy named Maxwell. The guy that got bumped off the other night. There's only one answer to a stupid remark like that, Fletcher. Get out of my office or I'll have you thrown out. Take it easy, Nelson. Whether you know it or not, your daughter got herself into one billy of a mess, and what's more, she got me into it, too. Just who are you, and what do you want? I told you. I'm the guy that got into a jam trying to help your daughter. Ridiculous. I'm perfectly capable of giving my daughter any help she needs. That's a laugh. Did you know that for years, Hilda has been blackmailed by Maxwell? Hilda, too? Why, that... Now, 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 Mr. Nelson, don't speak ill of the dead. Especially when you may have had a hand, shall we say, in hastening his death. Are you accusing me of Maxwell's murder? Could be. Well, you're wrong. That's what they all say. But what do you want? Your side of the story, Mr. Nelson. Did you ever see the letter Archer Maxwell wrote accusing you of his death? Yes. James Maxwell has held it over my head for years. But I didn't kill his father. It was an accident. Archer must have been out of his head when he wrote that note. Just what was in the letter? Oh, I don't remember the exact wording, but it accused me all right. Strange part about it, a piece of the letter was missing, torn off. Did you see the torn piece? No, but Maxwell had me. He could smash my business and send me to the chair on the strength of that letter. So I kept dishing the money out to him. How does Carl Streeter tie into the setup? He and James Maxwell were two of a kind. I don't know what street I had on Maxwell, but he got a cut in the money. Fact is, once in a while, Streeter came up here to collect... Well, thanks, Nelson. That's about all. Ain't it funny, Johnny? Even no hotel room like this seems good to get back to if you get tired enough. Yeah, just like home if you're up with your rent. Johnny Fletcher speaking. Oh, hello, Mr. Fletcher. This is Cornelius Pat. I have some good news. I saw some of the girls, and I have quite a few nylon orders for you. Could you come over right away? Thank you very much, Miss Pat. I'll be looking for you. <laughs> come as soon as you can. Goodbye. Bye. That Spats character wants to see me right away. I knew what the dames felt for you, like they all do. You ain't going, are you? Not a chance. Hey, how's about me going to get them orders? Is she a good looker? Say, now you got something, Sam. We'll both go in, and if she doesn't recognize you either, we got nothing more to worry about. Now, please, Johnny. I was only kidding. I don't want to see her. On the way, we'll pick up the enlargements of those microfilms. Come on, you big lip. Sam, you're about to lose those pictures. Shove them down further in your pocket. Yeah, yeah, I'll watch them. Johnny, I'm worried. By yourself, this fat stain didn't recognize you. But the both of us together like this, forget it. Let me do the talking. Don't I always? Oh, do come in. I've been waiting for you. Uh-huh. Miss Spatz, may I present my friend Sam Craig? How do you do, Mr. Craig? It's indeed a pleasure. It sure is. Get those hands up, both of you. Hey, what is this? It's the law, bud. Priscom Riley. I'll keep him covered. 
Uh, the cleaner. Hey, what is all this about? We're arresting you two for the murder of James Maxwell and Carl Street. Who says? I do. I definitely saw you do it. <laughs> you thought I didn't recognize you when you came snooping around the other day, pretending to sell nylons. I'm not that stupid. And I thought you liked me, Miss Bat. Don't be absurd. And I'm afraid all those crime stories you write have gone to your head. Please get these men out of here, officers. I have work to do. Sure, lady. Put the cuffs on them, Riley. Let's get moving. Now, just a moment, officers. Miss Spats, you know we didn't kill Maxwell and Carl Streeter. Tell it to the judge. And don't forget, fella, anything you say now will be used against you. Ah, the trouble is you have too much imagination, Miss Spats. Or may I call you Mrs. Maxwell? How dare you say such a thing? Oh, I'm impulsive that way. Officers, I'll leave it to you. Sam, give me those photographs. Here, take a slant at this. It's a photograph of the marriage license of Cornelius Spatz and James Maxwell. Yeah, that's right. Well, suppose Mr. Maxwell and I were married. What of it? Nothing. Except that you would have cause to become very jealous when you imagined your husband was falling for Hilda Nelson. Well, he was falling. Maybe so. But Hilda Nelson's a swell kid. Your husband get, couldn't get the first face with her. <laughs> Beginning to look as if you're the one who has too much imagination, Mr. Fletcher. Oh, no. The fact is, you've been masterminding the blackmail deal against Hilda and her father for years. And you were getting fed up with having to split the dough three ways. Everything you say is absolutely absurd, Mr. Fletcher. Oh, no. You really worked it out slick, Cornelia. You took the apartment next to your husband so you could keep everything under control and still not be suspected of anything. Then... Officers, will you please take these men away? Lady, looks like that guy's got something. Go on, bud. Well, Cornelia, you were scared of being tied into the deal if anything ever went wrong. So you had a copy of your marriage license made on microfilm and did it in the chamber of the gun. Then you destroyed the license. Look at this other film, officer. What's it all about? It's the photograph of the original letter that Cornelia and her playmate blackmailed Hilda Nelson and her father with. It was made before the corner was torn off. You see? The letter actually clears Nelson of any suspicion of killing Archer Maxwell. That's why Archer wrote it. But the way it's worded, with the corner missing, it becomes a perfect accusation. Gee, Johnny, you never cracked to me you had this all figured out. I didn't. So we picked up those film enlargements on the way here. What's all this leading up to, Fletcher? To the fact that Sam and I didn't kill James Maxwell and Carl Streeter. It was Cornelia Spatz. I did not. You can't prove that I did. How do you think she killed him, bud? Oh, that little fracas Sam and I had with Streeter, thinking he was Maxwell, was just what the doctor ordered for her. She waited till Carl Streeter had gone, then she stepped across the fire escape to her husband's apartment and shot him. But what about Streeter? Oh, she got afraid of what Streeter might say if the cops picked him up. So she went to his apartment and killed him. That's right, isn't it, Cornelia? Here's my answer to that. Get her gun, Sam! Oh, let go of me! Let go of my arm! Oh. Well, sister, that settles it. Same as a written confession. Put the bracelets on, O'Reilly. Oh, nice yeah. going, fella. You done some nice figuring on this one. Thanks. I'm sorry it had to be a tame. <laughs> Before we return to Johnny Fletcher and Sam Cragg, we pause again to mention that this is the spot where you present a final brief sales message. Now, back to Johnny Fletcher and Sam Cragg. They have just entered their hotel room. Sam Cragg speaking. Oh, Sam, this is Hilda. Dad and I just heard the wonderful news about what you did. We're so happy. Oh, it was nothing. Sam, Dad and I were just wondering if... Sam, hold the phone, Hilda. Go away, Johnny. You bother me. Yes, Hilda. Go on. Well, Father and I want you and Johnny to come over and have dinner with us. Why, sure. I'd love to, honey. Sam, no. Just a moment, Hilda. Listen, you dope. We're invited to the Nelsons for dinner. Eat. E-T-E-E. -E -E. Eat. Remember? We can't go. What's the matter with you, Johnny? Why can't we? Because there's a dead guy in our closet. Uh-oh. Here we go again. <laughs> Be sure to be with us next week when we bring you another best-selling Johnny Fletcher mystery by Frank Gruber entitled The Mighty Blockhead and starring Albert Decker and Mike Mazurki. Tonight's story was The Navy Colt. This program was produced in Hollywood's Radio City. This is NBC, the national broadcast.
Charlie, he's heading for trouble. Taxi! Taxi! Over here! Yes, sir. Where to? Follow that man. Yes, follow that man. Follow him into danger, into romance and high adventure. Follow his trail wherever it leads, through a maze of thrills and spine-tingling intrigue. Yes, follow that man, because it's Steve Mallory, the private eye. And here he is, Steve Mallory, in tonight's adventure for your product, The Trail of the Terrified Temptress. Trail began on one of those nights we seldom get in this part of California, dry and dusty as a mummy shroud, with a grating sandpaper wind that dehydrates your eyes, cracks your lips, and splits your nerves wide open. The kind of night when solid citizens get together to keep from screaming and end up screaming at each other. But not me. Me, I was minding my own business, like the fellow says who was hit by a truck. Just sitting quietly in my own room, knocking myself out. I had the radio up and the last of the good scotch down. And I was... They told me if I came to Hollywood, I'd be in pictures in six months. I've been out here for six years now, and the closest I'd come to a camera was when I had my kidneys x-rayed last fall. Oh, oh but I'm not discouraged, no. I, I had the fastest screen test in history. They called me at seven, shot the test at eight, Ran the test at 9, and at 10 o'clock, I was back on my good humor wagon. But I want to tell you, some of these California drivers, they okay, have... Okay, the okay, walk God. through it or wait till I open it. Well... Mr. Mallory, I was so afraid you'd be out. Ten more minutes, I would have been. What's on your mind, Let sister? me in, please, quickly. I've got to get out of this hole. How old are you? 22. Step right in. Lock it, lock it. Now, take it easy. I'm as eager as the next you beaver. You fool, there's a man following me. I'd be surprised if there wasn't. I'm afraid of him. He's been following me for days. You've got to protect me. Well, okay, but who's going to protect you from me? Please, please, I'm not joking. You've got to do something. What'll I do, start firing shots at the door? I haven't seen any man. He must be out there. He was right behind me in the lobby while I was coming up in the elevator. He was buzzing for it downstairs. Takes him a long time to get here, don't it? You're sure there was somebody following you? Oh, well, not that I doubt you, Go but... out there and look for yourself. Sure, only you come along. But I... But... Oh, no buts. I don't know you, sister. Not that it wouldn't be nice. But I'm not taking any chances. This door locks from the inside. Wouldn't I look like You've a... You've pr- got to trust me. Lady, I, I trust you more than anybody I know, but, but that's because I don't know you so good. Come on. <laughs> well, what do you know? Nobody in the hall. The elevator. Look, the door's partly open. Yeah. That's funny. Okay, buddy, you're faded. Come out grinning or pick up your marbles and slide back down that chute. It's a hot night and I don't want to play. There's a shoe wedged in at the bottom of the crack. Yeah. Looks like it's full of foot. Well, here goes. (laughs) This your big bad wolf, baby? Looks like you won't have any more trouble keeping him away from your door. (laughs) He was lying face down, mostly, but twisted like a Vienna roll, like he'd been just about to step out of the cab when it happened, and it spun around like a surf swimmer as the door closed on his foot. Whoever'd done it had been with him in the elevator. A long, pearl-handled nail file was the weapon, sticking straight out of the back of his neck like a Toreador's Espada. I knelt down to take a look at him. I turned him over. Dude, freak. Do you know him? I ought to. He's my partner at the agency. Oh, too bad. I told him he was getting careless lately. Should have let me cover him. Leaves me in a bad spot. But I'll promise you one thing, Harry. I'll get the dirty rat. Here, sister. But... Step in here. Give me a hand. Let's get his body out in the hall. Okay. Now listen, sister. What the... Hey! Well, I'll be up. She powdered out in the elevator. I beat it down the corkscrew steps like I was on fire, but when I hit the lobby, she was gone, and I couldn't find her on the busy street outside. 
He'd vanished like an ice cube in boiling water. I got hold of the hotel, Dick, and we beat it back up to my floor, the 11th. You guessed it. Harry's body was gone, too. Yeah, there was a little blood, but the hideous corpus was gone like vaudeville. Yes, I blush to admit it, but I went to bed at nine. Sorry. You're not, and I'm used to it. And to what disaster do I owe the pleasure of this call? Brace yourself, honey. This old joke, and I, I don't see how I can soften it. Harry's been killed. Harry? Killed? But... Oh, Steve. Yeah, rough. Nobody did intercept my passes for you now, baby. But listen, Rusty... Rusty. Yes? Rusty, don't crack up. Not yet. You gotta take it and you gotta hang on. At least for a while. A lot's depending on you. Okay, Steve. I'll make it now. Good kid. Now look, you've worked for the agency long enough to know that Harry's business was his business and mine was mine. Mm -hmm. We, We didn't check each other and we didn't cross each other. But this makes his business my business, you get me? Yes, Steve. Okay. I want to know everything about the case he was working on and who was paying him. Some dame he was tailing let him up here, and she or somebody else knocked him off. You know who she might have been. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, Nita, something. Nita called, that's it. I've got it all down in the folder at the office. Okay. Brief me on what you can remember and give me the fill-in later. Who had her shadow? Why, she hired Harry herself. She wanted protection. She was afraid of being alone or something. Wait a minute. Yeah, think so? Yes, and I think it's important. Harry filed a dictaphone report late this afternoon. He wanted me to type it tomorrow. He was pretty snug about it. You know, the way he gets when he's on to something. Said you'd be tipping your hat to him for a week. Yeah, he was always trying to get me to do that. Wish I had once in a while. Yeah. Did he say what it was he discovered? No, he was in a hurry. Said he had to check the morgue files right away. I was already late getting out, so I controlled my curiosity till tomorrow. Anyway, it's all on the cylinders. Yeah. Yeah, what else I need to go? She wanted to see you at first. I remember I thought that was odd at the time, so I took a better look at her. She looked a little dazed or something. Anyway, you were busy with a case of scotch. Yeah, I washed that up tonight. What else? Uh, what was she afraid of? Her own shadow, it seemed to me. Oh, darn it, Steve, I can't remember the details. Oh, yes, yeah, she's a singer. Might have known. Nice diaphragm. Where'd she work? At the Xanadu. Xanadu. Sunset Strip, huh? Well, we'll knock it off the income tax. Oh, Steve, are we going? Sure, maybe. Soft lights and music for me and down to the office for you, oh. where there's never a cover charge, never a minimum. Get all the dope out of the folder and phone me at the Xanadu. Oh, Steve, I do all the dirty work and you have all the fun. Sure, and I get all the credit and you get all the cash. Come on, Rusty, on your horse. Maybe Harry was in it for laughs, too. Maybe what happened to him is somebody's idea of fun. Well, whoever he was, baby, he's got himself a new playmate. And I don't think you'd like the way we're going to play. But you can sit on the sidelines and coach me, honey. You'll be doing as much for Harry as I will. Okay? Okay, Steve. And... Yeah? Oh, I was going to say be careful, but what's the use? Okay, honey. Over and out. Steve? Yeah? Be careful. Outside, the dry wind was beating the city like a rug. The gutters were gargling dust, and the hills above the Sunset Strip were huddling together like scared chicken thieves in the dark. The Xanadu was a beautiful club, in the same cheap way as most of the women who filled it. I mean, it had started as one fool's dream. It switched ownership a dozen times and always cost somebody dough. But while the old framework sagged under a dozen faceliftings, its surface was all fresh paint and glitter, and a sound of gaiety bubbled out of it, like the hep chatter of an aging bobby soxer. It was run by Manny Borden. As far as I knew, it was run on the level. But when you balance a ledger on Manny's honesty, always leave room in the margin for correction. 
Annie Borden saw me coming in. He always liked me. Like a wife likes cigar ashes on the rug. Well, well. Steve Mallory. And I thought the two-bit cover charge would keep out the rip, Fran. Hello, Borden. That's a funny opening line. Is all your dialogue that good? The whole act is good, Mallory. But you can't get in it, so get out. Yeah, you get funnier all the time. But I can't wait for the topper. Where's the dame? We don't serve dames. You've got to bring your own. What dame? Don't act stupid, stupid. Need a golf, your canary. Where is she? Listen, Seamus. Where she is is where you ain't going to be. I got a package deal on that, and I deal you out. So like I said, you should pardon the expression, blow. You listen, Manny. I haven't got time to play footy with you. You tell me where she is, or I'll ram your minimum down your throat. I think she killed my partner. Oh, too bad. It was only a step up from you, but I'd have taken odds you'd get it first. First or last, Borden, I want that game. Lots of guys have made the same mistake. Try looking. I'll tell you when you're getting warm. Now, that's real helpful, pal. Where's that door back of the van stand go? You're a bright boy, Stevie. You're getting warmer already. Thanks, sweetheart. I rustled through the dancers on the floor like a stag at a sophomore hop, while two big guys in evening dress ran a photo finish for second to the door. They were right behind me as I opened it and helped me through with a gun in my back. We went down a short flight of steps into an alley outside. Then they went to work. Hey, the boss says we should clean your nose for you, Mallory. Says you're having trouble with it. Aren't you boys taking chances? Only two of you and only one gun? One's enough. Cover him, Crocker. Yeah. You know, I don't like his mouth. I think I'll change it. <laughs> oh, you never let his glove on me. Still talking, huh? I like it better, though, when them little red bubbles come out. Try this out for size. <laughs> Oh, you're developing a nasty habit there. You ought to check it while you're young. Boy, you keep coming back like a song. Don't you? Now you're playing dirty. You know, I think I'm spoiling me manicure. You'll pardon my shoe. That's funny. Ain't got so much to say for himself now, has he? No. I thought he'd never run out of funny cracks. Too bad. I was just beginning to get a kick out of it. When I came around, my my head felt like the inside of a washing machine flapping out the family flat work. I would have traded my stomach for one with ulcers, and my nerves felt like they'd been yanked from my body, rubbed with sandpaper, tied in knots, and put in backwards. Other than that, though, Borden's boys hadn't bothered me at all. I got my eyes swiveled around so they were both pointing at the same thing. I was lying on the couch in my own apartment, and across the room, Nita Golf was sitting in a strapless evening gown. That was that gown that undid me. Well, well. I've been sitting here wondering what color your eyes would be. Yeah, I'd like to know myself. What color are they? Blue. A lovely baby blue. With uh, just a shot of magenta for contrast. Oh, cute. I love abroad with a sense of humor. And I love big, helpless brutes who get hammered unconscious by bigger, unhelpless brutes. Brings out the woman in me. Yeah. Well, that dress helps, too. Listen, sister. Oh. Oh, that's it. Lie back. Shouldn't try to do too much at first. A few weeks you'll be sitting up and I'll start you weaving baskets. Oh, no, thanks. I, I was never any good with my hands. Well, you're no good with your head either, especially when you lead with it. Yeah, I know, but I I have a lot of dumb luck. Like, I I take the count in an alley and wake up here with you. Think that's good? I don't know. How good is it? How good do you think? How good can it get? Oh, relax. You're still an invalid. Anyway, you're not my type. At least you wouldn't be long if Manny Borden found out. That reminds me. How'd I get here? I found you in the alley back of the club. I figured you must have been looking for me, so I kind of felt responsible. I brought you home. Yeah. Well, that's neat enough for now. Who killed my partner? You think I did, don't you? I don't know why you should have, but you could have. I don't know why I think you didn't, but I don't think you did. Thanks, Steve. Okay, but even I could be wrong. 
so far it reads like a couple of pages must have been stuck together. Let's see. You came to me screaming for protection from the very guy you hired to follow you. Yeah, yeah. I did what? Well, you hired Harry to follow you and then... I hired him? Yes, you hired him. Oh, are you sure? Sure, I'm sure, aren't you? Oh, no, not at all. Oh, oh good Lord, it's happened again. What's happened? Come on, baby, start making sense. Steve, look at me. Oh, not like that. Just, just look at me and tell me. Do I look like a perfectly normal human being to you? Well, I'm normal enough not to think so. But when I talk to you, do I sound coherent? Do I make sense? Well, don't take my word. My, my class voted me most likely to become idiotic. But as far as making sense goes, the best I can say for you is that you seem normal. What I'm trying to say is I, I think I'm sane, as sane as any girl could be who's been through what I have, but, but I don't remember ever seeing your partner before tonight. Give me that again, gently. If you say I hired him to follow you up, I must have hired him, but I don't know how to explain all this. But I have moments of... Well, I lose control. Things fill in on me. I forget. I, I don't know where I am or, or later where I've been. I, I never wanted it to happen when I was alone, so I, I thought of hiring someone to follow me. I thought of hiring you. Well, that makes sense. What you have is transitory amnesia. It's, it's like a champagne hangover. It comes and it goes. Now, you were smart to want to keep a tab on yourself. It's always nice to know where you've been. But what I say is, I thought of it. I don't remember doing it. Well, let's say you did. And then you forgot you hired Harry and you were afraid of him when you spotted him tailing you. So you ran to me because I was the guy you intended to go to in the first place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's but that wasn't the worst of it. I, I mean, it wasn't just the fear of not knowing where I'd been, but but more the fear of what I might do, and, and, and still worse than that, of what I might be accused of having done. Do you, do you follow this at all? Uh, I fell off as we rounded that last semicolon. I'll try a different approach. My husband... Oh? That's right. Oh. He's dead. Oh. And, and maybe I killed him. Manny Borden says I did. Well, Manny might be inclined to exaggerate. What's your story? I don't know what to think of. I could have been... Yet I don't know. I, I loved Philip with all my heart in spite of what he was. Philip Gall? Not the guy? Yes. Ah, quite a guy. Yes, he was. Yeah, nice people you play around with. I don't play. He was my husband. Sorry. No, really, kid, I, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. You're perfectly right. It was everything you think he was. Fast money boy, cheap, flashy, weak, a heavy drinker, a heavy gambler, a bad loser, and a worse winner. He wasn't even faithful. I, I don't know. I just loved him, I guess. I couldn't help it. <laughs> I should do this to music, sitting on a piano. Yeah. Yeah, well, anyway, I got troubles of my own. How was he killed? Automobile wreck. Manny says I was driving says I'd been drinking and crashed into a road bank on a detour in Topanga Canyon. Steve, if it's true, then I'm guilty of manslaughter and I want to pay for it. But I can't remember. I can't remember a thing. Yeah, how come Borden knows so much about it? He says I walked to a grocery store and phoned him to get me. That sounds like something I'd do. He says he picked me up and brought me home. The boys got the car off the road and took Philip's body away. What boys? Crocker and Jenks. Oh, those boys. Yeah, I've had the pleasure of meeting Crocker and Jenks. I'm in the clear if it's true, but I don't remember ever being out of my room. When I came out of the fog, my clothes were torn. I was covered with blood and I reeked of liquor. But there are about eight hours I can't account for. Whose car were you supposed to be driving? Mine. Uh-huh. That is, my, my husband's. I, I mean, it was registered in his name. Mm, but you paid for it. Oh, well, yes. Where is it now? Have you seen it? Yes. It's a horrible mess. Manny has it hidden in one of his garages. He has a lodge in Topanga. That must have been where we were going. I don't know. So, Manny did his good deed, hushed it up, and kept you out of it. For the police, that would make him an accomplice, more guilty than you are. What's it make him to you? Scoutmaster? What do you mean? Ah, quit stalling. He did it because he wanted something. He never did anything any other way. He has a way of getting what he wants. You didn't go for him, so now he's playing heavy, heavy hangs over thy head with this manslaughter rap. And you're the forfeit. Am I right? All right, just scare me. 
Yeah. Sometimes I scare myself. Especially when I can't figure out how any of this has anything to do with Harry's death. I owe you an apology for running out on you the way I did. I was panicking. Oh, yeah, you had a right to be. If they ever started grilling you and you cracked out with that transitory amnesia stuff, you'd be cooked. Especially if they tumbled onto this manslaughter caper. That's the big joker. That and why anybody was mad at Harry. Now, I got a lot of good back fence gossip here, but nothing that ties up with him. That's all I care about. Is that all you care about? I thought I wasn't your type. You'd be somebody's type. But not yours. No. Not mine. Well, forget it. You forget things, so forget it. All right. While you're forgetting, forget I kissed you. But you didn't. Oh. Oh. You are my guy. Thanks. I was afraid I was using the wrong toothpaste. So far tonight, nobody seemed to like me very much. Maybe my charm's coming back. I think I'll go over and try it out on Manny Borden. Well, they say a crook always returns to the scene of a crime. So does a cop. It was a crime the way Manny Borden's boys had mussed me up, but I was willing to forgive and forget. After I kicked their teeth out, I got back to the Xanadu at 4 a.m. The place was dark. It looked as empty as a canary cage after the cat got in. Except for one light in back. The alley door made just as good an entrance as it did an exit. I picked my way through the darkened club without playing musical chairs with the furniture. The door of Manny's office was partly ajar. I sidestepped the shaft of light that knifed out of it and plastered myself against the wall like I was part of the woodwork. It was a funny kind of night for Manny to be interviewing talent, but I thought I'd wait my turn. A little courtesy never hurt anybody. Whoever he was talking to was a good friend of his, same as me. Grifter, you're dead and you'll stay dead if I have to see to it myself. Sure, Manny, sure, I'll stay dead for another five grand. You know, this uh, being dead is kind of quiet. Leads to thinking. I've done a lot of thinking lately, mulling over my misspent life. I kind of wish I had it back to live all over again. Maybe I'd live it differently. You know, you get an idea like that in your head, and it takes a lot to make you stay dead. Like I said, five grand. It'll take a lot less than that to make you stay dead, though. I know, I know. But I don't think you want to get involved. Not that way. It'd uh, be kind of messy. You'd make the kind of mess I like, a quiet mess. Remember, Galt, you're already dead. Yeah, I know. It's sad, isn't it? But I'm afraid there's a certain young lady who doesn't hold with that. You remember, I told you about her. She's the one who influenced me to leave Nita to your tender mercies. No, she kind of fancies me the way I am. And she knows where I am and what I'm here for. So if I don't come back, I have an idea she'll get a little nervous. And when she gets nervous, she likes to talk to somebody. And I think you know who she'll talk to. You're bluffing. You wouldn't tell that to me, then. <laughs> now, if I'm bluffing, you'll never know until you call me. Besides, I'm getting bored with this deal. There's only one way the play can go. And I'm holding all the cards there are. I should have made that car crack up the real thing in the first place instead of a phony. Well, you go for phony setups, Manny. Because you're a phony yourself. Phony crack-up, phony amnesia, phony everything. All but the five grand. And that better not be funny. Pardon me, punk. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Good. Nice work, Jank. No, no, I'll take out the launch and head for Catalina. Yeah. About halfway over. Mm Mm-hmm. That's right. All right, Galt, that'll be all out of you. 
I just filled an inside straight and you're covered. Don't be a fool, man. I put down that gun, so... Oh, the dame will sing, huh? <laughs> you didn't know it, punk, but she's the only card you had. <laughs> For the last time you were here, Jenk followed you to see where you went. Oh. And you led us right to her like the smart oh. operator you are. So... Jenks taking her for a boat trip. And maybe she can walk back and maybe she can't. But you're one dead man who ain't gonna tell any tales. Now, wait a minute, Manny. You're making a mistake. I... I lied. She doesn't know anything. That's what you get for shooting off your face. And come to think of it, that ain't such a bad idea. No. No. No, no Manny, please. Wait a minute. You gotta believe me. I, I'll get out of town. I'll never come back. I... Listen, man. I've listened enough, you yellow-bellied louse. I killed that Seamus because you were sap enough to let him recognize you. You don't think I'd stop at you? No. no. Oh, Manny, give me a break. What do you want me to do? I'll do anything, Manny. Anything you say. I, I... want you to drop. No, oh, no, no. For God's sake, Manny. Oh. Oh. Who are you? The United States Cavalry. Who do you expect? You... You saved my life. Yeah. I'd rather save kitchen fat. It's worth something, Galt. I know. I, I got that coming. But listen, I got to stop them. They got my girl. They're going to... Yeah, I heard. Give me that phone. I'll call the harbor police and the coast guard. Hold it. Hey, boss, it's Jank. You in there? Well, waltz me around again, Jank. Hey, boss, I need the key to the lock. <laughs> Meet the new champ, Jenk. Well, there was a little more excitement after that. I, I had to get the drop on Crocker, Borden's other handyman. Well, that turned out to be easy. He was in the back of the car trying to keep Galt's woman from kicking out a window. Well, I didn't dirty my hands on him. I, I let Galt do that. She was his woman. It was a nice fight while it lasted, but when Galt went down for the fourth time, I, I kind of influenced the decision with the butt of my gun. I turned the whole mess over to the local gendarmes. Jenk, Crocker, Galt, the dame, and what was left of Manny Borden. Made a nice package, but no profit to the agency. Borden had been feeding Nita Galt a drug that made her lose her memory for short periods of time. Yeah, yeah, they have things like that. And then the rat killed my partner, Harry, because Harry spotted Philip Gold alive. Ah, uh, poor old Harry. He found his body on the roof of my building. The killer dragged it up there when I went after Nita. Planned to dispose of it later. Good boy. Knew his act of habeas corpus. I got to bed about ten the next morning and was just about to sleep when... Oh, no, not again. Steve! Steve, where have you been? I've been trying to get hold of you all night. Oh. I have that information you wanted. Oh, great. That's the full stun you. Harry was following Nita Gold because she was subject to spells. Yeah, but... yeah, that's fine. Write me a letter, will you? Well, what's the matter? Don't you want to hear this? Harry had seen her husband coming out of the Xanadu. Sure, Only sure. Here. Some other time I am trying to sleep. Well, that's a fine attitude, I must say. I spend the night knocking myself out doing your work for you, and now you tell me... Rusty, honey, I, I love you dearly. I appreciate everything you've done, but do me one more favor, will you? Yes. Go out and read the newspaper. All right. What page? Oh, Rusty. Well, I guess you know what you're doing. Yeah, I think I do. I'm going to sleep. Steve. Steve Mallory. Well, wouldn't that curdle you? Going to sleep at a time like this. Well, that's all there was to it. A dead husband who wasn't dead, an amnesia victim who didn't have amnesia, and a few double crosses that didn't come off. Oh, I guess this is the end of the trail. Here's where I'll drop you off tonight. Uh, driver? Yes, sir? Pull up just a minute. So long. See you next week. Okay, let's go. There goes that man again. Yeah, he's really heading for trouble. What are you Mallory.
stories off in a cloud of dust, speeding off in pursuit of new adventures. So follow that man. Follow the trail of Steve Mallory again next week as he leads you along the trail of the tingling spine. <laughs> Private Eye is written for radio by Doug Hayes, who plays the part of Steve Mallory. Production and music by Richard O'Rourke. Nita Goff was played by Monty Margaret. The part of Rusty was played by Rosemary Kelly. Stanley Waxman was Manny Borden. Philip Galt was played by Tom Holland. Buddy Gray was Crocker. And Paul Freeze was Jenks. This is James Matthews speaking. <laughs>